In a different universe, the entire world was celebrating the defeat of the greatest villain. Hordes of people had gathered to shower praise at the hero who defeated the demon king and brought peace to the world. There will be no more monster invasions, and no more innocent civilians will die needlessly. This fantasy world of Iskard has finally reached an era of peace after centuries of war. In an alley, two kids were running to see the hero who had just come victorious from his battles. The boy urges his sister to hurry up before they miss everything. For them, this is a once-in-a-lifetime opportunity they can't miss. While running, the boy comes across a passing figure in a dark robe. His presence is such that the boy's body freezes on the spot. When his sister catches up to him, she's confused to see the frozen state of his brother and looks in the direction of the robed figure. She doesn't understand why the man is walking in the opposite direction of the hero's parade, and her brother is scared that she might draw unwanted attention. He tells her to look away. Looks like the boy was able to identify that the robed figure is a dark magician, a sinister class of mages who dabble in the powers of darkness. His sister doesn't really understand the big deal behind being a dark magician, but the brother educates her that it basically means that person in the dark robe is cursed. The man in dark robes carry a white sack on his shoulder and walks a lonely road towards the cathedral where the saint of this era awaits his arrival. As she was gazing at the world that will finally get to see some peace, she hears a knock on the door. When she turned, the robed figure stands there at the entrance. Her golden hair are a symbol of her divine powers, and her white robes signify her purity. She looks at the man and welcomes him back. In contrast, the robed figure's dark clothes and silent presence give off nothing but sinister vibes. If the saint is a being of pure energy, the robed man is the incarnation of darkness. His name is Minold and when he unpacks the sack which contains the head of the demon king, it is revealed to us that he was in fact the true hero all along. But due to the dark nature of his powers, he had to become a shadow, while a useless man in fancy armor took all the glory. The saintess thanks the dark magician on behalf of the empire, but her words are cut short by the magician. He has but one desire. He did all that was asked of him, and now he wants the saintess to fulfill her end of the promise. The saintess wears a grim expression, but assures the magician that she remembers her promise and will be sure to fulfill it. And since that will be the case, perhaps she should refer to the dark magician not as Minold, but as Kim Minjun, which was his original name before he was forcefully summoned to this world. Standing under the statue of the goddess, the saintess tries to have a heart-to-heart -heart discussion with the protagonist. She tells her that she's sorry he had to bear such a heavy responsibility, and she explains that she did not give him such a job because she hated him. In fact, she will be forever in his great debt. But the man replies that he hates her so much that he could die right now. Even when met with such a cold response, the saintess says that she will do everything in her power to change the people's opinion about the dark mages in this world. She begs the man to reconsider his wish to go back to his old world. But there's nothing to consider in Kim Minjun's mind. He replies that he has already been used enough. Now, he simply wishes to return to his world in one piece. She sighs and says that if he stays behind for the sake of the empire, she promises that he will be rewarded for all of the ill treatment he has received thus far, and more. But looks like she was too late and the dark magician tells her to stop her acting. The saintess protests that she's not acting and is being very sincere with her words, to which the protagonist replies that there is nothing she can give him. The saintess eyes widen with surprise. By virtue of being the gods chosen, she holds quite a lot of power in this world. So what does this man desire that she cannot provide? He replies that he was brought here by force. He was used like a slave, and now she wants him to stay behind so he can wipe her ass some more. For him to forsake his life like this, what can the saintess give him in return? She answers that she can grant whatever he desires, because if he were to cease existing, the Empire's peace may not hold for long. But then, the protagonist asks for his first wish to be granted. He wants to eat Korean fried chicken, but the saintess doesn't even know what it looks like. He asks for kimchi, but once again, the saintess doesn't know anything about it. He complains that the food in this world is disgusting. He has eaten nothing but high-calorie biscuits all these years. How can he be expected to live in a world where he's forced to eat such trash? And if he can't be provided with good food, can the saintess at least provide him with a gaming PC and a good internet connection? Of course, none of that is possible in an undeveloped world like this. In the end, the saintess clenches her fist and gives up on keeping him in this world. He never belonged here in the first place. She drops her head in defeat and agrees to start the return ceremony right away. She takes him to the summoning chamber, where the protagonist reminisces his memory of the past when he was first summoned, and is happy that he will never have to see this place again. The saintess tells him to stand in the summoning circle in the middle and proceeds to start the return ceremony. And then, a bunch of magic patterns start moving under the protagonist's feet right away. She tells him that she will start by removing the protection of the saint from his body first. Kim Min Jun takes off his glove and looks at the hand with the saint's symbol on it. Even though it's called a protection, it's just a leash that stops the summoned person to fight the saint. He's glad to finally be getting rid of it. 
the saintess holds out her hands, and a radiant light purifies the symbol from the protagonist's hand. She seems quite perplexed, because not only the dark magician will be giving up on all the incredible power he built up over the years, he is also refusing to take all the riches and the fame that he would get by staying here. But the man is fed up with this world, and asks the saintess to mind her own business. Instead, he asks why the saintess isn't concerned about this situation. Once the symbol is completely gone, he could kill her if he wanted to. But the woman replies that she knows she is the root cause of all the hatred in his heart. If he were to kill her, she would gladly accept her death. And now that the protection is undone, she tells him to kill her if he'd like. And if he has no such desire, she'd like to start the next stage of the ceremony. The next step involves removing the powers the protagonist has obtained in the world of Isgard, and the saintess steps back from the circle to complete this process. But this is where things won't go as according to the saintess, but how the dark magician wants. He quickly hurls a rope of binding dark energy to subdue the saintess and hold her up in the air. She tells the man that possessing the powers of this world will kill him if he uses the dimensional gate. What he's doing is complete nonsense. But this man worked himself to death to obtain these powers. There's no way he will leave them behind before going back. He drops the saintess on her ass and proceeds to open the dimensional gate himself. Even though her life was spared, the saintess is more concerned that the dark magician will never be able to open the dimensional gate with his unholy powers and will probably die as a result. But looks like her worries were unwarranted, since the protagonist was already standing there with a fully functioning portal. Even then, the saintess warns him that he's risking his life by attempting to travel the dimensions so rashly. But he was already aware of such things. That's why he practiced his magic thousands of times to perfect it. He's confused why the people of this world divide the magic into light and darkness in the first place. When he reached the peak, he realized that all magic is the same anyway. In any case, he puts his hand in his pocket and says that there is something he would like to give to the saintess before he leaves. What could it be? Nothing. It's just a fist, which he tells the saintess to shove up her ass as he enters the portal, knowing that he will never have to see this stupid world ever again. She shouts for the protagonist to stop before the portal destabilizes and kills the caster. But it was already too late, and the summoning chamber was soon filled with waves of bright purple energy. And then, the portal collapsed on itself and vanished into thin air leaving the saintess all by herself in the chamber. She slams her fist on the floor in anger. Even though they had their differences, she's upset that she was hated to this extent when she did nothing but fulfill her duty. She never wanted to make anyone suffer, and she never enjoyed putting the protagonist through all that hardship. But now, none of that matters, since the two of them are worlds apart from each other. In an unassuming building on Earth, purple lighting sparks, and Kim min Jun is teleported inside. Finally, he's back on the planet he was taken from. Even though he did it so confidently, he felt like he was going to die during the dimensional travel. But all of that is finally over. As he stands, he finds himself in the same room he was summoned from. And when he looks at his table, his phone is still charging. This sensation of having your phone in your hand. Min Jun can't describe in words how much he missed this feeling. And his favorite game, Dungeon Power Fighter is still installed inside. Only when he opened the game, the reality started kicking in his mind. And he couldn't help but laugh maniacally at his successful return to Earth. But it's too soon to be happy. For some reason, there's no internet connectivity in his apartment. And outside, a squad of soldiers is hugging the walls as if they are in a war zone. The unit commander asks if they're correctly headed in the direction of the creature. And the scout confirms that they're on the path relayed by the radioed location. He asks his corporal why regular soldiers like them were dispatched to deal with something so dangerous. And the corporal is just as confused. He says that such questions should be asked to the headquarters. He knows nothing. Nothing can be done now, and they have no choice but to fight. So the soldiers take a deep breath and get ready for battle. On the corporal's signal, they rush to the road and turn the corner to shoot the enemy. But what they see is completely different from what they were after. Kim and Jun is walking the streets, pissed at the fact that his phone is getting no network connection, and not a single store is open in the area even though it's the middle of the day. The soldiers are confused to see a civilian in an area that was restricted from access, and shout for the young man to come back to them. Minjun is also surprised to see the armed soldiers. He wonders what the army is doing in a civilian area. He assumes that the soldiers must be doing their training drills and apologizes for getting in the way. And that's when the soldiers notice something behind Minjun and shout at him to run away as fast as he can. When he turns around to see what has the soldiers so flustered, he couldn't have been more confused by the bizarre sight before him. A huge wolf-like monster is leaping at the protagonist to rip him apart with its claws. But he wasn't surprised because of the monster, he was surprised why something so weak-looking could have the soldiers so scared. After all, he just came from a world where he fought much stronger monsters for years. But when he clenched his fist to summon his dark powers, the demonic energy failed to manifest. It was completely gone. Not that it really matters in this case, since Minjun is able to crush such small fry with his sheer strength, and has no trouble burying the wolf monster's face in the ground. 
The soldiers are stunned silent by this superhuman display of power, and the monster's teeth break off completely from the force of the impact. The fact that it dared to attack him is still pissing off Minjun, and he brutally crushes the monster skull his with bare hands. Even though he can't use his dark magic due to lack of the demonic energy, he's still not weak enough to be beaten by such monsters. After all, he went through hellish strength training every day when he was in Isgard. Still, he knows of the identities of these creatures. But why has it appeared in this world? He has a lot of questions, and only the ones behind him can answer them for now. But when he calls for their attention, the soldiers are so scared that they can barely speak. After talking for some time, the soldiers take the protagonist in an army vehicle to escort him out of the restricted area. The corporal warns the man that he was wandering too far in a monster-infested area. Under normal circumstances, he could have been arrested. But since the commander told them not to escalate the situation, they're just letting him go. But how is it possible that he really doesn't know about anything that's happening in the world? The protagonist simply lies that he had been living abroad. But regardless, this isn't the Korea he used to know. The phenomenon of dungeons appeared when he was around seven years old. Monsters from dungeons started appearing in real life. He recalls the soldiers and military beating them up like right now. And with the appearance of dungeons, superhumans called the Awakened also started appearing. Fade had abilities that surpassed the level of average humans. They joined the Hunter Corps which was newly established at the military base and completely wiped out the monsters as soon as they appeared. So prior to being summoned by that saint, Korea had no danger of being harmed in the civilian areas. And now, there's an even bigger problem. Due to the current chaotic state of the world, is it possible that the Dungeon Power Fighters servers are completely gone? If that happened, then Kim Min Joon wonders what was the point of coming back to Earth in the first place. The corporal can't help but be suspicious of this man's behavior. The world is in a state of chaos, so how is it possible that he doesn't know about anything simply because he was living abroad? But then again, he doesn't have the balls to ask questions that don't concern him. He already witnessed the protagonist's strength firsthand. Kim Min Joon calls for the corporal's attention and asks if the people evacuated safely during the crisis, especially people like game developers. And is it possible to get a job in this day and age, especially in a game company? What about the destruction of building? Are places like the server storage systems okay? Looks like his needle is stuck on the game and he needs some answers. The corporal replies that he will explain everything from the start. The reason the situation got this bad is because of the weird phenomenon that started to spread from the dungeons two years ago. One day, the dungeons began to appear much more frequently and started getting larger as well. But the biggest problem was the increasing number of giant monsters that kept coming from these strange dungeons. Because of that, the military couldn't control the dungeons anymore, and the situation got so far as to lock down some of the civilian areas. Since then, the military has been trying different methods to fight back, but they lack in numbers. Min Jun is extremely disappointed to hear this explanation. He doesn't give a crap about such matters. The only thing he wants to know is whether the game companies are doing alright, because he wants to play Dungeon Power Fighter. The corporal asks the protagonist how old he is, and he replies that he's probably 21 this year. The corporal suggests that he should enlist in the military soon if that's the case, since half of his 20s are about to evaporate into thin air. Min Jun doesn't understand. The mandatory military service used to be five years for the Hunter Corps and three years for regular troops, so why would he need to waste half of his 20s? But since the situation has worsened in recent years, all troops now serve for five years, not just the Hunter Corps. If Min Jun is 21, he probably has his enlistment letter ready. What a disappointment. He came back so he could live the rest of his life in easy mode and play his favorite games. But now he has to serve in the military for five years. He's furious that he didn't even get to connect with the game servers yet. That's when his phone finally receives some network, and he gets a message from the military. It's an enlistment date notice to join the X Division, and the enlistment date is tomorrow. The timing couldn't have been more uncanny, so the protagonist assumes that this is probably some spam message. But the corporal assures him that it's real and not a spam. Once again, it is a huge shock to the boy. How can the military enlist people without even a physical examination? And how does it make sense to notify you only one day before enlisting? But the corporal replies that the military is extremely short on manpower and such practices have become very normal. And for the notice, he's sure that he just saw it late. He suggests Minjun to go to the internet cafe close to the evacuation center and double-check his status himself. The mention of the PC cafe filled Minjun with new life. When his parents went missing, he just holed himself up in his house and played games. But then, he was summoned to Iskard when he was in grade 12, without even a single friend. And after years of hell, he gets to experience the forgotten paradise of humanity. An internet cafe, where the servers of his favorite gamer still live, and he can play it to his heart's content. As he wastes away his hours in this haven, he keeps ordering all the fast food that he missed eating in his previous world. Even the waitress is shocked to see how much he can eat. 
and now that his need to play games has been handled, it finally starts hitting him how the world has changed completely. He checked the internet news articles, and everything the corporal said was true, including the enlistment date that he'd been notified about earlier. As the text message had said, the due date was tomorrow. If he possessed all of his powers from Isgard, he would have been able to clear every single dungeon by himself. But for some reason, his body is completely depleted of the demonic energy that is the main source of his dark magic. But it's not like he's defenseless. In fact, he's confident that he can still clear all the dungeons by himself. And after thinking about it for a few minutes, he shouts out loud with his newfound resolve. If it means saving his favorite games from getting wiped out, he has resolved himself to solve everything by himself. The next day, he walked into the National Defense Center as per the enlistment instructions. He was surprised to see so many people who had come for the same purpose. Some were saying farewell to their families, and some, to their lovers. No matter where he looked, he was amused to see everyone's depressed expressions. And then, the announcer called for all soldiers to report to the auditorium immediately. I guess the military isn't how it used to be, but Minjun doubts it will be as tough as Iskar. Inside the auditorium, the commanders were shouting and cursing at the new recruits to show discipline and stand up straight. They're dropping the F-bombs in every sentence and forcing miserable vibes on every soldier. The recruits are surprised to see this horrible treatment when they haven't even started, and Minjun is surprised to hear these weak insults, as compared to his Spartan teachers from Isgard. In contrast, the military instructors are actually really nice. This is when the battalion commander steps to the podium and calls for everyone's attention. Before starting their agendas, he asks the new recruits to raise their hands if they want to apply to the Hunter Corps and didn't get the chance thus far. He incentivizes the recruits by saying that the Hunter Corps receives a different treatment and has a much higher base pay. But even then, no one raises their hands. The commander informs the recruits that this is just a formality for now, there is no need to be so nervous. But looks like he missed someone. Among the crowd, a single volunteer had raised his hand. Of course, it was none other than Kim Minjun. The commander asks for the volunteer to step forward immediately. Heeding his superior's first command, he pushes against the ground with such force that the floor cracks, and when he jumps into the air, he's flying well above everyone's heads. He lands majestically on top of the podium, and the battalion commander can do nothing but look at him with immense surprise. This is when he introduces himself as the recruit Kim Minjun, and says that he would like to apply to the Hunter Corps. This is how the legend of the greatest hunter to ever exist on Earth began. The story continues in the northern regions of Isgard. It is a dark and desolate mountainous area, a place full of rocky cliffs and lifeless dust that covets the atmosphere. There are not a lot of people populating it, perhaps that is why it has a reputation as the Forgotten Canyon. The inside of a deep dark cave has a shining beacon of light within it, as we hear someone's voice. So what I'm saying is, the protagonist, Kim Minjun mutters, this dark mage job has no end to turmoil. He speaks the truth. This job is much more difficult than he had known, and he definitely believed that the dark mage was one of the worst character classes out there. He sits atop a spider's head. It's just there on the ground, lifelessly letting him trample on him. He breaks into a monologue. Even though we have insane skills, if we run out of demonic energy, it's all for nothing. This was true. Dark mages had a huge reliance on their demonic energy, which served as their version of mana. It's not like it will naturally restore itself like mana of the regular mages. He thinks of the white wizard when he says that. The white wizard would always have mana within him. In fact, his whole motto is that mana is always within you. Just collect it. Just collect it. But dark mages did not have that sort of choice in their life. The only way to truly replenish demonic energy is by killing monsters that possess it, and then drain them of it. The hero has realized that it's not very efficient to replenish demonic energy by using it, and he's also realized that his image as a dark mage will result in him never finding any party members. He's going to be alone in every battle, and that in itself is a tragedy. It's a bit crazy, but if he ever runs out of demonic energy in a dungeon, he will most likely just die. So, why is he smiling and in such a good mood? Well, he's got a question of his own. What is the best method for a dark mage to restore demonic energy and also retain it? He asks while sitting by a bonfire, waiting for someone to respond. Who is he speaking to? Well, it turns out, there's nobody to respond to him, because everyone he's around is dead. Not to fret though, they aren't people, they are large poisonous cave spiders that can easily bite someone's head off in one swift tug of their teeth. Kim is sitting on one of the 50 spiders he's killed. All of them almost exploded with green goo oozing out of their bodies with large holes protruding from within them. He hears a large thump behind him, something piercing the very ground he stands on. He looks back through his peripheral vision and notices that behind him is the forgotten canyon hidden dungeon boss, Arachnus, a humongous spider five times the size of any he's fought so far. Its large bulbous red eyes, sharp teeth, and tweezer-like claws are staring at Kim as it jumps towards him. 
Kim tries to make conversation with the thing, but quickly come to realize that it's just a creature of vanity, with no self-control over what it does. Arachnus looks at the carcasses of all its children, and lets out a large, terrifying and roaring scream, which simply does not even faze Kim. He's too confident of a dark mage to worry about a spider being his demise. In one swift movement of his arm, he pierces through Arachnus' thick skin and beheads it. In just one hit, he took down the boss, and he gave us an answer to his earlier question. What is the best method for a dark mage to restore demonic energy and also retain it? Well, according to Kim and Jun, the answer is to defeat monsters with maxed out strength levels. Honestly, that makes a lot of sense. 645 days before returning to Earth, Minold has taken on a dungeon of spiders and their queen all alone by himself and has come out triumphant. Fast forward to the present time, we see Kim and Jun in a normal looking environment, with a cup of coffee being given to him. You say your name was Kim and Jun. The voice asks him, to which he responds yes. The man in the army uniform then tells him to wait there, and a troop from the Hunter Corps will come by. He thanks the man, and acknowledges that the coffee was made by the battalion commander himself, which is a big deal for Kim. The guy sits down with Kim, and asks him some personal stuff. You seem enthusiastic, why did you apply to the Hunter Corps? The man asks him. Things are pretty bad these days, and most people are pushing to return back to the regular army, despite them having special abilities. Why do you want to be in the Hunter Corps in particular? The man is inquisitive. Kim simply responds by saying he has some business in the dungeons. They both stare at each other awkwardly for a minute, before bursting out into laughter at the absurdity of Kim's answer. The battalion commander then tells him that since Kim is so funny, he won't charge him for the auditorium flooring that he smashed. While Kim's internally thinking that he's not joking, so why is his answer so funny to the old buffoon? Here, we get some context. All dungeons that spawn in Korea are managed by the army, and not just by any regiment. The Hunter Corps are a unit of highly skilled soldiers, and the only way to advance through the ranks is by showing your worth, showing your power and your abilities. Minjoon wants to become part of the Hunter Corps so he can get access to dungeons. He wishes to clear a majority of them by himself, and when that happens, he thinks that he can get the ability to recover his powers. Of course, this is all Minjoon's imagination, and reality may differ from this, though it's still fun to hope. He's so confident in his abilities that he thinks he can probably gain 10 stars, advance 10 ranks and clear pretty much every dungeon in 5 years' time. After that, he thinks that he can simply relax and spend the rest of his days being a highly paid public hero figure. A perfect plan made by someone who wants to speedrun his life. While Kim Minjoon is contemplating this quote-unquote fantastic idea, Hunter Corps Sergeant Lee Seung Ho enters the room and gives a commanding salute. The battalion commander introduces the sergeant to Minjoon, and the sergeant immediately is interested. He asks Minjoon if he really has hunter abilities, and if he does, he can easily open a status window. He asks Minjoon for all of his stats. The sheer energy of this sergeant seems to irritate Minjoon. What is wrong with this guy? He thinks to himself, are all hunter corps this frustrating? Anyways, he opens up the status window and starts to check it. He realizes that they had status windows even in Iskard, so this shouldn't be anything new to him although it was just numerical values of your stats and abilities, so he didn't care much for it. Status window, he says, commanding it for his stats. But then his face has an expression of shock. The twitchy sergeant keeps asking him what he sees on the status window, but it turns out, the status window shows nothing. It just says error. Sergeant Lee seems visibly frustrated. He had never heard of something like this before. Now, somewhere in Jongidu, at the Hunter Corps Training Center, a conversation is taking place inside of the battalion commander's office. It's been a long time, I haven't seen you in 10 years, says the battalion commander. Didn't think I'd run into you here. Why don't you take a seat, Hunter Sun Yunseo? Hunter Sun Yunseo stands tall, staring into the battalion commander's eyes. She says that she isn't a hunter yet. Just like everyone else who has enlisted, she's merely a recruit. She wonders why the battalion commander has called her to his office and asks her to not give her any special treatment because of her father. The battalion commander shuts down any of her worries and mentions that she was called due to a separate matter from General Sun. He then continues with more information, saying that Hunter Sun won't be getting any special treatment, as the Hunter Corps are already a difficult organization to get into. Hunter Sun is further confused. She asks why she was summoned, to which the battalion commander gleefully responds. You're a renowned rookie, he tells her. Why wouldn't I be interested, seeing as I'm the training commander here? It turns out, the training commander just called Hunter Sun to give a few words of encouragement before she got busy with her training. He thanks her for choosing to enlist as a soldier instead of an executive, as someone with her skills would be incredibly useful in the field. He tells her that they are always short of people like her, who are skilled and committed to doing their duty, and that he thanks her both as a citizen of Korea and as a soldier. This obviously embarrasses her a little bit, but she thanks the commander for the kind words. Outside of the window, the commander sees a truck pulling up, which reminds him of Minjoon, and he mentions to Hunter Sun that she might be getting quite a funny comrade on her team soon. 
So, they decide to go pay a visit to Minjun together. Minjun arrives with Sergeant Lee at the Hunter Corps Training Center, and he's immediately overtaken by the sheer beauty of this building. It's a huge building. With many floors and a complete coating of glass, it shines brighter than the sun. Minjun is utterly taken aback. How much taxpayer money did they pour into this thing? He wonders to himself. He notices that this facility is simply no joke, and thinks whether or not there's a PC room in here. Sergeant Lee is there to keep him grounded though, and he reminds him not to get too excited as his recruitment hasn't been confirmed yet, because of the error thing with the status window. Sergeant Lee reminds him that since he's a special case, he will be tested personally by him. And it's obvious that Lee doesn't like him much, because he says that if it was up to him, he would have sent him to the military police right away. He continues his rant. When all the tests are completed, and you're confirmed to be a liar, you best be prepared to enlist into the military police immediately. It's almost as if Sergeant Lee is a bit jealous of Minjun, which Minjun wonders too, thinking how Lee is being stingy about everything. Anyways, he asks Lee what the test is, and Lee points towards a large crystallized red rock. It turns out, this is a red stone, a byproduct of the dungeons that emerged. This is an extremely hard, dense and heavy rock, and it's something that wouldn't even budge, no matter how strong a recruit may be. Thankfully, Minjun isn't just any recruit. Lee gives him a test. If Minjun can move the red stone even an inch, he will pass the test. That brings a smile to Minjun's face. Is that all? He exclaims. The test is too simple for him. Lee's demeanor immediately changes. He realizes that Minjun's not as daft as he seems. Lee thinks to himself, there's no other way to check someone's status window, and there have always been liars who try to take advantage of their mediocre abilities and get into the hunter corps. Lee wonders why the status window had an error, despite Minjun having jumped 5 meters to the podium before. He is almost certain that Minjun is a liar. A bit farther away, on the balcony onlooking the testing room, the training commander brings Hunter Sun with him to see Minjun's test. He apparently showcased incredible physical abilities in front of the battalion commander at the recruit training center, but his status window shows an error somehow. The training commander tells Hunter Sun that he's never seen such a case in all his years being in his position, and that he has high hopes for Minjun and wants to see how unique he will be. Minjun is standing near the red stone, with his hand placed on it. He wonders to himself, this is that ridiculously heavy red stone that was all over the Iskar dungeons. At this size, I can easily push it away. Minjun leans forward, pulling his arm backwards with his fist closed. He's revving up a punch that will definitely push the red stone. Who knows, this might even have some demonic energy inside of it. He thinks to himself. Sergeant Lee and Hunter Sun are looking at him, wondering as to what he's about to do. In a swift strike, Minjun lands a punch right at the center of the rock. But it doesn't just move. It completely shatters. The dust settles, and there's a large hole in the red stone. All three of the spectators are completely shocked, their mouths wide open in surprise. It turns out, there is no demonic energy inside of the red stone. Somehow, Minjun had managed to absolutely obliterate the red stone. His sheer power was so much, that even he himself was surprised. What a monstrous bastard, Sergeant Lee thought to himself, completely shocked at Minjun's prowess. The first day of training begins, as recruit Nam and Hayek and the rest of the recruits are clearly struggling to go through it. They are running up the stairs, as in Hayek's internal thoughts are going all over the place due to the fatigue he's feeling. There is something wrong. Even before enlisting in the Hunter Corps, I knew that training wouldn't be ordinary. He thinks to himself, trying his hardest to not lose his strength while climbing up the infamous 6,000 steps. Since you'll participate in actual battles immediately, you must train like crazy for four whole weeks. You weigh yourself down with sandbags from the very first training session, and you have to climb the infamous 6,000 steps. And Hayek continues, as he's obviously not having the best time here. The instructor that keeps hassling you while he checks your finishing time is something already expected. Here he's obviously talking about Sergeant Lee Seung Ho, who they call the devil instructor. And Hayek realized that even after such crude training, you could only increase your stats a little bit, and you would be placed right into battle afterwards. He had to endure it, just because he was a hunter corp recruit. That is what he thought, until he saw Minjun. Are we the problem, he thought to himself. Minjun, on the other hand, was having the time of his life, going through this training swimmingly. H feels extremely light on his feet. If he had all of his demonic energy, he'd be flying. He loves the training here because it's so simple compared to the experience he's had in all his time during dungeon dwelling. Compared to the rags in Isgard, this military uniform is definitely my style. He thinks to himself, and he absolutely loves the food that they serve in the Hunter Corps mess hall. Their routine is quite strict, they have to wake up at 6am, and after breakfast at 8.30, their morning training lasts up until lunch, after which they do afternoon training till dinner. However, the one thing that he loved the most about it is that he gets to have free time at night. There's a PC room inside the facility that's equivalent to the level outside of the army, and if you're consistent and truly remain a part of the Hunter Corps, you can do whatever you want with your free time. He's truly living his dreams, from getting paid handsomely, to being fed and having time to exercise and play games. It was all that Minjun wanted. 
he rushes up the stairs even faster due to the excitement of his thoughts, and the others stare at him confused on how he has so much speed and energy. Sergeant Lee is standing atop the mountain, at the end of the 6,000 steps. He hears a large noise of footsteps going really fast, and sees Min Jun coming up. Kim Min Jun, who is this guy? It normally takes an average recruit at least one hour to climb the steps, how is he done already? Sergeant Lee thinks to himself. However, Min Jun seems disappointed. Is this it? He asks the sergeant, and begins pestering him about something he mentioned earlier. Did you say that we would be getting an outing pass if we finish in less than 30 minutes? How long did I take? The sergeant simply chooses to not respond, and hands him the outing pass instead. Min Jun begins thinking on where he should be using this outing pass. Meanwhile, the sergeant is checking how long it took him to finish. And Min Jun made a record breaking 21 minutes, 1 second and 43 milliseconds, something no one had ever done before. He's the first recruit ever to receive an outing pass. But it isn't everything to have high stats and good strength. The most important thing is the ability to react to monsters for the Hunter Corps. The sergeant is slowly beginning to see the potential in Min Jun. Looks like he'll be paying close attention to the protagonist from now on. Back in the common room, the recruits are having existential crises, worried whether or not they'd have to go through such strict training regiments every day. In Hayek is excited looking at his status window. Looks like his stats went up, and Anne and the recruit congratulates him. This excited everyone, and all the recruits around Minjun started to check their stats through the status window. He was sitting there wondering, they're all getting excited simply over one stat point. Really, he recalls his training days in Isgard, where his stats would go up by 10 per day. If he wanted to raise his resistance to physical damage, he would get beaten up until his stats went up. The other recruits begin speaking to him. You've got an outing pass, what will you use it on? In Hayek asks him, and Minjun is just unsure of what he'll use it on for the time being. One of the other recruits expresses jealousy, while another one begins talking about something he heard. I overheard the instructors earlier, and they said no one has managed to obtain an outing pass from Sergeant Lee so far. This excites the other recruits. In Hayek asks Minjun if he works out a lot, while another recruit tells him that it was incredible watching him climb up those stairs like it was nothing. This is something Minjun had never felt. Having people chat with him and converse with him like he was a normal person. He thinks about his time in Isgard. Since he was a dark mage, the people of Isgard pretended like he didn't even exist. Like speaking to him was some sort of sin. They even refused to make eye contact with him, because they thought that he was bad luck. He likes that communication is a thing here, and he honestly is a fan of it. He hears that Hayek mentioned to another recruit, The PC room is open, are you going to use it? The other recruit says he's too tired. But when Minjun hears of this, he bursts with energy and jumps out of his seat with excitement. The PC room is open. Why are you just telling me this? He runs straight towards the PC room to get to gaming. Minjun and two other recruits are chilling in the PC room, with Minjun feeling more satisfied than he has ever felt in his life. He looks up at the time. It's 9 p.m. And he thinks to himself, since it's 9 p.m. right now, I'll get at least two hours of sleep when I'm done gaming. Two hours of sleep was more than enough for Minjun, since getting an hour's worth of sleep was a maximum in Isgard. Two hours of sleep is a luxury for him, and he was ready to end his gaming fatigue. The other two recruits in the room just stare at him while he's playing Dungeon Power Fighter and wondering there are people who still even play that game. As the training continues, Sergeant Lee is training the soldiers to run consistently with maintained speed. The recruits behind seem to be super tired, but they're still going on. Don't increase the distance, maintain your speed. If there are any recruits who cannot complete 40 kilometers in two hours, they will not be served breakfast, shouts the insufferable Sergeant Lee. Meanwhile, Kim Min Jun flexes his abilities. I hit 10 max levels yesterday, he tells his fellow recruits while taking a sip of water after finishing the run. When a fellow recruit asks why he's not even sweating, he responds that this much is nothing more than a stroll. The recruit then asks him another question. Did you seriously just play games all nights except for two hours for the whole four weeks? Are you a monster or something? Minjun replies with a jest of his own. Monster, I brought water to share with my lovely comrades, I guess you guys don't want it. As he begins to spill the water onto the floor. The recruits all flock around to the water saying good things about him. They look almost like a flock of baby birds being fed in their nest. You guys are like baby chicks, says Minjun. Sergeant Lee walks into the scene. Attention, he screams. The lieutenant is very disappointed in all of you. He begins to bully the squadron for their frailty. Even though we are in the last week of training, only half of you are even able to pass the standard. You are the most lacking squadron we've had to date. Meanwhile, Minjun is just thinking about why he's referring to himself in third person. He continues, with a grim look on his face, as if he is about to drop the most terrifying piece of information that they've heard in a while. If you're deployed after your training is over, half of you will die in less than a month. With this kind of outlook, do you think you can even finish the last stage of training? It is called, the Dungeon Adjustment. The final stage of training, the very last battle to become a proper soldier of the Hunter Corps organization. 
A majority of the dungeons will vanish once you've defeated all of the monsters within them, but sometimes, a rare phenomenon can happen, where a dungeon can still remain. In that case, the dungeon will modify itself into a transforming dungeon. It will change its internal structure on a regular basis, almost like it is procedurally generated. It becomes a great training facility, where recruits can experience every form of environment. The training that is facilitated within this transforming dungeon is known as the dungeon adjustment, and it is notorious for being extremely difficult for the new recruits. They are already scared out of their minds, but this kind of reaction is expected. In fact, the lieutenant prefers to maintain this level of tension. It's good to handle recruits as if you are handing race horses. When they need discipline, you must have a heavy hand on the whip, and console them with carrots when the time is right. He encourages the recruits by giving them a piece of carrot they would drool over. He announces that the recruit with the highest score from this training will receive a two nights and three days vacation pass. This is the part where he expected everyone to be overjoyed, but their reactions are as dull as a koala. He emphasizes once again that the highest scoring recruit will receive a vacation pass. It is something to be extremely happy about. He hypes them up with the amount of things one could do in three days. But no matter what he says, the recruits aren't the least bit happy with this lackluster reward. Of course, with the exception of our protagonists, who couldn't be happier to hear about a three days vacation. And finally, it came time for the hellish dungeon training to begin. The recruits were extremely surprised to see the sheer size of the dungeon gate before them. Some of them are still confused what they're supposed to be doing here. This is when an army truck nearly runs them over and stops in the front, knocking up the dirt in their faces. The recruits are confused, but it doesn't take long for them to see what the truck had brought along. What are these luminous eyes behind the cage? The story continues with two very important questions. What were those luminous eyes behind the cage and what possible danger could the military be planning to introduce to the unsuspecting recruits? Those eyes glared through the bars in the cage, with growls that would send shivers down your spine. Upon further inspection, as the eyes adjusted to the darkness of the cage, the recruits saw beasts with large fangs and furry skin. The cage was filled with hounds. These weren't just regular hounds though, they were a bloodthirsty and an absolutely terrifying breed. The recruits were terrified, with two of them quickly choosing to hide behind Kim Minjoon while another one of the recruits fell to the ground. Of course, Minjoon didn't think of the hounds that way. Instead, he found them to be quite amusing. He thought they were equivalent to tiny puppies and did not fear anything about them. The lieutenant screamed at the recruits, wondering if they were scared of the hounds. He then tells them that those are the monsters that they will be facing during their time in the transforming dungeon. This scares the recruits even more. The lieutenant instructs them to form teams of four people before they can enter the transforming dungeon. The goal is to defeat at least one monster and then make their way back out of the transforming dungeon so that they can prove themselves as valuable future soldiers to the hunter corps. He gives them a small pep talk and basically tells them to push through any of the pain and that definitely lifts their spirits up. He then tells them to gear up as it seems that they are about to get some fancy armor for this mission. One of the instructors asks the recruits to proceed one by one and pick up their Hunter Corps exclusive safety suit, also known as the Mid-2. This suit looks like a piece of armor shining in silver with a tough and heavy-looking exterior, almost like a steel chassis. However, the only purpose of this armor is to protect its wearer. It is roughly made and is quite rigid along with being incredibly heavy. The recruits seem a little skeptical about it, wondering if the Hunter Corps could have provided them with something tougher. Minjun doesn't like this piece of armor either. He feels really gross wearing it, knowing that this armor has probably been used hundreds of times by previous batches of soldiers. Since this armor cost around 50 million Korean currency to make, he asks the lieutenant if he can take off the armor quickly if he defeats the hounds fast enough. The lieutenant, being a stout bully for his recruits, just tells off the recruits for being too arrogant without even seeing who asked the question. Once he sees it's Minjun, he basically just says yes to him. He then takes a moment to remind Minjun that the transformative dungeon is a team training exercise. He has to make sure that his team is safe and secure while also ensuring the completion of their goal. Minjun's always known that the other recruits are kind of incompetent. So, he comes up with a plan to teach his teammates how to kill the hounds. He begins to explain it to the boys by telling them that the hounds will leap at them to attack. Once they do, they should grab the hounds by their legs and snap their backs. He continues by saying that if the hounds don't die from that, then they should fold their backs in the opposite direction and then rip them apart into two pieces. Minjun's face is filled with excitement while giving the gnarly details of his plan, but the recruits' faces have an expression of nothing but being unamused and tired of Minjun's cockiness. The lieutenant shouts for the hounds to be released, and the instructor opens the cage door. The hounds immediately jump out, galloping at a ferocity the likes of which these recruits had probably never witnessed before. Growling and drooling at the mouth, their sparkling white eyes had a blinding effect on everyone who looked into them. The hounds immediately ran through the dungeon's massive door, vanishing completely. The recruits are confused as to why the hounds did not attack them and went straight for the dungeon. 
Minjun cleared their confusion by telling them that they saw their home and their minds gravitated towards it immediately as they had been captured for a while. The recruits understand this, but this makes them wonder how Minjun knows the psychology of the monsters so well. He wishes he could tell someone about his time in Isgard. He wishes to tell people that he used to be a dark mage. But that's information that he simply cannot divulge with anyone else at the moment. The lieutenant cuts them off, scolding them for laughing and joking on the so-called holy training grounds. The recruits try to brush the conversation off but the lieutenant decides that he wants them to be the first team into the dungeon. Minjun and his buddies were the first ones that would go into the dungeon, and that had been decided now. The sergeant waves his red lightsaber looking thing, signaling the team to enter the dungeon. The four boys begin walking towards the dungeon, with one of them having a determined look on his face, two of them completely worried about what the future holds, and Minjun simply excited to finally get things going. He just wanted to be done with the exercise so he can take off that heavy and dirty chest plate that was polluting his body. The only commonality between these four dudes was that they all had big ears. The lieutenant picks up his radio and contacts the instructor team that is waiting inside of the transformative dungeon, just in case anything goes wrong and the recruits manage to find themselves in some actual danger. The observer radios back to let him know that the team has entered, as he spectates with a corporal from a hiding spot amidst the crystallized walls of the dungeon. The devil instructor, the one all the recruits hate, is one of the two on protection duty. He sees Minjun and is immediately surprised, and he wonders to himself about Minjun's prowess. Minjun's scores have been great during the training and he's been performing well in general in all four weeks of proper exercise. However, will he be just as outstanding in the dungeon? That was the question on the instructor's mind. The bloodthirsty hound eyes stare at them from within the crevices in the walls, waiting for an opportune moment to strike them down as Kim Minjun and his team walk further into the depths of the dungeon. The wolves are seemingly ready to pounce on the four recruits, but Minjun is also seemingly aware of the situation and knows that they are following them stealthily. He thinks to himself on how he can take them down by just a flick on their foreheads as they pounce to attack. The problem, however, is that he can't do the exercise all by himself, otherwise his teammates won't get any stat points. Since this is a team exercise, they'll all have to contribute. So, Minjun lets his team know that the hounds are about to attack. They're completely surprised, and the shock takes over their brain as they start to scream out. Minjun reminds them that the protective suit is really strong, but they don't listen as they're frozen in fear. He decides to take the lead and walks in front. One of the hounds runs towards him, but Minjun makes a quick dodge towards the side of the hound and punches it on the head, immediately killing the furry animal. Meanwhile, one of the other recruits gets pounced on by a hound as it bites into his arm. The hound stares into Minjun's eyes while the recruit screams for someone to help him, and Minjun quickly runs to him. He kicks the hound away, sending it flying into a wall towards its instant death. He helps out the recruit, and realizes that the situation is much more dire than he thought. He starts to dish out some real battle knowledge, and tells them that they must fight back otherwise the hounds will overwhelm them if they sense their fear. The hounds would think they are easy prey if they don't attack back, and since they are more in numbers, the recruits can easily overwhelm their enemy. He yells that if this was a real-world situation, two of them would be dead by now because of that fear. He tells his recruit buddies to put pressure on that last hound, and together all three of them begin attacking it with Minjun's guidance. The instructors hiding in the crevices of the dungeon are shocked to see this unfold, seeing Minjun's attitude and how well he is guiding his team leaves them wide-eyed and baffled. The recruits grab the hound, overwhelming it with numbers and taking it down. The instructors begin to form conspiracy theories on the other hand, wondering if Minjun is really just a recruit or if he's a secret instructor that was deployed without their knowledge. They begin to calculate the scores of the team, and of course, Minjun scores the highest. He scores high because he not only showed great physical strength, but because he also showed great leadership skills. He helped his team overcome the challenge by encouraging them and making them work together. The rest of Minjun's squad is obviously going to get average scores. The squad celebrates and takes a sigh of relief, knowing that they have finally overcome their most daunting challenge so far. The instructors jump out of hiding and tell them that they did well. Now, all that they had to do was follow them back to the exit. Minjun wonders why there were instructors here, and he pesters them about whether or not he would get the vacation pass or a high score. He then makes fun of them, saying that they care a lot about the recruits, but act tough for no reason. The fun conversation keeps going until they reach the gate. The ground begins to shake vehemently and they are all worried if this is an earthquake. Minjun clears the recruits' confusion by telling them that the transforming dungeon is simply transforming at this very moment so it's nothing to worry about. However, the instructors start to panic and the recruits are shocked to see that the dungeon door begins to shrink and close. The recruits also begin to panic as the dungeon door closes up. The instructors try contacting the lieutenant through their radio, but it seems the radio is dead due to the dungeon transforming too fast. They had over a month before the internal structure of the dungeon would change but it seems that this unexpected occurrence changed things up quite a lot. 
the instructors decide to not think too much about that now and take the recruits to a safe space to hold out for the time being. They begin explaining the situation to the new recruits who are currently about to wet their pants out of fear. They explain to them that they will just wait for an hour and see if the door opens up, as explained in their manual, and they tell them not to worry. The recruits breathe a sigh of relief as the instructor tells them that the Hunter Corps is probably assessing the situation from the outside, and that the lieutenant is going to take the proper steps to get them to safety. Minjun on the other hand knows that they are just trying to keep the recruits calm, because they wouldn't have had the training exercises here if they knew that unexpected situations like this would come up. He understood that this was something out of the ordinary, and that a situation such as this, where their exit is completely closed off, is definitely an ominous sign. Minjun wonders if the dungeon has transformed into an enclosed dungeon, and if that is the case, then it may be a bit harder to defeat. On the other hand, Minjun knows that he can make sure that everyone is safe since he is there. The instructors try to have a conversation between themselves about their situation, but decide to go somewhere else to talk. In their private conversation in a quarter, an instructor tells the other that the dungeon has transformed into an enclosed dungeon, which surprises the other instructor who somehow had no idea despite being a literal instructor in the renowned Hunter Corps. He explains how the enclosed dungeons work. A transformative dungeon turns into an enclosed dungeon only when an outsider enters it. Their entry into this space made it transform into an enclosed dungeon, and the only way to get out of the enclosed dungeon is to defeat every single monster that is within it. So now there's a few things that our heroes have to get through. A bunch of monsters in a maze-like dungeon, along with the fact that they cannot be helped from the outside at all. The instructors tell the recruits of the situation, and now they're all tensed up. They have to clear this dungeon as four recruits and two instructors, and they have to do it all by themselves without knowing which monsters have appeared. The unfortunate thing here is that the instructors aren't fully equipped to deal with an enclosed dungeon, so they've got to make do with what they have and keep on moving. The head instructor knows that he'd be in big trouble even if a goblin showed up, since it would take at least 10 minutes for him to even take down one of those. The only plan he can come up with is to utilize the protective suits that the recruits have equipped. He considers using them as a meat shield, to put the recruits up front and defeat the monsters while the recruits try to hold on with their protective gear. However, he feels too responsible for them, knowing the grueling training he has put them through and the trust they have put in him, it would be unfair to them. His self-esteem would not allow it. The recruits are scared, but they keep pressing on and following their instructors. However, Minjun senses something going awry, so he looks back at one of the instructors. The head instructor notices this and begins inquiring what's happening. And then, everyone turns to look at the other instructor, who seems to be gripping on his throat, struggling to breathe. He falls down onto the floor, with thick foam frothing out of his mouth. The head instructor runs to him, and then he falls down onto the floor as well. Both of their mouths have foam coming out of them, and they are knocked unconscious. Kim and Jun runs to them. He checks on the instructors and tells the recruits that it's nothing serious, they have just fainted. He realizes that he smelled something familiar, so he picks up the instructors and throws them towards the recruits, telling them to catch them. He leaves the instructors in the care of his comrades and tells them not to follow him. He orders them to stay specifically near the exit and not go anywhere. They all scream at him to come back as he begins to go deeper into the dungeon. He begins to sprint into the dungeon. Bursting with excitement, Kim and Jun realizes what's going on. His internal monologue explains to us what has happened. The instructors apparently fainted due to the presence of demonic energy, which he didn't expect to find on Earth. It is something that even his guardians need a protective veil for, and its very existence is that much more deadly for normal humans. It does exist on Earth though, and that's great news for a dark mage like Kim Minjun. He explains that demonic energy is like a charger for a dead phone when it comes to dark mages like him. He runs deeper into the dungeon, and can begin to see the source of the super-dense demonic energy. This brings even more excitement to our hero, who simply cannot wait to see the true levels of what he is about to face. However, when he reaches as close as he possibly can, he doesn't see anything, nor does he hear anything. There is nothing but the void of silence staring back at him through the glowing purple crystals in this enclosed dungeon. He simply cannot find a single trace of any monsters around him. However, all he had to do was to simply look up. The scent of the demonic energy had led him right towards his prey. Kim and Jun had finally found a worthy opponent, one that reeked of demonic energy. He saw a large alpha hound, pulsating purple with the sheer volume of demonic energy within its overgrown body. It had four eyes, glistening purple with an aura of demonic energy that surrounded its body. Its teeth were as large as knives, and claws sharper than cutthroat daggers. This was a proper fight, and one that Kim and Jun had been craving for ages. He didn't even dream about facing the dark hound in this enclosed dungeon, so this was definitely a pleasant surprise for our hero. You see, dark hounds are extremely different to regular hounds, and Kim and Jun had already encountered this one before. When he was only a year into his time in Isgard, he had his first encounter with this monster. 
He had never seen something so terrifying back then, and he was quite new and underleveled to fight a behemoth like that, so he almost died during that time. However, things were different now. Kim Minjun is not the new summon, he's the final raid boss. And he was more than happy to see a familiar face. Kim Minjun decides to take this hellhound head on. Having full confidence in his abilities as a dark mage and a hunter, he knew that he could more than easily overpower the foul creature. The monster was hanging on the ceiling, staring at our hero, and it decided to pounce upon him. He pulled his hand back, closing his fist in the exact same way he prepared to punch that red stone before he got enlisted as a recruit into the Hunter Corps. The smile on his face was infuriating for the monster, which lunged at him immediately at the first chance it got. He thanked the monster for the meal as he pushed his arm out in such a fast punch that it sent the monster flying upon the slightest contact with its fur. The monster had died, and the insane amount of demonic energy that was locked deep inside of its monstrous body began to pour out. Kim and Jun obviously took this opportunity to drain as much of it as possible, absorbing every bit of demonic energy that he could. However, the scent of its monster blood was still in the air, and it was still just as sickening as Minjun remembered. The monster's blood on his hand was poisonous, as it turns out that defeating dark hounds is difficult due to their poisonous blood, which can cause the skin of any human to rot upon immediate contact. Minjun stares at his hand, his veiny hand covered in the monster's blood. But if we know one thing about dark mages, it might be the fact that none of those poisonous effects apply to them. They cannot be hurt by a dark hound's venomous blood, just like the demonic energy feeds them rather than hurting them. Minjun drained this monster of all its demonic energy, it was a feeding that he hadn't gotten in ages. However, this whole ordeal had left him wondering over a few things, and those things troubled him quite deeply. He wondered how a dark hound, a monster that is normally only found in Isgard, is doing on earth in an enclosed dungeon of all places. He had always considered the idea of monsters on earth being able to harbor demonic energy, but since the instructors were completely unprepared for it, he was sure that this was the first instance of something like this happening. Not to mention, he had not seen a single note about the demonic energy in any of the training manuals, or the monster education at the training center. Of course, the possibility of a monster as dumb as a dark hound being able to manage interdimensional travel on its own simply had no chances of happening. Kim and June was definitely confused, but he had a theory. He believed that only a dark mage as powerful as him could have made this possible, and perhaps the saint who could utilize the god's powers would be able to do that. Anyone else stood no chance at pulling something like this off. Though at the end he did consider that he might just be overthinking things, and he tried to force himself to think that this might just be a minor occurrence or a coincidence of some sort. For now, he just decided to take the corpse of the monster back to make the report to his superiors. However, this journey wasn't over yet. They still had a dungeon to get out of, and this new incident had brought with it more questions than ever for Kim and June. Previously, the new recruits were sent into a dungeon for their training, where Minjun showcased results that were far above his rank. The training was over, and the party was about to head back. But before they could step out of the gate, the dungeon transformed, and the party lost its way. A wave of mysterious energy knocked out the instructors, and Minjun went ahead to investigate on his own. He managed to come across a massive dark hound, and when he defeated it, he felt some of his demonic energy get restored. Back to the present. The instructor is being woken up by the voices of the young recruits. He opens his eyes as he hears the panic in their voice. They stare at him as their voices calm down a bit with their instructor's awakening. Suddenly, he screams out loud as if he had woken up from the most terrifying nightmare. This scares the life out of the recruits. They thought that these guys had woken up as zombies, but they just get up with concern of everyone being okay or if anyone is hurt. They tell the instructors that they're fine, but then they speak about how Kim and Jun delved deeper into the dungeon by his lonesome, which shocks the instructors. They begin to give him further details of what happened, and the instructors are furious in utter disbelief of Min Jun's actions. The instructor is in complete shock. He genuinely cannot believe that Min Jun would do such a thing. He thinks that Min Jun's behavior should get him kicked out of the academy immediately. However, he knows that he doesn't have the authority to make that decision right now, especially since he fainted instead of keeping the recruits safe. Just when the instructor thinks about going out and saving Minjun, one of the recruits tells him to look to the other side of the cave. Well, it seems that Minjun has returned, and he has the corpse of the monster he killed on his back. The instructors are shocked once again. It seems as if making this face is their only job. They look at the hound, and realize it looks very different than the regular ones. He drops the monster on the floor and tells the instructors to look at that thing. The instructors begin to analyze the body of the monster and realize that it's the creature that caused them to faint. The recruits on the other hand are also in disbelief wondering how their comrade even managed to kill such a big monster. Minjin looks towards the cave's entrance and realizes that the portal gate has opened. The instructor put his hand on Minjun's shoulder and asked him if he really defeated the hound on his own. He simply looks at the instructor, and instead of a verbal response, Minjun just nods. 
The instructor sweats now as he nods and acknowledges the recruit's achievement. The lead instructor orders the other one to lead the recruits out of the dungeon, while he'll stick around and talk to Minjun a bit. Once everybody leaves, the instructor knows he now has the opportunity to talk to Minjun. In front of the portal gate, he tells our hero to detail everything in a report and give it to the lieutenant about what happened in this dungeon, and of course, Minjun says he will do so. He tells our hero to leave nothing out of that report, make sure it's highly detailed and it even talks about how incompetent the instructors were. It turns out this guy does not care about his reputation much, he is way too honest of a soldier. He covers his face in embarrassment as he says that they fainted instead of making sure the recruits were safe, and that he has no excuse for letting his guard down in such a vital situation. Finally, he thanks our hero for making sure that everybody's safe and that he really appreciates it. Minjun blushes as he's glad to be of help, but a little embarrassed of the compliments. The instructor puts his hat back on, saving the little dignity he has left, and says that he must accept his wrongs as a man. He then says that they must get back. As they're leaving the cave, with the portal glaring blue lights, the instructor wonders how to report the cause of his unconsciousness. Minjun on the other hand is ecstatic. He's just received a bunch of compliments from his comrades and his instructors, it's a good day for him. As he's about to leave the dungeon through the portal gate, a notification window pops up and tells him that the error has been fixed. Minjun is frustrated as he questions what kind of error this even is. He curses at the system, stating that it's as ridiculous in this world as it was in the other world. The window pops up again, and this time it shows him his stats. He has 60 point in strength, agility, and stamina. He also has 10 points demonic energy and an E-ranking possessed skill called corruption. He looks at the window and wonders if that's all, because he finds it extremely strange. Then his eyes glanced at something on the window, it states that he's the founder of a cult named Lumi Nuna is my favorite character. He's shocked to find this embarrassing information in the status window. Here we get some background to this particular embarrassment in our hero's life. He started the cult out of his love for a character named Lumi from a game named Dungeon Power Fighter. You see, he created this cult as a joke when he reached the peak of his powers in Iskard. This was to get rid of any of the stalkers and creeps that followed him around. They used to pester him a lot and would annoy him into pursuing the world domination quests with him, so he just came up with it to get rid of them. Of course, that barely worked, as that only made them like him more. As he looks at his stat window, he realizes that he's gotten much weaker and that his stats are much worse than he expected. He already knew this would happen though, because this was his penalty for the dimensional travel when he returned to Earth. The one thing that bothered him most though, was that out of his endless skills, only one remained, and that too was a low-ranking one. He's really annoyed now, as an expression of pure frustration takes over his face. He compares this situation to a third-rate novel, where the hero is sent back to start from level 1. Stories like this made him extremely nauseated. Of course, he knows he can't reach all of his objectives at this rate, but there was a silver lining. His confidence was just as unshaken, he knew if he could reach the peak of dark magic powers before in another world, he could do it again in this world too. For now, his objective was crystal clear, he had to recover his powers as soon as possible, so that the game development wouldn't see any more delays due to the monsters popping up. He shakes himself out of it and makes himself realize that it's doable. He knows that his experience here is not going to be much compared to the torture of Iskard. The scene switches to the training center where utter chaos had taken place. There were three reasons for this, the dungeon gate closing while training was in session, a lack of clear instructions from the lieutenant, and the fact that a single recruit destroyed a new species of monster they had never seen before. This all happened despite the instructors being unconscious. And due to these unforeseen events, the recruits should have received private ranks so that they could enjoy their freedom until they were dispatched. However, that wasn't going to be the case. In the recruits' conjoined sleeping room, they wonder why they're on standby despite the crazy events that occurred in the last week of training. They're annoyed that they don't even get to watch TV. One of them asks Minjun's teammate if he managed to capture a huge hound by himself, to which he responds by saying that he did indeed see it. Some wonder if Kim Minjun get the rank of sergeant within two years, but the rest aren't so sure, because the Hunter Corps exams are known for their extreme difficulty. In the battalion commander's office, we see our hero posting up and saluting the commander. The commander salutes back and tells him to come in, whereas the lieutenant is there on the floor in a very awkward-looking position. The commander tells the lieutenant to get out, and he salutes him before leaving the room with only the commander and Minjun inside. The commander laughingly talks to our hero, telling him that a lieutenant who doesn't check the dungeons properly should be punished. He puts his hand on his seat, beginning to sit down as he tells Minjun that they should leave the pleasantries aside. Minjun looks with wide eyes in confusion as the commander tells them that they need to talk about something. He tells them that since Minjun has received the highest score, he's going to give him a special proposal. He asks Minjun if he wishes to hear it. A crane and a flock of chickens, that's the commander's metaphor. This idiom is used to describe an outstanding person, someone who is much more skilled at a certain thing than the others in their batch. 
we see the commander sitting in his chair, looking at our hero and thinking how truly extraordinary he is. He is glad that he's alive in the presence of such talent. He never would have thought that there would be a crane in his flock of chickens. Kim Minjun is simply so good at what he does that he makes everyone else seem like nothing. The commander's mind is going places. He questions placing Minjun in the regular ranks because it would be a waste of his talent. He realizes that a certain group needs people. Maybe he could fit Minjun in. He tells Minjun that he knows about his ambition to rise among the ranks as fast as possible. But according to the rules, privates cannot take the promotion exams for at least one year after passing their recruitment finals. However, the commander proposes an exception to this rule for Minjun. Hearing this makes Minjun's eyes sparkle. The commander begins to laugh out loud, speaking with his commanding voice. He tells Minjun that if he joins the hunter corps in Chiorwen, he will use his authority to grant him that exception. He tells him that if he wishes, he could take this opportunity, and he wouldn't have to wait another year. Minjun marinates on this opportunity, and the two stare at each other quietly for a moment. The commander wonders if he has proposed too tall of a task for the recruit, because even someone of his Minjun's skill would think before agreeing to joining Chiorwen. Now, Minjun is still thinking about this opportunity, and he wonders about Chiorwen. The 104 division known as the Invincible Hunter Squad is there, a place that all his comrades told him to avoid. You see, this is a place with constant snowfall and freezing weather, but it isn't a boring place, because monsters and dungeons appear out of thin air there. It is the most extreme version of the front lines you could imagine. What would Minjun's initial thoughts be? Well, he thinks it's a fun opportunity. He just wants to advance, doesn't matter where he's placed, and he's also going to be granted a promotion exception. Not to mention, there's a bunch of dungeons full of monsters, which are the best conditions for him to become as powerful as possible. He needs to advance at any cost for his plans to work, because the higher his rank is, the more leveling opportunities open up for him. He looks at the commander, and with a determination in his voice, he agrees to the proposal. The commander doesn't believe it at first, shocked completely at Minjun's answer. He tells him sternly that he will go, and he has a look of nothing but accomplishment and self-confidence on his face. Outside of the Hunter Corps Training Center, we see a group of newly made privates standing outside with their bags in their hands. We see Private Rocker crying his eyes out while saying goodbye to Minjun, telling him to keep in touch. He straight up puts his head out of the car and pesters him about it, but Minjun swears he will. There's another guy just looking at them and cringing. Raka asks why Minjun would volunteer to go to Chiorwen, and Minjun just looks at his friend and says it's a bit too difficult for him to understand, and that his goal is something insane. The sky looks beautiful as the two friends talk. Raka asks him whether it's something like achieving max level a hundred times. However, Minjun says he's already hit max level 30 times, so it shouldn't be too difficult to reach a hundred. His friend tells him he's crazy, with a sense of admiration in his tone. He bids Raka farewell, as Raka is still heartbroken to be away from his friend. Afterwards, Minjun looks at him going and realizes that the loudest guy has left the base. He's standing alone outside the training center, wondering why he's the only one standing here. Suddenly a large military truck pulls up in front of him, and it breaks right near his feet. The door opens, and he hears his voice being called out. He looks towards it, and a large man, with a heavily muscular physique and thick sunglasses stands before him. His name is Kim Minji, according to the name tag. He looks at Minjun, and asks him if he waited long, telling him that it took too long because of the snow. He looks at the guy with a sense of wonder, telling him that he hasn't waited too long while also wondering what month it is for it to be snowing already. Minji begins to walk away orders, tells our young hero that they must depart for the squad, and orders him to get in the back of the car. Minjun quietly gets in the back, and puts his stuff down on the ground, as the ride of his life is about to begin. On the ride, Minjun was glad that he gets to start his life as a soldier from now. He's not the sort to care much about going through difficult training exercises or battling monsters frequently, however, there is one thing that worries him. He's terrified of hazing. He doesn't want to be in miserable situations where he's getting trolled or pranked by his comrades. He simply lacks the patience for it at the moment. He is mature enough to know that he must endure it for now. The ride seems to be going quite smoothly, but then the thought comes into his mind that if he hits his superior even once, he will be sent to military prison as a regular soldier. The ride was calming, with pristine views of scenery and architecture. Minjun had fallen asleep, but he woke up to see pieces of snow falling everywhere. He couldn't believe his eyes as they reached the Invincible Hunter Corps headquarters in Chiorwen, because there really was snow here. Minjun was walking with Kim Minji through the halls of the headquarters. Minji opens a door with his veiny, muscular hands and pushes Kim Minjun inside, announcing that he's a newbie. Minjun enters the room and sees a bunch of boys either cleaning or relaxing. He orders them to feed and instruct Minjun on what to do. The boys' eyes begin to glisten when they see a newbie. They rally around him, asking him his name and once they find out, they talk about how Minjun was called Super Soldier and he was the guy who killed that hound by himself. One of them picks up Minjun's bag and throws it at another boy, telling him to unpack Minjun's stuff. 
Minjun looks at them and realizes that these might be the alphas of this dorm. There's one more thing he has noticed though, the way that these fools are looking at him, it's as if they've found a new play toy. They ask him why he chose to volunteer at Chiorwen, despite having such good grades. Minjun's answers their query by saying that the front lines are the best place for experience and the fastest way to advance. They look at him in confusion for a second, then their expressions completely change as they call him crazy and admire his choice. They begin bombarding our hero with questions, asking him whether he has a sister or a girlfriend. He says no to both of those questions, so they asked him to show them his talent. Minjun wonders if they'll buzz off if he shows them his talent. He raises his finger and tells them that he'll show them one finger push-ups. One of them speaks out in anger, saying that they can do that all day. However, the other one tells him to go ahead and show them. Their expressions change so fast that it feels like someone took the light out of their life. However, it was just Minjun putting his finger on the ground and doing full-fledged vertical push-ups using just his finger. They're completely shocked, because they never expected him to do it vertically. They wonder if anyone else in their platoon could do that, and one of them mentions that a particular someone they know could. As they're talking about that particular someone, we see a man dressed in uniform arriving at the door of the dormitory. He walks up to Minjun who is still in the vertical push-up position and tells him to go away. Minjun recognizes immediately that voice, he knows who this is. It turns out, it's none other than Sergeant Lee Seung Ho. Minjun is taken aback by seeing his previous instructor, Sergeant Lee, in the same dorm room as him. However, the other guys have gotten used to him, and they begin to berate him and annoy him for being dispatched as an instructor. They ask him how many days he's left of his time here. He just doesn't respond to them, and they begin to annoy him even further. In an act of frustration, he screams that he has four days left, and he tells them to leave him alone. Funnily enough though, they were already tired of his conversation, so they fling him the bird and move on. The sergeant says that he's pretty mad, but he can't really do anything about it. Meanwhile, Minjun is just glad they left. The sergeant lays down on a bed, turns on his phone and starts watching a video about volcanic dungeons. Minjun realizes that even in a space as tiny as this dorm, the rank difference between those occupying it is vast. The sergeant calls out to one of the privates named Dongjin, telling him to instruct Minjun since he's a junior here. Minjun looks at the guy introducing himself and wonders how that guy is his senior. Dongjin asks our hero if he wants to talk over some food, because he has a permit to visit the PX. They head to the PX, and Dongjin tells Minjun to pick out whatever he eats. He tells our hero to eat as much as he likes, and Minjun figures that this guy is just really nice. At the counter, the basket full of food leads to a bill of 300,000 won. Dongjin pays it, but he's shaking in his boots. Minjun is chowing down on the food that he's bought, and Dongjin tells him to enjoy it. Minjun asks why they're not allowed to use the PX regularly. Dongjin tells him that it's a rank system, privates first class and below are only allowed to go there on weekends. On top of that, one needs to be a private first class or above to use gyms, and if you want to use the PC room, you need to be a corporal. Minjun almost choked on his food when he heard this news. He found it crazy that you needed to be that high of a rank to use the PC room. Dongjin agrees that it's unreasonable but knows that he can't really change anything at his rank right now. Minjun asks with curiosity in his voice whether there is a way to change that, surprising Dongjin. He says that the only way is by getting to the rank of sergeant to even attempt it. Minjun is heartbroken and extremely frustrated, because he was really looking forward to the PC room. Dongjin dives deeper, and he tells him it's very difficult to become a sergeant in the Hunter Corps. He gives a little info about himself, saying that he had failed the advancement exam many times, so he's been stuck as a private first class for three years. Minjun thinks that he should get promoted quickly so he can bring Dongjin up with him as well. He encourages him to keep trying as he will surely get it in the next attempt. Here, enters another bully, who puts his arms around Dongjin. He asks them if they're eating the delicious food by themselves, and Dongjin offers the guy to join them, seeing as he's a corporal. Of course, he says yes. The corporal begins chowing down on the food, eating away the chips and drinking all the soda. Minjin looks at him in disdain, thinking that this guy is a creep. After eating, the corporal tells them that he won't say anything about them chatting, but he wants them to be present during the firearms training tomorrow, or it will be their funeral. Dongjin steps in and says that he was about to explain firearms training to our hero, since it's a bit different in Chiorwen than in other places. The corporal takes offense to this and begins to mock and ridicule Dongjin. Dongjin apologizes, but the corporal just bullies him further and further. Minjun is annoyed at what this guy is doing, so he decides he won't just sit there and watch. From under the table, Minjun sends demonic energy into the food that he's eating, cursing him to spit out the food. The corporal cannot eat anymore, and his face goes numb as he simply stands up. Dongjin asks him what the matter is, but he doesn't respond. Suddenly, he says that there's something weird, looking at the expiration date on the food. However, sweating profusely and feeling sick, the corporal decides to save his dignity by saying that it's probably nothing. Turns out, Minjin had used the corruption skill on the corporal. He grins at the corporal as he's walking away holding his stomach. 
He then diverts his attention back to the private first class and asks them about the firearms training. It turns out, here, in the Invincible Hunter Squad, they use bullets that are even higher power than the monster-killing bullets used by regular Hunter Corps. This means that the guns will have a much higher kick. You can imagine the regular ICM bullets as ponies, but the Invincible Hunter Squad's bullets like wild stallions. The recoil is so much that it could fluctuate the control of even an extremely skilled gunslinger. Dongjin says that since monsters appear more frequently, they need the extra firepower. Minjun thinks about that metaphor for a second, finding it very fitting. He thinks about the ranged weapons he had to make do with an Iskard, comparing them to elephants if these are ponies and stallions. He becomes more confident in his ability to control them. He grins excitedly as he begins looking forward to the training. The day of the training arrives, and the soldiers are on their way to the location where it will take place. The firearms training facility is filled with shooting noises. We see a soldier blasting away at his target, with gun flares that could lighten up the room. Turns out, it's our boy Minjun. He's sad that he missed one shot. The guy looking at the target is flabbergasted, stating that 19 shots were direct hits and one was a miss. His two alpha roommates are also shocked, while Dongjin stands in awe of our Minjun's gun skill. Minjun stands proudly with his gun, while people wonder if he's a cyborg or just lucky. Up in a booth, two shadowy figures stand looking down at the firearms training. These are Lieutenant Kim Minchial and Sergeant Hyo Tisiak, both completely entranced by Minjun's pure skill. The roomies ask Minjun how he shot like that, and he simply says he just did what he was instructed. Kim Minji, the hulking behemoth of a man, emerges from behind the two so-called alphas and appreciates Minjun's shooting. He says that he looks forward to seeing Minjun shoot in the special training in the afternoon, and Minjun is immediately intrigued about it. The alpha roomies begin pestering Kim Minji too, saying he's too biased for Minjun. He just tells them to quit it and put their helmets on. The rest of the soldiers there start clapping for Minjun, and Dongjin compliments him even more. Minjun thanks him, then asks what the special firearms training entails. He says he doesn't know much about it, but he tells him all he knows. This special firearms training will consist of two-person teams in a training facility, where they would be eliminating monsters on the way to a destination. The monsters aren't too dangerous, but they will be moving targets and they will attack them too. There will also be civilian target plates that pop up randomly, and they must avoid shooting them as that will result in an automatic failure. Dongjin tells him not to worry about the actual monsters, and that it will be a controlled environment with proper supervision. However, if he knew Minjun, he would know that our hero never gets as excited and joyous about something as getting to fight real monsters. After the firing test, we see the group of soldiers enjoying lunch. It is bountiful, with lots of different dishes to choose from. Dongjin is completely shocked at the fact that Minjun managed to hit 19 shots at the target, while he compliments Dongjin for hitting 13 shots of his own. Dongjin mentions that how he has had some experience but he's not very good. On the other hand, he believes that Sergeant Lee is one of the best soldiers he's ever seen. On average, Sergeant Lee shoots at least 17 shots, which made him the number one shooter in the whole squad. Minjun is listening to this while eating. He acknowledges that since 10 hits is the squad's average, Sergeant Lee is much better than the rest. However, he also realizes that he is officially the number one shooter now. Dongjin then gives our hero a word of encouragement, saying he's sure that Minjun will do great in the special firearms training. Minjun asks him that he had told him before that there would be two-person teams. Yet, he is speaking as if he was not going to be joining him. Dongjin tells him that the executives will be deciding the teams, which means they never know who they're going to be paired with. Which makes Minjun curious, and he asks what the method and criteria was to decide teams. Dongjin begins going into a rumor he heard, which stated that the deciding is done through the ladder lottery. Essentially, the ladder lottery is a method of raffles. It is particularly designed to create random pairings between two sets of things, people or commodities. Anyways, the scene switches from the cafeteria to the special firearms shooting range. The big and burly Sergeant Minji is standing there barking orders, telling the soldiers to get into their bulletproof vests, and be on standby as the training would commence in five minutes. Every single soldier in the room is gossiping, wondering what the special firearms test would be like. Yet, Minjun was just standing there, minding his business. Of course, he wasn't going to get peace for too long. A man dressed in uniform comes yelling that he's in the team with the newbie, looking at our hero. Well, it turns out that our hero was teamed up with none other than the corporal that enjoyed hazing. He walks in saying that a corporal and a private are world apart, boasting his own skill. Minjun is definitely taken aback by this, wondering why he had to team up with this guy of all people. He also realizes something from Guangxik's behavior, but he hadn't learned his lesson yet. The corporal starts talking to our hero telling him that the average finish time in the squad is 3 minutes, and that Minjun should aim to approve upon it. His face has a devious look as he says that Minjun must finish within 3 minutes, or he's going to regret it. Minjun simply looks at him, without responding at all. This annoys the corporal, he asks Minjun why he isn't replying. 
pestering him by saying that he's lost confidence and his 19 perfect shots were just a fluke. Minjin is internally frustrated, thinking about how big of a lost cause this guy is. However, he just says that he will try his best to the blithering idiot to make him shut up. The corporal doesn't care about that though, he wants Minjun to just provide results, and he says if Minjun finishes later than him, he would die. He points at the squad talking to Sergeant Minji and says that he should observe the team going ahead. The two soldiers stand in different elevators, whereas Minji stands in the middle as he tells them to get ready. It's Kim Moongi and Jiang Hanyang, and those two state that they're ready, hence they start descending. The special firearms training is a special kind of creature. It involves two members of the same team in separate elevators being sent down to the underground facility. This tactical training taught soldiers to slay monsters and protect civilians. However, now it was something different, almost a competition amongst the troops. It was a race now, and the whole purpose of the trial was to see who reached the end fastest and cleanest. The final objective was to press the finish button at the end before your opponent. Minjun was looking at the large scoreboard to ensure he knew what was going on. There were different sized monster icons, and Minjun wondered why. The corporal told him that it showcases the threat. The more dangerous a monster is, the bigger the icon will be. He begins explaining Minjun the format of the special firearms trial. He explains that there are two monsters on each lane, and that one encounters will be randomized. You will have no clue what you're getting into due to this format, and it will surprise you in the lanes. We see a participant currently in the trial running into a rake toad, which is a large and powerful creature. The rake toad attacks him with its tongue, and he seems to have gotten unlucky in the monster selection. On the screen, we can see that the participant that ran into the bigger monster ahead. Minjun realizes that even if he moved fast, he got unlucky with the monster. He knew that his opponent would catch up to him. Of course, the opponent ran into a large rat and shoots it to shreds. He walks away from the dead rat's body, confident that he'll have an easy time in the trial. However, he immediately runs into a large earthworm, which is humongous in size. Meanwhile, the guy who fought the rake toad just got another rake toad to battle. He's visibly frustrated after killing the second one by unloading a whole clip into it. Annoyed, he thinks that his opponent probably won already. But when he reaches the finish button, it's empty. There is no one near it. He walks over to it and presses it with a big smile on his face. The buzzer sounds, and the crowd celebrates as the challenge was completed in 2 minutes and 24 seconds by the trooper as the others discuss the sandworm thing. The winner mocks the loser, meanwhile the loser just complains about his bad luck. It turns out that they had a bet, and now the loser must give him a treat at the PX. On the way back, they notice that aside from being late, the loser had also shot a civilian, which disqualifies him. The two walk out bantering about what they will buy, and the corporal notes that two had made a bet before going in. This catches Minjun's attention, and he's intrigued by the idea of a bet. Surprising the corporal, he tells him that they should make a bet too. He says that the loser should grant the winner any one wish. This makes the corporal laugh, but he decides to indulge Minjun out of overconfidence. He then says that there is nothing a mere private can offer him, but there is always something a man like him needs. He decides that Minjun will need to give him his salary for three months if he loses. Minjun is a bit disappointed to see that he couldn't come up with anything better than money, which is such a typical mob behavior. He agrees to his condition, and the corporal is glad because he is confident in himself. Dongjin notices the two talking, and he starts getting a bit nervous for Minjun. Minji shouts for the next group to get ready. Minjun and the corporal get into their separate elevators, ready to get going into the trial. Minji asks if they need to say anything before going in. The two synonymously deny. Minji notices they're ready, and he initiates the trials. The elevators begin to descend, and we see Minjun lost in his thoughts as he is heading to the underground levels. He notes that he fell for the corporal's provocation, and he's a bit unhappy that he made himself noticed. However, he is well aware that he's not mature. He's never going to let provocations slide by. As the elevator doors open, his demonic aura begins to sense the demons in the trial. At the top level of the building, the other candidates are looking at the score screen and excited to see the trial. They're talking about how the two candidates made a bet, and they're confused how a private could possibly hope to win against a corporal. Suddenly, all of them are shaken as the ground exempts a harsh tremor. It begins to move rampantly, and some of them lose their footing in fear before the tremor stops. The candidates ask each other whether that was an earthquake. Dongjin says he doesn't think that it was. They look at the screen, shocked to see that one of the monsters is moving towards the other monster in Minjun's lane. The door opens and Minjun is making his way through the lane, wondering what that tremor was. His face is taken over by confusion and instinct, and his eyes are left wide open. It is a gigantic one-eyed monster, with humongous claws and horns, devouring a large rat monster. Looks like Minjun will have to face the toughest monster he has so far fought on Earth. Realizing that it's probably just another monster with a big body, he calms himself down immediately, but he's still confused why it's eating another monster. The monster sees Minjun present in the lane. Minjun looks up, directly into its big ugly eye. 
The monster begins to rage, pulling the rat out of its mouth. It throws the rat at Minjun, but he jumps and maneuvers around the hit. He lands safely on the ground, and a thought enters his mind. He wondered whether fried chicken was on the menu in dinner, and he wants to get this through fast so he can eat. He notices the civilian target he's not supposed to shoot, and realizes that he cannot shoot mindlessly. The monster takes a step towards Minjun, as our hero notices that the creature is trying to attack him. He loads up some demonic energy in his left hand, as he wonders why the creature is rampaging. The monster tries to grab Minjun with its massive claws, but Minjun strikes with a fistful of demonic energy. It carves through the creature's arm, cutting through it with three precision slashes. The monster begins to scream out in pain, as its hand is torn apart and dismembered. Minjun sees this and smiles, now all he had to do was shoot it down. However, his attention is caught again. You see, the monster's arm begins to regrow right in front of Minjun's eyes. And to make things more interesting, instead of regrowing its hand, it regrew a giant sword in its place. The troops can see that Minjun is fighting a large creature on the screen. They're all confused on what's happening, and why one of the monsters is missing. Minji is looking at this and he has a revelation. If the first monster is missing, that means the second monster was the Cyclops. Cyclops are also known as the Devouring Demons. They consume a source of energy to increase their regenerative and attacking capabilities. Minji wonders something though, this monster doesn't attack unless its life is threatened, and he wonders what provoked it so much that it broke out of captivity, and started raging after devouring the other monster. It was our boy Minjun, and the intense demonic aura that he carries around himself with a smile. As Minjun was dodging the excessive slashes from the Cyclops, he found himself high up in the air, battling the overly aggressive creature. He loaded up his gun, knowing it would be easy to kill it with his hands, but he'll indulge the gun fun since it was firearms training. He began raining bullets at the Cyclops face. The bullets tears through its eye, and the monster roars out in pain. Minjun lands on the ground, as the monster is suffering but not in silence. Minjun notes that its eye isn't regenerating very fast, so he can end it now. The monster quickly turns its head towards our hero. As Minjun is running towards it, ready to strike, the Cyclops retaliates by swinging its sword arm. He is taken by surprise. He notes that the Cyclops knows his location even after losing its eye. Minjun pulls a Neo Bullet dodge and ducks out of the arm slash. The monster takes the opportunity to attack with its other hand, and slams Minjun into the ground. At first, it looks as if it's over, but Minjun had the strength to block its attack. As he was holding back the monster from squishing him like a tomato, he considered how strange this whole thing was. There was no shot that the training center would use a monster this violent, and even though he squashed its eye, the monster knew where he was exactly every time. This is where he has the epiphany, was the monster reacting to Minjun's demonic energy. The scene cuts to the elevator door opening within the lane. Minji walks into the second lane, carrying his incredibly large LMG. He is worried about Minjun's safety. He blames himself for letting something like this happen, as an energy-fed Cyclops isn't something a private could go up against at all. He runs through the lane as fast as he can, hoping Minjun hasn't succumbed to his death. Meanwhile, the corporal has had a great time in the trial. He's about to clock in at 2 minutes and 30 seconds, confident that Minjun never stood a chance. The corporal wonders what to do with Minjun's salary. He decides he will spend it on his vacations, as he nears the finish line. Once he reaches it, his hopes and dreams are crushed. Minjun is already standing there, inspecting the finish button. He looks back at the corporal with an incredibly indifferent expression, before sprouting into a really devious smile and pressing the button. The corporal's reaction shows that his life is ruined, at least for the time being. Minji makes it to the place where Minjun fought the Cyclops. He looks at the corpse, and questions how Minjun could have shot the monster for it to end up in the state that it is in. Everything above the monster's chest was so graphically brutal. The corporal and Minjun walk out of the elevator to cheering and applause all around them. The others show appreciation for Minjun defeating a fed Cyclops. Dongjin comes running in, asking him if he's alright. Minjun is glad to see his buddy, and tells him he's not hurt at all. Dongjin asks him how he defeated the Cyclops, and our hero tells him that it was all thanks to his teachings. Meanwhile, the corporal is fuming out of jealousy. One of the troops reminds everyone that this team placed a bet, and that the newbie won. The corporal smacks him in the back of the head. He threatens him, and tells him that it's an unfair situation so the bet was off. He starts giving excuses, saying he couldn't have won in that situation. He said the special firearms training was designed with two monsters in mind, and he did defeat two. He then asks how many the newbie defeated, and reminds everyone that Minjun only defeated one monster. He points at them and tells them it was an unfair situation, and tells Dongjin to say something too. Dongjin is a meek person, and he feels a bit daunted by the question. The corporal orders him to say something and threatens him. Minjun wonders why the corporal has to be the worst. He thinks about how despite this scenario being unexpected, he doesn't feel good that he killed the monster with his fist. This is why he was planning to forget the bet. However, looking at him pestering Dongjin, he doesn't want to let it go. 
someone walks up to the crowd after hearing the commotion. The assertive voice mocks the corporal, saying that the newbie took the bigger risk and that the corporal should be ashamed. The corporal looks back and sees who said that. The mystery man divulges information about the cyclops, saying they're harmless but once they turn, they are horribly difficult to fight. He tells the corporal that the newbie faced a much bigger threat, and everyone knows this. They're all shocked to see who said such wisdom-filled words. It was none other than our very own, Sergeant Lee Seung Ho. We appreciate the casual appearances he makes. The corporal is embarrassed. He tries to mock Sergeant Lee, saying he's showing off his rank in front of the juniors. Sergeant Lee shuts him down, saying he's the one always showing off. The corporal tells him to stop embarrassing him over his jokes, and the sergeant decides to double down. He tells the corporal that everything that doesn't go his way becomes a joke to him. Sergeant Lee says that being higher rank is great, because he gets to embarrass stubborn donkeys like him. Min Jun smiles as he now knows that's how things work. Meanwhile, the corporal is fuming red with embarrassment, anger, and every other bad feeling. Honestly, this is the face I wanted to see him make ever since this fucker made his first appearance. Comment down below if you're satisfied as well. Sergeant Lee turns his head to him, seeing his reaction, and asks him if he has anything to say. The corporal brushes it off and says he doesn't. The sergeant tells him he's right. He doesn't have anything to say because he shouldn't, leaving the corporal embarrassed in front of his juniors as he walks away. It's evening time, as Dongjin and Minjun are standing outside cleaning and conversing. They talk about Sergeant Lee receiving a double promotion. Dongjin tells Minjun that Sergeant Lee was a special case since he had the highest grade in the advancement exams. He continues, telling Minjun that the two-rank promotion has now been made unavailable. It turns out that a staff sergeant that got it caused an accident in a dungeon. Sergeant Lee was the last case of this double-ranked promotion. Minjun wonders if there are ways to get special advancements, and Dongjin tells him that there are exceptions like rescuing a civilian during an emergency. There's also achieving outstanding accomplishments in a monster hunt, but they're all subjective cases. He tells our hero to forget that the regulation even exists, as there have been next to no hunters who have advanced with it. Minjun acknowledges that, while realizing that subjective means the commander will have the final say. He's quite desperate for an advancement at this point. He doesn't wish danger on civilians, but it's as if he's almost disappointed that there aren't enough incidents happening on this border as they said. He wants to advance already after being a private for two days, whereas Dongjin is just standing there encouraging him. Minjun wishes for a gate to appear, and just as he thinks that, there is an alarming all over the camp. The broadcast comes from the control center, telling everyone that middle bat monsters have appeared at an oil reserve. They instruct all hunters to gather there and immediately install the protective shield. Dongjin tells Minjun that they're going, and Minjun has a huge smile on his face. Middle bats are monsters the size of a human child. These monsters live in colonies and attack in droves since they individually do not pose a threat. The biggest threat about them is that they can spit fireballs, so the oil reserve may be in huge danger. Their attacks could lead to the whole military camp being blown away. We see two soldiers standing guard at the oil reserve, and the bats begin to come at them. One of the soldiers points his gun at the monster, but another soldier stops him from shooting. He tells him that they might start attacking if he shoots at them, and that could compromise the oil reserve. The soldier questions this decision. He asks if he doesn't shoot, then is he just supposed to watch the monsters? The other soldier is smarter, telling him that they should observe since they aren't approaching yet. The issue has also been reported, which means a squad with a protective shield is on its way. The soldier with the itchy trigger finger asks what happens if the monsters blow up the oil reserve, making his comrade feel super nervous. They imagine an incredibly huge explosion that would devour the entirety of the military camp. They are mortified and start panicking, wondering what they should do and why the middle bats showed up there of all places. Finally, Minjun comes walking in, stating that he will draw their attention. They are surprised to see a newbie being this bold. He starts walking towards the middle bats, and they scream at him to fall back since he doesn't have any equipment. He's looking at the middle bats as guests who will help him advance quicker. Not only will he get recognition for saving the military camp, he will also gain a ton of experience points. He walks towards the middle bats, flaunting his demonic energy. He thinks of the cyclops and remembers that monsters are attracted to his demonic energy. The middle bats definitely notice his aura and start circling around him right away. He smiles at how perfectly it worked out and gets ready to devour his prey. There's a squadron carrying a large crate, rushing towards the oil reserve. Suddenly, they come to a halt as Dongjin is completely stunned. Sergeant Lee looks at the idiots just standing there and tells them to install the shield immediately. They are so stunned that they have trouble speaking. They eventually snap out of it and tell him that the private Kim Minjun is fighting all of the bats single-handedly without any equipment. Sergeant Lee couldn't give a carp and shouts at the recruits to deploy the shields. Meanwhile, Minjun is just ripping the bats one by one. He realizes that it's taking too long, so he needs something to kill the bats faster with. He hears Sergeant Lee's voice behind him. Sergeant Lee is running towards him and telling him to fall back. 
Minjun ignores what Sergeant Lee said and just wants all of those experience points. He notices that Sergeant Lee has a baton in his hand, and that catches Minjun's attention quite well. He uses his demonic energy on Sergeant Lee's stomach. Sergeant Lee doesn't realize it and thinks that his stomach is acting up. Minjun approaches him, pretending to be worried about him. He asks to borrow the baton from him, before taking it by himself and telling the sergeant that he'll be back in a moment. Minjun's smile widens as he knows, fun times are starting. He rushes back into battle with his shock baton, ready to rip those middle bats apart. He's taking out multiple bats in one hit, and he's having an absolute blast in doing so. Sergeant Lee is just standing there looking at him, with an expression of pure unfiltered surprise. He realizes that Minjun is simply overpowering every single one of those middle bats, as we see him destroying them. There are two soldiers carrying equipment, and they notice a bat flying above them. The bat has a nasty look on its face, as it looks directly at the oil reserve. Its mouth is foaming with flames, and its eyes glowing red with violence. Sergeant Lee orders the boys to fire at the bat, and if something happens, he promises to take take full responsibility. They are ready to shoot, aiming the gun at flying creature. Suddenly, they stop and start staring in confusion. Up in the air, behind the middle bat, Minjun appears with a smile on his face and the shock baton in his hand. In one quick strike, he overpowers the bat. Electricity fizzles throughout the sky as Minjun's shock baton connects with the monster. Meanwhile, the squad below him is left wondering how he even got there. The troops then successfully install the protective shield. The shield is activated, and they all gather around it while collecting the middle bat corpses. Someone calls out to Sergeant Lee. He quickly looks back and salutes. It was the operations officer, Captain Junchik. He tells Lee that he did a good job, but asks where the middle bats even emerged from, because no one detected them on radars. The captain reacts to the stench of the roasted bats and asks who barbecued those monsters, and how many of them did he kill. Sergeant Lee tells him it was a total of 30 bats, while wondering where the commander was. He tells the captain that the battalion commander will be arriving in a bit, and the captain acknowledges. Lee was thinking how embarrassing it was that the captain was absent during an emergency. He assumes that the captain was just watching the radar in the control center. The captain kills his chain of thought and asks him if he was the one to roast those bats. Sergeant Lee tells him that it wasn't him, knowing it has to be someone extremely skilled with the electric baton. The captain asks for the identity of the valiant fighter. Sergeant Lee tells him that all 30 bats were killed by a single soldier and to report it as such. The captain is shocked. He cannot believe that every single middle bat was killed by just one individual. Minjun walks up behind them as they're talking and tells Sergeant Lee that he came to return the baton he borrowed. He's holding a broken baton, with wires propping out of it, as he asks whether the baton was expensive, because it sure isn't usable anymore. After his exploits fighting the flying rodents, there's no wonder everyone was suspicious of Minjun. He had shown his strength publicly, and now, all eyes were on him. We see the battalion commander's office, in which Sergeant Lee is quite seriously asking Minjun if he has re-enlisted. I don't know why Sergeant Lee's in the battalion commander's office, but alrighty. Minjun denies this, but then he's asked whether he's a regressor, but he denies that as well. Sergeant Lee tells him never to do anything rash like this ever again then. He tells our hero that he might have been lucky this once, but that luck won't be on his side forever. Minjun assesses how it wasn't luck, but he should keep his mouth shut. Sergeant Lee goes on explaining a bit more now, talking about how Hunter Corps are a special unit. They are smaller in scale and scope with four battalions each. Not to mention, each battalion consists of fewer troops than in the regular military too, but there's a reason for that. Minjun thinks about how that's because not all the Awakened keep re-enlisting, but he doesn't want to say it, it'll only get more eyes on him. But Lee goes full patriot mode with the next sentence that comes out of his mouth, asking Minjun if he's aware of how this all works. Minjun doesn't reply, just looks at him like a lost little puppy who has no idea what's going on. With a passion in his voice and a burning determination in his heart, he tells Minjun that this is because every single person in the Hunter Corps is Awakened. Of course, not all of them are going to be fighters, a lot of them specialize in different fields like administration, tactics, weapons research and monster theory. Minjun is surprised upon hearing this, he thought the entirety of the Hunter Corps was all about fighting. However, Sergeant Lee clears up that confusion. It didn't matter what you did for the Hunter Corps, you only advanced based on your accomplishments and you needed to be awakened to get those. Minjun looks up at the tall boy standing in front of him and wonders why he's getting an exposition dump so early in the morning. Of course, Sergeant Lee wasn't going to disappoint him, as he tells him that if he expected something fun, then his expectations will come true. Minjun's eyes sparkle, what did this sexy son of a bitch have in store for our hero? Well, as we see a car driving in towards the HQ, we know that someone is coming. It's not just a regular person, as the car has a number plate with two golden stars. The 104th Hunter Corps resident celebrity was coming, the hunter who had killed the most amount of monsters out of any. We see the bearded man sitting in the back of the car, looking like he was being driven around by Colonel Lee Junbium. 
the car drives into the HQ and stops. The door opens, and from within it, a burly man walks out. This deadly hunter was about to visit their battalion, and he probably had a whole lot to teach everyone. The battalion commander, Lee Junbium was saluting hard and yelling the word at the top of his lungs. Meanwhile, the smaller fry, the captains and stuff were also there sweating nervously as they stood in presence of the most terrifying hunter corps member in the world. The man came up and shook hands with none other than our boy Sergeant Lee Seung Ho. He was genuinely shocked, but still appreciative that a man of his caliber was greeting him. Meanwhile, Min Jun stood there thinking that this guy was quite lively. Our hero wondered how strong this guy was, he was a two-star from the hunter corps, so he had to be something special. Right then, he walked up to Min Jun and asked him if he was the Kim Min Jun while shaking hands with him. Min Jun was surprised and shook hands with him out of courtesy, even though he doesn't care much about anyone. And immediately, our boy noticed how strong this guy's grip was. He patted Min Jun really hard on the back and told everyone to be at ease. He asked them all if they figured out which gate the middle bats came from. The battalion commander said that they did, stating that the gate was on 1.2 kilometers north of the battalion headquarters on a hill. They were also already investigating the gate's rank and had restricted access to the area. The two-star told them to inform the division commander's office directly once the gate's rank was confirmed. He then asked them about their problem with the radar, and one of the captains noted that the alarm had not gone off until the middle bats approached the battalion, but there was no equipment malfunction, so they were still checking if there were any blind spots. The two-star had knowledge of this, and he said that it might have to do with the sheer numbers of the demons, and to report it to the divisional ordnance office so that they can set up two more radars. The captain screamed in agreement, showing pure respect to this two-star legend. On the other hand, Minjun was having the time of his life watching everyone shitting themselves and being so tensed up. He then turned his attention to our hero, telling him that while he was indeed courageous and his initial response was good, he should have been more careful and brought equipment. Minjun apologized, while still disagreeing internally, thinking that if he took time to get the equipment, the battalion might have gone up in flames. It turns out though, the two-star was just joking. In fact, he was quite proud of Minjun for defeating the middle bats by himself, saying that if he hadn't reacted this fast, the oil reserve would have exploded. The captains were stunned listening to this, they wanted some of that appreciation but they weren't getting any for being cowards. The two-star brought a gift from the division commander for our hero. He slapped a sticker onto his chest. Minjun had finally achieved the rank upgrade he wanted. The two-star congratulated him on the advancement stating that it wouldn't have happened like this under regular circumstances, but a soldier like him who's achieved something exceptional should be rewarded as soon as possible. Our boy was now Private First Class Kim Minjun, and he was thankful. He ordered the battalion commander to give Minjun a vacation. He was getting three days and two nights of relaxation while our hero was slightly shook about getting the advancement so quickly. The vacation made him really happy though, he could go in and vibe in the PC room now without any exceptions. The life in the military was getting more exciting by the minute. Minjun started walking out with Captain Kim, and as they were walking through the hallway, the captain began to show his appreciation. He was glad that Minjun had accomplished so much, but also happy that even he got commended due to Minjun's overwhelming performance. Minjun thanked him, he was as joyous as anyone could be. The captain asks him what he was going to do outside of the HQ, it was his first time going home after enlisting after all. Our hero had no idea though, this was entirely uncharted territory for him. The scene switched to the bustling city streets, lights and banners everywhere, people walking around in cars to be seen on the roads as Minjun walked with a pep in his step. But first thing our hero would obviously had to do was to find himself a PC room. He knew that all he wanted to do was play Dungeon Power Fighter at the PC room, and nothing could stop him now. He didn't want to go home, because he would have had to enter a restricted area. The worst part is that they didn't have any internet connection there. So, he was going to just spend the next three days and two nights in this PC room without wasting any time on traveling. As he was walking into the PC room, he heard a commotion behind him. It was two friends, and one of them talked as if he was wronged by the soldiers. The other one asked him if he went out to that cave again, and the hat guy mentioned that he was going there just to pick some mushrooms. He was angry at being stopped, even though he had already obtained permission from the owner of the mountain and even deposited the money. The hat guy asked for a drink, but the buddy denied him. Talk about a low blow. His buddy mentioned that someone he knew went there before it was completely restricted, and the mountain smelled foul with toxicity. He continued, saying that the guy had a headache for a few days afterwards, so it was just pure trouble going in there. The hat guy said that he'd wear a mask or something when he entered, but their conversation was cut by our eavesdropping gamer, Minjun. Minjun asked them where that place was, and they looked back at him nervously because he was in uniform. They looked at each other for a moment, thinking of what to say, but at the end they decided to tell him eventually. Actually, instead of just telling him, they took our guy. They dropped him off at the side of the road, just near a place called Huachin. They couldn't drive him any further due to it being a restricted area, but Minjun thanked the guy for the ride. 
The chonky boy asked him if he could really resolve whatever was on the mountain. Minjun looked into his eyes with determination, telling him that the restriction will be lifted by tomorrow and that they will be able to go there again. They noticed the two stripes on his chest, realizing that he was a private first class. They stared at him for a few moments, not knowing what to say. Then they drove off, they weren't gonna hang around for someone to see them. Minjun looked up at the mountain, and he could sense the demonic energy that was radiating from within it. He had decided to come to Huachin for his vacation instead of spending it all on the PC room. He had smelled it from afar, that familiar scent. He could visualize it, that purple energy in the air and that foul smell, it was demonic energy, and our boy was happy he had found this opportunity to take it all in. There were guards protecting the cave entrance. They were wearing gas masks on their faces, because the demonic energy was too overwhelming. Minjun was hiding between the trees, looking at them. He noted that the security was quite heavy near the entrance, but he had to find a way in by any means whatsoever. He didn't want to get noticed, so he gestured his hand and a wave of demonic energy emanated from within it. It floated towards them like air. They couldn't see it, but they ended up breathing it. As soon as they inhaled it, they could feel that their stomach was hurting, as they clenched their tummies tightly. They looked at each other and thought about what to do, thinking that they'd just hold it in but then they couldn't. They decided that they needed a potty break after all, thinking how no one would come here anyways. The entrance was now empty, with no security at the cave's opening whatsoever, it was time for Minjun to head in. He started walking into the cave, slowly placing one foot in front of the other. As soon as he entered, he could see the place was glistening with demonic energy and that put a smile on his face. However, there was one problem, when he placed his hand on the ground to sense anything in the area, he couldn't sense any monsters whatsoever. He wondered why the demonic energy was so dense in this cave if there weren't any monsters, as he went in deeper. It didn't matter if there were no monsters here, all he wanted was that sweet sweet demonic energy, and he began to suck it all in. The demonic energy was flowing into his palm, giving him the power that he craved so much. His demonic energy stats were increasing. It was rising so steadily with every moment. As he looked at the notification window that had appeared in front of him, he had now reached the demonic energy threshold, so his skill called Corruption was now enhanced. Along with Corruption, he had unlocked a new skill called Nightwalker. Minjun was overjoyed. This had been a phenomenal turn of events for our guy. This was a thing to celebrate for our hero. Not only did he enhance one of his skills, but he had unlocked a brand new one. As he looked at the status window, Minjun thought about the sheer amount of luck he needed to get this for free. His strength, agility and stamina were at 60 points, and his demonic energy was now at 15 points. He looked at his hand, feeling the power surging through him, free demonic energy, and a usable skill, without having to put in any effort whatsoever, this was a major dub. The Nightwalker gave him the ability to summon a shadow, called the Nightwalker. He knew about this because he had used it a lot in Iskard. This shadow's specialty was that it was great at assassinating targets from the safety of stealth, but there was one downside. This summon needed to be fed demonic energy on a regular basis to be maintained. He raised his arms, ready to show off his new powers, and ordered the Nightwalker to emerge. This little ghost was worth all the demonic energy he had to feed it. He might look cute, but the Nightwalker was more dangerous than anyone could ever anticipate. As soon as he emerged though, Minjun was kind of shocked by how tiny this guy was. He was confused, was this a part of the dimensional travel penalty? Why was he this tiny? Was it maybe that his demonic energy stat was too low? He needed to know, because this was fucked up. It was awful, he thought the Nightwalker would be way bigger. He's afraid that such a tiny weakling would be eaten up by the sun and won't have much use. Then he came to a quick realization, this creature was tiny in size, which means that it can hide in shadows. This was its strength, behind that tiny, cute little body, was a monster of assassinations. After a small time skip, the three days and two nights had now passed, and Minjun was back at HQ. He saluted his comrades as soon as he got back to the dorm, and mentioned he was back from vacation. His comrades gathered around him, noticing that this is the guy who advanced in the shortest time to date, and that he also got a vacation from the division commander, and he got a badge from the two-star as well. Minjun looked backwards, as he noticed someone familiar. He had brought a gift for this person. It was for his buddy, Dongjin. He hands him the gift, which is apparently a bottle of moisturizer, which is weird because I thought soldiers moisturize themselves with the blood of their enemies. Anyway, Dongjin thanked him. He pulled the bottle out, and was genuinely gleeful at the sight of it. He told Minjun that he would use it really well. And here comes the dickhead who Minjun beat in the special firearms training, mocking their friendship. He had asked Minjun to bring him some Maxim magazines. But the thing that Minjun brought along was just some instant coffee with the same name. He gave the guy his Maxim packs, and he left accepting his gift with a sad and annoyed look. Meanwhile, Minjun and Dongjin bantered about how he would become corporal one day. Now enters the redhead and his lackey, who mentions that he saw Minjun's name on the advancement examination. The lackey notes that the application period for that was already over before Minjun even transferred. It hasn't even been a year to Minjun's enlistment, which means he shouldn't qualify. 
Red Head notes that it had to be the division commander who got him in, otherwise it didn't make any sense no matter how you saw it. The comrades look at each other and discuss how this was even possible, but they decide to show him some respect now that he was a private first class. As they wait on Minjun for an explanation, Minjun begins to talk about how it was the training commander who had made him a special offer. If you remember, that guy sent him here on a special recommendation, and he had a huge interest in seeing Minjun succeed because he was so exceptional as a soldier. Minjun told them the whole story, and afterwards he was looking at them for their reaction. Their faces were filled with nothing but confusion, they had no idea what this all meant. Red had noted that Minjun came here because he wanted to start advancement exams a year in advance, calling him a crazy fucker for having the balls to do this. The lackey notes that since Minjun is already a private first class, his advancement exam would turn him into a corporal. The comrades talk about how if he passes, he might be the most terrifying new recruit in the 104th Battalion, while the actual corporal himself is just making his maxim to drown his sorrows with. Lackey mentions that the advancement exam candidates will have an orientation, and that a special weapons training would happen afterwards too. They said that he'll be suffering the whole week. As the two leave the room, they banter why they aren't taking the advancement exams right now, even though they are both sergeants. Minjun thought about the specialty weapons training and wondered if this was different to special firearms training. Another time skip happens, and we find ourselves at the orientation for the hunter advancement examinations, where the instructor is talking about a quick orientation on how the examinations will go. Minjun sat there listening, as the instructor bullied those who were being overconfident for already knowing the details. Minjun listens carefully, while the corporal falls asleep. The instructor mentions that the examination will consist of two parts. There is a written exam, and a practical exam. The written part is usually a basic written test, which makes it super easy to clear. Minjun walked out feeling quite confident about what he heard, remembering that the practical exam is what really mattered. It would basically be a test of their stats, their specialty weapons proficiency, and their ability to handle monsters. Minjun knew that he would pass, but he wondered what perks he would receive for getting the perfect score again. As he walked through the hallway, he thought about being more serious in his approach to the examination. The sun rose up, and it was time for the specialty weapons training. These were usually close quarters weapons, swords, throwing knives, daggers, maces and all that other jazz. The instructor stood above them, ready to teach them all how to get it done. He ordered the privates and privates first class to not pick any weapons other than swords. The academics yell in agreement. He orders corporals to take their weapons and go train far away, and if they're slacking off, he would bury them alive. He told the rookies that he will teach them basic swordsmanship from the Hunter Corps manual. However, he also warns them that following the guidelines blindly won't do them much good. He tells them that they must use it as a foundation to create their own styles and adapt to any situation that comes their way. He asks them if they understood, loudly yelling at the top of his lungs. The rookies agree. After all, they can't really say no. He tells them to follow along with him, to concentrate on what he does and to look at nothing other than what he's doing. It doesn't matter if a naked girl was standing to their left, they had to keep their eyes peeled on him. He picked up a sword and showed them some incredible moves. He was flowing around like water, jumping from place to place, swiping and dashing, ducking and slashing. This dude had seemingly mastered the art of swordsmanship. As the sword let out dust, our hero stared at it knowing something was different about this weapons training. He understood why it was called the specialty weapons training, as he was joyful that he'll finally get to show off some moves. He knew that you can't just keep fighting monsters with rifles, and this lets you hone your skills if that situation ever arose. The rookies were trying their best to move their swords around, showing off their subpar skill levels. Meanwhile, Minjun was making the air flow around them with his swordsmanship, channeling the specialty weapon's true power. He knew how this shit worked, and the rest were suffering from a skill issue. As he swung those swords, his opinion on this swordsmanship was that it was better in Iskard. He leaped up in the air and tore through the air, making it quite literally visible to the naked eye, while the rest of the rookies stood flabbergasted. Minjun knew that the technique is all that mattered, as he showed off his impressive swordsmanship skills to the rookies. The instructor tells everyone to halt, and calls Minjun to the podium. Minjun notes this, and says that he is on his way. He walks towards the instructor, thinking what did he even do this time. He slowly walks to the podium, his sword in his hand and his mind racing. He tells all the rookies that their movements are horrible and that they do not flow well, and that they must all take cue from Minjun. Minjun was shocked, he knew he was good, but he didn't think he was so good that this guy would straight up compliment him right away. The instructor pulled out his stick, and ordered them all to follow exactly as Minjun does. Minjun showed his skills to them all again, the way he slashed the sword was spectacular compared to the rest of the rookies. The instructor knew this, and he kept pointing out how he was doing this to the rookies and how they should follow him. He keeps blazing his sword around, carving through the air and atmosphere before landing on his knees. The rest of them were standing there, they had no idea how to even fathom replicating that. 
Minjun sat tired. It was a hot day and he basically served as the training instructor for the private and the private first class soldiers. The instructor showed up behind him. He told Minjun that he did good while pulling something out of his pocket. He handed it to Minjun, telling him to eat it when he was alone. I hope this isn't an advertisement, but if it is, please pay me. Anyways, Minjun had a pack of something in his hand now thanks to the instructor, while he wondered if the instructor just carries this shit around. He looked at the pack, and just as he was about to start eating, someone else showed up. It was none other than Dongjin, who asked our hero to look at his form during the break. Minjun wondered why he wanted him to look at his form while hiding the packet given to him by the instructor. Dongjin said that his specialty weapon is the sword but it's still tough for him to fight monsters with it. He wanted Minjun to take a look and give him pointers. Minjun had no idea what to say, but this was his boy, his homie, and he agreed to help him as much as possible. Dongjin showed off his form, and he seemed to be doing quite good with the sword while Minjun leaned against the wall, snacking away as he looked at his buddy's skills. He ate the chocolate sandwich, noting that Dongjin seems to have been training for quite a while from his moves. He noted that Dongjin's movements weren't the problem, but he lacked something, and that something wasn't easily achieved. Private First Class Lee Dongjin's problem was confidence, and our hero knew this right away. He remembered his time in Isgard, and how he used to lack confidence too. He knew that it might not be the right time yet, but that there will come a day. On that day, Dongjin will transform with the help of our hero. He will turn Dongjin into a top-tier hunter, a confident one who is always ready for combat. The last chapter ended with the anticipation of the advancement examination, and it was the day that they would finally begin. People at the HQ were spending time doing different things, taking it at respite from the preparation that they had done. Some were watching TV, loving the music as they looked at idols. Others were playing basketball, sports was always a fun way to relax. There were others that were playing board games. Suddenly, an announcement blared on the speakers. It was telling all of the hunters who were scheduled to take the advancement examinations to proceed to the military training ground immediately. Everybody was knocked on the head with this news. Except for our hero, Kim Minjun stood ready to take on anything in the upcoming examination. He had a determination in his eyes, as he knew that today was the day he would be becoming a corporal. The sun was shining on the faces of the young examinees, as they stood in the military training grounds. The instructor for this exam was 2nd Lieutenant Kim Chialman, because everyone is going to be called either Kim or Lee in this series. He tells everyone that he will be their guide through the exam. The examinees listen carefully, but before that, he wants to see the number of personnel from each company. A bus comes up, as it seems that they will be taking the exam somewhere else. The second lieutenant stands and checks as everybody enters the bus in an orderly fashion. Once everybody's in, he talks about how the exam will be held at the 105th Division. The bus takes off, and he tells them to look at their practice questions while they were traveling. In the bus, the examinees are a bit flustered to say the least. Minjun starts eavesdropping on a conversation between two examinees. He hears them talk about how the 4th Battalion is coming to the advancement exams, which means that they, and by extension we, would get to see some females in this series after so long. One of the examinees is really excited to show his weapons proficiency in front of the girls. They talk about how the girls might want their numbers and stuff, meanwhile Minjun is just listening and laughing. He knows that they're going to try their best, but it doesn't matter, he was too confident in himself. The road to the 104th Division was filled with beautiful vistas. It was very evident that this was a military establishment when they finally arrived, full of perimeters with security and shit. The scene switches to written examination room number 7. Here, all the examinees are seemingly done with their written examinations, and it was time for them to get their results. The invigilator, Kang, says that everybody has passed except for Cho Jiangwook. This was the same guy who was talking about getting the girl's number, and he's about to be really embarrassed because everybody is laughing at him. He starts to sweat nervously when he finds that out, he was not even gonna get to show his skills off anymore. On the way outside of the written examination, his friends are bullying him for failing the exam which was easier than a driver's license test. Minjun wasn't paying attention to anything, he was having the time of his life vibing on his own. Everybody was walking in a straight line, as it seemed that it was time to take the physical exam. Here, a familiar face pops up. This is someone we haven't seen in a while, but this blue-haired woman was staring at the examinees walking away. Inside of a beautiful-looking building at the 105th Division HQ, we hear a speech going on. Inside the auditorium, we see a bunch of soldiers as the speechgiver is applauding the examinees on having come so far. This was Lieutenant Colonel Lee Chialju. Like I said, it's just gonna be Kim's and Lee's in this series. This was the man in charge of the advancement exam. He talks about how his objective is not only to find people worthy of promotions. In fact, they wanted to showcase a friendly competition between three different divisions. Minjun is looking at this and feeling sleepy, he wanted the exam to start already so that they could finally advance. However, Lt. Col. Lee talks about how there are members who are attending this examination based on special exception. 
He calls out Min Jun's name. But he wasn't alone, as LC Lee takes the name of the blue-haired girl, Private Sun Yun Seo. LC Lee keeps talking about how they are hunters who enlisted a year ago but they're very exceptional at their job. Meanwhile, Min Jun is incredibly happy to find out that there's someone special other than him. At this point, almost nobody is giving a shit about anything that LC Lee is talking about, except for the nerds. The nerds talk about how if you applied to the front lines you can get special exceptions. While there's another one talking about how a lot of people rejected the offer to join the 104th division, and if they didn't, they could be like Min Jun. There's another one who talks about how Min Jun already became a private first class. They all get very excited and start looking at our hero, he was turning heads everywhere. His head turning skills are so great that he eventually turns even the blue haired girl's head. Of course, he pays no mind to the attention from anyone else. However, when he notices that Sun is looking at him, he can't help but look back. Sun immediately gets shy though and turns her gaze away. Min Jun pretends that he didn't see anything, even though he did catch her looking at him. Anyways, LC Lee tells everyone to do their best, which is something no one probably heard either. Finally, someone useful gets up on the stage. Thankfully, this guy isn't named Lee or Kim. This is Captain Jiang Sangxiao, and he announces the commencement of the test for strength, agility, and stamina. The first one is going to be the strength test, which is going to be really simple. All they had to do was push back examiner Dave Bautista. Min Jun remembered how there was an exam that made him push a huge red stone, and he wondered why all of the exams were like that. They only had a time limit of one minute to do this, and it looked like a piece of cake pretty much. If they managed to move him 10 meters backwards, they get the highest score out of a 100-point scale. Dave Battista stood in front of the 10-meter squares that they had made on the ground, and they would be called up one by one to try their luck. A private named Kim, once again, from the 103rd Division was called forward first of all. This dude looked pretty bulky, wearing a tight t-shirt that showed off his muscly physique. He walked up to Dave Bodista and grabbed his shoulder, pushing him as hard as he can. I want to call this guy the boulder, because he was not even feeling a hit. He was pushing so hard that his face was going red, almost as if he was giving birth. Dave Bodista's shoulder tapped him, and sent the guy flying away. This man, who looked as if he was about to score some winning points, was immediately disqualified. As the loser lay on the ground, the invigilator mentioned how if you don't earn a score of 40, you disqualify immediately. The rest of the examinees start shitting themselves when they see this ludicrous display. I mean, I would be too. After this, people were swatted away at the hands of big man Dave Bodista like flies. Some were earning 10 points and getting disqualified. The others were getting 20 and then getting disqualified just the same. There was no clear winner, and even the invigilator was getting pissed off by how incompetent these shitheads were. Finally, it was time for someone interesting. Sun Yunseo, the blue-haired special gal was up next. She was sweating nervously, but thankfully, she had passed. I mean, would have been cool if they showed us how she scored 50 points, but whatever. Everyone was shocked, they had no idea how this frail little girl had managed to get this done when they couldn't. Somehow, she had moved him 5 meters backwards. She walked away looking like a chad. This is what you call a real girl boss. The boys were taken aback by her beauty, while some others were talking about how she's a nepotism baby because she's the daughter of the division commander. These guys were fanboying hard, and it was very pathetic to see in all honesty. She looked back at them, and I'm pretty sure she was judging them like me. She walked through the crowd of admirers, but the only one disinterested in staring at her was Min Jun. Of course, Min Jun was thinking about her too, how she's the one who received a special exception like he did. It was our hero's turn, the time had come for him to show off his incredible strength. He announced his arrival, mentioning his private first class title as he came forward. He walked up to Dave Battista, and he had an idea in his mind of how this was going to play out. He knew that he shouldn't treat this situation like the Red Stone, because if he did, Dave Battista would die. However, if he manages to push him past the 10 meter mark, he might get a special bonus. So, he decided to go for it. Put both of his hands front and center, all five fingers open, ready to push hard and brash. Dave Battista went flying, I'm pretty sure nobody in his entire life had been able to push him this far. The crowd was shocked, their faces went white with envy and fear. Thankfully, Battista managed to land on his feet. He wasn't just burly like a bear, he was nimble like a cat as well. His feet dragged him the ground with him, leaving behind a broken wood chips. Not only was Battista shocked and enraged, even the invigilator had no idea how this was possible. Private First Class Kim Min Jun was the only person here who had managed to acquire 100 points. He was smiling, he knew this was coming, but no one else had any clue, not even the blue-haired Nepo baby. As he walked away, feeling Sun's gaze, he realized there weren't any bonus points after all. Of course, Min Jun wasn't the final examinee, and there were more yet to be disqualified. A girl was sent away crying because she failed to push Dave Bodice to more than one meter, resulting in her disqualification. The rest of the examiners were just standing there wondering why this was so difficult. The strength test had finally ended, and it was time for the next one, which would be the agility test. 
Of course, being the agility test, it would start without any breaks. The ones who were disqualified were sent away, they made lines and walked away disappointed with their own performances. Meanwhile, the staff was changing up the equipment and bringing in new stuff that would be used for the agility stat test. They were setting up a big green net, and I mean, they were having some trouble setting this shit up. Then, they brought in a huge mini gun. Honestly, it looked like an anti-tank weapon, but it was just a big mini gun that they would be using for the agility test. The examiners were looking at this and they were terrified, they were wondering if they were going to be made to dodge bullets, after using up so much of their strength trying to push the behemoth Dave Bodista. The invigilator was laughing, as he finally revealed that they would indeed be dodging rubber bullets. It didn't matter if they were rubber bullets, they were being shoved out at an unprecedented pace from within an anti-tank weapon, in other words, it would still hurt like a bitch. He tells them to dodge everything, and they start to be nervous, this time, there was a lot more pain involved if they messed up. While they were all pissing themselves, Minjun found this amusing and just smirked at how interesting things had gotten. The man operating the gun was ready, and he was out for their blood. Okay, so, the objective here was to dodge the bullets for a consistent one minute. If they would last one whole minute surviving the bullets, they would achieve the perfect score. Of course, all the contestants had to stay within the designated area inside of the net. The thing that made the examinees even more scared though, was that the examination could also be passed while tanking the hits for one minute. You just had to stay inside of the net for one whole minute, and you would pass with flying colors. Those who ran out of the safety net in less than 30 seconds, or those who became severely injured would be disqualified immediately. Now, it was time for the test to commence. But before that, Minjun heard a familiar voice behind him. As the voice called out to him, he turned his head in surprise and looked back. It was none other than his homie private first class Dongjin, smiling and waving at him. Minjun was surprised to see him there, he had no idea that Dongjin had passed the strength test. Dongjin asked him why he was this surprised, did he really think that his homie was going to fail the strength test? Minjun denies that, even though he really did think that. Just like you thought that too. Dongjin tells our hero that all the private first class have passed the advancement exam once before, so they were a bit used to the format. The only thing that messed them up was that the overall score standard was higher for them, which is also the reason why Dongjin had been failing the tests for so long. He gives our hero a tip, telling him that these rubber bullets fly at the same speed as real ones, so you shouldn't be dodging them based on his eyesight. As the bullets came out of the gun, flying as fast as any regular bullet, he told him that it was important to predict the bullet's trajectory and dodge them accordingly. The bullets were hitting people, and there were screams all around the military training grounds. As soon as the first bullet landed on a guy's skull, it cracked it open and made the guy bleed. He was on the floor there, just crying out in pain and bleeding away. Of course, he immediately got disqualified, and an examiner was told to escort him to the infirmary. As Minjun saw the situation, he noted that so many people were being disqualified just from the stat tests, perhaps this was why the pass rate was so low. But still, it was reasonable that these tests were so difficult, because there were so many monsters out there that were so much more terrifying than any of these tests could ever even imagine. And you knew that this was reasonable, as he thought about the damage that monsters could do. Another examinee was disqualified, but this time it was because he ran out of the safety net because he just did not want to get hit by the bullets. The invigilator was extremely annoyed, he told them that they were cowards, because this test was nothing compared to the sergeant advancement exam that was taking place in the exam room next to them. People were walking away disappointed, nervous and sad in their own performance, but these tests were tough so I forgive them. Even though they don't know I exist, I'm just a random narrator out here. Of course, someone interesting had to eventually come up, and this time it was none other than Private Sun Yunseo, the blue-haired Nipo baby. She walked up in front of the safety net, and cracked her fingers, she was ready for some action. The bullets came flying in. The crowd was watching in anticipation, they were all slightly nervous for the girl. They should have known better, she was better than them all and she dodged the bullets better than they ever could. Nine seconds had passed and she was dodging bullets like Neo from the Matrix. Jumping and dodging, dashing, dancing and doing whatever else you can think of to avoid the onslaught of bullets. The crowd was in awe of her skill, they couldn't believe how good she was. And as the clock reached 57 seconds, even the invigilator applauded her for dodging everything. The 60 seconds were finally over, and Sun Yunseo had not been hit even a single time. She had received a perfect score. As she walked past the crowd, everybody was staring at her or trying not to stare at her, but they were all impressed by her amazing skill. She passed Minjun by, giving him quite a mean look. He looked back at her and wondered why she was doing that. Meanwhile, the rest of the examinees were just staring there wondering if these two were dating. After all, why would she be looking at him if they weren't? She stepped slowly there, staring deeply into our hero's eyes, leaving him wondering what she wanted from him. Thankfully, the tension was broken by the invigilator announcing that it was Minjun's turn to bite the bullet, or dodge it. He quickly turned away from her and started walking towards the safety net. She still looked at him while she was walking away. Guys, I gotta say, this tension is too much for me to handle. 
Minjoon used his peripherals to look back. He was getting a bit uncomfortable by the fact that she was still staring at him. Just a bit too much now, not gonna lie. As he stood in front of the safety net, he wondered what she wanted. Was she expecting a compliment? But why would that be the case when they don't even know each other? While he was in thought, he did not realize that the gun was primed and ready. The chamber went off, and the bullet came flying towards him like a meteor. He quickly dodged it by moving his head away. The bullet was too slow for our hero. Sun was impressed, I think she thought of him as her rival, but his skill is way too far ahead of her. He still had his hand in his pocket, as he thought of showing her just how capable he is. He wanted to truly show off the difference between their skill level, so he would keep his hands in his pocket, as the bullets came raging in. Everybody was shocked at this display, they couldn't figure out how he was going to do any of this. Yet somehow, Minjun was dodging every single bullet just by slightly moving. Not a single jump, not a single dash, he would just slightly curve his body every single time a bullet would come to strike. Aside from that, he kept moving closer towards the gun, leaving less space between him and the bullet. Eventually, he was so close to the gun that the bullets just moved past his face as he gave his blue-haired rival a smile. She was shocked, that's for sure, as she reacted out in nervousness. Meanwhile, he was just dodging bullets while staring at her and laughing. This guy was destroying her soul. The invigilator was so dumbfounded when he saw this ludicrous display that he forgot to even check the time. It turns out that the gun had been firing for a minute and ten seconds. He immediately called a ceasefire and stopped the bullet hell that Minjun was standing amidst. Not to mention, he gave our hero a perfect score on the agility test. The gun stopped, as Minjun was just two steps away from the barrel. He had truly shown off here today, and even if he didn't impress the ladies, he surely scared the life out of them. The originator had no idea how to even respond, so he just ignored it and started calling the next contestant. The agility test was done, and it was much later in the afternoon now. After a small break, the rest of the remaining examinees were called onto the grounds as they stood in front of a big blue portal gate. The invigilator told that they did great on the agility test. As he was sweating profusely from the heat, he told them that they would commence the stamina stat test now. The stamina stat test was the last out of the three, and it was way too simple. Everyone had entered the dungeon through the big blue portal gate, and it was time to start marching inside of the empty transforming dungeon. The test was simple, the contestants had to race inside of the empty transforming dungeon. They had a time limit of 40 minutes, in which they had to reach the examiner at a turning point, where they would get their hands stamped by him and return until the time ran out. Of course, to make things interesting, they never told the examinees the distance to the turning point. They had no idea how long they had to keep marching to get to the turning point, this would be a proper trek. As Minjun was marching with the rest of the examinees, he wondered if they were all pacing themselves since they just started. As he was walking, he wondered if he would get into trouble if he just ran ahead. He was getting bored from walking so slowly, marching was really not his thing. In that moment, someone tapped his shoulder and he could feel them brushing past him. It was none other than the blue-haired nepotism baby as she ran past him, zooming ahead. She looked back at him, staring into his eyes. As he wondered what she wanted this time, he quickly realized that this was a race now. She started running, and everyone else started running behind her. The long march had turned into a long race. Still, it made a lot of sense, as there was a 40-minute time limit. Minjun was overtaken by excitement, when he realized that she had just managed to send him the signal to a challenge. The challenge was to race her, and our boy wasn't one to hold back in competition. The blue-haired girl dashes off ahead, taking the lead in the race as she looks back at our hero, challenging him to keep up. He immediately realized what it was, as he burst out laughing, knowing that she was challenging him. The game was afoot, and the race had started. It was going to be a trek to the finish line and Minjun had no intentions of losing, as he started to put one foot in front of the other, at a pace faster than you'd ever see from a regular soldier. He made a break for it, running ahead of the competition while they could only look and do nothing. They could not compete with him, this man was too fast. They started yelling out behind him, telling him to wait for them but he had only one goal, reach the end faster than the blue-haired girl. The dungeon was rocky, and the fog was covering the little visibility that was available, but the blue-haired girl had no intentions of sticking around. She wanted to win just as bad as everyone else. Suddenly, she noticed something behind her, it was as if a shadow was on her ass. Nope, it was just Minjun, giving her a smile as he had easily caught up to her. He looked at her, and told her that this wasn't going to be too difficult for him. She was confused at what he said, and asked him what he was saying, and he just replied that he was talking to himself. He dashed ahead of her, leaving her behind, confused and shocked at his incredible pace. He laughed hysterically as he took the lead, he couldn't help but show off. She was stopped dead in her tracks, terrified of what she was up against. As she was standing there, panting, she wondered what the hell kind of power our heroic MC was made of. Her mind started to wander, remembering how when she left the battalion commander's office, she was greeted by a whole crowd of reporters. This is where we were going to get Sun Yunseo's backstory, we were finally going to learn more about her mysterious past. 
She was shocked at first. She wasn't used to so much attention from the world. They kept questioning her and bugging her about her meeting with the battalion commander and asking her if the rumors were true and that she was indeed the daughter of a general and had incredibly high stats. She had no idea how to respond. It felt as if there was too much responsibility on her shoulder. As she walked away from the crowd of reporters, she could hear them whispering about how she was a nepotism baby, but that she was still a normal person and not too arrogant. They didn't know much about her. As she was walking away, she heard them and how they assumed that she was going to be the best recruit in the enlistment year. She took off her jacket. This is still the flashback, by the way. She wondered about our hero and how he broke the redstone in one hit. She was surprised and impressed by his strength and wondered what his deal was. The scene switches to a training center where an announcer is stating that the white team has won. What did they win? Well, let's find out together. Sun was standing atop a catwalk, waving a blue flag while she was in her training attire. She had a smile as sweat was dripping down her face. She made her way off the catwalk and went back to her team to celebrate. The announcer screamed that the blue team's flag was captured by the white team, and they had set a whole new record of 3 minutes and 34 seconds. He also told the white team to take a break for 10 minutes. He called up the blue team towards himself as another trainer walked towards the white team. She told the girls that they've set a new record for the training center and that they can rest here for now. The girls were happy they had accomplished something great. Her team was celebrating as they rested. They were proud of our comrade for doing everything, recognizing that they hadn't even done anything. So they decided to cheer on their comrade, Sun yun -seo, who had won them the training. She was blushing. At this point, we know that she doesn't know how to take a compliment. However, she did have a faint smile on her face, as one would expect in this situation. Later, we're brought back to the girls' locker room. There, the women are engaged in different activities. Most of them have gotten changed, while others read books, fold their clothes and use their phones. Suddenly, a short-haired blonde girl slams the door open as she enters the room. She came in and announced that the record they set for capture the flag in the morning was broken in the afternoon training. She seemed hella worried. Then she began to recount about how quick the new record was, which stood at a minute and two seconds. The girls were confused. How could such a record even be made? It turns out, it was none other than Kim Min Joon, our MC who had broken it. This immediately alerted Sun Yun Seo. She remembered who it was, as she had been bested by him without much difficulty. In the girls' shower, we don't get to see much but they seem to be vibing. However, Min Joon's name is on every person's mouth at this point. This was during the time where he got a near-perfect score shooting the ICM bullets, and Sun Yun Seo was starting to get annoyed by his constant record-breaking performances. Blondie kept talking about Min Joon during every other activity or training, and at this point, our girl had had enough. It didn't even stop during midnight, when they were supposed to be sleeping, as she kept mentioning about how he caught a hound which was the size of an elephant in the dungeon. Sun finally told her to shut up and go to sleep. Blondie was not shutting up though, it's almost as if she was zoned out while talking about our hero and Sun just wanted her to be quiet. Eventually, she spaced out herself into a sleep that would bring the memories of her past in her dreams. A solemn figure was tying the laces on their boots. They had rough hands, the hands of a soldier. It was a bulky figure. The physique seemed to belong to a man who had seen many fights in his lifetime. A little girl approached him. It was none other than Sun herself as a child. The man was her dad, a veteran of the Hunter Corps. She looked up to her father, and in her dream, she was staring at him while the background was completely white and colorless. The entirety of the color went into that man. It seems that he was a huge source of joy for Sun, and his smile brought her happiness. He gave her a pat to the head, roughing up her hair and showing her some fatherly love. As he left through the door, she looked at him in yearning, almost as if she didn't want him to leave. In that moment, a small smile appeared on her face as she knew exactly what her goal in life was going to be. She was going to become strong, just like her father, she was going to keep everyone safe and make a name for herself as a powerful soldier in the Hunter Corps arsenal. The scene switches to the battalion commander's office, who compliments her on the phenomenal training she's been doing for the past four weeks. He called her in his office so that he could discuss something important with her and asked her if that would be all right. She thanked him for the consideration and wanted to know more about what he wanted to discuss. He asked her where she wanted to apply and told her that since she has exceptional grades, she can be dispatched to any division that she wants. It was as if she was standing in a winery but instead of wine bottles, these were military headquarters, she just had to pick her poison. She thought about her answer as the battalion commander insisted on knowing where she wanted to go. Did she want to be near her father or somewhere else? She just mentioned the name of our hero, Kim Min Joon. This confused the battalion commander, trying to understand what she meant. She decided to clarify things after taking a deep breath. She asked him which division did recruit Kim Min Joon apply to, because that was going to be her poison of choice. Finally, we are brought back to the race. As Sun Yun Seo is running, splashing her feet through some muddy water, she remembered that she didn't apply to this division just so she could have childish competitions with her fellow recruits. 
as she's trying to gain more momentum, she realized that she provoked him because she was a little upset. Perhaps that is why he was mad and showing off. In her mind, she kept seeing him as the main rival during this assessment. He bested her each time they competed, first during the strength stat test, and then during the agility test. She realized her errors, her jealousy had gotten the better of her. So, as she decided to run faster, she noted that she would apologize to him first. The goal was clear, she wanted to become stronger, she never intended on becoming number one. She came here just so she could get stronger without her father's help, but making enemies was not part of the plan. She knew that she had encountered someone extremely skillful here, and instead of being her rival, he should be someone that she learns from. She was not going to be childish anymore, as she had finally reached her destination, the turning point stamp validation booth. Yunseo noticed that Minjun had already gotten there, and the man in charge of the stamps kept telling him to go away. He was wasting time just standing there. However, he was just standing there in spite, just so he could show her that he got there first. As he ran past her from the turning point, he told her that he almost fell asleep waiting for the slowpoke that she was, which embarrassed her. The embarrassment quickly turned into rage. He had pissed her off real good this time. She started yelling at the invigilator to stamp her quickly, because she wanted to get back in the race really fast. As she started dashing away from the turning point, she decided to fuck the apologies. Even the very sight of Minjun's face had enraged her so bad that she wanted to take revenge. Unfortunately for her, when they made their way out of the portal, they were all tired beyond expression. Of course, Minjun was just having fun. This was just another day at the office for him. The invigilator told everyone that private first class Kim Minjun was in first place with a record of 29 minutes. On the other hand, private Sun Yunseo, the blue-haired Nipo baby, was in second place with 32 minutes. The invigilator congratulated Minjun, telling him that he got a perfect score in every single stat test. He thanked the invigilator, he was happy to just be there. That was the end of the stat tests. Every single hunter who passed would get to eat a delicious meal and then gather in front of the training grounds for more assessment action. All of the hunters yelled out an acknowledgement, showing their enthusiasm even though they were so tired they could fall on the ground. The hunters picked their jackets off the ground as it was time to head back for lunch. For a brief moment, our hero made eye contact with the blue-haired woman. Instead of being mature though, Minjun simply showed her the tongue and taunted her more. She was not annoyed anymore, she was just embarrassed at this point. As he walked away from her, a familiar face found him. It was none other than Lee Dongjin, who told him that he was being rude while the girl just stood there watching. Yet, it seems that her embarrassment and anger had completely died out, as she giggled a little bit. She realized that she was the one who fell for provocation, and on top of that, she also lost. She didn't have anything else to say anymore, she just looked up at the sky and smiled, knowing that there was good competition in this place. She could feel the cold breeze of the air touching her skin. It was almost as if she walked into heaven after emerging from hell and felt refreshed as her sweat dried off. She straightened her hat, preparing herself for the next assessment that was about to take place, and she started moving towards the rest so she could join the group for a hearty meal after the tough stat tests that she had gone through. After they had finished eating, it was time for the second practical examinations to start at the examination center. We see a wooden club slam into the ground, as it seems that the second practical examinations had already begun. There were a bunch of goblins standing around a lone fighter, the hunter had a sword in his hand, and he had already slain one of them. One of the goblins roared out loud, its yellow eyes piercing through and causing terror. The other goblin started laughing maniacally, it wanted to engage but it was scared. The corpse of a dead green goblin sullied the ground, its tar-like blood splattered all over the place. The hunter was none other than Private First Class Lee Dongjin. He wiped the sweat off his forehead as he got ready to take on more of those ugly fuckers. He looked at them, analyzing their movements so that he could mark his target. A blue goblin jumped off, lunging towards the private first class. However, Dongjin was prepared as he maneuvered his sword. The one thing that he didn't expect though was for both goblins to attack at the same time. The other one started moving behind him as well, and he was about to turn into a meat sandwich if he didn't make a decisive move. He turned his eyes quickly towards the blue goblin, knowing exactly what to do. He immediately blocked the blue goblin's wooden club from turning his face into pulp, using his incredibly strong katana. Then, he used his foot to kick the goblin in its chest giving it a pretty good heartache and also sending it flying far away. In the meantime, the green goblin had made its way exactly behind him, but the private first class was prepared for any attacks coming his way. Dongjin moved out of the way of the club attack, barely managing to save face and save himself from any damage. The counterattack was brutal as he slashed the goblin through the chest, carving into him as a fountain of blood started to spurt out of its cut open upper body. Yet somehow, that evil little goober managed to land on its feet. Dongjin was annoyed, but most of all he was frustrated that his sword swipe didn't kill him. The goblin was angry now, its iris turned red, as the carved up chest kept leaking blood out. Both of the goblins were now standing in the same place, and they could overwhelm him if they decided to attack together again. 
As this fight was going on, our hero was looking at it from above and spectating. He stood up at a balcony. It was a spectator area, where people could look at the assessment from afar without putting themselves in danger or confusing the goblins on what their target was. Basically, the second part of the practical exam was called the specialty weapons proficiency, and it was way simpler than what our hero had expected. All they had to do was display the techniques they had learned in the hunter corps to the examiners. That was essentially the whole test, and it didn't matter how strong their moves were. All they had to do was follow the manuals in order to pass. Most of the applicants had chosen swordsmanship as their specialty, and while our hero had gotten the perfect score, his buddy, Private First Class Lee Dongjin ended up receiving a very high score as well. The invigilator congratulated him, and was proud of what the Private First Class had managed to do. Yet something was lingering on his mind, and that was the main combat itself. As Dongjin struggled during the combat, it seemed that his fears had been realized. Ninjun expected that his homie would struggle during the combat, because that was one of his weaknesses in general. Goblins were closing in on Dongjin, as this was the last part of the practical exam, known as the ability to handle monsters. People would spectate from above, as a hunter would have to defeat four hounds. However, since Dongjin was a private first class, he had to defeat three goblins while wielding the chosen specialty weapon. As the goblins closed in, Dongjin managed to cut the green one into half, slicing through it like butter. Now, only the blue one remained, and it wasn't going to be much trouble alone. A splash of blood poured out of the blue goblin. It fell to the ground, breathing its last breath. Dongjin stood above it, with the sword pointing downwards as he was about to stab it through the chest and end its life. He pushed the sword down, cutting through the skin, bone and muscle tissue to pierce the goblin's heart. The invigilator announced that it took our boy a total of 7 minutes and 52 seconds to finish the ability to handle monsters tests. I guess this wasn't a good enough number, because instead of saying anything else, they just told him to return to his seat. The homie looked quite disappointed in himself, as he was drenched in sweat, huffing and puffing from tiredness. As he walked away, he knew that his performance wasn't as good as he wanted it to be. Minjun stood up there spectating still, he noted that his buddy had many opportunities to kill the goblins, but he hesitated each time. He would either fall back or keep defending himself by guarding with his sword, and at times, he would also get overwhelmed instead of attacking them himself. Minjun wondered if his boy had no confidence in his own abilities, but he did not want to make any assumptions. Dongjin emerged through the gates, but his head down in disappointment, he felt as if he let himself down. He walked past our hero, still feeling depressed after that subpar performance. Now, it was the turn for our hero to show off his ability to handle monsters, and no matter what happened, today he would become a corporal for sure. He had confidence in himself, and he was going to tear his homie piece by piece until he gained confidence in himself and his own abilities. The other examinees stood by in shock, looking at their fellow hunter as it seems he had made a weird choice. Even the examiner himself, and even Sun Yunseo, the blue-haired Nipo baby were shocked by his choice. It was a black baseball bat, not just a regular one, it had nails poking out at the head. Yup, our hero had chosen a baseball bat with nails, this was going to be his specialty weapon for this test. The examiner was confused, he assumed that since Minjun had picked this weapon, he was going to have a tough time during the ability to handle monsters tests. However, our hero had a smirk on his face, because he knew that the one thing you require for such a test was something he already possessed. As the gates opened, and the three goblins emerged from within it, our hero was confident in his abilities. He knew that all he needed was some powerful impact, as he smiled with his teeth out. The goblins immediately began to rush towards our hero, the fat one was running towards him, while the green ones were jumping around like monkeys towards his direction. But he just stood there nonchalantly, not worrying about anything. He gripped the baseball bat as hard as he possibly could to the point that the veins on his hand began to show. You see, in his mind, these goblins were nothing but a frail little rabbit. As he swung his bat, at the most aggravating pace, he thought of himself as a hawk that can kill rabbits with a simple grip. As the goblins had finally reached him, the swing of his bat was about to reach them as well. They looked terrifying. They had bloodlust on their minds and heavy clubs in their hands. Yet in one fell swipe of his baseball bat, it seems that they completely vanished. Just like a hawk only leaves behind a feather as a sign of its killer instinct. In only four seconds, Minjun had accomplished something that took everyone else minutes worth of effort. The goblins had turned into small pieces of demon meat, with nothing else left of them aside from their tiny pieces of flesh. The examiners couldn't believe it. Not only did he receive a perfect score in every practical exam, he simply destroyed those goblins in one hit. The other hunters cheered for him, while the main examiner and Sun Yunseo stood there in shock and nervousness of his ability. He looked up at the spectators, specifically at Sun Yunseo. She gleamed into his eyes, trying to understand what he had just accomplished. However, Minjun simply gave her a wide-jawed smile. He stood there, with his hands raised up, knowing that he was the most powerful hunter to ever touch this assessment. 
As the other hunters were clapping and cheering, Sun Yunxiao was left wondering what kind of a reckless fucker our hero was. It was evening now, and the exam was over. All the hunters stood outside of the building near the buses that had initially brought them there. The examiner congratulated them on doing a good job on the exam. In particular, he praised our hero for doing a phenomenal job. Minjun was about to say his name with private first class before it, but he remembered that he was a corporal now. The examiner laughed it out as he tapped his shoulder, telling him that he was advancing so quickly that he was forgetting his rank. He told him to keep it up, as he continued laughing. The examiner told them that he was concerned since he was the only one from their battalion who advanced this time, but the battalion commander was overjoyed with the report. Everyone circled around our hero, congratulating him on passing, because if he didn't pass, the squad would have gotten bullied when they got back home. They also told him not to bully them when he becomes a sergeant, because he was advancing rapidly. Minjun was overjoyed, he had somehow ranked up so quickly that nothing was off the table anymore. As they made their way back into the bus, he looked behind and saw his homie. Dongjin had a look of disappointment on his face, but our hero gave him a pat on the shoulder. This made him a bit nervous, but also happy that his friend was still being nice to him even though he had ranked up. However, being the menace that he is, Minjun had an entirely different plan in mind when it came to training Dongjin with the specialty weapons. In the bus, the other hunters looked out awkwardly at Minjun. This wasn't for no reason though, because Sun Yunxiao had finally decided to approach him for that apology. She stood there, staring at him like a weirdo as he was about to head into the bus. He noticed that she had a private first-class tag on her breast pocket. He knew immediately that she had advanced, and why wouldn't she? She was the second most achieving candidate during the exams. She had done phenomenally well at the ability to handle Monster's test, and she was the only one even trying to compete with him on mostly everything else. He knew that it was obvious she would be passing, and with passing, came the advancement. He didn't have time to chat though, as he got into the bus and sat down on his seat. However, when he looked outside of the window, there was so much more than the beautiful evening colors to behold. Sun Yunxiao was still standing there, staring at him like a lost little puppy. As she looked at him, she wondered if she should take this opportunity to apologize to him. She didn't want to come out as rude like earlier, and started to try her best to apologize. Just as the words were about to leave her mouth, she saw something that made her eyes open wide. It was Minjun, with his face squashed against the glass window. He pointed at his lips to tell her to focus on what he was saying, and began to tell her to never provoke him again. If she ever tried to provoke him again, he stated boldly that she would be dead. I guess he didn't mean that literally, but that still shocked the girl who had just witnessed the incredible amount of strength he had. The bus immediately took off, blazing away in the evening light before the sun set. She stared at the bus as it drove away, leaving nothing but a trail of dust behind it. As she looked at them leaving, specifically Minjun, she finally realized what a crazy son of a bitch he was. It almost seems like he killed the love flag, but Yunxiao seems to hold him in a much higher regard than before. Let's hope they meet again soon. This episode starts with the bus speeding away from Sun Yunxiao. Although we don't see her, she was told to buzz off by Minjun. As the bus gets onto the freeway and starts to stabilize itself on the speedy motorway, we see that Minjun is about to have a crowd annoy him. The boys in the bus start pestering him, asking him why Sun Yunxiao looked so interested in him as they left, and how she would keep staring her down even during the tests. They want to know more about what's going on between them, and they're adamant on knowing. Minjun doesn't know what to say, but he decides that honesty will work just fine. He tells them that she provoked her, so he just showed her who's the boss, by bullying the life out of her during the tests. The guys are stunned, they look at him in surprised and slight shock. Then they exploded, asking him how she even provoked him. According to them, the look in her eye was definitely not provocation, more like some sort of infatuation. They surround him like wolves, they're mad that he didn't take the chance to get with the hottest recruit in the 104th division. She was the girl of many soldiers' dreams, and they were pissed that he bullied her a little during the tests. Minjun could do nothing but sit there being annoyed. He told them straight up that she wasn't his dream girl, which annoyed the others. However, their curiosity was more empowering, and they asked him if not her, then who his dream girl actually was. He told them that it was someone named Lumi. The guys were confused. Who the fuck was Lumi, Minjun? Give us the tasty deets about this whole situation. Lumi resurfaced in Minjun's memory, the most beautiful woman in the entirety of Dungeon Power Fighter, her beauty unlike any other that Minjun had seen. He was surprised that the others didn't know about Lumi, and he asked them about it. They had an expression of annoyance on their face when they realized who Minjun was talking about. I guess they didn't agree. They knew who Lumi was, but they probably didn't understand his obsession with her. It didn't matter though, these were fruitless conversations because they were on their way back to the training center, where life would go back to normality with no girls in sight. They were back home, back at the training center, and it seems that celebrations were in order. We see empty boxes full of bones, it was apparent that this was a chicken wing party, which reminds me that I should probably eat something, because I've been so busy keeping the channel alive for you guys that I didn't even think about eating. 
the boys are having the time of their life. The food was hella yummy and they were munching away like monsters. Just when they thought that the food was over, the lieutenant brought even more for them all. He told them that they could eat as much as they wanted today. Redhead and his lackey were pleasantly surprised by the lieutenant's attitude, guessing that he was probably extremely happy about something. The lackey looked back and gave Minjun a thumbs up, thanking him for the meal as he assumed that all of this was because of him. Redhead smiled at Minjun with excitement, surprised by the fact that Minjun already had three stars. He told him that he knew Minjun had the potential to become sergeant soon. Minjun didn't say anything, he just kept chugging on his Pepsi. Suddenly, someone entered the room, but would this disrupt the party? It turns out that it won't, because it was Lee Seung ho holding a big ass crate of beer. The party was just getting started, as he asked all members of the second squad to gather in the lounge. The second squad boys agreed immediately, while others wondered what was even going on. Lee Seung ho explained that after he gave the report to the administration about the squad dinner, it was like Christmas had come early. He talked about Minjun's perfect score in the advancement exam in that report, so while Minjun was drinking his soda, he was about to get treated for it. Redhead and Lackey both saw the crate that Lee Seung-ho was holding, and immediately got greedy for it. I mean, it's alcohol in a soldier's camp, everybody's bound to want a taste. Lee Seung-ho is a brash person as always, because he tells the two idiots to fuck off. The drinks weren't for them, they were for Minjun and the second squad. The whole room was pissed at them as they left, hoping they choke on the beer and cursing them. Redhead was especially pissed off, he thought that Lee already knew about Minjun's prowess, which is why he put Minjun in his squad right after he had been transferred here. He might be right, but it didn't matter, he wasn't getting shit-faced tonight either way. The day had been quite celebratory, but finally it was night, and the full moon had bloomed to light the entire HQ. The streetlights were lighting the areas within the HQ, as our hero decided to take a nighttime stroll. He walked right to the back of the building, and looked around to make sure he was truly alone. He cleared his throat, readying himself to say something. Emerge, he said, and gestured his hand to let some of that demonic energy manifest from it. The puppet began to form out of the dark demonic energy, as Minjun held his hand up high. There it was, the little guy looked so adorable, it was like something from a Gritsuko came to life. Minjun looked into its eyes and asked it how it had been. The little guy was happy to be summoned and started to play around with the fly. Minjun was a bit concerned when he had initially realized how harmless the puppet looked, but he had come up with a good way to make it more appealing. He didn't need the puppet to be an assassin, for the time being. He had an entirely different role for this little bugger. As Minjun told the little guy that he would be gathering information, like a secret agent in the shadows, the puppet disregarded the news even though it heard what its master had said. It was just too busy fucking around with the fly. Suddenly, Minjun heard someone's loud and annoyed voice in the background, and he turned his head while Tiny got startled. He told the puppet, We'll call him Tiny from now, to stop dicking around and follow anyone who seems high-ranking. He wanted Tiny to gather information about any sort of unusual occurrences, especially if those unusual occurrences are related to demonic energy. Tiny put his hand out, asking his master for something in return for his loyalty, perhaps. Minjun realized that he was simply asking for permission to go, so he formed a small vortex of demonic energy in his hand as he approached his minion. He handed off the small vortex to Tiny, and the puppet took it like a champ. He immediately started dashing away into the opposite direction once he got a hold of the demonic energy. Meanwhile, Minjun was softly yelling at him to be cautious and not get caught. As Tiny ran off all excitedly, Minjun stood there feeling hella anxious. He was worried about what the consequences would be if someone saw him. But it didn't matter for the time being. Because in that case, the whole squad would go into a state of emergency anyways. Suddenly, he was about to feel even more anxious as Sergeant Lee Seung Ho came up behind him and asked him what the hell he was doing out back. Minjun stood there stunned for a bit, thinking of a good excuse to slap the sergeant in the face with. He turned around slowly and said it was because he hadn't gotten drunk in a while, which is why he needed some fresh air after the beer. Lee asked him if he had low tolerance. Minjun surely wasn't going to admit that, because dark mages quite literally cannot get drunk. You see, they're built quite different to your usual homies. It didn't matter whether it was alcohol, anesthesia, poison or any sort of disease, as soon as it entered a dark mage's body, it immediately detoxified itself and killed the effects. Sergeant Lee congratulated our boy on the advancement, and Minjun thanked him for the celebration and the beer. However, the sergeant told him not to get too comfortable or cocky now that he was ranking up, but to also ensure that he was keeping up the good work. Minjun nodded his head, he was going to make the sergeant proud. Lee Seung Ho left Minjun to it, letting him take in the fresh air, but he reminded him that since his tolerance isn't low, he shouldn't linger outside for too long and to join the squad as soon as possible, because the guys were going to wrap up the beer by themselves otherwise. Minjun breathed a sigh of relief as the sergeant walked away. He knew that he would need to be even more careful from now on if he didn't want to make anyone feel suspicious of him. In any case, the more Minjun had gotten to know the sergeant, the more he realized how normal and by the book he was. 
though, that was never going to be an issue for him. Minjun never cared much for anyone's personality type, and he surely wasn't going to care about Lee's. The moonlight was as beautiful as ever, it was radiant and glowing. The next day, as morning came rolling in and brightening everything around the HQ, it was time for those in charge to have a conversation. The two in charge, the captain and the commander were looking at the scores from the advancement exams, and realizing that Minjun was a separate beast. The commander was thinking of killing all of the fuckers who attended the test, but Minjun saved them by getting a literal perfect score. The captain mentioned how Minjun had set an entirely new record of 4 seconds in the ability to handle monsters test. This reminded the commander how much Choi Soonbium from the training center kept praising him, now he realized why. He had surpassed every single one of their expectations, and had raised the standards for all soldiers in the hunter corps. The commander then reminded the captain that Minjun was also the one who defeated all of the middle bats at the oil reserve. The captain knew of this, Minjun had been the first to jump into combat, he was the only one who had the balls to take action right away. The commander was so severely impressed by Minjun's skills, how he had become corporal in less than a month, and how extraordinary his advancement was. The commander knew that Minjun would be someone exceptional in just a short while from now. However, something lingered on his mind, he knew that soon the entire hunter corps will know about him, and when that happens, he will start to get observed by them. The captain asked if he meant the Hunter Special Forces Brigade, and asked the commander if he really trusted Minjun to that level of responsibility. The commander had full confidence in Minjun at this point. He had seen countless hunters till this point, and these hunters that managed to join that Special Forces Brigade were known as Hunter Corps Legends. It was time for a new legend to rise up, and the commander had high expectations that it would be Minjun. The scene switches to a desert landscape. Among the tall sand dunes and rocky cliffs, a foggy aura lingers. We see a soldier, geared up in his battle suit, walking through the sandy arena. Suddenly, reptilian monsters started to emerge out of one side. The other side saw rock golems jump out. Meanwhile, you had brutish orcs and small goblins accompanying the lizard folk. This soldier was surrounded. As the monsters glared this lone warrior down, screaming at the top of their lungs to intimidate the man, he realized that they had him surrounded, the orcs, the goblins, all of the monsters combined forces. It was none other than Minjun, as he looked at them and smiled. He asked if they had all finally gathered in one place for him, as he bonked his own helmet with his spiked baseball bat. The scene switches once more to a hunter chugging on a grape-flavored energy drink right out of the bottle, perhaps he was trying to get rid of the hangover. Dongjin woke up, looking bizarrely overtaken by the effects of last night's drinking. Minjun on the other hand, walked into the room looking as fresh as ever. The other two saw him, looking absolutely okay, while they were diving in their own nausea. They looked at Minjun, and he looked back at them. The ponytail guy, tired out of his mind, asked Minjun if he was alright. Minjun said that he was completely fine, which shocked Ponytail, because Minjun had drank so much. Ponytail admitted that Minjun really was a monster, but our boy's attention was elsewhere. As Sergeant Lee walked into the room with a towel wrapped around his neck, Ponytail asked if he was alright. Turns out, Sergeant Lee was covered in sweat, but he was okay. He had been sweating himself out and had managed to detoxify his body. Minjun had a fruity moment where he admired Sergeant Lee's body and thought of how soldier-like he looked. Do not ship this, we ship Minjun with the Nepo baby. Sergeant Lee asked Minjun if he had been to the gym already, but Minjun hadn't had the time to give it a look-see so far. Turns out, Minjun could use it as much as he liked now, because he was a corporal, and he yelled yes sir in acknowledgement. As Sergeant Lee was leaving, he stopped as he was reminded of something else. He turned his gaze towards Minjun, and told him that the VR device for their squad was pretty good, and that he should give it a try sometime. This perked Minjun's attention immediately, VR was going to be his playground. He got insanely excited as he wondered if it was truly time to test out the Hunter Core VR room that he had heard so much about. Minjun stood outside gym number 2. This is where the VR device was also located. He stood at the door and readied himself to enter a new world. His excitement knew no bounds and he wanted access as fast as possible. So he grabbed the doorknob and turned it to enter the fantastic room full of new technology. It was an awe-inspiring moment for him as he took it all in. He saw how realistic the room looked, but I mean, it is a real room, so I am confused why he would think that. The idiot. He headed towards the control panel and tried to figure out how you manually choose a scenario. After fiddling around with some options, he saw a selection of monsters that he could choose from. Hounds, monster rats, goblins and orcs were available and he immediately picked an orc. He could also select the number of monsters, and since Minjun wanted to truly have fun, I guess you know what happens next. He gave a devilish smile, as he knew exactly what he was going to do. He started smashing the plus icon and adding more and more orcs into the scenario. He wanted as many orcs to fight as he could. Turns out, the maximum number was 30 monsters. That was quite disappointing for our boy. He wanted to feel like he was inside of a Dynasty Warriors game, which really does have you fighting like a hundred enemies all at once, there's nothing like it. 
unfortunately, he had to go next and now it was time for him to select a weapon. This was exciting, and as always, Minjun knew what he wanted. He had made his selections, and the only thing remaining was to now get into the fun. He grabbed the VR headset and the controller, putting the headset on. This started to initiate the battle. As he stood there in the VR room, he saw the room transformed from a regular training room to a literal desert. He was now fully suited in battle armor, holding a baseball bat with nails sticking out of the top end. He was really surprised by what he saw, and looked around to find that he was in a completely different place. Immediately the orcs started to spawn in front of him as the countdown began. Once the countdown had finished, the orcs started to punch and stomp the ground, while running towards our hero with a rage in their eyes. Minjun was ready, though, with a baseball bat in his hand and excitement in his eyes. He appreciated how well made the VR scenario really was. One by one, he started to smack the orcs away with his baseball bat as they kept approaching him. As the hits were connecting, he realized how satisfying the impact against the enemies was feeling. He was destroying the enemies though, cracking open their skulls with his baseball bat and sending them flinging around the whole area. There were still more of them coming though, they kept emerging out of thin air and they looked brutal. Minjun was loving how realistic it felt as he yelled at them to come at him. As he broke another orc's skull, it fell to the ground and started to despawn. It seems that he had taken care of all of the enemies, because there were no more left as the final few vanished. That was it, the battle had completed. Minjun was a bit disappointed though, because the battle felt a little lacking due to the quantity of enemies being only 30. So, when he got a dastardly idea, he knew right away that he had to give it a shot. He selected 30 goblin units, he then selected 30 orc units, along with 30 stone golem units and 30 lizardmen units. He was milking this VR machine for all it had. If this was a PlayStation VR, it was going to be sounding like a jet engine at this point. The enemies began to spawn, just like we saw earlier, and the first to come were the goblins. After them, the orc units began to spawn. Soon after, the stone golems and the lizardmen also entered the battle arena. As Minjun fixed his helmet, he knew that he had done what he intended on doing. He was excited as this was now a real monster hunt. The army of enemies surrounded him, the stone golems on one side, the orc units, lizardmen and goblins on the other. They had all gathered, and it was time for Minjun to get into the combat, as the countdown started. 3, 2, 1, the fight started, and the lizards were the first to jump at him. The orcs started to dash towards him as well. Scratch that, it seems all of them were doing a combined attack, but Minjun was just happy to meet them all and introduce them to Lucille. That's a Walking Dead reference for you uncultured swines. As he leaped into the air with a horrifying look in his eye, he called them all cuties that he was going to kill. The first blow landed on an orc, destroying its skull in its entirety. Right after, he gave a stone golem a real beating with his bat while the orc was throwing up blood. The lizards were not going to stay safe either, their long faces were getting smashed to shit. Don't even ask about the goblins, those guys simply never stood a chance. As a goblin pounced at our hero after he had took down the stone golem, Minjun dodged its swipe attack. He then returned the favor by hitting the goblin right on the next, dismantling its entire existence. As he beat up the goblin to kingdom fuck, the other monsters were shocked by the sheer might of this warrior. The fight, the fight lasted several minutes, but it was clear that these monsters stood no chance against our hero. Soon after, the only one remainder was a lizard who got hit in the face really hard. Poor bastard. And that was it. When that lizard hit the ground, it was game over for the monsters. He stood around a sea of bodies, different types of monsters all lay beneath his feet. The battle had completed, and Minjun had won with pure ease. He tapped his helmet, so that he could get himself out of the virtual reality experience, and the simulation began to terminate. He was out, but he had a lot of fun doing that. As he took the helmet off, faced with reality again, he proclaimed how insanely fun that was as an experience. Minjun liked it so much that he claimed that this was the best thing after Dungeon Power Fighter. Suddenly a notification window popped up, and notified him that a skill called Basic Blunt Weapon Handling had been created. Minjun was a bit surprised, as he looked into this. His proficiency with linked weapons had increased, and he wondered if it was this easily done. He was pleasantly surprised now, having skills was always a bonus. He had never even anticipated weapon skills, so this was a good thing to find out. Now he knew one thing that was a game changer, he didn't need dungeons anymore to acquire skills, he could do that simply in the gym. As he walked out of the VR room, he noted that he should come and play with other weapons too when he has free time. He noticed someone walking towards him. It was none other than our boy Dongjin, but he seemed to have a concerned look on his face. Minjun asked him what's going on. The private first class was terrified, pointing towards the board next to the VR room door. Minjun was confused as to what he was talking about, but as he looked, he realized what it was. All of the units that he had defeated in the second simulation were mentioned on the board. This was unprecedented, and everybody was going to find out about it soon. For a moment, both of them just stood there in silence. Dongjin asked him if he really defeated all of them. 
Minjun was a bit hesitant to answer, but then he got an idea, one that could both free him of this record and also help Dongjin get past his fear of handling monsters. He looked at Dongjin with a high-rank superior dickhead look on his face and told him that they were going to have a little chat in the gym. Dongjin was confused and somewhat scared. He asked Minjun why. The corporal was not going to give him an explanation though, as he carelessly looked away. Psych. He gave him a terrifying look of pure horror and told him that he was going to be training. He pushed Dongjin into the gym, while Dongjin pleaded that he was still hungover, but Minjun told him that he'd be fine once he breaks a sweat. The door closed shut, and I cannot imagine the horror going on behind it. In any case, someone else wandered around to the gym side. He looked at the record on the board, which stated how 120 monsters had been brutally killed in the simulation. It was none other than Corporal Dickhead, and he almost shit himself when he saw that list. He had never seen anything like this in all his years of being a hunter, and I'm sure that he was going to spread this news around. Which begs the question, will it actually affect our hero's life if his secret gets leaked? It's another snowy day at the base, and Corporal Kim is walking out of the command building with a face that certainly tells a story. A story about a man who may or may not have seen a literal god in action. When he comes back to the barracks, he finds his fellow douchebags loitering around in the locker room as usual. A private gets up when he sees the corporal walking inside. The corporal asks him if he has seen the others, but he's mainly only interested in knowing about Kim and Jun. The nervous private replies that everyone has gone to the storage room to fetch the snow removal equipment. And as for Corporal Minjun, the private states that he would be staying at the gym until the start of their scheduled activities. However, the poor private messed up his act by mistakenly calling Kim Minjun as the corporal in front of a narcissist bully. He was expecting to get punished for that, but surprisingly, Corporal Dickhead is now an enlightened being. He shows no signs of jealousy or hatred, and calmly orders the private to find Kim Minjun and tell him that the platoon commander is looking for him. The private accepts the orders, and immediately rushes out of the room before the bully changes his mind. The said bully then pulls up next to the remaining guys in the locker room, asking them what they're doing. It turns out, the men were being men and betting on something utterly stupid. In fact, they even asked Corporal Dickhead to join them if he wanted. It was a bet with their entire monthly salary on the line, and they were guessing how long it would take for Kim and Jun to rank up and become a sergeant. The corporal took a look at the sheet, and wondered why these idiots were always trying to bet on everything that happened at the base. But what's more interesting here is the fact that the ponytail dude wagered that Minjun would rank up in six months. The purple hair laughs hysterically at his ridiculous assessment, but Ponytail is confident in his bet. He makes the point that Kim Minjun is definitely not normal, so it wouldn't make sense to judge him with common sense either. Meanwhile, the corporal was simply looking at the sheet, making an assessment of his own. While the purple hair kept teasing the Ponytail on his terrible decision, the corporal decided to take part in the bet as well. He put down the sheet with the pen, and Ponytail picked up on his entry immediately. His eyes popped open in surprise when he noticed the time that the corporal had estimated for Minjun's next advancement, and shouted at him that he cannot be serious. And if he is, he won't be able to take this back later. The Ponytail kept shouting that he would lose his entire month's salary with such a stupid bet, but Corporal Dickhead simply did not care. He waved his hand, and quietly exited the room. Seeing his confidence, the Ponytail comments that Corporal Dickhead is even crazier than himself. And I don't blame him either, because looking at the betting sheet, we see that Corporal Kim wagered that Minjun will become a sergeant within a single month. The scene then switches to the gym, where a bunch of weirdly colored dumbbells are placed neatly on their racks. Weighted bars are propped up on their stands. And a big sign on the wall warns us that using the equipment made out of redstone is prohibited, unless you have someone to spot you. I guess that explains the weird color of the equipment. And that would also explain why our boy is using the heaviest redstone bar by himself to do some squats. I mean, we all know that he doesn't really need a spotter. As he gets up with the bar, we get to witness the incredible buff body that he's always hiding under his unassuming clothes. I don't know about the accuracy of this anatomy, but I'm Loki drooling over his muscles. His back isn't the only thing he has to show either, my man has the arms of a goliath. After a good few sets of dumbbell curls, he lets go of the incredibly heavy red stone weights to look at his gains. Although the special equipment is making him bulk up, our boy has been using these weights regularly, but his stats haven't increased all that much. In times like these, he can't help but remember the world of Iskard, where he had access to all his OP skills, and he could increase the level of his skills by increasing his stats. If he had such a skill in this world, Minjun is sure that he would be nothing less than a Super Saiyan. But for now, he has to put up with the slow increase rate of his stats. But this is when a notification window pops up, and our hero lays his eyes upon something really interesting. A new E-ranked skill called Power has been created, and it has immediately increased his strength stat by 5 points. It looks like a really crappy and basic skill at first, but Minjun is just happy to gain something new, because he can rank it up with time anyway. Meanwhile, the private who was sent to fetch him has arrived at the door. He salutes the corporal with a stiff and nervous expression, 
and relays the information that the platoon commander is looking for him in his office. Minjun, drunk with the reward of just unlocking a new skill, looks back with his sparkly eyes, thanking the private and agreeing to see the commander. There's nothing else for the private to say here, but he's left truly confused at Minjun's weird-as-fuck expression. While our boy happily gets dressed to go and see the commander, the poor private is left wondering if everyone in the base has gone crazy without him knowing. The next thing we know, we find ourselves at the administrative office in the main building, where Kim Minjun walks in, saluting the platoon commander and confirming that he's here to see him as requested. The platoon commander sees our hero and waves his hand with excitement, I guess he was looking forward to their meeting. As Minjun comes closer, the commander gets up from his seat, letting him know that it wasn't anything serious, and they can continue the conversation in the counseling office. As he points towards the counseling office where they're headed, he asks Minjun about his life as a corporal, because it has already been a week since he attained his new rank. Minjun replies that he's having a great time, and congratulates the platoon commander on his advancement as well. That puts a sparkly smile on the commander's face, because I guess he was pretty excited about the whole thing. He takes the compliment, and replies that his advancement was only thanks to Minjun, because he took care of that incident with the middle bats. As the two take their seats, the commander once again thanks our boy for his excellent contributions, and Minjun replies that he only performed his duties. The platoon commander then hands out the file he had been holding this entire time, and explains that this was the reason he called Minjun to the office. As the platoon commander explains, this was something given out to Minjun by the battalion commander, who acknowledged his achievements regarding the incident with the middle bats, and also the fact that he obtained a perfect score on his advancement exam. We see that the file was actually an award of excellence for our hero. The platoon commander apologizes for giving it out so casually, but assures him that this award will definitely go down as a big achievement in Minjun's military life. Hearing that, our boy's ears perk up once again. If he can rack up such achievements, he asks with his signature sparkling eyes if they can be used to grant him further exceptions. Of course, the platoon commander isn't sure of that either. He tells the new corporal that such awards aren't easy to obtain, and very few people have been able to obtain them as early as Minjun. Not to mention, even fewer people have actually managed to get multiple awards of excellence. But none of that can discourage our excited puppy. Instead, he asks his senior that if he can get 10 of these rewards, will he be able to advance to the next rank faster? He keeps making up some fantasy scenarios in his mind on how he can get even more time to play his favorite games, and the commander is just sitting there silently, wondering if Minjun thinks that these awards are given out like coupon codes for Amazon. Anyway, a few days pass by, and we're now standing in front of an underpass where a dungeon gate is open, and the commanders are briefing the units about their mission. The platoon commander explains that their platoon has been assigned to clear this dungeon, and we see a lot of familiar faces while he further entails that if everyone completes their job like they were trained, he is confident that everyone will walk out of the dungeon without any injuries. He lets everyone know that they should already be familiar with the type of dungeon they're about to enter, while Sergeant First Class Kim Minji puts down a crate of necessary supplies for all units. Everyone from the platoon makes a disgusted as fuck face as they lay their eyes upon the crate of supplies, and they do it for good reason. You see, as the platoon commander takes out a face mask from the crate, we get to know that the dungeon they're about to enter is called the Monster Rat Nest. In other words, the literal sewers. Soon after, we find ourselves inside the sewer dungeon, where the units are splashing through the disgusting and toxic waters. At the back, we have our trio of Corporal Kim Minjun, Corporal Ponytail, and our best friend, Private First Class Lee Dongjin. As the three complain about the rotting stench of these sewers, we see that Sergeant Lee and the second platoon commander Kim Chialman are the ones in the lead. While Sergeant First Class Kim Minji and the privates follow our main group from behind, let me tell you a little bit about this place. You see, the monster rat nest dungeon, that's referred to as the sewers inside the Hunter Corps, isn't categorized as highly dangerous. However, it usually spawns more than 200 monster rats, and the narrow environment of the tunnels restricts the usage of firearms, which makes it a fairly complicated dungeon. Sergeant Lee puts up his fist to signal to the platoon commander, letting him know that they're about to step foot into dangerous territory. The commander passes on the warning to Lee Dongjin and the people behind him, and we see that our group now stands in a rather open clearing inside the dungeon. Sergeant Lee points out that this open area has only two entrances, so they should lure the monsters to this place to wipe them out. As you can see from this little mini-map, the platoon has entered from the left, and the only other entrance to the area is directly in the opposite direction. The platoon commander agrees Sergeant Lee's plan, and signals the remaining units to start preparing the bait. We get an aerial view of the platoon, as we see someone approaching the commander with the crate that contains the bait to lure out the monsters. The man who brought the crate is a private first class from the same platoon and the mere stench oozing out from the close box is making Corporal Ponytail uncomfortable. I don't blame him either, because the dungeon's disgusting odor, coupled with the special gas masks from the Hunter Corps, makes an environment where the hunters can't perform to their full potential. 
It also doesn't help that while the platoon commander tries to take out the bait, the crate is literally oozing with an ominous and disgusting feeling. And as it turns out, the bait was actually a rotting banana, which stinks worse than the farts of that one disgusting uncle in all your social gatherings. The thing is actually so bad that the author had to censor it for your viewing pleasure. Kim and June and Corporal Ponytail reel from the sight of that bait, as Ponytail comments that it's no wonder the rat monsters smell so horrible. If they only eat disgusting shit like this, it wouldn't be possible for them to smell any better. In any case, upon the commands of the platoon commander, everyone starts moving to plant the baits in every corner of the cave. But this is when something odd catches the commander's attention. As he steps forward towards a corner, his foot comes into contact with an ominous pile of bones. The commander reels back from the shock when his eyes witness the next scene, which truly makes him confused. Not only was the entire floor covered in bones, there was something odd about the bones themselves. You see, upon a close look, you can tell that these bones actually belong to the monster rats that they have come here to exterminate in the first place. When the platoon commander notices the same, and bends over to inspect the scene, Purple Hair yells out that a swarm of monster rats is coming their way from the second entrance. Seeing the battle approaching, the platoon commander quickly changes priorities to command all his units to assume their respective formations. The shield unit steps forward in unison to guard the attack unit from any ambush. We see that Sergeant First Class Kim Minji is the one handling the shield bros, and the platoon commander is giving out orders to the attacking hunters who will directly face the enemies. Corporal Ponytail and Purple Hair start betting with each other on who will kill the most monsters, and I'm really starting to feel like these two have an addiction. Sergeant Lee warns the idiots to not let their guards down, but Ponytail ignores the warning and asks him to join them on the bed as well. Strangely enough, that puts a smile on Sergeant Lee's face, because the idiot energy is a good source to lighten up the mood in such a tense situation. Meanwhile, Minjun is only focused on the task ahead. The crappy bananas seem to have worked better than I expected, because the monster rats literally start pouring out in hordes from the other end of the cave. The platoon commander takes out his sword and orders all units to hold the defense line and to not break the formation at any cost. That means the soldiers will engage the monsters in their current standing positions, and as the rats leap out with their gnarly claws, Minjun is finally feeling excited to get in on the action. Purple Hair managed to slice off the head of a monster rat in a single strike, and Ponytail manages to kill off three at once with his dual wielding weapons. Sergeant Lee is always a cut above the rest, and easily manages to incapacitate his side of the monsters with his iron knuckles. Minjun is having fun observing these people from the sidelines, probably making a tier list of reliable comrades in his head. Two more people stand out from the rest, and these are the sergeants of the second platoon. One of them is Sergeant Kim Jiangti with his war hammer, and the other is Sergeant Cho Tiwook with his exceptional skill in dual wielding katanas. Surprisingly, even the previously known Corporal Dickhead is pulling his weight excellently by handling several monsters at once. While Kim was paying special attention to the corporal who had previously shown rather pathetic attempts to bully him, he gets jumped by a gang of three skeevers. However, these puny monsters aren't even worth our hero's attention, as he keeps looking away, but somehow still manages to club the rats exactly in the face. In fact, the single swing of his club was so fast and powerful that all three buddies ended up losing their heads in the blink of an eye. Despite all of this, some monster rats were managing to slip under the feet of the fighting soldiers. But of course, there's a last line of defense, waiting to intercept these pesky little intruders. Sergeant First Class Kim Minji and the platoon commander himself are ones handling the outliers. And as long as they stand, none of these monsters will manage to lay their claws on the shield bros who are watching the other entrance. As you would guess, these guys haven't escaped Minjun's eyes either, and while he continues to play whack-a-mole with his monsters, he notes that the wide area that the two top-ranking officers of the platoon are covering is the testament to the fact that you can't advance in rank unless you have the ability. But then, he finally lays his eyes upon the last man who keeps surprising him on multiple occasions. This man is slicing off the rats with his weird cross-pattern swordsmanship, and he's none other than our homie, Lee Dongjin. Minjun had been taking special care of Dongjin for a while now, and seeing the results of his friend's special training put a smile on his face. He's not the only one to notice the improvements in Lee Dongjin either, Sergeant Lee is also smiling from the back after seeing his incredible potential. As someone calls for extra hands on their side, Dongjin is the one to answer their call, and right behind him, Corporal Purple Hair and Dickhead are still busy chopping up the rats. After slicing off the monster, Corporal Dickhead takes a moment to stare blankly in the direction of our hero and Dongjin, probably wondering if Minjun can make him stronger as well. However, this is not the time to be thinking about such unrelated stuff, so he swings his sword to wipe the blood off his weapon and gets ready to face the remaining enemies. And just as the rat corpses were piling up in the middle, the shield bros notice something going horribly wrong in the rear. It's a fresh horde of the monster rats, and they're coming from the rear entrance which the shield bros were stationed to cover. 
the platoon commander hears the signal from the privates and warns everyone to get ready for monster wave number two. He then immediately takes action and commands the first and fourth squads to deal with the monsters in the rear, while simultaneously ordering the privates to back off using their shields and to not engage in battle by themselves. The corporals of the fourth squad arrive for help quickly and promptly get busy chopping up the rat bastards with their various melee weapons. After a lot of slicing and dicing, and a swarm of dead monster rats on the floor, some of the soldiers start taking it easy, as they notice that the enemies have almost completely been wiped out. However, our boy Minjun notices something odd. His senses focus on a surge of demonic energy in the air, and he immediately starts looking around to confirm his suspicions. He didn't notice anything earlier due to the gas masks, but as he pays more attention, he can definitely sense a lot of demonic energy, and it can all be traced to a mound under Corporal Dickhead's feet. And just as Minjun notices that, the mound in question starts to break up. Our hero warns the soldier that a terrible monster is about to emerge from the ground, and as Corporal Dickhead looks below his feet, he knows he's fucked. The entire ground blows up in a massive column of dust and debris, and all the soldiers around the area fall backwards from the force of the impact. The platoon commander almost loses his shit when he witnesses the thing that emerges from the ground. This thing is an enormous mutated rat, and its existence in this dungeon would classify it as an irregular monster. Apart from the signature front teeth of a rat, this anomaly also has a pair of huge fangs on the side, and an extra pair of eyes that's glowing with an ominous purple color. It finally clicks with the platoon commander that the monster rat bones he saw earlier must be the doing of this irregular, it must be feeding on other monsters to fill its stomach. But while his assessment of the situation is important, a much bigger problem lie bare in front of the commander. The humongous mutated rat is staring down at its prey, and the food in question is none other than Corporal Dickhead, who was unlucky enough to get knocked over by the impact when the monster emerged. The creature is baring its teeth at the corporal, and he's currently too defenseless to do anything about it. And you can't blame him either, because even the platoon commander is paralyzed with fear after looking at the unholy creation in front of him. He wants to help the corporal, but his body is frozen in place. Sergeant First Class Kim Minji is also too far away to help in time, so the only thing he can do is shout at Corporal Dickhead to get up and run. Unfortunately for everyone, this man has totally soiled his pants, and running is the last thing his noodled legs are currently able to do. There's no time for him to take any action either, because the irregular monster has finally decided to swing down at him with its razor-sharp claws. Thinking that his life have come to an end, the corporal tries to shield himself one last time by putting up his hands and closing his eyes. You would think that Kim Min Joon would come to save the day, but the one who approaches the scene first is someone with a sword. The irregular rat's claw comes down on the soldier like a meteor, and although the helping soldier manages to deflect the blow, his own weapon gets knocked out from his hand. As the sword flies behind him, we see that the soldier who came to help was Lee Dongjin, and he's now holding firmly onto the shoulder of the corporal. Corporal Dickhead looks back at Dongjin in disbelief, still thinking about the fact that he's not dead. However, Dongjin rushes him to get up and start running before the monster attacks again. And just as they feared, the spawn of hell is now angry, shrieking out waves of terror with its abnormally large body. But while the platoon commander was shouting and fearing for the life of his men, it was finally time for our boy Minjun to jump into the field. With his shield in his hand, the hero jumps high up into the air to mount the back of the monster, while the same monster is busy cornering its prey on the ground. Kim Minjun draws back his shield, preparing to unleash a devastating shield bash on his enemy. However, he takes one last look at the rat before attacking. He notes the defocused eyes of the monster and the exceptional fearlessness in its actions. There is no longer any doubt in his mind that this creature is possessed by the demonic energy. And since that much is clear, he turns himself into a literal human comet, pummeling down the face of the monster into the ground. Li Dongjin and Corporal Dickhead jump back from the impact, shielding their eyes to protect themselves from any oncoming shrapnel. And then, out from the dust emerges a thumbs up of excellence. It's our boy Minjun, and the thumbs up is signaled towards Li Dongjin for his valiant effort in protecting his comrade, without any fear for his own life. After seeing Kim Minjun arrive on the scene, Dongjin lets out a smile of relief, he knows that his homie will take care of the rest. So, he takes the corporal and rushes back to the defense line, where the platoon commander is shouting for Minjun to fall back, and Kim Minji is commanding the remaining corporals to get into formation. Meanwhile, Minjun is simply facing forward at the enemy. The irregular monster is up and about once again, bearing its disgusting fangs at the latest attacker. It unleashes an attack filled with demonic energy at our boy, and as we see from the aerial view, a shockwave of the purple energy starts traveling in all directions. This causes the stalactites on the ceiling to break and fall, and the platoon commander finds himself surrounded by a rain of rocks. All the dust knocked up by the stalactites act as a smoke screen for Minjun, who thanks the monster for helping him conceal the fight from the others. The gigantic monster is now going for a claw attack at our hero, almost feeling like it's ripping through the dimension itself. 
However, its opponent is a literal god amongst men, and we see his eyes sparkle with his own brand of demonic energy. Minjun can afford to go wild now, since the monster already went through the trouble of providing him with a smoke screen. In the very next moment, he shoots forth like a bullet, striking the monster rat in the leg, breaking it completely. He follows up that attack with a shield rush, and manages to bash the monster with such immense force that it actually gets knocked back at supersonic speed. But it's still not over, as Minjun abandons his shield and rushes straight towards the monster to deal the finishing blows. He ends up unleashing a barrage of superhuman fist strike, and the poor monster can do nothing but screech in agony. After a few seconds, he stops his punch in midair to look at the condition of the monster. And needless to say, this poor bastard couldn't be any more dead. Its muscles have caved in where the punch has landed, pieces of its ears are missing, and almost all of its teeth are gone. Seeing that, Minjun opens up his fist and begins harvesting the demonic energy of the monster. The energy leaves the corpse in waves and gathers on our hero's hand in the shape of a cackling ball, fueling him with even more power. As all the remaining energy gets sucked out of the rat, its eyes slowly start to lose the purple glow that once made it scary. And when that is over, a notification window pops up, letting our hero know that his demonic energy stat has increased by one level. Kim and Jun didn't expect this creature to hold so much demonic energy. So, as a gesture of politeness, he takes out his metal bat and thanks the monster rat for its awesome loot, before proceeding to beat it to a pulp. I guess our boy will keep getting stronger by the day, and there's nothing anyone can do to stop it. But I'm still curious to see whether his power was witnessed by anyone else fight inside the sewer dungeon was now over, and we stand outside at the base where the army is guarding the entrance. The boys from the second platoon are exhausted, and catching their breaths on the road until it's time for them to head home. Looks like Purple Hair managed to pull ahead of Ponytail in their bet, so he keeps telling him to admit his defeat. There's nothing for him to refute here, so Ponytail swallows the loss, but we all know these two idiots will bet on something again. Now we take a look at the platoon commander, who's on phone with the HQ, briefing them about the situation. He explains how they were attacked by an irregular monster and how all squads have managed to escape safely. He also confirms that there was only one such monster in the dungeon, and looks over at our boy Minjun as he tells the HQ that the monster was defeated by a member of his platoon. Meanwhile, our hero was busy smelling the stink on his clothes, kind of like how you can't help but smell your hand after scratching your balls. But of course, you always regret your decision later, and Minjun's reaction is no different. At least the commander is being more useful and requesting for reinforcement task force in the meantime. While Minjun tries to dust off the stink from his uniform, someone approaches him to complain that they never find anything normal on the front lines. It turns out to be Ponytail, and as he takes a seat on the ground, he just wants to thank our boy for saving everyone's ass inside the dungeon. He even mentions how he was frozen in fear when he saw the irregular monster. Minjun decides to turn polite for once and says that he did nothing more than his duty. In fact, he apologizes for jumping ahead without any orders from his superiors. But as Ponytail remembers the monstrosity that rose in front of them, he knows that orders wouldn't matter in such an obvious state of emergency. He thanks Minjun once again for taking action, because if he hadn't, Corporal Dickhead and Dongjin would have died by the hands of that creature. Right now, Corporal Ponytail is worried about our hero instead. He asks him if he's alright and whether he got hurt during the fight. Minjun doesn't say anything, but simply nods his head to confirm that he's okay. His expression tells us that he's glad to see that someone cares about his safety. But then, someone else asks him the same question, wondering if he's really not injured at all. This time, it's the platoon commander himself, and the seriousness on his face is a clear sign that he's starting to grow suspicious of Minjun. Still, our boy shows no signs of nervousness and replies that he doesn't have a single scratch on his body, at which, even Ponytail wonders if the dude is even human. The commander lets out a huge sigh while holding his head and orders Minjun to meet him in his office when they head back to base. Looks like he has a lot of questions, but very little answers. Minjun finds it odd that the commander would need to talk to him, but he agrees to the orders anyway. Even when he was walking back towards his truck, Ponytail noted that the commander wasn't looking very happy. Just as we see him holding his head in confusement, Kim Minji can be heard on the phone right behind him. After getting off the phone, he informs the commander that all members of the platoon have only suffered minor injuries. Dongjin has also completed his examination and is headed back to the camp. The commander's face finally starts to lighten up when he hears that even the dickhead corporal only suffered minor bruises on his head and will be able to join the camp by tomorrow. The commander lets out a huge sigh of relief and Sergeant First Class taps his shoulder to assure him that everything is fine. He then turns around on his feet in an attention stance and shouts the final command to all squads. He lets them know that due to unforeseen circumstances, they will finish their attempts to clear the dungeon for today. He then orders everyone to check their equipment and get ready to head back, and all units shout yes to the command. 
We now find ourselves back at the administrative office in the main building of the camp, where Minjun is sitting next to the commander, as the commander states that he called him here because of his report. He wants Minjun to write down in detail how he defeated the monster, and he will then submit the report to his superiors. Our boy takes up the pen and paper, but he doesn't really know what to write on it. I mean, he tried to beat the thing with his shield, but since that didn't kill it, he just finished it off with his fist. But if he writes something like that, he can't really imagine if the people at the HQ would even believe him in the first place. The commander notices his hesitation in the matter and puts down his bottle of five-hour energy on the table. He couldn't see clearly because his vision was obstructed. But there's something he really wants to know about the fight, so he asks Minjun directly. With a bead of sweat rolling down his face, he asks our hero if he defeated the monster with just his bare fists. Minjun's knuckles were already bruised up a little from the last fight, and his hand twitched when the commander called him out. He was caught in the action, and our boy isn't exactly a good liar, so, instead of making up an elaborate story, he just admits that he had to use his fists because he couldn't really think of anything else in the heat of the moment. His words make the commander lose the light in his eyes, as he blankly asks Minjun to reveal his stats. As casual as ever, our hero reveals that his strength stat is 65, whereas his agility stat is a solid 60. Obviously, that makes the platoon commander flinch in surprise. Even as a first lieutenant, his stats are only 40, which are already above average. But somehow, a seemingly regular soldier in front of him claims to have both of his strength and agility stats above 60. The commander falls back on his chair to look at the ceiling, when he realizes that Minjun's stats are more than double than that of an average sergeant. He lets out a sigh when he thinks that Minjun could have been a part of the Hunter Military Academy, especially when he has such exceptional stats. But when he looks at the innocent face of our hero again, he remembers that Minjun is supposedly a high school dropout, which would complicate his enrollment into a prestigious academy, even if his talents were exceptional. Still, the commander plays his part of a responsible superior and informs our hero that if he ever plans on becoming an executive, he should take the GED tests to go to university. He further entails that once Minjun becomes a sergeant, he will be able to take up some online programs, which would help him prepare for the exams. But as you can already see from Minjun's face, he's not too keen about the idea. He scratches his cheeks in awkwardness and admits to the commander that he has never liked studying. If he can rank up with just his achievements, that alone is enough to satisfy him. Hearing that, the commander lets out a pleasant exhale. He gets comfortable in his chair and tells Minjun that he won't force him if he's not comfortable. But if he ever changes his mind, he would always let him know. In the end, I guess he's happy to know that Minjun would be staying in his platoon. It's already nighttime at the base, and the commander tells our boy that he will fill out the report on his own, ordering him to head back and get some rest. Minjun thanks the commander and opens the door to get ready to leave. But before that, the commander has one last thing on his mind. He stares at his cap, which bears the insignia of the first lieutenant, and realizes the rank difference between himself and a corporal. So, he stops Minjun one last time before he exits the room. He tells him that if it weren't for him, it's possible that the entire platoon would have been wiped out by that monster. He remembers the horror of facing that creature in front of him and mentions how he was frozen solid, not able to do anything. In the end, he thanks Minjun from the bottom of his heart. As his direct superior, he felt that he should be the one to acknowledge his achievement first. Once again, Kim Minjun smiles at Commander and humbly replies that he only did what he had to do. That puts a big smile on the Commander's face. He couldn't be happier to have someone so reliable under his command. But of course, as our boy walks out of the office, we know that he's not such a simple person. It's true that he only did what he felt like doing, but the reason behind his actions wasn't the safety of his comrades. In fact, his only real priority was to obtain the demonic energy and to build up his achievements so he can keep ranking up. And speaking of his comrades, he comes across an unexpected face which kills his excitement. Kim Minjun, Lee Dongjin, and Corporal Dick had stand face to face in the hallway, and we see that the former bully is still bandaged up after his encounter in the dungeon. It seems like the corporal wants to join Lee Dongjin's special training program under our hero's guidance, but Minjun doesn't look the least bit happy to hear that. On the other hand, the corporal is literally sweating like a pig, unable to hide his embarrassment, but still willing to become our hero's student. As Dongjin stands nervously next to the two, Minjun starts asking a bunch of questions. Firstly, he's confused how the dickhead even came to know about the special training. And secondly, as he points his finger directly at the former bully, he wants to know why he wants to train with them when he hasn't even recovered from his injuries. The bully thinks back to the time in the sewer dungeon, where Dongjin was fighting unlike ever before. He had an unwavering resolve in his eyes, and he showed no hesitation in the face of danger. Lastly, he was the only one who came to save him from the monster's attack, when everyone else was frozen with fear. Given all of that, the bully nervously replies that Lee Dongjin has grown a lot in a short period of time, and it must be thanks to Minjun's special training. He tries to be more honest, but his pride as the former bully won't let him. 
the dude can't even look our hero in the eyes when he says that he wants to join their training to become stronger. It's taking him a lot of courage to even voice these words, but at least his heart is in the right place. Now, we tend to forget because Minjun has been acting nice most of the time, but our hero is a natural-born bully. Even right now, he's having a really hard time holding back his amusement. In the end, we can see his inner devil stand behind him as he tells the corporal that he would never accept him so easily. With a wicked smile on his face, he actually calls the corporal by his full name, Kim Guangshik, and lets him know that there is a certain order of doing such things. Guangshik knows exactly what Minjun wants, but he's too embarrassed to say the words. But after a moment, the apologetic corporal finally decides to swallow his pride for the sake of getting stronger. He bows down in front of Dongjin, aggressively thanking him for saving him in the dungeon and apologizing for bullying him previously. Of course, our boy couldn't be happier to see this, but Dongjin is starting to get nervous because he is a junior. The corporal finally becomes fully sincere and apologizes once again for all his previous actions. He states that he is serious about training alongside Dongjin and reveals that he would like to become a non-commissioned officer due to some personal circumstances. Since Dongjin is such a sympathizing homie, he turns to Minjun, telling him that he doesn't mind if the corporal joins them in their training. But of course, Minjun doesn't share the same feelings. He stays silent for a while, which starts to confuse Dongjin. And then, he finally opens his mouth in an ominous fashion. He replies that he's not fine with taking in the corporal, which comes as a surprise to both men. Wangshik feels dejected, but he understands that Minjun wouldn't be comfortable around him due to his past actions. So, he just thanks the two for saving his life in the dungeon, and promises to never bother them again. He then turns around to leave with his slumped shoulders, the dude looks like he will never recover from his emotional damage. But then, our hero tells him that he can take him in, but only on one condition. That perks up the ears of the corporal, as he immediately turns his head to hear what Minjun has to say. But in all honesty, no one would have expected him to say the word pigeon. Of course, a big question mark dangles on the corporal's face, as he has no idea what Minjun means by pigeon. But the misunderstanding soon gets cleared when our hero makes the face of a divorced auntie whose only hobby is to ruin others' marriages and tells the corporal that he will accept him if he acts like a pigeon for an entire day. Guangshik's head starts boiling with rage when he hears that, but Minjun tells him that he would never accept him if he doesn't comply. So, as enraged and angry as he is, the corporal starts puckering up his lips. Every single vein on his head starts to pop out, his eyes start to twitch, and all of his teeth grind against each other as he starts to slowly coo like a pigeon. Dongjin can't believe how far the corporal is pushing himself for the sake of receiving this training, and right behind him, Minjun is starting to look like one of those smiling titans from Attack on Titan. I mean, just look at this dude's face in a close-up, he's not even bothering to hide his amusement. At this point, I'm not even sure he's supposed to be the hero or the villain. The scene then switches to a beautiful night, a fantasy-like cathedral, and two full moons in the starry sky. It's pretty clear that we're now in the world of Isgard. A creaky trolley is being pushed around, and a muscular man in a Spartan helmet is the one doing the pushing. We also see that the object on the trolley is covered in a cloth. He stops the trolley just before reaching a woman in white clothes, and when the said woman thanks the muscular Spartan for his good work, we get a proper look of her familiar back. This woman is none other than the saintess that we haven't seen since episode 1. The Spartan man just stares silently at the saintess, with his battle-hardened scars clearly visible under the moonlight. The saintess turns around, expecting to hear a response from the Spartan warrior. But when he says nothing, she asks him directly if there's something he wishes to say to her. Finally, the warrior speaks. He asks the saintess how long she's planning to keep doing this. Hearing that, she turns around to step forward in his direction. But instead of standing in front of him, she goes past him in the direction of the trolley that he brought here. Her face now fully visible under the bright light of the moon, and her features as holy and beautiful as one would expect from a person of such charisma. As she slides the curtain on the package to take a look inside, I think I speak for everyone when I say that we can all appreciate this elegant view. What peeks from behind the curtain is the purple glowing eyes of a beast, whose angry growls can audibly be heard to the saintess. She lets go of the curtain to conceal the monstrosity and lets out a small exhale of satisfaction. The concerned warrior once again tries to call out to the saintess, as if trying to convince her that she should reconsider her actions. But then, the holy maiden hold her left hand in front with her palm open, and on her command, a massive purple magic circle opens up in the middle of the room. The same magic circle that was once used to transport Kim and Jun back to Earth. The circle draws the abundant magic energy from the surrounding air, and the saintess speaks to the Spartan warrior once again. She says that she's sending another gift to the man who decided to leave them, but her next sentence makes the warrior reel back in surprise. Much like Minjun, this bitch knows how to change her expressions fast, and with the devil riding her shoulder, she proudly claims that there's no such thing as too much anger when it comes to revenge. So I guess now we know why our boy kept running into irregular monsters inside every dungeon.
I swear, I'm never letting a woman become my enemy. Now we head back to Earth, where a soldier is busy digging up dirt with a shovel. It turns out to be a sergeant from the 2nd platoon, and Purple Hair is right beside him. Even though they just came back from a dangerous dungeon, it looks like the army is already using them for manual labor to erect a new camp. When the sergeant finally loses energy and slumps over like some damsel in distress, Purple Hair makes an astute observation. He asks his superior if all these new camps actually help when it comes to fighting monsters. And when they look over at the other guys digging holes, even the orange hair sergeant is forced to wonder about the camp's functionality. But in the end, they're just soldiers who can't disobey orders, so it is really not up to them to decide the functionality of anything. And while they were discussing, a military vehicle makes a stop right in front of the squad. The sergeant and the purple hair corporal both drop their jaws when they see the vehicle, their faces tell us that they just received more work. And that is indeed the case, because the truck just brought in a material called steddle, which makes every single soldier sigh in unison. This steddle thing comes in the form of cubes, and the squad members immediately get busy transporting them, with Sergeant First Class Kim Minji handing them out from the truck. We see that Kim Minjoon and his student are also hard at work, transporting the steddle cubes to their designated locations. And now, it's turn for the newest member of the main roster to make his appearance. Corporal Guangshik is also on duty, and it feels like he has something to say. Out of nowhere, while obviously looking over encumbered with the weight of a single cube, he starts explaining why this material is called Steddle in the first place. According to him, Steddle is a nickname given by the soldiers, because they're not sure whether it's made out of stone or metal. This unassuming looking cube is extremely hard, and weighs a lot more than what it looks. Which is precisely why, the military uses this material to build their camps in different areas. Guangshik was just about to explain how this material is actually extracted from certain dungeons, but then he notices our boy Minjun right next to him. Of course, this fucker is casually carrying two of these cubes on his shoulders, and they might as well feel like paper to him. Seeing one cube on his right shoulder, and another one sitting on his left, the corporal is left stunned. But he should know better that anything is possible when it comes to Minjun. Realizing the same, the sergeant gives up on figuring out his unusual friend, and whispers to himself that he just wanted to explain a few things in case anyone was curious. I have a feeling that he'd be doing a lot of explaining in the future as well. In any case, the labor-intensive work of the soldiers continues, and each played their parts in transporting the special material to the camp. Minjun was sometimes seen carrying four cubes at once, which definitely surprised the others, but we're already past that point. When the truck gets emptied out, Kim Minji commands everyone to take a 10-minute break before starting again. As the tired soldiers make themselves comfortable on the road, Sergeant First Class Kim Minji approaches the platoon commander. He reports that he heard something unusual when he went to pick up the materials at the division headquarters, which immediately grabs the commander's attention. According to what Minji has heard, it would appear that a tin can dungeon has appeared somewhere in their area. As soon as the soldiers hear that, they all start losing their shit immediately. It almost feels as if they heard about the existence of a taboo. They all want to confirm that they hear correctly and start calling out to Kim Minji. All of the corporals and sergeants look scared and almost start crying out of desperation. They even start clinging to Kim Minji, begging him to let them sit out on the next raid. It looks like these guys are tired and would rather not deal with anything more troublesome. However, Minji tells them that they're still investigating the matter. Seeing the whole commotion, our hero gets confused about what's happening. Corporal Guangshik notices his confusion from across the road, and the smug look on his face tells me that he's about to start another one of his random explanations. And just as we get a zoom in on his face, his annoying chuckle confirms all of my suspicions. According to Guangshik's monologue, the tin can dungeons are quite special. Hunters refer to them as such when they meet certain criteria. Firstly, such dungeons are larger than normal. Secondly, the number and variety of monsters within these dungeons are above average. Thirdly, they neither have bosses, nor any high-risk monsters inside. When all of these conditions are met, the resulting dungeon is called the Tin Can Dungeon. They are the perfect place for hunters to accumulate real battle experience, so they're often used as locations for divisional training within the military. In fact, this process has a name of its own, and according to Guangshik, it's called the Hunter Field Maneuvers. Now we all know about the importance of his explanation, but our boy Minjun is simply confused about who the corporal keeps talking to. One more look at Guangshik's empty face, and I'm telling you right now that he has officially become one of those explanation characters in Man Was. And it looks like he has realized this too, as he looks to the side and whispers that he just felt like saying shit because someone might be curious. I guess he has already accepted his new life. In any case, Minjun is a bit curious to know about the hunter field maneuvers. But when he turns to the side, the desperation of other sergeants in front of Kim Minji makes him feel like he might not need that training anyway. As Minji was just about to lose his patience with these idiots, the platoon commander stated that they don't have the option to skip this training. Not to mention, it's the perfect opportunity for the soldiers to build up their accomplishments. 
and of course, the word accomplishment is sure to get our boy's attention right away. He thinks about all the awards of excellence he might be able to stack up by participating in such trainings, and suddenly, he's the happiest man on the planet. He feels glad that he decided to join the front lines, because this gives him the best opportunity to stack all of his achievements. But just as he was feeling excited, he noticed a creepy face, looking directly at him from inside his shadow. Minjun's excitement quickly faded to nothing, and he asked his tiny summon what the fuck it's doing here. Tiny did nothing but smile back with cuteness, and our hero stepped foot on his face to eliminate his cuteness. He squats over the little bugger to conceal its presence, and looks over at the others to check if anyone noticed. Thankfully, they were still busy whining about the training. Minjun let out a sigh of relief that no one noticed Tiny, then proceeds to place his hand on the shadow to ask why it came to see him. Thanks to the powers of his shadow summon, all the information start flowing into him at once. He sees the image of two executives of the Hunter Corps walking inside a hallway, talking about requesting reinforcements because an irregular monster has been sighted. The woman informs the man that the request was sent by the investigative team, and it was regarding the new dungeon that appeared in Yonggu. The man asks if the dungeon has appeared in one of the military-operated areas, and the woman replies in affirmation. We can see from the cap in her hand that she holds the rank of a major. She entails that two members of the investigative team lost consciousness inside the dungeon, which is a phenomenon that has only made its appearance recently. In her opinion, they might need to clear out this dungeon as soon as possible. The man, whose face and rank remains unknown, gives no heed to the warning of the major. He commands her to let the regular soldiers handle the new dungeon, and to allocate all of their forces for the dungeons located in their own area instead. And of course, the major accepts the orders as they come. That ends the stream of information from Tiny, and Minjun comes back to reality. He looks down at his little friend with a smile on his face, and Tiny over here is looking hella cute as ever. But of course, Minjun steps on him anyway. He stands tall over the struggling minion with an ominous smile, and says to himself that he's going to take a day off soon. It would seem that he's planning to enter the dungeon on his own, but we already know that the Saintess has prepared for him another surprise. The story continues with a bright sunny morning in a normal residential area. Our boy was busy packing some stuff for his vacation, that he applied in order to explore a rather peculiar dungeon. We see him putting on his hoodie, and his hunter core uniform can be seen in a paper bag on the floor. The boy zips up his clothes and gets ready to leave. But before stepping out of the apartment, he takes a look at his surroundings. His eyes focus on a family picture, where his platoon commander can be seen with an elderly couple, most likely his parents. Going back in time for a bit, the platoon commander was a bit pleased to see that our hero was trying to take a vacation, which is also why he overworked while transporting those steddles. He comments that Minjun is really something else, and our boy's eyes sparkle as he thanks the commander. I mean, it wasn't really a compliment, but the commander is more concerned that Minjun's previous apartment is in a restricted area, and he doesn't really have a place to stay. When asked about where he spent his last day off, our boy meekly replies that he just stayed inside a PC room. The commander had figured that to be the case, so he has an alternate option in mind. He gives Minjun a key to an apartment, where he asks him to spend his day off comfortably. He explains that the apartment belongs to his parents, but since they're away on some business, it's completely empty. Minjun feels that the commander is being overcourteous, so he tries to refuse the offer. But of course, the kind superior won't let that be the case. He sighs and takes out a paper from his pocket, which contains the address of the apartment. He entails that it's a bit further from the camp, but it's still a much better place to live than a PC room. Minjun takes a look at the address, and since it's actually quite close to where he wants to go, he feels like it's not a bad place to stay. In any case, the commander doesn't care if Minjun stays in the apartment or not, but he tells him to take the key with him anyway and have fun with his day off. Rather awkwardly, our boy ended up accepting the offer and guessed it means that he now has a place to stay. Meanwhile, the commander was back in his office, leaning back in his chair and letting out some big sighs. He gets up to look at a certain report, which seems to be the reason he was a bit worried in the first place. You see, this report is about our hero, which states clearly that his entire family has been missing. It's rather concerning for the commander, because a person of unknown origins and unlimited potential is always a cause for concern. Regardless, he chooses to believe in his instincts, and looks the other way, hoping that Minjun would be one of the good people. And now, we come back to the family picture, which our boy is still staring at. Zipping up his hoodie completely, he takes one more glance at the commander's family, probably reminiscing something about his past. However, it is now time to go, so he puts on his hood, and slowly exits the apartment, completely ready for the adventure ahead. After traveling for a bit, our hero gets off on a bus terminal, and resumes the rest of his journey on foot. While on his way to the dungeon, he reminds himself about the details of this mission. From what his little summon managed to gather, the dungeon is supposed to be open inside a deserted school in this area. Moreover, all units are advised to stay one kilometer away from the gate and control the civilians. 
As expected, the military barricades were soon in sight, and the troops were standing on guard to stop any civilians from proceeding further. Of course, our hero isn't a normal civilian, so you can see him sneaking off through the roofs above. After a few hops and some parker, he lands in an alleyway, completely behind the defense line of the military. He eventually finds himself behind an electric pole, seemingly staring at his target. And there it was, the special dungeon gate in its full glory. Since all units were ordered to maintain their distance, there was no other human in sight. Pulling down his hood even further and heading towards the dungeon, Minjun wonders about the kind of monster he will find inside. But he finds it a bit annoying that Tiny the Shadow Summon returned without completing its duty. It could have waited to identify the monster as well. In any case, as our boy calmly steps foot inside the cackling gate, he tells himself that he can simply choose to run if things get too dangerous. And then, a notification informs him that he has entered the dungeon. It's nighttime inside the dungeon's space, and you can see a lot of dead trees around. As usual, Minjun trudges through the terrain without a single care in the world. But as he passes through the forest, he notes that the area is quite humid. Eventually, he comes to a stop as his eyes lay upon something peculiar. He finds a broken sword on the ground, the likes of which the Hunter Corps units use very often. As he bends down to inspect the weapon, our hero wonders if a battle took place in this spot. But as he was staring, something felt odd. He could feel the presence of a creature trying to hide in the bushes, so he called out to it directly. Minjun openly told the creature to stop wasting its time and come out if it's hostile. And the next thing we know, a huge thing dangles over a pair of legs, and we can see our boy staring directly at it. Thank god it was just the cloth, I would have lost my shit if this was something else. In any case, the eyes of this creature glow ominously with the same purple energy that we always notice in other demonic monsters. It has a really huge and bulky build, and for a second, Minjun wonders if the creature is a goblin. He then takes a second guess, calling it a kobold, because goblins aren't usually so big. But whatever the creature is, its size is unusual for its species, which definitely puts our boy on guard as he gets up from the ground. He gets himself into a fighting stance, wondering how the investigative team managed to come alive after facing off such a monster. In the next instance, the massive creature leaps off the ground, and we can see him in the air, going directly for our hero. With a burst of the demon energy, the creature attempts a swipe attack at Minjun, which he dodges immediately. He takes this chance to go on the offensive, and aims a punch towards the monster. As always, the punch explodes in the face of the demonic bastard, with shockwaves of Minjun's energy scattering in all directions. However, as the flash of the impact dispersed, our boy laid his eyes upon a sight he hadn't experienced in a while. You see, the demonic creature was not only unharmed, but it smiled in the face of its enemy. But as soon as it opened its mouth to bite his hand, our hero shifted gears, knocking up the creature with an explosive kick to its face. The impact of the kick was so high that the monster was lifted a foot off the ground. With the agility of a cat, Minjun managed to land on his feet after the attack, keenly observing the impact on his target. And as it turns out, the monster was still fine, and it actually managed to absorb the impact from the kick as well. This is quite possibly the sturdiest opponent that we've seen our hero fight. The creature is not only sturdy, but also pretty reckless as it continues to swipe its claws at our hero. Minjun dodges the attack once again, but this time, you can tell from the smirk on his face that he prepared something extra. The creature's leg starts getting sucked into the ground where our hero was previously standing, and a notification informs us that he has used the D-rank corruption skill on the ground. It turned the solid earth into quicksand, and the monster's leg kept getting sucked inside. This was the perfect time to resume the attack, so our hero started rushing straight towards the demonic creature with his superhuman speed. He followed up the dash with an onslaught of powerful blows, each landing on different parts of the monster's face. Even while pummeling his enemy to death, Minjun was impressed by the monster's tenacity, it wasn't even trying to block. And then, as one more punch goes for the creature's side, a bluish hue lights up in the shadows. It swiftly blocks our hero's attack, which is the first time the monster tried to defend himself since the start of their fight. As the counter swipe reaches for our hero's face, his eyes get fixed on the blue light from before. As expected, something is definitely shining at the sight of this weird troll-like monster. But in his fixation, Minjun lets down his guard and gets rocket launched by the swipe. As always, he manages to land on his feet, and the monster is just growling without moving from its place. This is the first time an attack has landed on Minjun since his return to Earth, and the fucker managed to rip up his brand new hoodie. Now that things have gotten this far, our boy looks at the broken katana again, and equips himself with the weapon. Pulling back his hoodie and getting up from the ground, he looks at the monster to comment that his enemies on Earth so far have been nothing better than ants. However, he calls the troll a rhinoceros beetle, which is probably the highest praise it has given to any monster. The angry creature screeches at the top of his lungs, his ugly nose covering his entire mouth. And right away, it comes swinging at our hero with yet another powerful swipe of his massive hand. It goes without saying that the monster's jaw remained open, and its eyes started to show a hint of fear. 
when our hero not only didn't budge from its attack, but looked him dead in the face, commenting that a bug is still nothing more than a fucking bug. Minjun was now pissed at the monster, too pissed at it to give it a peaceful end. And with veins popping up on his face, he stabs the creature's side with his broken sword, demanding it to pay him back for his new clothes. Finally, the troll bastard had a reaction, and it opened its mouth wide to screech in absolute pain and agony. But our boy wasn't done with it, so he winds up another heel kick to smash the monster's head. His kick came down with lightning speed, and the effects of the attack made his eyes glow in adorable rage. However, the aftermath of the attack wasn't quite so adorable, as the troll was now a bloody mess, and Minjun stood on its smashed head as the victor. Naturally, the next step was to absorb all of its demonic energy, and just as usual, it started to gather in our boy's hand as a ball of purple lightning. After that, we're bombarded by a wall of notifications, each notifying our hero that his demonic energy stat has increased even further. Eventually, another notification informs us that since the demonic energy has reached a certain threshold, Minjun has the Dark Arrow skill. After the unlocking of the Dark Arrow, his Nightwalker skill gets enhanced, and a new skill called Basic Swordsmanship is added into his arsenal. Excited by such plentiful rewards, Minjun gets curious and calls out to the status window to see his current stats. As the status window comes out, we get to see all the newly added skills in his information. Upon further inspecting the skills, we find out that Dark Arrow is a skill that uses demonic energy to shoot an intangible projectile. On the other hand, basic swordsmanship can slightly increase our boy's proficiency with swords. At the moment, both of these skills are ranked E. Minjun absolutely loves the fact that he has now unlocked a long-range attack option, but he's a bit confused why basic swordsmanship was added. But then, he remembers that he used the broken sword to defeat the monster and was lucky enough to land a critical hit. But that brings him back to the monster, which is down to the ground, with the sword still lodged in its side. As he takes out the weapon, he wonders if the creature was already wounded before it encountered him. He's also curious about the item which was shining inside the monster earlier, so he puts his hand in the wound to check it out. In a rather brutish way, he pulls the hand out of the monster, making a lot of blood gush out. He looks back to take a peek at the item he found, and inside his bloodied hand, the thing that he finds is a little peculiar. It seems to be a piece of metal, with very sharp edges that are designed to penetrate deep. Minjun figures the metal to either be an arrowhead, or a chipped off piece of sword, and he's confused if this was the doing of the investigative team who explored this dungeon earlier. However, upon a closer inspection, the piece of metal looks a bit familiar to our hero. But there's no time for him to examine it any further, because a whole group of trolls have appeared behind him. It's not a bad thing for our hero, because he was already quite eager to try out his new skills. So, he gets up and taunts the monsters to bring on the fight. Naturally, the dick-nosed bastards get irritated, but we can see from their eyes that these guys are not possessed by the demonic energy. Not that it matters to Minjun, because as he summons his energy to create the dark arrows, he knows that he's going to blast some monsters anyway. It is finally time to witness the power of a proper E-rank offensive skill, and our boy has never been more ready. The arrows shoot out from both his hands, each traveling an unpredictable trajectory, but heading towards their target nonetheless. Each arrow manages to take down Brian and Steve, while John just stands scared in the middle. Minjun's mission inside the dungeon is already finished, but he doesn't see any harm in sticking around to have some more fun. However, what's considered fun for Minjun is a nightmare for John, and he knows that he's royally fucked. Our boy will make sure to not only make some lasagna out of him, but also add all of his friends to the mix. After that unholy incident, a few hours pass by, and the gate inside the deserted school is still unguarded by any military personnel. Minjun eventually pops out of the gate, but you already know that he had a lot of fun. As he steps onto the solid ground, he looks back to confirm that he has finished clearing the dungeon, and since the trivial matters are out of the way, it's time to make some proper use out of this vacation, and in Minjun's case, that means spending the rest of his time playing Dungeon Power Fighter. Once the day is over, we find ourselves back on the military grounds, where the Hunter Corps units are training like usual. We see Sergeant Lee in the front, and the two gambling corporals in the back, completely out of breath. Minjun is also somewhere in the middle, totally unfazed by the hard military training. He remembers the events of the last day, where he defeated a demonic monster and enjoyed some quality time playing his favorite game, while also munching down on some ramen. As a whole, it was quite a satisfactory day. But when he returned to the camp, the entire platoon was in a grievous mood. Everyone had heard about the hunter field maneuvers in the tin can dungeon, and no one wanted to deal with that shit anymore. But they didn't really have an option to sit out the training, and they're already out in the fields with their platoon commander. Every platoon will start in different corners of the dungeon, and gradually work their way to move towards the center. As the commander and lieutenant first class Kim Minji lead the tired troops up the hill, the commander notices something odd in the distance. You see, this is division-wide training that involves reacting to numerous emergencies at any given time. This time, some monsters have appeared on the horizon, so the commander signals his troops to take their positions. 
the corporals take up their weapons as soon as the emergency is announced, but our boy Minjun is just excited about it in the back. Up at the top of the hill, numerous black balls roll down towards the platoon, and as they come closer, we see that these balls are actually blood-sucking monsters with razor-sharp teeth. Funnily enough, the commander calls them the Dark Balls, and since normal firearms are effective against them, he orders his troops to sheathe their specialty weapons and take up their guns. All units get in their positions in a matter of seconds, fully ready to fire on command. Minjun also squats down to take aim with his rifle, and as we get a zoom in on his face, you can instantly tell that this dude finds this training to be the most fun out of anything so far. With their positions at the ready, the commander orders his troops to shoot at will, and take down all their enemies. One by one, the soldier starts unloading their cartridges, and with each bang of the shot, a new ball gets popped. Even so, these fuckers were moving at such fast speeds that some bullets were bound to miss. That didn't stop the soldiers from shooting them though, and Kim Minji warned everyone that unlike my own balls, the dark balls are well known for their tough skin. And since they can also float in the air, they're harder to apprehend with melee weapons. But the balls were growing bigger and darker as they grew closer to the units, and the commander was starting to notice that they're too close for comfort. He immediately orders all units to cease the fire and start getting ready for close combat. Right now, there are only three of these monsters remaining, but dealing with them can get hard if they manage to suck on some human blood, which is why the commander asks everyone to be careful and not get bitten. Minjun can guess that it's probably game over once you get bitten, and if a lot of his teammates get wiped out in this manner, their platoon score will hit rock bottom. Just as he was busy pondering that, one of the balls managed to lunge at the front units, who were a bit too nervous to react properly. Of course, our boy can't let his score take the fall because of some newbies, so he jumps into the fight himself. Approaching the free-falling ball, Minjun calls out to Sergeant Lee so he can get ready. And immediately, as the dark ball comes down, he kicks the thing up in the air with his incredible soccer skills. Sergeant Lee and the rest of the units are left staring at the bizarre sight in front of them, because the ball was shot up straight on a vertical axis, and it wasn't showing any signs of slowing down. Heck, even Kim Minji and the commander are just looking at the thing go up. Minjun has a proud look on his face, but if he could openly shoot the targets with his dark arrows, he knows that this would be a lot easier. Anyway, the troops took point and started to shoot at the dark ball while it was still in air. And of course, the monster exploded immediately upon being blasted. Following its demise, our boy sends another pair of big black balls into the sky, and the commander told all his troops to fire at will while they were still in the air. In a matter of seconds, the hill was littered with black matter of the monsters, and none of them were left alive. The troops finally had some room to breathe, as they stood there silently to restore their energy. The commander announces a well-deserved 10-minute break, and asks everyone to look for injured members in their respective squads. If anyone is harmed, he is to report to the commander immediately. With that, the commander taps Minjun's shoulder for a job well done, and our boy gets some more thumbs up from Sergeant Lee, and Corporal Former Bully as well. Lee and Guangshik accidentally meet eyes with each other, feeling a bit awkward while they're simultaneously commending a former junior. And with that weird exchange, the two decide to go their separate ways. Meanwhile, the other two sergeants take a seat on the ground, so exhausted that they can feel their souls leave their bodies. Orange Head comments why the training is so much more difficult than usual, because they have already gone through a great deal of monster encounters. The Sleepy Eyes replies to his comment that he's not sure about the reason, but he has heard some rumors that this may not actually be a tin can dungeon. When the orange head asks him what he means, the dude replies that according to some other platoons, there was apparently a boss inside this dungeon. But when the designated team went to clear it, they were left stunned by the sight before them. The monster was some sort of giant elephant, and it was already defeated by a familiar face. That familiar face was none other than the living celebrity of the military, the two-star hunter corps officer. And judging by the blood on his fist, you can guess that he defeated the giant monster with his bare hands. He approaches the soldiers after noticing them, and the poor guys start shaking in their boots. The two-star had nothing but a huge smile on his face, claiming that since the boss monster has been defeated, they can use this dungeon for the divisional training. Sleepy Eyes explains that killing the boss would close the dungeon, so they captured it alive in its incapacitated state, and are keeping it somewhere in a cave so the dungeon be used for training. Needless to say, this makes the two sergeants cry out in streams of tears. Their sorrow is only further intensified when Kim Minji hugs them from behind, telling them to get off their asses because the break was over. He drags the two sergeants away to get going, and Minjun over here was quite pleased with their talk from earlier. He had an idea, but he's now sure that the two-star from the Hunter Corps is actually pretty good, and he's possibly looking forward to meeting him again. The platoon was now following their map once again and headed towards their destination, but just as the commander reached the top of the slope, he noticed something odd while signaling his troops to stop. The thing that he saw was so surprising that it left him with a meme face of absolute shock. The other units all started noticing the same as they reached the summit, each showing an expression of puzzlement on their face. 
Minjun was no different, as he looked down below and recognized a certain man. In the clearing after the slope, a man was sitting by himself with his legs crossed. He was wearing a tag that said injured, and as we zoom out, we see the face of the two-star with his massive smile, looking eagerly towards the approaching platoon. Meanwhile, a different scenario was playing out in the world of Isgard. Amidst the flourishing green nature of this world, a jacked-as-fuck old man sat next to a stone building, smoking a mean-looking pipe. His ears perked up as he heard someone approaching, and when he looked up, the giant Spartan warrior was standing in front of him, with his hand over the sword on his hip. The old man comments that the warrior has come back really soon, and the Spartan shrinks in embarrassment when he adds that he must have broken his weapon again. But the old man knows that the loyal warrior was probably only taking care of the Saintess's dirty business, so he asks him to hand over the sword, which the warrior does so politely. I guess this old man is probably a blacksmith, and as he looks at the weapon, he can't help but wonder how it got into such a bad shape. So when he inspects the blade up close, he asks the warrior if he had been hunting demonic monsters. The story continues at the central dungeon assembly point, where a bunch of military officers are discussing something important at one of the camps. The name of this glasses-wearing man is Ko Jiangxiao, but we'll call him Colonel Ko for the sake of simplicity. Colonel Ko is a battalion commander in the 104th Division, and he's currently worrying that something might go wrong in the Tin Can Training Dungeon. The person on the other end is Colonel Jiang, commander of the 1st Battalion in the same division. He states that the training is being held because the higher-ups are worried about the gradually decreasing combat power of the soldiers. Even so, Colonel Ko isn't pleased with the idea. He thinks that they're pushing the poor men too far. That's when Colonel Junbium, the 2nd Battalion's commander, walks into the tent, holding an assault rifle over his neck. They all salute each other, and Colonel Junbium asks for the whereabouts of the division commander. The 1st Battalion commander snickers, while Colonel Ko nervously tries to answer the question. A huge shout is heard from the tent when Colonel Jundium hears that the division commander is currently inside the tin can dungeon. The fat man simply laughs wholeheartedly, claiming that they should know about the troublesome nature of their division commander, there's no one in the military who can stop him. But that doesn't reassure the poor Colonel Jundium, who's worried why such a monstrous man has gone over to see the training of his soldiers. That's when the glasses dude steps up with the answer. Like every glasses character in any manhwa ever, the dude adjusts his frames to create really needless suspense. He states that the division commander said something before leaving. He said that there is a certain soldier he wants to see in action with his own eyes. And with those words, we come back to the man in question, the two-star smiling emoji, the commander of the 104th division, who sits patiently at the center of the dungeon. The arriving platoon is more than just a little confused to see such a man, and they honestly don't know what reaction to give. In fact, they didn't even remember to salute him. For the first time ever, we see Kim Minji cower behind the platoon commander, who is also just as stunned to see the two-star. He knew that they were supposed to escort an injured person during the mission, but the role of the injured man was supposed to be performed by someone from the HQ, not by Brutus from Popeye. And if you don't see Brutus when you see this cartoonish man, I will be very disappointed. In any case, the platoon commander doesn't look any less than a cartoon himself, as he sees the behemoth of a man tower himself next to him, dwarfing the poor soldier in comparison. Brutus shows the commander his injured side and smilingly tells him to take good care of him during their training. That very statement sends shivers down the spine of the commander, the poor dude is just lost for words. But I guess he finally remembered to salute his superior, so he gets into stance and takes up this absurd mission. Two privates bring out a stretcher, and the nervous Kim Minji tells the division commander that they will carry him for the remainder of the mission, even though he's almost the size of a mammoth. Brutus stares down at the sergeant first class, quite displeased to see the tiny stretcher. He approaches the sergeant while addressing him, and Kim Minji shouts out his title in fear of the commander. And with just his bare hands, Brutus spins up the stretcher into a ball, breaking all the supports like they were twigs. I guess he really didn't want to lie down on this thing. He then claps his hand to clear off the dust and walks away from Kim Minji with an annoyed expression. But I guess Minji is a good soldier since he still tries to reason with the division commander, telling him that the injured person needs to be on the stretcher for the purposes of the training. Of course, Brutus denies his attempt and tells them to continue their training without minding him. And while the sergeant was busy crying, the two star spots our boy right behind him. Just from the excited look on the division commander's face, it becomes pretty clear that he came here in person to observe our hero. Kim and Jun notices the expectant gaze of the commander, which also makes him spark a vicious smile of his own. He knows that something exciting will happen soon, and he can't help but feel that this training is seriously fun. After all, there's still plenty of the dungeon to explore beyond these hills, and the amusing parts are still not over. We then roll into a montage of events after their meeting with the division commander, where the platoon fights off a bunch of monsters while the two-star observes our hero with curiosity. When monsters attacked, Kim Min Jun always had the most kills. Whenever an unexpected threat visited the battalion, Kim Min Jun was once again the first to react properly. 
he carried the giant division commander on his back, managing to evade all the traps and eliminate the enemies, adding more fun to the training for our hero. However, soon enough, the other soldiers were standing on their last legs. They were completely out of breath and sweating profusely under the weight of the heavy military equipment. This occurred during their fight against some peculiar lizard monsters covered in a disgusting layer of slippery mucus. One of the privates swung his sword with his remaining strength, landing a slashing attack on the weird lizard. Just as it got cut in half, another emerged from behind him. At this point, the private was thoroughly drained of energy, his eyes rolled, and he slowly started losing his balance until he eventually collapsed on the ground. The lizard took this chance to launch its sticky tongue at the private, but quickly had its face sliced off with a swift horizontal cut. The slash came from our hero, wielding a sword boosted by the E-ranked swordsmanship ability he recently obtained. Although the skill itself isn't special, Minjun realizes it adds a significant boost to his power, possibly allowing him to level up sooner. He extends a hand to the exhausted private, helping him off the ground while the others work to slowly finish off the remaining monsters. The private thanks Minjun for his kindness, but our boy seems to have other things on his mind. Seeing his comrades suffer so intensely, it seems like he has decided they need to take a rest. So, while another soldier was busy fighting the lizard, Minjun swooped in to finish off the abomination himself. In fact, he sprinted through the entire battlefield to cut up the creatures one by one. He was done with all of them in a matter of seconds, reaching all the way to the platoon commander to signal that everyone needs to rest. Brutus had the pleasure of observing the whole scenario from a prime seat. He was informed that these hunter field maneuvers were by far the toughest ones to date, but he's seeing someone who's treating the training as his playground. Meanwhile, a lizard tries to approach him from behind, thinking that it can take down its unsuspecting prey. Of course, the poor bastard gets blasted by a single punch that the two-star doesn't even bother to look behind for. This is when the platoon commander shouts at his troops to take a rest after they're done, precisely what Minjun wanted for the tired soldiers. He gives the commander a thumbs up in acknowledgement of his decision, yet another gesture that the two-star doesn't fail to notice. He smiles at the potential of this new corporal, and it's clear that our hero has left an everlasting impression in his mind. Now, let's switch the scene and take a look at another platoon fighting in a different part of the dungeon. It's the female-only squad of the division, and they seem to be fighting the big black balls that our hero fought earlier. Much like Minjun's team, the girls are pretty much exhausted as well. It looks like these balls are giving them a lot of trouble. That's when one of those abominable creatures charges at a private, with the soldiers getting in position to parry, but another familiar blue-haired girl is already on the scene to deal with it. That's right, the Nepo baby is back, and as she slices the black ball in half, we see that our girl is still as sharp as ever. Soon enough, all of the monsters lie dead on the ground, and the girls finally get a chance to catch their breath. One of the privates was busy thanking Sun Yunseo for her incredible skills when one of the black balls started moving behind her. The girl was simply amazed at how Yunseo had defeated most of the monsters by herself, unaware that another was coming right after her. By the time she noticed the monster's screech, the girl was already too late to react. A helmet flew up in the air, and the private fell to the ground as her comrade shoved her for protection. Of course, Sun Yunseo was the protector, and with her helmet in the air, her hair slowly untangled. The private looked back at her friend to see what happened, and we see that the Nepo baby struggled at the edge of a cliff while stopping the black ball with her sword. The others ran to her late, but they were too far away to help. With the force of the shove, it seems like Yunseo tripped over at the edge of the map, and there's no one to save her. On the other hand, it was almost evening time in the dungeon, and our boys were having a moment of relaxation chatting among themselves. Kim Minji and the platoon commander were discussing their next route on top of the hill, when the division commander came in to startle the two, and commented that all members of this battalion have come this far without any major injuries. He had a big-ass smile on his face when he commended the platoon commander for being extremely competent. The poor dude, on the other hand, was so afraid of the two-star that he didn't even know how to react to a simple compliment. He thought that the division commander was scheming something evil. That's when he noticed Minjun and his friends behind, having a chat with each other while holding their weapons. It seems as if our hero is guiding his two students regarding some combat stances. The platoon commander observed that, and sprouted a smile on his face at their incredible efforts. He replied to the two-star that his soldiers are exceptional, and they have come this far with their own abilities. But even then, the division commander told him that his soldiers' abilities are part of his competence, and he should be acknowledged for that. After lifting up his spirits, he smiled with his shiny teeth on full display, telling the platoon commander to do his best until the end of the training. He then turned his head towards Kim Minji, who's definitely not avoiding eye contact on purpose. Looks like these two have some history as well, since the division commander started pinching him in a chokehold, telling him that his body balance is all wrong. I guess he just enjoys bullying his favorite soldiers. Just behind them, one corporal and a private first class were watching this comedy skit, and since one of them is wearing glasses, you best be sure that an explanation is coming. 
the fade cut asked the glasses corporal if this is his second time in the hunter field maneuvers, and the glasses guy replied in affirmation. Fade cut then expressed his desire to ask him a question, but the glasses said he's too tired to speak. Nevertheless, he's a man with glasses in a man whoop, so when the fade cut pointed to his side to ask about a certain something, Corporal Glasses also moved his head to provide the answer. There's a hole in the ground, with a big ass do not enter sign next to it, and fade cut is a bit curious what it means. Corporal Glasses adjusts his frame, like they always do, to start the explanation. But surprisingly, the explanation ended up being quite short, as he simply replied that he's looking at a hole. That's when the platoon commander told his troops to get up and start moving, and everyone started getting off from the ground. The conversation of the two still continues, and Private Fade Cut is still confused about the hole. Corporal Glasses notes that he really doesn't have any idea about the dungeon hole, and he asks the dude if he slept through the briefing session before they came here. That startles the private, so you know that Glasses was spot on. Once again adjusting his frame for no fucking reason, the corporal finally gets into his god-given character to start the proper explanation. He says that not much is known about the dungeon holes, but it is hypothesized that it is a separate space, which connects to another dimension through a gate. However, he elaborates that these gates are not a perfect connect to an infinite space. The dungeon itself is a separate space, and when it opens through a gate, some parts of it are not properly connected. So these holes that appear throughout the terrain are essentially packet losses during the data transfer. And since this phenomenon is commonly observed in most dungeons, the holes were aptly named the dungeon holes, which the corporal tells us while still adjusting his perfectly balanced glasses. Needless to say, the fade cut is still pretty impressed. But now he has a different question. He wants to know what happens when you fall outside the dungeon's borders or inside one of those holes. At that, Corporal Glasses claims to not know much information, but apparently, falling into these holes will make you pop out of any random spot inside the dungeon. And just as they finished their conversation, a bunch of soldiers started making a ruckus at the front. The platoon commander stepped up to see what was happening, and both him and our hero were quite surprised to see the strange sight before them. Minjun, in particular, recognizes the person lying before him, and it just happens to be the Nipo baby, the beautiful Sun Yunseo of the female platoon, who's lying unconscious on the ground. After a few moments, we see the girl drinking out of a bottle to hydrate herself. She's sitting on the ground while the platoon commander relays this information to her platoon. The two-star observes the new soldier's arrival with curiosity, but doesn't seem to show any emotion or take any action. That's when the platoon commander turns to inform her that he has informed the 4th Battalion about finding her, so she doesn't need to worry about rushing back. The girl is still concerned about the safety of her friends and wants to ask if all of her squad is safe. Once again, the kind commander informs her that everyone is safe, and they were all worried about her. But now that they know she's safe, they will resume their training like normal. That lets the girl exhale a sigh of relief, and she thanks the commander for the information. But she then feels a sharp flinch in her leg, and when she looks down, her foot seems to be properly bandaged. I guess she sprained her ankle before she fell into one of those dungeon holes. A strong girl like Yunseo doesn't like to get injured because she's afraid of relying on others. Nevertheless, she's already injured, and Kim Minji speculates that it would be difficult for her to continue her training with that foot. He still tries to comfort her into taking some rest, because it's important for soldiers to take care of their injuries before combat. The platoon commander shares the same sentiment. He informs her that someone from the HQ will arrive soon to fetch her, but it also means that her training session has come to an end for now. The girl expresses her protest to that, she wants to continue her training. But knowing her current conditions, she restrains her emotions and dejectedly lowers her head with sadness. That's when Brutus finally decides to show up, asking about the condition of the soldier. It goes without saying that his appearance left a wall of questions on Yuncio's face, starting with what the fuck a major general was doing in a place like this. The platoon commander updates the general that there are no serious external injuries on the girl, but she has a fractured left ankle, which is making it difficult for her to continue the training. The two-star considers this a pity and asks the girl what exactly happened to her. The shocked girl panics and gives out her name first, then proceeds to explain that she fell off a cliff while fighting a monster, and when she opened her eyes, she was already here. The division commander speculates that she probably fell into one of those dungeon holes, but he considers it lucky that she's still somehow alive. But then, something suddenly clicks in his head, which makes him flinch in his position. He asks the girl for her name once again and the Nipo baby replies that she's a private first class, and her name is Sun Yunseo. The division commanders seem to have an overreaction at that information. He yells if she's actually the daughter of Sun Tiho, who belongs to the 4th Company of the 4th Battalion. The girl seems a bit shy of her status, but reluctantly agrees with the general since he was right. In the very next moment after hearing her say that, the man puts on his injured tag on our girl and frantically starts looking around for someone in a panic. 
Everyone else in the platoon looks dead tired and unable to be of any use, but there's someone here who still looks to be in perfect condition and is even training his friends for combat. The Major General calls out to Kim Min Jun, which makes our boy look in the direction of his voice. He comes running to the general and the platoon commander, and upon seeing him, the Nipo baby hides her face in embarrassment. Her face is blushed with a red color, and she's a bit hesitant to look our hero in the eye, probably because she still remembers their weird encounter from last time. Anyway, her expressions soon make a 180 when the division commander asks Min Jun to carry the girl so they can resume their training. For a moment, our boy doesn't understand what the fuck is happening. But it looks like the Major General is mad, and she wants Yoon Seo to stay in their platoon until the end of the training session. Min Jun then looks at the shy girl and starts calculating this weird situation. The girl is still hiding her face in her hands, and the commander is simply fuming with unexplained anger. But regardless, this looks like an opportunity to earn another accomplishment during the training, so Min Jun happily accepts the task from the two star, confirming that he will carry the injured soldier. He then proceeds to walk towards the Nipo baby, who's quite startled to see him approach. My man squats down on the ground to give the girl a piggyback ride, and it goes without saying that she's not happy with the idea at all. Minjun knows that the girl has no choice, since not agreeing would be the same as forfeiting from the training, which would plummet her evaluation score. Looks like the Nipo baby is aware of that as well, but she's still extremely hesitant. In the end, she closes her eyes to resolve herself and shyly agrees to get on the piggyback ride. Our hero couldn't be happier to hear that, as it means he's well on his way to unlock a new achievement with the general. The others look at Minjun like he's a monster, not understanding where he gets his bottomless stamina from, but they're happy since they don't have to carry a person instead. Our hero picks up the girl on his back, and the platoon commander walks next to ensure they're okay. He tells Minjun to follow Vice Commander Kim Minji on the back and let him know if he gets tired and needs rest. Of course, this bastard over here doesn't have any intention to rest, and it's not like he's gonna get tired either, he's just too happy at the prospect of a new achievement. He looks at the Nipo baby with the same excitement, thinking of her as a ticket to his bonus. Of course, the girl averts her gaze to avoid looking into his eyes, she's still too shy about their last encounter. Not that it matters to Minjun, this dude is just busy grinning at such an opportunity. Meanwhile, the division commander observes the two from behind while still showing an unexplainable look of discontent. Kim Minji walks up to him and informs him that rumors will spread if they make an exception for the daughter of another division commander. But it's not like the general has any intention of backing down. There are no regulations that state they can't help the injured, and all of this is still just a part of their regular training. But despite that, Kim Minji notices a hint of something else when the general says that there's something he's missing. His brows twitch with annoyance, and he looks genuinely angry while calling out the name of Sun Yun Seo's father, Sun Tiho. He calls him a fucking asshole, and I'm really not sure why he's so pissed to see his daughter inside this dungeon. Let's resume our epic story, this time, directly with the face of our favorite Nipo baby, Sun Yun Seo. She looks at the exhausted soldiers ahead of her, and then averts her gaze nervously at the men behind her. Kim Minji looking as solid as always, but the general behind him should have absolutely no place in this training. Nevertheless, it's a sausage festival out here, and the poor lone girl couldn't be more uncomfortable. Not to mention, she's being carried by yet another weirdo. The girl tells Min Jun to let him know if he's tired, because she can always choose to retire from the training. But our boy rubs off her concern, blatantly stating that she's lighter than Stettel. And in case you forgot, Stettel is supposed to be one of the heaviest materials on earth, so that wasn't exactly a good compliment, as you can already see from Yun Seo's startled face. My guy then continues to guess her exact weight, but is stopped abruptly by the embarrassed lady. Meanwhile, the other soldiers are simply too tired to bother with this nonsense. Embarrassed and blushing, Yun Seo tells our hero that she will stay quiet, so she requests him to shut the fuck up as well. And for some reason, the general seems quite interested in this conversation. After calming down a little, our girl contemplates the fact that she's only able to remain a part of this training thanks to the monster who's carrying her. So, she sighs as she lets him know that she will definitely repay him for his favor in the future. Of course, as achievement hungry as always, Minjun couldn't be happier to hear such words. In fact, he would love it even more if the said favor were to come directly from her father. But after all this, the idiot continues from earlier and tries to guess the poor girl's weight once again, which is a conversation the men behind them aren't gonna miss at any cost. Before our boy could spit out an exact number, the girl started beating on him to make him shut up, pleading him to not embarrass her any further. Kim Minji and Brutus both look at each other for a moment after witnessing such a scene, and boy would their next expressions creep the fuck out of Yun Seo. You can tell that these two old men are looking at a couple in the making, and they couldn't be happier to be a part of it. Anyway, the night soon fell upon the dungeon once again, and our soldiers were now more tired than ever, barely managing to even maintain their posture. As usual, the platoon commander was navigating from the front, and the corporals behind him were desperately hoping to not encounter any more monsters. 
While crying their eyes out, they couldn't help but curse the very handsome individual, who threw them inside a training dungeon that was set to hell level of difficulty. This is when their commander tells them that only two kilometers are left in their destination, so everyone should maintain their focus and not let down their guard until the end. As he asked the corporals behind him to relay this message to the rest, the exhausted soldiers couldn't be happier to hear such news. At last, they could see an end to this disaster of a training. But of course, their enthusiasm was short-lived, as they both noticed an unforeseen predicament on the horizon. As soon as he noticed, the bald corporal yelled at the commander that flying monsters are approaching them from the sky. After laying his eyes upon the threat as well, the commander ordered everyone to get into their battle formation. They were about to engage an airborne enemy. The monsters that charged at the platoon from above were an absolute abomination, looking like the bastard child of a snake and a sparrow. Their teeth were sharp, and their glowing eyes were a sign that these creatures were nocturnal. Turns out, these things are called the Black Rakes, and there's no doubt in the platoon commander's mind that they couldn't have faced a worse enemy at a time like this. The creatures circle above the panicked soldiers, and the general observes this whole situation from a distance. After taking a look at the monstrosities himself, the general can't help but consider the platoon unlucky. They had come so close to the finish line with an injured troop, but this might actually spell the end of their training. You see, the black rakes might be small-sized monsters, but their teeth and claws are sharp enough to tear through skin. Of course, the hunters wouldn't die from such injuries, but given the tenacious nature of the enemy, a proper fight would be very hard for the tired troops. Not to mention that it's nighttime, and even the general is having a hard time spotting the airborne enemy with his weakened eyesight. Meanwhile, the poor soldiers continue to swing and miss at the annoying creatures, feeling an overburden of exhaustion with every breath. Kim Minji is staying at the back line to protect the injured, but it's clear that he's quite disappointed at the sorry fight being put on by his troops. Heck, even the general is forced to comment that such pathetic reaction times should be grounds for point deduction, and the poor sergeant first class can only listen. He sees the sorry state of his soldiers and how much they're struggling to fight these monsters, but he knows that he can't use the excuse that they're tired and have low visibility. After all, they're hunters, and being prepared for such monsters is their job. However, Kim Minji knows better that even if he leaves his post and rushes over to help, there's not much he can do to change the outcome of this battle. In fact, as he watches the commander miss his target as well, he wonders if falling out of line at such a crucial time will result in even further point deduction. In the end, Kim Minji has no choice but to trust the platoon commander and await his orders. But given the desperate expression of the man himself, I doubt he has a solid plan either. Meanwhile, our boy over here is absolutely demolishing his teeth in annoyance and anger. The words point deduction from the general are still ringing in his ears, and that's the one thing that our homeboy could never accept. Cursing and clicking his tongue, my man rushes forward with the startled and helpless girl on his back. As a single tear falls off Yunseo's eye, Minjun skids to a stop behind his commander, telling him to give him a chance in the fight. Of course, the commander is furious at the mere suggestion that he would want to engage in battle while carrying an injured soldier, so he yells at him to stay back. However, seeing nothing but point deduction in his eyes if the situation were to continue, our hero states that everyone has reached their limit. And with those same words still glittering in his eyes, he claims that he's the only one who can turn this fight around. Seeing his confidence, and the extremely poor battle that the rest of them are putting on, the commander gives him a chance to explain his plan. Minjun whispers his plan, and both the commander and Yunseo lean closer to listen carefully. But as soon as they hear it, both of them shout in unison at the craziness of his plan. Realizing that she was being uncharacteristically loud, the Nepo baby puts a hand to her gaping mouth. However, the platoon commander has a completely different expression. You can tell from his face that he's seriously considering Minjun's idea. And sure enough, much to Yunseo's surprise, the commander taps his best soldier's chest, telling him that he will only get one chance. If he fails, everyone will retreat immediately. The girl can hardly process what's happening. She can't believe that the commander is choosing to trust in such an abrupt plan by his subordinate. And meanwhile, the black rakes were going crazy over the heads of the fighting soldiers. Most of them could do nothing but watch the bird-like creatures, unable to strike them down with their weapons. Desperate to end this fight, the commander tells Minjun to hand him the injured soldier and head forward, but he's interrupted mid-sentence by our uncomplying hero, who insists that there is no time to waste. Once again feeling the rush of desperation, the commander grits his teeth while agreeing to the soldier. So, Minjun rushes ahead while carrying the Nepo baby on his back, while the commander orders everyone to clear a path for the corporal and get ready to open fire at the enemy. His commands spark a curious reaction from the general, who's surprised to hear that he wants the soldiers to use their rifles when they can't even properly see the monsters. But the plan had already commenced, and our boy was now busy reloading his rifle and telling the girl to hold on tight. After all, as you can tell from his achievement-hungry face, there's no way he's gonna lose an injured person on the field. 
At this point, Yunseo has absolutely no choice but to follow his directions, so she closes her eyes and grabs on tightly to the lunatic's body, bracing herself for what is to come next. At the same time, Minjun's eyes were starting to burn with his demonic energy, and with the help of his power, he was easily able to spot all the flying creatures, even through the darkness of the night. As he sets his eyes on the target, our boy narrates that he's just as familiar with the darkness, as he's familiar with the beginner hunting grounds of his favorite game. Minjun puts one of the black rakes in his scope, and a wave of demonic energy starts to gather around his trigger finger. Looks like he has finally activated his dark arrow skill. Since the skill can be concealed inside a long-ranged weapon, our boy opens fire at the flying creature. The bullet flies at supersonic speed, coated by a massive ball of dark demonic energy. The swift monster sees the bullet approaching, and quickly navigates the air to dodge around it. But despite its best efforts, the energy surrounding the bullet tears off half of its body. The girl could hardly see what was happening, but she didn't miss the fact that the creature was killed in a single bullet. And that alone was something really worth thinking about, since she couldn't wrap her head around how Minjun made it happen. You see, our boy knew that it would work. The bullets have grown to the size of cannonballs thanks to the dark arrows, which of course makes them incredibly hard to dodge. And since he's the only one with night vision, no one else can really see what is happening in the night sky. And so, like the main character from Metal Slug, my man starts shooting like a maniac, while Yunseo simply held on for dear life. The Black Rakes couldn't have been better targets for his newly unlocked skill, as they kept getting blasted in the air by the seemingly undodgeable dark arrows. All the other platoon members stared at the spectacle in a daze, hardly able to believe what the fuck was happening. As the monster's flesh fell out of the sky in bits and pieces, the only thing going through their minds was how incredible Kim Minjun is. On the other hand, our boy was now done with his one-sided massacre, so he looked back to face his squad, letting them know that he has killed everything. I can only imagine what sort of embarrassment must be going through the poor girl's mind as she's forced to cling on to such an absolute monster, who doesn't seem to give any fucks about this situation at all. Anyway, the squad can finally continue its march, and it goes without saying that everyone is more exhausted than ever before. But still, as is apparent from the platoon commander's face, they have all eased up after going through their last battle. And at last, they can see the military barricades of their destination. The camp has been waiting for their arrival, marking the trainees who finished first, and congratulating them for going through this hellish training. As the superiors applaud their efforts, our soldiers form lines and start entering the camp. It was a long journey, but they can finally take some sighs of relief and relax their minds. These guys couldn't be happier at the moment. Kim Minji was the last to enter the camp, and after checking off all the people who returned, the attending sergeant announces that all members of the 2nd platoon from the 2nd company have passed their training. The exhausted boys smile at the result of their hard work, glad to have finally made it back after finishing every single one of their tasks. Minjun has a big-ass smile on his face as well, because thanks to him, his entire platoon has passed, and there won't be any point deductions. This is when the medical team arrives with the stretcher to take care of the injured Nepo baby, and the platoon commander finally shouts to congratulate all of his troops, because none of them gave up. He knows the end report is gonna be sweet. True to their commander and duties, the soldiers all salute and raise their thumbs in acknowledgement of their feet. Now it's Kim Minji's turn to take over the command, and he orders his troops to not behave unruly now that they have returned. They will relocate to their barracks very soon, and then everyone can relax however they want. Everyone starts retreating towards the main tent, but the platoon commander spots an outlier in the group. It's none other than Minjun, and he's asking the medical team where he can get rewarded for his accomplishments, instead of finally putting down the poor girl on his back. The commander takes this opportunity to call out to him, which immediately averts our boy's attention. Looks like the commander wanted to personally thank his best soldier for his excellent contributions, and always taking the right actions in the face of danger. Minjun thanks the commander for his high appraise, although he would much rather prefer a more tangible reward. In any case, the medical team was now getting tired of waiting, so the Nepo baby finally tells our hero to put her down. As she adjusts herself on the stretcher, the girls apologizes for any inconvenience she may have caused to the platoon and thanks them for helping her finish the training. Since the commander is just a solid man all around, he tells the lady to not think of herself as a burden. He's just glad that they were all able to finish the training together. This is when the elephant behind them starts bursting out in laughter, looking extremely pleased with the end result of the training. With a big-ass smile on his face, the general expresses his absolute joy over the fact that everyone from the platoon managed to pass this dungeon without hiccups. In a fit of his excitement, he lunges forward to hug our hero, but I guess Minjun didn't like that idea, because he quickly dodged out of the man's sweaty arms. There's a brief moment of awkwardness when the general just stands there with his arms crossed, but then he turns around like a bear to go for yet another hug. I don't need to explain much in this panel, because it's clear from our hero's face that he hates the idea. The entire comedy sketch was being witnessed by the Nepo baby and the commander, 
who just find it hard to believe the completely absurd nature of the general. But then again, it's not like they can't understand his excitement either, because it's only thanks to Minjun that they were able to finish their training at all. When the general had finally managed to catch the poor soldier, his attention was averted by someone's salute. And immediately when he laid his eyes upon that person, the general froze up like a deer before a truck. The one who saluted was 4th Battalion Commander of his division, Colonel Yu Jehai. She's the one in charge of all the female units in the 104th Division, and judging by everyone's scared reactions behind her, she's quite the scary individual. The woman goes right past the general, ignoring him completely with an annoyed expression on her face. And Minjun can't help but wonder what sort of authority can she have to ignore her superior like that. Surprisingly, when she sees her favorite soldier, the woman's frown turns into a smile, and she asks the Nipo baby if her injury is serious. Yunseo explains that she simply sprained her ankle and should heal up in no time. Seeing that the girl was lucky enough to fall into a dungeon hole, the colonel feels relieved and asks the medical team to escort her with care. And when she's done with that business, the stout woman turns her gaze back to her left. She stares directly at the scared general and asks him about his training observation activities. With a double-edged smile on her face, she asks him to have a private talk with her so she can give him a piece of her mind. The division commander wonders if he has to do it right now, but the colonel won't take no for an answer. With the face of a benevolent demon, the woman warns him to follow him right away, and I guess we can all tell that Brutus is finally fucked. God knows what happened between those two afterwards, but our scene has now switched to the next day, a bright sunny morning inside the 104th Division's HQ. Inside the cafeteria, Minjun was busy munching down on a fuck ton of carbs and protein. I guess his hard work has earned him a good meal at least. Other than the chef who seems to be carrying even more chicken, our boy is the only one inside the cafeteria at this moment. The chef brings him a fresh batch of piping hot fried chicken, which makes Minjun's eyes sparkle with excitement. Unable to believe this VIP treatment, he asks the man if it's alright for him to have so much food. The gentle chef gestures him to look around and says that no one else will visit the cafeteria today since they're all tired and sleeping, which means Minjun can eat everyone's share by himself. My boy couldn't be happier to hear such news, so he gratefully accepts the benevolent gift of scrumptious fried chicken. As he continues to chow down on those juicy thick thighs like an absolute glutton, the chef indulges him in small talk, telling him that their platoon is being rumored as the best in the division after their training. He tells him about all the praise he has been hearing about him from the battalion commander and the other colonels, and remarks how he even managed to defeat a bunch of black rakes by himself. Our hero was just busy gulping down his food, but the chef was really impressed that he managed to solo so many monsters in the darkness. He comments how this round of Hunterfield maneuvers was rumored to be the worst one till date, and more than 50% of privates gave up the training in the middle. I guess the chef was a chatty guy, because he kept going on his useless banter for quite a good while. On the other hand, our boy was simply appreciating the incredibly juicy meat that he could now eat all by himself. While all of that was going on, a few officers were walking down the empty halls of the building. The colonel in the middle noticed something from the corner of his eye, and felt a bizarre moment of silence when he saw that the training grounds were completely empty. He comments how the entire camp feels like a ghost town, which alerts the captain next to him. The captain with the scar over his mouth replies that that everyone has been given a day off after their exhausting training, and the majority of the soldiers are just sleeping in their barracks. The colonel seems pleased to hear that, but comments that they should also get up and eat. And continuing their walk, he mentions how everyone did amazing in their recent training, and how the division commander looked quite pleased with the results. That sparks the interest of the other captain next to him, who loves the fact that the division commander personally went to observe the training. He finds him to be really cool, and not overbearing at all. Of course, he's the only one who feels that way, because the colonel isn't pleased to hear such words about Brutus at all. In fact, he finds him nothing more than overbearing. He remembers how the commander of the female battalion gave them all a serious lecture over the division commander's careless attitude, and the fact that he left his post to fool around in a dungeon. Captain Kim looks shocked to hear that, he finds it hard to believe that a colonel would yell like that in front of a major general. But his superior corrects him, letting him know that she wasn't in the wrong at all. After all, it is a fact that Major General Brutus left his post without saying anything. Since the captain still looks a bit skeptical, Colonel Lee lets him know that the 4th Battalion's commander is a scary individual. Imagining her as a super soldier with a blade on her shoulder, the man can't help but comment that everyone in the division fears that woman, and even he is not an exception. In any case, he's glad that the matter with her was settled thanks to Kim Min-joon, because thanks to his incredible results, the division commander's interest in him was somewhat justified. Putting a wide smile on his face, the man couldn't help but look forward to our hero's future inside the military, and since he's a part of his battalion, he's also really looking forward to the next monthly meeting. Now let us move back to the main building of the division headquarters, where a meeting is taking place behind a closed door. 
putting on his glasses that don't match his face at all, the division commander seems to be looking at a report. The one sitting in front of him is Colonel Yu, the commander of the 4th Battalion. Since she's slowly taking sips out of her teacup, I guess her rage from earlier has calmed down. Brutus is now finished reading the piece of paper and looks at the colonel to confirm that the dungeon cleanup schedule is good to go before asking her if the Nepo baby is doing okay. The colonel puts down her cup of tea and replies that the girl didn't receive a fracture. She then continues that Yuncio is recovering pretty fast and should be finished with her treatment by tomorrow to resume her duties. Hearing that, Brutus remarks that the girl really seems to take after her father and that's exactly when his phone starts to ring. Without wasting a single breath, he picks up the tiny phone in his hand to answer the call, almost as if he was looking for an excuse to get himself out of this meeting. But his day only got worse when the voice on the other end greeted him by calling him a bearded bastard. Annoyed at such words, the Major General demands to know the person's name. In response, the man on the other end doesn't really give out his name, but expresses his disappointment that Brutus has already forgotten his voice. Looks like the Major General has finally recognized the voice, and he asks with a look of shock if he's really talking to the person he's thinking about. His sudden change in tone seems to have alerted Colonel Yu as well, and the scene finally switches to the other side, where the man confirms the division commander's suspicions. We see on his title plate that he's also a Major General like Brutus, which means that they both share the same rank in the military. And as we finally zoom out to look at the man, we see his angry face with popping veins. This man is the division commander of the 107th Division, Sun Tiho, and also the father to our favorite Nepo baby. He seems absolutely pissed about something, as he refers to Brutus as an annoying fucker and challenges him to a duel. Last we left off, Nepo baby's father was on phone with Major General Brutus, giving him an ear full of insult and challenging him to a duel. And now, as we start this episode, Brutus is retorting back while fuming, complaining why Sun Tiho called him a bearded bastard. In the background, it seems like Colonel Yu is already invested in this conversation. On the other side of the phone, Tiho won't stop insulting his rival division commander and desperately wants to duel him to settle their scores at once. At this point, Brutus is already holding his head to control his anger and questions if Tiho is acting so weird because his daughter got injured. Colonel Yu listens carefully as Brutus calls the guy a nerd and tauntingly asks if he's even a soldier who's worthy enough to fight him. Of course, Major General Sun Tiho fires back, telling Brutus that he just needs a little exercise and he's the perfect punching bag to warm up. Finally, Brutus acts like the bigger man and shouts that Tiho is acting extremely childish. But if you ask me, he's not much different either. My statement is backed up by the incredibly concerned look of Colonel Yu, who's observing silently while Brutus fails to explain that it's not his fault that his daughter got injured during training. This is when Tiho crosses the line and says that Brutus couldn't even get married, there's no way he'd understand his feelings. The bearded dragon finally snaps, crushing the phones in his hand while banging his fist on the table, demanding to know the location of the bastard who's so keen on having a duel. But of course, he's just talking to himself now that his phone is broken, and me and Colonel Yu are both wondering if this dude is okay in the head. He keeps hurling threats at Tiho, and gets mad when he doesn't hear an answer. Finally, he replies back to the thing that got him triggered in the first place. He shouts that he didn't marry on purpose, it's not because no one wanted to marry him. Poor guy, I can really understand his struggle. As a 29 years old unmarried virgin, this is really starting to hurt. Anyway, Colonel Yu takes the hint and cautiously comes close to the raging idiot, while he's still going on about why Tio isn't saying anything in response. With as much respect as she can spare for such a moron, the colonel informs the major general that the call has already ended. And sure enough, when Brutus pulls back his phone from his ear to look at it, the poor thing is already cracked into pieces. But without giving a second thought to his anger management issues, he turns to the colonel and asks if she has Sun Tio's number saved in her phone. For a moment, the woman stays silent in fear of losing her phone as well, but eventually, she heaves a sigh and accepts her sad reality that she needs to work under such a meathead. Understanding the situation, she tells Brutus to calm down, and try to understand that Major General Tio has every right to be angry. At first, the clueless idiot snaps at her for taking the side of the nerd who insulted him and his capability to get married, and even questions the colonel if she's the one who informed him about his daughter getting injured. But rather calmly, the woman replies back that the major general learned about it because the hospital probably contacted the girl's guardian when she got admitted. Besides, she states that Tio probably isn't mad because his daughter got injured during training. He's angry because a certain someone granted her special permission to finish her training instead of transferring her to a hospital. And finally, Brutus is humbled by being slapped with some facts. Still, with a charming smile on her face, the colonel adds that he should call Sun Tiho and explain the situation properly, because he only wanted to find out the capabilities of the second platoon. Coughing in embarrassment, the humbled Brutus accepts that he should probably explain to his friend that there has been a misunderstanding. 
he only needed to see how his soldiers would react to an actual injured person. Meanwhile, the colonel takes out her phone to make the call, but when she sees the crushed Samsung Galaxy something in the Major General's hands, she reconsiders if this is really a smart idea. And after giving it a second thought, she pulls back the phone and states that she will put the call on speakerphone instead. As she makes the call and puts the phone on the table, Brutus is visibly starting to panic. It looks like he's not really sure how he would explain anything at all. But still, he sits with a hint of impatience, and we hear a click from the phone as Major General Teo picks up the call. Without even saying hello, the dude straight up asks Colonel Yu why she's calling him, and questions if she's sitting together with the bearded bastard. As calm as ever, the woman addresses her superior politely, and explains that she's calling him instead because the division commander's phone is broken. Meanwhile, the division commander in questions is still seething at Tiho's harsh insults. But anyway, he sets his anger aside to tell Tiho that he was too worked up earlier to explain things properly. He clarifies that there was an emergency while he was out in the dungeon to observe a particular platoon, but before saying any further, he starts making a sour face like he just swallowed an entire lemon. Looks like words of apologies come to him with great difficulty, and Colonel Yu observes as her superior struggles to calm down his nerves. But finally, Brutus admits his mistake to Tio, stating clearly that it was his fault for being careless and putting her daughter's life in potential danger. And so, he formally apologizes for his mistake as the division commander. His sincere words put a warm smile on General Yu's face, who realizes that Brutus tried to understand the feelings of a parent, despite not having any children of his own. But you see, the mood was instantly killed between the two and Sun Tio opened his mouth on the other side of the phone, asking Brutus what the fuck he's even talking about. With veins popping out of every corner on his face, the Major General comments that Brutus is probably making excuses to avoid the duel because he's scared. So instead, he demands to know the name and unit of the bastard who carried his daughter on his back. Well fuck, it looks like this doting father is angry because his daughter got carried around on some other dude's back. Even Colonel Yu and Brutus can't seem to digest this information, they just stare blankly at the phone in awkwardness. This is when General Sun finally lays bare the reason for his anger, he's just furious because Brutus allowed someone else to give his daughter a piggyback ride. He was about to go on and ask about the bastard's name again who dared to carry her daughter, but Colonel Yu decided to take the initiative and ended the call to stop things from getting worse. Of course, her phone immediately started ringing again, because Tio still needed that name, and the colonel was now starting to get worried about everything. The phone kept ringing non-stop, so the woman took a peek to see how Brutus was handling this absurd situation. As you'd expect, the guy was furious. He mustered a lot of courage to apologize for his mistakes, only to find out that the fucker on the other end was angry for something completely unreasonable and unrelated. Colonel Yu got anxious, and she tried her damnedest to stop the beast from going berserk. But I guess it was already too late, since Brutus could hardly contain his anger as he asked her to prepare a vehicle. He took all of his frustration on the poor sofa, and I'm really starting to think he needs some therapy. The flustered colonel steps back in caution, asking the major general where he's planning to go. And the camera finally pans towards the absolutely fuming face of the idiot, who's about to crush his own teeth while he orders the colonel to clear her schedule, because they're going to head straight for Sun Tio's division. At this point, Colonel Yu is straight up calling both of these men as absolute idiots in her mind, and she's absolutely fed up with their poop-filled brains that are only good for fighting. Meanwhile, the man who's unknowingly causing all this chaos is simply strolling across the hallways without a care in the world. Heck, he loved the chicken he got for free in the cafeteria so much that this is pretty much all he can think about. But well, even if he sings and moves along with hands in his pockets, there's not a moment in Minjun's life that can be considered boring by any standards. Because in a shadowy corner to his right, his tiny minion was waiting on his master with a sexy pose to give him a speck of his attention. Sure enough, my boy noticed something off at the corner of his eye when he walked past, so he stops his stroll to confirm his suspicions. And when he suddenly turns his head around to see what the heck he saw, the little condom head was overjoyed to see his master notice him, he couldn't help jumping up and down with his tiny hands and legs. Of course, his adorable actions go right past our hero, because this dude is just annoyed that Tiny is appearing in random public places again. And so, he grabs the little fucker by the head, puts him in his pocket, and bolts out of the hallway to talk to it in private. He finds himself a quiet backside corner of the building where no one comes around, and after confirming that the area is void of any human presence, he allows the tiny shadow demon to come out and state its business. Minjun warns his minion to never come out in public places again, and asks it why it came to find him in the first place. The shadow demon seemed pretty confused at first, and started explaining in its weird sign language that he made sure there was no one around when he showed himself earlier. Minjun seems to be aware of that, but that doesn't mean he won't get pissed off if Tiny keeps popping out randomly for no reason. That harsh treatment makes the adorable creature sulk. He just wanted to surprise his master and gain some affection. 
finally realizing that he was being too harsh with his words, Minjun heaved out a sigh and spared some demonic energy to feed the shadow minion. He presented the spiral chaotic energy to Tiny on his hand, and the little bugger instantly became happier. In a matter of seconds, he started devouring the spiral, and while adoring over it, our boy asked Tiny why he came to see him. To explain the matter, Tiny pointed out his finger at his master. Minjun noticed that it must be something worthwhile if his minion wants to experience it in person, so he extends his finger as well until a link has been created between their memories. Tiny's memories take us immediately towards a scene of destruction, where an entire town block seems to be decimated by some sort of fight. We can also see a bunch of hunters panicking and fainting, which leads our hero to believe that there might be some traces of demonic energy in the area. Lastly, we see the sign that shows the location of this place, and I'm guessing this is going to be our hero's next destination. A lot of stuff has been happening in that area, so Minjun can easily guess that this should be worth the trip. He commends Tiny for going so far away to find some traces of demonic energy, and the little dude is getting cocky with just this minimal amount of praise. It's not surprising that he was able to travel so much though, because Tiny has the Nightwalker skill that lets him travel great distances in the shadows throughout the night. To encourage good behavior going forward, Minjun feeds the little fat fuck another spiral of demonic energy. And with that business out of the way, he's starting to plan out how to take another leave so he can excuse himself and leave for this area. While heading back to the dormitory, the matter seems to be completely occupying our hero's mind. He can't possibly leave without any notice, and it will be a waste of his vacation days if he were to apply for a day off by himself. As he opens the door, he wonders if he can get granted a holiday by the army itself so he won't have to waste his vacation days. But when he looks into the room, his entire squad seems to be cheering on with excitement in front of the platoon commander. Minjun doesn't know what the fuck is going on over here, but it doesn't take long for the commander to notice him and congratulate him for being selected as the best soldier of the hunter field maneuvers in the entire division. Minjun thanks his superior, but seems like he has more to say. The commander explains that the best soldier will be given a separate reward later, but thanks to his excellent contributions in the dungeon, the entire platoon has been given a day off. Well, what do you know, this shit was exactly what our boy needed to hear, so it's no wonder that his eyes are now sparkling like an excited puppy. Without wasting a second, he asks the commander if he can use his day off tomorrow, and the question seems to surprise everyone. It's not impossible, but the commander can't help but ask why Minjun is in a rush to avail it so quickly. Of course, our boy won't be explaining his plans to him, he just states that he needs to do some private stuff tomorrow. Since no one can really argue with this psycho who always seemed to do things at his own pace, none of them question his reasoning. And after a short delay, the commander approves his leave for the following day, which Minjun doesn't forget to thank him for. And so, here we are in Huechen, the scene of destruction that Tiny showed to our hero in his memories. Minjun definitely arrived at the correct location, but this is not what he had expected to see. A bunch of female hunters were busy cleaning and sanitizing the area, and when they notice a shadowy figure standing close to them all of a sudden, we zoom in to find an incredibly bored expression on our hero. It seems to him that the situation is already over, but he doesn't understand why there's so many female hunters in the area. He stands there awkwardly as he tries to process the information, and comes to the conclusion that he'll need to ask Tiny to give back all the demonic energy that he fed him earlier, because he can't find anything for him to do here. But that's when a familiar voice calls out his name, and as the girl takes off her mask to reveal her face, we see that it's our favorite Nipo baby, who looks a bit confused to see what Minjun is doing here. Let's rewind the time a little, so we can get an explanation to what is going on in this place. Before Minjun arrived, the girls were already busy sanitizing the entire scene of decimation. A pink-haired corporal was getting tired and irritated, she couldn't process why they had to do something so tedious right after their hunter field maneuver training. The tall black-haired beauty right next to her was also a corporal, and she knew that their training results were quite bad, so this is a sort of punishment from their battalion commander Colonel Yu. Even so, the pink shorty can't help but complain. Bad results or not, all of them are tired, and now they have to clean up after a monster outbreak without getting any rest. On the contrary, the tall girl is just happy that they weren't part of the attack team, who had to deal with the stampede of monsters that broke through the dungeon gate. And while the pink lady was busy cursing and grumbling, the tall mommy spotted someone familiar to her side. Even from a distance, you can look at the girl's blue hair and guess that it's the Nipo baby, doing her best with her duties as always. The corporal approached Yuncio, asking her if her injury is fine and requesting her to not overdo it with the work. As serious as always, the private first class stands on attention in front of the corporal and states that she has already recovered. The tall corporal commends her fast rate to recovery, but as the girl's superior, she advises her to take it easy for the time being. Looks like Yuncio really appreciates the corporal's concern for her well-being, and thanks her for worrying about her all the time. That's when they hear murmurs from the other girls, who are all wondering what a male hunter is doing here. 
The corporal may not know what's happening, but our Nepo baby has recognized the person right away. That's right, the dude is none other than our hero, and while some girls can tell that he's from the same division, none of them seem to know more about his identity. That's when we finally catch up with the last chapter, where Yunseo reveals her beautiful face to look at her favorite hunter, who also happened to carry her on his back to let her complete the training. Minjun, on the other hand, couldn't be wearing a more opposite expression on his face. He's just lost to see what this girl is doing here, probably because he didn't intend to get identified while conducting his shady business. Yunseo walks closer, and the two have a little standoff in front of the other female troops, who all seem amazed to see a male soldier in their midst. With a calm expression, the Nipo baby asks what Kim Minjun is doing in this area, because only the female battalion was asked to come here for support. In response, our boy makes a rather annoyed face, and replies that he's here on vacation. I can't even blame the Nipo baby for being mad at his response, because it doesn't really make any sense. She bluntly asks him if he's lying, but then my boy presents her with an application of leave signed by his platoon commander. After reading that, there's no more doubt that he's actually on vacation. But the girl still finds it hard to believe, and now our boy is wondering if she has some sort of trust issues. Giving back his paper, she asks him why he would come to a restricted area during his vacation, and Minjun is now starting to fizzle out on excuses. Averting his eyes, he lies through his teeth and explains that he had some business in Huachin, but came here first because he had heard about there being some sort of emergency. Just then, his sight falls upon a blue fracture in the air right behind the troops, which quickly expands in all directions to become a full-fledged dungeon gate. Of course, this is the sort of thing that makes our boy happy, and he quickly assumes a stance to get ready for some actions. The cackling sounds of the gate make Sun Yunseo turn around as well, and now everybody is panicking that a dungeon gate has opened. As they all rush to vacate the area, the pink-haired corporal cries that her day is only getting worse, they now have even more mess to take care of. For now, the tall beauty seems to show the most reasonable response, as she orders everyone to rush back and report the situation to the platoon commander before taking any unnecessary action. It's a total mess out there, and while everyone is heading back to their camp, only our hero is walking forward. The Nipo baby notices that, and quickly urges him to evacuate with the rest as well. But you see, this is exactly the sort of thing that Minjun was hoping to encounter when he came here, there's no way he would leave now. And so, he makes the excuse to the girl that monsters may start pouring out of the gate soon, so he will be the one to stay behind and buy time for everyone else to get themselves armed and ready for combat. I mean, just look at this dude's grin, he couldn't be more happy. Sun Yunseo can't understand his reasoning though, she thinks it's too dangerous because they don't even know what sort of monsters will come out of the gate. But once again, Minjun reminds her that the attack team has already left the scene. And if monsters actually come out, then everyone in this area will face a lot of danger. He assures her that he will make a run for it if the situation gets too rough, and if she has any equipment to share for him, he urges her to let him borrow it before retreating with the rest. One last time, the concerned girl tries to talk him out of this terrible idea, and this time, Minjun reminds her of her injured foot. He tells her to hurry up and start running, because it might be too late once the monsters come out. At last, the girl grits her teeth and gives up on having this argument, so she proceeds to take out the knife from her belt so she can hand it to our hero. Putting the hunter knife in his hands, she begs him one last a time to evacuate if things get too dangerous. And with those words, the girl finally starts running away from the gate promising to bring back the rest of her platoon soon. Now that everyone is gone and out of the way, our boy is free to face the gate and get ready for some juicy action he's always craving. He walks closer towards the gate, reminding himself that many monsters chose not to come out of a dungeon gate when it opens in the human world. He takes the hunter knife out of its sheath and drops the cover along with his military bag on the floor. The gate is now oozing all sorts of negative energies, but Minjun is perfectly ready for anything to come. He knows that the monsters who come out of these gates tend to move in packs, and sure enough, the first silhouette we see comes in the shape of a boar. As it steps out of the gate completely, we see its strong tusks and salivating mouth, along with a purple layer of demonic energy that's covering its entire body. As expected, it's a pack animal, and our boy is fully prepared to take it on. Following right behind the first one, a bunch of other red boars start crawling out of the gate, and the one at the front already seems to have its eyes fixed on our hero for a charge as it roars at him in anger. I guess these bastards stink quite a bit, because even Minjun is forced to close his nose when they get close. While he was busy waving away the stinky air, the stampede is approaching with a charge that's ready to blow him away. But instead of fleeing in response, Minjun braces his knife and starts running towards the boars instead. He starts off by shooting a bunch of dark arrows from his palm, but surprisingly enough, the arrows seem to bounce off on the boar's tough skin. I guess his E-ranked skill isn't strong enough to penetrate the hard skin of these creatures, but that doesn't mean Minjun doesn't have any alternate means. First of all, he jumps up into the air to avoid a direct collision with these charging beasts. 
and while they're confused after losing their target in an instant, our airborne hero is ready with his knife to slice up some angry piggas. He comes raining down with a barrage of swift slashes in all directions, carving up the demonic beasts in quick succession. But even after that attack, the eyes of the creatures stay purple and angry. And although they're all staggering, none of them have fallen to the ground or lost their balance. Minjun acknowledges that their skin is tough, but that doesn't mean their organs and insides will be the same. And so, my boy unleashes his D-ranked skill, Corruption. It sends out waves of volatile demonic energy out of his body, and enters the insides of the monsters through their various cuts and bruises, corrupting their wounds from the inside. With an evil expression, Minjun taunts the creatures if his demonic energy doesn't suit their taste. On the other hand, the sturdy boars are finally starting to bleed to their imminent death. But first, one of them decides to charge one more time with its last remaining strength. Of course, it doesn't take our boy any effort to dodge the attack, and it even works out in his favor as the stupid boar team kills its friend by charging into it instead. It's now time to reap the benefits, so our boy starts absorbing the demonic energy out of the fallen creatures. In a matter of seconds, the light starts to leave the monster's eyes, and the last remaining few also buckle to their knees after having their life force sucked out of their bodies. Now that they're on the verge of death, my boy comes back with his knife to finish the job. With another barrage of quick slashes, he finally manages to carve up the beasts one final time to end their miserable lives. And with that, a bunch of notifications start informing him of his achievements. His demonic energy stat increases by 3 points in total, and his Nightwalker skill gets enhanced to a new level. Moreover, since he was handling a blade, even his basic swordsmanship skill receives a level up. Now that he's done with the ones who rushed out first, Minjun gets ready to face the next wave of monsters. He hopes that more will come pouring out soon, and he can't wait to absorb all of their demonic energy as well. But just then, his enthusiasm is killed when he hears someone call out his name from behind. He turns his head to see what's happening, and it looks like Yunseo is already back with her friends who are now fully armed for combat. Our boy didn't expect them to come so soon, and he gets greeted by a heavy-handed shake-up to his shoulders by one of the girls. This short-haired lady is the Nipo baby's platoon commander, and she seems desperate to know if our boy got hurt by the monsters. Of course, Minjun replies that nothing happened, but the commander finds it hard to believe. She scans him from top to bottom for any injuries, and asks him why he stayed behind to fight the monsters on his own. Once again, Minjun's response stays the same, as he claims that he had to stay behind to buy some time for the rest. His words are sparking a lot of pink hearts and love bubbles inside the thirsty girls of the platoon. Because let's be honest, these poor girls don't get any bad action in the military. On the other hand, our boy is just angry that they came over and ruined the entire purpose of his vacation. He didn't even get to step inside the gate. Anyway, the platoon commander finally asks him about the man's unit number and asks him what he's doing here in the first place. Our hero then takes out his signed leave paper once again and explains that he's Kim Minjun from the 2nd Company of the 2nd Battalion. The female commander verifies the leave, and Yunseo stares awkwardly in the background to see if her reaction will be any different afterward. Naturally, the commander has to ask why a corporal would be strolling around in a restricted area on his rare holiday, and wonders if it's because he lives nearby. That's not really the case of course, so our boy gives the same excuse that he gave to Yunseo, that he had some business in the area, and came over to see if he could help when he heard that a gate had opened nearby. As a skeptical person, the commander finds it hard to wrap her head around the soldier's reasoning, but that doesn't mean the other girls feel the same. They're just swooning over our guy for his heroic behavior. Not seeing any point in interrogating him any further, the commander turns around and tells everyone to vacate the area, until the investigative unit and the attack team arrives to properly resolve the situation with the gate. And as soon as she steps away, the rest of the girl rush towards our hero to ask him a buttload of questions that he's too annoyed to answer. The commander lets out an exhausted sigh after witnessing the unbecoming thirsty behavior of her units, and Yunseo is the only one who stays behind to observe from afar. Meanwhile, my dude is fed up with everyone and everything, and simply wishes that all of them would fuck right off and let him charge into the gate to clear it out himself. Looks like being surrounded by a bunch of hot military girls isn't enough for this fucker, but I guess he has a separate list of priorities. Welcome back to one of my favorite series on the channel, where we start episode 16 during the night time in the camp. A loud shout of confusion is heard coming from the administrative office, and we head inside to see that the platoon commander is on phone with someone, who's updating them about the recent stunt pulled by our hero during his vacation. Unable to believe the report, the shocked commander once again confirms if they're talking about Corporal Kim Minjun from the 2nd Battalion. The man confirms that he's one of his subordinates, and is currently supposed to be on vacation. The next part of the report included our boy's current whereabouts, and the fact that he solo killed a bunch of red boars after volunteering for work. The commander can't help but get up from his seat after this information, surprising his colleague from across the desk. 
as it turns out. The person giving out the report was the Nepo baby's commander. She explains that although the gate has been closed and they are currently disinfecting all of their troops, there's something else that bothers her. She's too confused by the fact that Minjun is still deciding to volunteer and help out with the disinfection, which is a case she has never encountered before. My man's excellent sweeping techniques are being witnessed by the corporal duo from last episode, and the tall beauty can't help but wonder why someone would waste their precious vacation on something so bothersome. The pink shorty, who is already too fed up with the cleaning tasks after her dungeon training, is already head over heels for our hero who's sacrificing his own time to help them out. I swear, these gals are too thirsty to be falling for someone who's literally just being a janitor. Ignoring the heart-filled eyes of her short friend, the tall beauty wonders how our hero managed to kill the dungeon monsters with just a knife. After all, she'd heard that a charge from one of those boars feels like getting hit by Truck Coon and sends you straight to the other world. Meanwhile, the man who has already returned from that other world is a bit frustrated that he couldn't reap the full benefits after killing those monsters. Still, he has decided to help out with the cleaning to leave behind a good image. That's when our favorite Nepo baby approaches him from behind for a talk, surprising the little fucker because his mind was filled with impure intentions. Following up that exaggerated reaction, he proceeds to piss off the girl by saying that he was accidentally about to hit her in the face. You'd think that this would be a start of an interesting conversation, but my man just ditches the girl and tells her to move out of the way when he's cleaning. Surprisingly, Yunseo doesn't look too bothered by his actions and the fact that she keeps getting ignored. It almost feels as if she's accepted our hero's nature. But there's still something she wants to discuss, so she gets direct and asks him if he can spare some time for them to talk. In contrast to the ruined structures of the town, the moon on this night was incredibly beautiful and radiating with its maximum glow. And under its calming light, the two most important characters of this series stood facing each other to exchange some words. As nonchalant as ever, Minjun is the first to break the ice and ask the girl what she needs to say. The Nepo baby runs a hand through her hair, starting the conversation by recalling the first time they met each other during the promotional exam. Back then, she remembers that she was too arrogant in her behavior, but there's one more thing she just can't seem to forget. She confront our hero about it, asking him if he cursed at her from the window seat when he got on that bus to leave. Naturally, this Saitama clone with hair has absolutely no idea what she's talking about, and there's no way he'd remember every time he goes out of his way to piss someone off. But then it clicks to him anyway, the scene of him pressing his ugly mug against that window glass to threaten the girl standing outside. After remembering what happened, he corrects the girl that he didn't curse at her, he was just threatening to kill her if she tried to mess with him again. Of course, that shit is even worse on its own, but Minjun doesn't care. The girl heaves out a heavy sigh after hearing him out, and rolls her eyes like a defeated wife who knows her husband would never quit smoking, even if he says otherwise. In any case, Nipo Baby realizes that she was the one who instigated him first, and although her apology is late, she makes sure to say sorry to the man she's now greatly indebted to. Minjun sees her proper nature and sincerity, but for a wild nut like himself, he finds her way of living to be very tiring. On the other hand, the girl looks up at the man with a concerned face, hoping to see a reaction. And when he says nothing, she asks him directly if he will accept her apology. As you'd expect, Minjun tells her that there was nothing to apologize in the first place, and if that's all she had to say, he will now be taking his leave. But the girl stops him from leaving once again, and points out that there has only been one case in history, where a private managed to get a perfect score on the promotion test. The mention of an achievement gets our boy's attention, and he asks Yunseo if he's the one she's talking about. As the cold night breeze rustles the leaves on the trees, the girl responds that there was someone else, although our hero now holds that record as well. Curious to know more, Minjun asks impatiently about the other person who got the perfect score. The girl opens her mouth to say that it was her dad, but corrects herself immediately and changes the word to father. You can tell by the absolutely adorable smile on her face that Yunseo is definitely a daddy's girl who idolizes her father. Minjun asks if she's talking about the division commander, and with a face full of admiration, she replies with a yes. The girl further adds that her father was the only person in the military to receive two stars on his badge after starting as a private, which is the reason she also enlisted herself in the same rank. Finally, the blockhead is getting interested in the conversation, because he now knows about someone who had achieved the same goals as himself. But then, the wheels in his cobbed up brain start spinning, and he reels back from the shock when he realizes that the hunter army was only formed when he was seven years old. That means her father wouldn't have been young enough to enlist as a private back then, so he wonders what the heck actually happened. The girl explains in detail, starting by the fact that her father used to have a really weak body when he was young, and due to his bad vision and a few other health issues, he got excused from the mandatory military service. That was enough explanation for Minjun to figure out that he probably joined the military on his own when the gates appeared, and the mass awakening effect improved the division commander's physique. 
the girl confirms his theory with a massive smile on her face, mentioning how much his father wanted to grow strong to protect her and her mother. After hearing this much and observing Yunseo's delightful expressions, even the usually indifferent Minjun is now curious about her father and expresses his desire to meet him. I guess our Nipo baby was hoping for the same, because under the shining moonlight with her hourglass figure, and a face full of happiness and respect, the girl confirms that he would get along swimmingly with her father. Her assumption is based on the fact that Major General Sun has an extraordinary affection for strong soldiers, but those people don't usually go around carrying his daughter on their backs. And we now head to the location of the man in question, where massive sounds of pounding tremors are vibrating throughout a gymnasium, and a poor colonel on the sidelines is absolutely losing his shit over what's happening. Looks like Colonel Yu is also present on the scene, and her expression tells us that the situation is already beyond her control. The entire building were shaking, and we hear General Sun's voice echo through the court, asking his opponent if he's come all this way to tell him about Kim min -jun. The panel switches to the bruised-up face of Major General Brutus, who looks shocked to see that Nipo Baby's father already knows about our hero's name. General Sun's face is just as bruised, and while wearing a smile full of confidence, he informs General Brutus that he has an excellent network of information. We then zoom out a little bit, and find out the building was quaking thanks to these absolute human weapons beating the fuck out of each other. Brutus seems worried about what General Sun plans to do with Minjun, and the doting father replies that it's none of his concern. With a swollen cheek and bruised up knuckles, the man charges up for one more powerful fist, and Brutus responds in kindness by charging up an attack of his own. Meanwhile, the colonel on the sidelines is doing nothing but panicking, worried that no one would be able to stop these raging idiots from destroying everything in this building. Although his worries were pretty needless, since Colonel Yu promptly jumped in the middle of their blows when she noticed that things were getting a bit out of hand. With their bloodied fists stopped inches away from her face, she warns the grown-ass men that they have already been fighting for five minutes, and it's now time to give this shit a rest. Guys, I think I got myself a new mommy to worship. Scared of mommy Yu pulling their ears and grounding them for a week, the two children look at each other and activate the silent bro code, signaling the fight to stop. But even if the physical violence has stopped, they both still stand face to face with each other to continue the quarrel. They call each other names and refuse to admit that either of them has lost. And as we zoom out, we find out that the destruction they've caused to the gymnasium is gonna cost them a pretty penny to fix. In any case, the fight ends at last, and we find ourselves outside of the building once again. Brutus sits with gritted teeth on one of the park benches outside, and General Sun wears the same sour expression while sitting next to him on a different bench. Colonel Yu comes to them with a report from the 3rd Battalion commander and informs the two major generals that the Red Boar Gate has been cleared. Brutus acknowledges the report and the hard work of the 3rd Battalion commander and also makes sure to commend Colonel Yu as their senior. True to her character of a strong soldier, the woman accepts the commendation with a firm salute. She then proceeds to exit the scene and leaves the old friends behind to settle their scores in peace. With Mommy Yu out of the picture, General Sun finally speaks up and asks Brutus for the real reason he came here. The bearded behemoth takes a moment to glance in his friend's direction and judge his state of mind. And after seeing that he looks calm enough, he proceeds to inform General Sun to stay clear of Kim Min-jun, because he's going to specially promote him to the position of a sergeant. The calmness on General Sun's face went to shit when he heard our hero's name, and he started fuming that Brutus was rooting for the guy who messed with his daughter. Of course, Brutus lets him know that no one did anything to his daughter, and he should be grateful that Min-jun helped her out when she was injured. They both take a few moments to let off their steam once again, and I'm really starting to wonder how such idiots manage to climb to their positions. Anyway, now that he's a bit more rational, General Sun states that Minjun was only recently promoted to a corporal. And from what he hears, it also wasn't long ago when he was specially promoted to private first class as well. Brutus acknowledges that, and admits that he plans on at least raising him up to the position of a commissioned officer. The doting father lets out a heavy sigh upon hearing this, worried that such an action would give him a lot of unwanted attention. Not to mention, Gu Haxiao, the actual fucking general of the entire hunter army, would definitely want to recruit Minjun under his command, once he finds out that he's earned the acknowledgement of Brutus. Our bearded friend seems to be aware of that, and since he can't possibly go against the general's decision on his own, he has come here to ask Major General Sun to be on his side in the future. Of course, the doting father strikes back by saying that he can't possibly place his blind trust on a man he has never met, and he will decide what to do when he meets our hero in person. Basking under the beautiful radiance of the full moon, the two then stare off into the distance as Brutus asks his friend if he has any ulterior motives. And in response, the man simply chooses to stay silent about his intentions regarding Minjun. At the same time while these old rivals were reuniting, something incredible was happening at the location of our hero. Kim Minjun was surrounded by an ominous energy, and he felt himself reeling back from the sight he was witnessing. 
you see, a dark-robed figure was conjuring himself up in his dimension right before his eyes, and our boy was too stunned to react to this bizarre scenario. Surrounded by dark demonic energy, the man finally finishes materializing and stands up to his feet, and we see his long silver hair peek out from the robes. As he stands up and looks at our hero in front of him, a cunning smile appears on the man's face as he calls out that he has finally found him. But before we explore further what's going on, let's rewind the time a little bit and start from the moment where our hero and his new female friends were going their separate ways. The female soldiers were getting on the bus to leave for their camp, and the girls who had fallen mad for our hero were saying farewell, hoping to meet him again. The pink shorty in particular was very keen on asking him out for a date, but the tall guardian behind her was there to keep her on a leash. Before the shorty could blurt out her phone number for Minjun to call, her friends shut her up by holding her mouth and thanked our hero everything he had done to help them. The pink shorty then turned around to argue why her friend would ruin her perfect moment, and it allowed some time for Yunseo to exchange some glances with our hero. This time, there's no cursing, life threats, or awkward rivalry between them, so the girl simply bids her farewell with a warm smile. Just like that, the bus had left, and our boy was left alone on the road to go about his way. He turned around and heaved out a sigh, looking glad that he could finally stop with his nice guy persona and go back to being normal. That's when he laid his eyes upon something unexpected, and as the perspective switches, the pouting condom head was standing close to him once again. Minjun looked at him with eyes full of disappointment, not knowing what the creature wants this time around. The tiny shadow demon coughs on his hand while extending the other, quite shamelessly asking for more demonic energy for his ever-growing belly. Of course, my man is already angry with Tiny for the misinformation earlier, so there's no way he's gonna reward him with anything good. Tiny looked a bit disappointed after getting rejected, but his expression soon changed once he picked up a weird signal in his head. The adorable condom head started jumping up and down to get his master's attention, but Minjun was already looking in his direction. Since Tiny can't really speak, he communicates with his master by wincing his eyes and exerting demonic energy waves to send his thoughts. The waves tell Minjun that someone from Isgard is currently crossing into this world, and they're not even using a gate to do so. Instead, it's using a direct dimensional portal. Seeing how Tiny was able to detect such a faint presence, our hero finally realizes that maybe his shadow demon isn't meant to be an assassin, but an excellent radar for any traces of demonic energy. Delighted by this news, the excited Minjun tells his little minion to show him the way and take him to the location of this intruder. A few minutes later, the two of them find themselves in the thick of forest woods, and Minjun tosses a ball of demonic energy to Tiny for his excellent work, which the little creature happily accepts. This is when the demonic portal suddenly starts cracking into the air, startling the both who were standing carelessly right next to it. The portal expands slowly into an ominous field of purple pulses, and bursts into crackles of black lightning before a person starts to appear. The next few panels are a repeat of what you saw earlier, so I will save you the trouble and switch them quickly to bring you up to speed. After the man from the portal seemingly recognizes our hero, we found out that Minjun is in fact extremely repulsed by the intruder's appearance. The panel flips to the face of the silver-haired man who just appeared, and I'm suddenly not sure of this guy's actual gender. I guess I'll just assume he's a male until we're told otherwise. Anyway, a blob of snot starts dangling from the man's nose, and abruptly starts rushing at our hero with tears of happiness. He refers to Minjun as Master Minold, but my dude just wants him to stay the fuck away. Not that his concern was necessary, because the weird person trips by himself and falls flat on his face for reasons unknown. Concerned for the man's safety, Minjun reluctantly goes closer to check up on him, while Tiny waves goodbye because this shit is way beyond his pay grade. It looks like our boy has also recognized this person, because he asks him why he followed him to this world when he told him to leave him be. Looks like the snot has somehow migrated to the other nostril and the man with the weirdly feminine eyes is still busy crying while looking at our hero. Minjun sees how the man's devotion to him is the same as he remembers, and heaves a sigh of relief as he remembers their first meeting. You see, back in the other world, this silver-haired dude was once on the verge of death in the middle of a desert dungeon. A heavily clawed paw of a beast stomped close to him, and we zoom out to see that he was about to be devoured by a manticore monster. The man had accepted his defeat and closed his eyes, but opened them again when he realized that he was still somehow alive. To his surprise, the beast was stopped in its tracks by a mysterious ball of demonic energy. The volatile ball had killed the monster, and the owner of this power made his appearance on the scene. It turned out to be none other than our boy Minjun, and while calling back his powers, he was intrigued by the presence of another human in this desolate place. He then comes closer to the fallen man, standing tall over his head while inquiring to know his identity. The man was trembling in front of the dark maid's presence, and he was too famished to exchange any words. Our hero noticed that the silver hair was nearly at the edge of death, and leaned in closer to comment how he was strangely handsome for a dude stuck in a desert. He was about to ask him why he wasn't speaking, 
but that's when the man opened his mouth to ask if the Dark Mage was Master Minold. Our hero gets confused why he knows about him, and out of nowhere, the silver-haired handsome starts crying with tears in his eyes. He starts trembling and shaking, and comments how Master Minold is the hope of all Dark Mages in the world. Minjun gets repulsed by such words of course, and is even more surprised that the silver hair was also a dark mage. He then stands back on his feet, and asks the man why he's so fucking weak if he's also from the same class, and wonders if that's somehow normal in this world. In any case, he could care less about such things, and waves goodbye to the man after warning him not to refer to him with such cringe titles. But before leaving, he remembers something very crucial that makes him stop. My man turns around, and the polite Korean inside him is suddenly worried that he didn't ask for the man's name he had just saved. The silver-haired dark mage lowers his head upon hearing the question, and depressingly replies that he doesn't have a name. That seems very odd to our hero, but he's not one to ask a lot of questions. Still, seeing that the man doesn't even have a name on top of being weak as shit, Minjun thinks that he's the perfect person to give him a proper name. That's when the next panel brings us back to the present, where he is once again holding the pathetically weak dark mage who somehow managed to follow him to this world. He calls the man Li Bongu and shakes him aggressively to ask why he would risk traveling to another dimension. Now I know you guys are also curious, so I went ahead and googled what Bongu means in Korean. And holy fuck, my man actually named this handsome dude as Li Fart. I'm well aware that fart jokes get boring really quickly, so I'll just leave you with this translation, and go back to calling him Bongu from here onwards. Anyway, Mr. Bongu is looking like he's about to collapse any second, and replies to our hero that he had no choice, because Minjun disappeared without leaving behind a single note, and his cult has been on the verge of collapse ever since. Our hero gets pissed to hear this. He never wanted any loose screw fanatics to start worshipping him in the first place, so why the heck would he tell them before leaving? Looks like my guy had a very devoted fan club in the world of Viscard. And one such fan followed him back to Earth after all, so he once again gets annoyed and pushes the silver-haired dark mage back to the ground. Just like how you would wave away the air after farting. The man starts crying like a maiden in distress, complaining that he should at least have taken him along as his right-hand man. Needless to say, I doubt that this weak-ass dude is gonna become anyone's right-hand man in the near future. In any case, Minjun is now starting to get annoyed at how easily the guy keeps collapsing, so he extends his hand and injects him with some of his demonic energy to recover his strength. And just like that, the famished dark mage springs back to his feet like Ieda Senzu Bean from Dragon Ball. The man feels blessed to have been saved by our hero once again, and promises to repay his kindness with the rest of his life. However, Minjun has had enough of his nonsense, and he now wants him to quickly tell him how he managed to come here. With a serious look on his face, the man replies that his arrival in this world was a miracle, created by his longing to always stay next to his savior. This shit is getting gay really quickly, so Minjun tells him to cut the crap and get serious. I mean, he knows that there's no way such a weak dark mage could possibly gather enough energy to open a dimensional gate, and he suspects the Saintess of Iskard must be the one who sent him here. Once again, the fanatic replies that Minjun devotees never follow anyone's orders, and he's the only one they worship. Fed up with his cringe, my dude pops a vein on his forehead, and threatens to kill this so-called devotee if he doesn't tell him the truth. So, finally understanding his situation, the cultist dark mage starts explaining that he was keeping an eye on the saintess due to some disturbing rumors. The scene switches to Iskard, and we explore the man's memories as he was surveilling the giant cathedral in the body of a raven. After successfully crossing the barrier and infiltrating the building, he turned back to his human self to keep tabs on the rumors. People were reporting that strange sounds were coming from the temple every night, and the dark mage was hiding here to investigate. He took a peek at what was happening, and found a bunch of temple guards transporting some cages. From the cages, you could see the silhouette of some growling beasts possessed by demonic energy, and from the tusk of this one in particular, I'm pretty sure it's one of the red boars that Minjun defeated later. Rumor had it that the temple was catching a large number of monsters, and from the way these guards are transporting the cages, it's safe to say that everything was true. Bongu followed them up to the door, and what he saw inside had completely left him shocked and bewildered. Although the saintess and the guards noticed his presence, he managed to find out why none of the monsters were ever seen leaving the temple. And following his intuition, the man jumped straight into the summoning portal in the chamber instead of trying to run away. He had wondered how these monsters could have disappeared without a single trace, and without a doubt in his mind, this ominous summoning circle was the reason. Minjun quickly grabbed the man's collar when he finished explaining, and threatened him with a serious face to make sure he's telling the truth. But of course, there's no way such a devout person would lie to his idol, and Minjun was now left wondering how dirty the saintess really wants to play this game. And since he now knows that the blonde bitch was actually behind all the demonic monsters he was encountering, Minjun figured that his new friend may also know about a certain item he found a few days ago. 
he shows him the piece of Damascus steel that he found in a troll monster he had defeated, and asks him if he recognizes this metal. Judging by the pattern and the shape of the metal, Bongu can easily guess that the fragment resembles the blades that the temple guards carry on their person. In particular, it strongly resembles the blade of the guard captain, who was also our hero's Spartan teacher in Iskard. When he mentions it, Minjun also suddenly remembers his sword, and a shiver is sent down his spine when he remembers those absolutely hellish days where he was trained like a fucking donkey. In any case, now that he knows the truth, our hero wonders why Bongu decided to enter the circle instead of running away, especially when there was no guarantee where he could have arrived. Not to mention, there was a very good chance for him to get killed if he was one step too late to enter the circle. Of course, the mad lad just laughs it off, because he didn't really think any of this through. It doesn't really surprise our hero either, because his cult followers were neither very smart, nor were they normal in any sense of the word. He then proceeds to look again at the blade fragment in his hand, and thinks long and hard about what the saintess must be planning by doing something so strange. I'm also not too sure of her end game, but it's pretty clear that she's only feeding our hero with more demonic power, which he otherwise had no way of increasing in his world. Welcome back to this epic manhwa, where we resume the story 1200 days before Kim Min Jun's return to Earth. During one beautiful sunset in Isgard, the saintess was staring off into the distance next to her temple. Her flowy blonde hair was shining mesmerizingly in the orange sunlight, and she wore an expression of loneliness on her face. Her daze was interrupted when she heard a familiar voice from behind, asking her what's the matter. As she turned around, the voice belonged to none other than our hero, who was curious to know why he was called to see her. Pushing back her hair and sprouting a radiant smile on her face, the saintess simply commented that it's quite nice to be outside and feel the wind. But of course, our hero is a thought slayer, and there's no way in hell he's gonna let himself be swept away by this sort of mood. In fact, he's incredibly pissed at the woman's answer. With a bitter tongue and a popping vein, he replies that he's been sleeping out on the fields for several weeks, and he's definitely not in the mood to be getting cozy in the wind. As is evident by the saintess's expression, you can tell that she's regretting her choice of words as well. In any case, she brings back the smile on her face, and apologizes with a lonely expression for her inconsideration. After all, she was simply excited to be out in the open since she can't really leave the territory of the temple any further. Once again, Minjun could care less for her sob story, and immediately asks her again why she called him. Finally, the saintess gets to the topic, and replies that she received some reports of our hero's colleagues getting seriously injured inside a dungeon. She was about to mention their extremely embarrassing cult name, but our boy cuts her off to clarify that none of those idiots can be called his colleagues, and he's definitely not a part of any such cult. Moreover, he clarifies that they followed him on his own, and then got injured by some dark hounds, and since he has already treated their injuries, he'd rather not think about them any further. The saintess smiles at the mention of dark hounds, as she's once again learned a new word from our hero. Seeing her expression, Minjun walks closer to her, and elaborates that he's referring to a monster called the Parkas. Since its literal translation in his home language is a dark hound, he prefers to use that instead. But that in turn makes him beg a certain question, and he suddenly turns serious to ask the saintess about it. You see, Minjun wants to know if there's really no connection between Isgard and planet Earth, which was swarmed by these exact same monsters before he got summoned. After a brief moment of silence, the saintess replies with a simple yes. Not gonna lie, her expression right now makes her look very suspicious. In any case, she explains that gates and monsters began to appear in Isgard hundreds of years ago. If there's any connection between this world and the Earth, then it's the fact that they're both suffering from the same unusual phenomenon although she admits that it makes sense for him to be suspicious, especially because he came to Iskard through a gate. But she also clarifies that dimensional travel is not so easy. A lot of energy and resources were spent in summoning only Minjun to this world, so it would be impossible for them to conjure so many dungeon gates and monsters through different dimensions. Our boy gives the woman a keen look of observation after hearing her explanation, and after confirming her answer, he starts walking back while giving a singular warning. When the time comes for him to go back home, he simply wants the saintess to not go back on her words. Once again, we see an unexplainable smile of confidence on the woman's face as he watches him leave, almost as if there's a lot she has planned that she's not yet willing to reveal. Regardless, that marks the end of the little flashback, and we now find ourselves back in the present timeline. Inside the mountains where our hero discovered his number one fan, he thinks about the exchange with the saintess that we just witnessed. Since he never really trusted her, he investigated a lot about Iskard on his own, and unfortunately, whatever the saintess said appeared to be true. At that time, it was indeed impossible for her to move large dungeons and monsters to his current dimension, but things now seem to be very different. He has been running into demonic monsters one after another, and he can't really figure out why the saintess would spend so much of her holy power to do something so pointless. 
one explanation that comes to his mind is the presence of holy artifacts, which could make it possible for her to be able to perform such a feat. But even then, it doesn't really answer if she's actually going to so much trouble just to catch our hero. In any case, while he was wondering about all of this, his attention is diverted by the creature in front of him. Mr. Fart, also known as Lee Bongu, is currently bending the knee to proclaim his eternal loyalty to Master Minold, who has once again saved his life. Minjun knows that there's nothing he can do to dissuade such an absurd fanatic, so he tells him to at least call him by his real name, since Minold was just an alias back in his guard. With a face full of excitement, the fanatic tries referring to his master with his proper name. But Korean is hard, and he fucks up the pronunciation in a way that I can't even describe. Minjun tries to correct him, but immediately gives up and asks if Bongu is able to utilize some imitation arts. The man confirms that he can, but our boy is a bit doubtful since he could only spare him a little bit of his demonic energy, as it's an extremely hard resource to collect on Earth. Once again, the fanatic thanks his master for whatever he was spared, and confirms that he's still able to transform into a small animal with his current level of energy. Minjun is happy to hear this, and points Bongu's gaze at a nearby crow, telling him to mimic the bird. Without a moment's delay, the dark mage coats himself in his demonic energy, and Faze shifts into a crow within seconds. Appreciating his new look, our hero orders his subordinate to move with his other minion, and move inside the shadows unless he's called for. The minion in question is staring daggers at his new rival already, and I'm pretty sure he doesn't approve of his presence. With his tiny and chubby legs, he moves closer to the fanatic. The condom head turns into a dickhead to express his annoyance, and the crow stares back to stay his ground. The tiny creatures stand within kissing range of each other, ready to go on a brawl for no fucking reason. Minjun stops them of course, but the crow starts getting jumpy in anger and dissatisfaction. My dude tells him to stop fucking around and use proper words, so the man finally speaks while staring into the eyes of his rival. As the self-proclaimed right-hand man of his master, he wants to make his hierarchy clear in front of Tiny. But of course, Minjun is having none of this bullshit, and orders the both of them to shake hands and let this matter go, or he'll abandon them on the sidewalk. For a moment, the two familiars stand comically in anger like Tom and Jerry, but after realizing that they can't go against their master, they both shake hands and save the matter for a later time. While the peace lasts under the rustling green trees of the forest, Minjun quickly makes it clear that Bongu will follow Tiny's instructions to know what he needs to do, and Tiny will stop Bongu from doing anything crazy if he loses his way. With safety first as their chief motto, the master asks his minions if they understand, and the creatures salute in response to confirm. And with that, he finally dismisses his familiars to go on their respective missions. The crow flaps its wings to take flight, and the night walker disappears into his shadow to tag along. Now the both of them being part of a singular body, they finally fly off into the night sky to do whatever the fuck they're supposed to do. As Minjun watches them leave, he heaves a sigh of relief with a rumbling stomach. Not sure if anything is still open at this hour, but my man expresses his desire to fill his stomach with some ramen and then go to sleep. A few days later, we find ourselves back at the camp where an excited Corporal Gwangshik bursts into the locker room to announce something exciting. The boys were being boys and hanging out as usual, but no one was able to interpret the former asshole's excited expression. After a moment of awkward silence, Ponytail commented that maybe his friend has finally gone insane, and the rest of them seemed to share the same opinion. Still, Orange Hair and his friend entertained Gwangshik's enthusiasm and asked him to explain what the fuss is about. With a big-ass smirk on his face, the man informs everyone that the platoon's quarterly performance chart has finally been posted in front of the admin office. That news garners the attention of a few sleepy individuals, and while Sergeant Lee puts on his uniform, someone comments that he probably got the first position again. There were a lot of raids and trainings this quarter of the year, and as the usual ace achiever, it's not too difficult to imagine Sergeant Lee at the top. Even Guangshik confirms that Lee was able to attain 75 points according to the result, which only assures the rest that he's most likely to take the first spot. But of course, we can't ignore the latest spice to the mix, and Guangshik makes sure to reveal the most surprising news of all. With a very docile expression, he whispers to the others that Sergeant Lee has actually only managed to get second in this quarter. For a moment, the others were excited that the top dog finally got dragged down a peg, but it also raised some concerns about who managed to get more than 75 points in the assessment. We already know who it is, and the man in question comes saluting into the locker room at literally the most perfect timing. As Minjun gets busy greeting his peers, the orange hair starts speculating if he's the one who topped Lee Seung Ho. Guangshik confirms this, and adds that our hero actually managed to shake the entire division by attaining a whopping 99 points in the assessment. Naturally, such an unfathomable feat garnered an insane reaction from the clueless corporals, who didn't even know that achieving such an absurd score was possible. Just then, the platoon commander walks into the room to see his subordinates, and everyone responds with a salute. 
he waves to Kim and Jun to ask if he had a good vacation, who enthusiastically responds that it was a great time. And while looking pleased to hear that response, the commander decides to show our hero the result of his latest achievements. The item in question results in some pretty strong reactions from the rest, who can hardly believe how this is possible. The only exception was Sergeant Lee, who somehow kept his face turned as if he already knew what was happening. You see, what the commander held in his hand was the symbol of a sergeant, which basically means that our boy was promoted once again. To receive a promotion without passing any test means that it's a special exception, and since Minjun's last promotion was also one such case, everyone finds it hard to believe that it has actually happened again. But regardless of their doubts, the commander confirms that they received the official documentation at their division today. And not only was Minjun chosen as the best soldier in the entire division during the hunter field maneuvers, but his volunteer work to clear a dungeon during his vacation was also highly acknowledged by the military. As a result, the division commander Brutus, who had a really merry time at the tin can dungeon with our hero, once again gave special orders to process his promotion. Needless to say, my dude was more than overjoyed at such blissful news, and he couldn't help but think even more highly about Brutus. And now, the platoon commander removes the three bars of a corporal from Minjun's shirt, and replaces them with four bars, which now officially showcase that he has been promoted to a sergeant. Naturally, a promotion is always a cause for celebration, and the entire unit claps wholeheartedly for their brand new sergeant except maybe one person, who was looking incredibly concerned regarding a certain matter. As Ponytail takes out a folded piece of paper from his pocket, we see that it's the same bet they placed before their dungeon training about Kim Minjun's next promotion, where Guangshik made the unbelievable estimate of one month with his entire salary on the line. Although it's still a bit unbelievable, Guangshik is more than happy to have won this bet, and Ponytail has no choice but to accept the reality and give up on his salary. But of course, lottery winners always get targeted whenever they win, and the paper was immediately snatched from the corporal's hand. The snatcher was none other than Minjun, and his new subordinates were already sweating bullets in nervousness about what he might do with their bet. As expected, our hero targets his disciple first and asks him if he's aware that he's now addressing a sergeant. It goes without saying that the former asshole has long since learned his lesson and would never dare look down upon the sergeant. After taking a thorough look at the paper, Minjun sees that his disciple has won a very generous bet, and Guangshik wastes no time confirming this information, although he stumbles multiple times over his words. By now, the poor corporal is extremely nervous and sweating, because he had no idea what our hero might be thinking. I guess his anxiety is justified, because Minjun is wearing one of the most wicked expressions I've seen him wear in a long time. He comments that it must be nice to be a winner, and I can only imagine what he's planning to do with his disciple. In the next scene, we're taken to a new location, where our hero is still donning his new badge and smiling like someone who's really having the time of his life. The reason for his happiness might just be the misery of these people who bet on him, and the two of them are already standing on attention and sweating. Meanwhile, poor Guangshik looks like his face is almost about to explode, and he desperately offers to give 30% of his winnings to Minjun. Our hero looks down at the struggling man and proclaims that he isn't doing this for the money. Hearing this, Guangshik raises the offer to 40%. And as we finally zoom out to get the full view, we see that Minjun was forcing him to exercise with the stupidly heavy red stones. Once again, he tells his disciple that money isn't the problem, and he wants Guangshik to understand that he's not really upset by the bets either. The poor man, who's also crying at this point, apologizes for the misunderstanding, but that doesn't explain why he's being punished. And to add fuel to the fire, Minjun even tries to add more pressure on the poor fellow's weights. Finally, just as the corporal's soul begins to leave his body, our hero decides to take pity and lifts up the bar with a single hand. The steaming corporal is now looking almost lifeless on the bench, and his two friends are scared beyond belief to see how the sergeant is managing to lift the redstone weights with just one hand. You see, according to Minjun, none of this can be considered as punishment, as he's simply helping his disciple train who previously expressed his desire to grow stronger. Moving on, he'd like to extend his generosity to the other two as well, but the betting addicts both nervously reject the humble offer in fear of their lives. Seeing their disagreement, Minjun shows a pitiful expression and calls it a shame that they don't want to train. And taking his smile as a positive signal, the corporals try to make the escape by saying they now have somewhere they need to be. Of course, they're stopped in their tracks when they hear the ominous tone of our hero, who's still repeating that it's such a shame. He then slowly turns to face the two, and with an absolutely horrifying smile, he reminds the corporals how it's a real shame they actually think they have the right to refuse his commands. Shivers are sent down the spines of the poor gamblers in pure horror of what might happen next, and as we step out of the training room, we can hear nothing but screams of agony. A while later, Guangshik is still unconscious on his bench, and the other two are coughing and panting on top of a pool of their own sweat. Looks like they had a really nice workout. Minjun takes this unfortunate timing to finally reveal that he has a favor to ask from the corporals. 
and immediately, the both of them are alerted to hear his commands. As long as it's not physical training, these idiots are actually willing to do absolutely anything. That's when Minjun starts hitting them with some facts of low-class injustice, where if a hunter is lower than private first class, he can't use either the training room to train or the PC room to play games. At first, the two corporals were lost in the sauce, but then our hero starting expanding that anyone who's lower than the sergeant is not even allowed to use a smartphone, and the list simply goes on. After hearing his complaints for a while, the gamblers rise up on their feet. They have the most resolute expressions you're ever going to see them make, and they completely understand that such discrimination and injustice in this day and age is extremely barbaric. And so, although they don't really give a rat's ass, they both understand their assignment and look at each other to acknowledge that they must work together in order to eradicate such rules. That's exactly what our hero wanted for them, but he warns him to not go overboard with any of their actions. He says that he will try to convince the other sergeants to lift some useless regulations, but he's going to leave the rest to the corporal duo. Of course, his commands are immediately accepted by the cornered gamblers, who would love nothing more than to leave this room if they're done with the details. With a small chuckle and a sigh, our boy waves his hand and allows them to leave. Ponytail and his friends start bolting out of the room as fast as they can, and Guangshik finally regains his consciousness at the same time as well. He tries to follow behind the two with his trembling body, but is immediately stopped by Minjun once again. Almost fearing for his life, the man turns around slowly to acknowledge the call of his sergeant. But at this point, the poor man is hardly able to keep his eyes focused in one direction. And to add salt to his wounds, Minjun reveals that there has been a reshuffle of personnel, and Guangshik has been placed under his squad going forward. From now on and always, the poor corporal will be forced to train together with our hero with his life hanging from a thread, and there's absolutely nothing he can do but cry out his eyes and accept his fate. Although I feel a bit sorry for him, I'm sure he'll turn out to be a solid companion for our hero in the future. Next up, we jump through time to get to the next event. But first, let's take a moment to learn about a certain monster. This slithery thing is called the snake mine, and it's a snake-like monster that lives underground for the most part. They are often found in large groups or colonies, and unlike most snakes from Earth, these monsters are not venomous. Other than their four green eyes, their most distinguishing feature is the two-headed rattle on their tails. When these snakes are killed, they explode themselves in a small but lethal radius. Which is why, you have to cut off their tails first, because the rattle acts as a detonator to the explosion. Right now, these snakes are writhing in pain after having their tails cut off, and the perpetrators are none other than our favorite hunter platoon. In order to avoid a chain explosion from these creatures, the platoon commander and his squads are slowly cutting off their tails so this dungeon can be cleared. Normally, a small team of experienced hunters is usually dispatched to deal with the snake dungeon, but this time seems different. Before Sergeant Lee had a chance to react, a mine snake had already leapt into the air to aim for his throat. He tries to block his face by guarding up with his arm, but his eyes are left wide open when the threat is suddenly dealt with. You see, someone had caught the snake's tail, and it prevented the monster to extend its body all the way to the sergeant. The catcher was once again our hero, Kim Minjun, and the bag full of mine snakes on his back shows us the reason why no one is really concerned about the creatures. After all, this dude had caught countless of these things back in Isgard, and he's experienced enough to clear this entire dungeon by himself, without letting a single snake explode. With him around the block to help out, the commander and the others can breathe a sigh of relief for sure. Looks like by the time we were shown the action, the platoon had already made good progress in the dungeon, and the commander was now ordering everyone to take a ten-minute break. The soldiers took a breather beneath the shade of some rustling trees after clearing out the ground, and the commander got busy mapping out their route along with Kim Minji. Sergeant Lee was busy inspecting his weapon for the next battle, and Minjun was seriously happy that he unlocked yet another skill. This skill is called the Agility Boost, and at its current rank, it's allowing our hero's agility stat to increase by 5. Our boy would have preferred for a class-exclusive skill to show up, but even something like Agility Boost is enough to make this trip worth his time. At the same time while he was inspecting his status, his crow familiar started speaking to him via telepathy, which immediately alerted Minjun's attention. The crow informs him that he has detected the presence of some demonic energy, and it's gathered in a fairly considerable amount. This information is important, so our hero looks around to clear the coast before discussing it any further. He then expresses his absolute joy at the news, and asks the crow about its current location. The scene then switches back to Lee Bongu's perspective, as he stands within electrocuting range on a pole in front of some house. After a needlessly dramatic pause, the crow responds that he's currently inside the ancient metropolitan city. A few days later on a weekend, we see the same house that Bongu was scouting, but it's now during the night time. Our hero stands cautiously next to a nearby pole in his jacket, and as the crow comes swooping to land on his shoulder, he asks his minion about the current situation. 
as instructed by his master before. Bongu confirms that he didn't take any action and only kept watch from a distance. However, since he couldn't sense the presence of a monster, it's more likely that the demonic energy is the byproduct of a dungeon. Minjun then asks for the number of people inside the house, and the crow informs that no one was seen inside the building until yesterday. Right now, however, one person is confirmed to be living in that house. According to the crow, the infiltration would have been much easier if Minjun had come here the previous day. But our hero scoffs at such a suggestion, since it was already really hard for him to get the permission for an overnight stay outside of his camp. In any case, he gets ready to get going by putting up his mask, but he would hate to go as far as to call it trespassing. After all, he's simply going inside the house to remove some extremely dangerous objects. Now that might make some sense on paper, but it is still very blatantly a crime, so Minjun warns his familiar to not get caught. With that said, the next thing we're shown is our boy's boot on a ledge, and we zoom out to see that he's entered the house through an open window. After sneakily turning the corner towards the living room, it seems as if our hero has finally laid his eyes on the object that brought him here. It was a piece of purple crystal sitting on top of the TV cabinet, and it seemed to be the thing that was oozing all of that demonic energy. Minjun approaches the object rather cautiously, but even though its demonic energy can be felt really clearly, it doesn't seem harmful to the body at all. Getting even closer to the enclosed crystal, our boy almost feels as if its energy was somehow refined. Before he can touch it however, a voice comes from behind to warn him not to move. We see a very familiar physique of a female soldier with blue hair, and Minjun feels like he has been caught red-handed in his crime. As you must have already guessed, the voice belonged to none other than our favorite Nipo baby, who's dressed very loosely inside her night dress. I guess that means that this is her home, and she's once again about to get reunited with our hero in the most unexpected way possible. In this video, we start our story from back inside the house that our hero infiltrated in the last episode. The Nipo baby was still unaware of the home invasion, and was chilling down on the bed with her phone in her hand. Looks like she was talking to her mom, who was pretty excited to inform her that she went on a movie date with her father. Unable to believe that her usually strict father actually booked some tickets to the theater for her wife, the daughter couldn't help but smile at his cute side. Her mom asks her if she'll be fine on her own in the house, and while Yunseo was writing down a reply, she heard a certain rattle in the house. It was concerning enough to make her stop writing and get alert, so she quickly opened the door to take a peek outside. Looks like the noise was coming from downstairs, so without any hesitation, she started sneaking down to confirm what's up. That's when she noticed something from the corner of her eye, the dark figure of a hooded man, sneaking about her living room like a robber. Of course, being the soldier that she is, the girl decided to call out to the invader and warned her not to move. She had already struck her fighting stance by now, and since she was convinced that no one would dare try to rob the house of a military general, she demanded the invader to reveal his motive. It took a moment for our hero to slowly turn around and acknowledge the voice, and when he looked at the person behind her, he was completely shocked to his core. Of all the people he could have expected to meet in a place like this, it just had to be the Nepo baby, someone he just can't seem to shake off his tail. Gotta admit though, our girl is looking smoking hot in those pajamas. Anyway, the two of them shared an awkward moment of silence in the living room, with neither of them saying anything at all. Naturally, Minjun was quite pissed at this point at the absolute absurdity of this coincidence. He stared daggers at the stupid crow who brought him here, and scared of his master's wrath, the traitorous bastard started pointing his feathers at the condom head, claiming that he's the one who first detected the demonic presence. Our boy could care less about the quarrel of his minions, and now that he knows that he's inside a division commander's house, he can kind of accept why there would be a byproduct of a dungeon inside. But what he can't accept are the absolutely worse odds of meeting the Nepo baby here. It was the same back when he found her during his forced vacation as well, and it really seems as if they're both bound by an ill-fated relationship. Our guy puts up his hands in frustration and annoyance, and the girl behind him sees it as a sign of aggression. Alerted by the danger, she puts up her fists and warns the intruder to freeze in his spot, as he's been clearly warned to not do anything stupid. Minjun ignores the warning of course, and simply puts his hands back in his pocket, convincing himself that he won't leave empty-handed. His careless actions alerted the girl to make her move, and she immediately took action to subdue the hooded figure. Her first attack was a high kick, which our boy ducked without a single moment of hesitation, while also rummaging around his pocket to look for something. He took out a pen and a folded piece of paper that he was randomly carrying, probably because he expected to leave a note of apology somewhere during his mission. Determined to drive the bastard out of her house, the girl relentlessly kept attacking him with a 1-2 boxing combo, but our boy simply dodged all attacks and continued his writing on the paper. Naturally, Yunseo was getting quite pissed at this point, so she decided to close things out with a heel kick to the robber's head. That's when our boy was finally forced to pay some attention to his attacker, and he noticed that the girls had improved a fair amount since the last time he saw her. In fact, he believes that she has the potential to get promoted to the position of a sergeant pretty soon. 
Still, after dodging away all of her kicks, Minjun got quite bored when a karate chop was coming to his neck, and instead of dodging once again, he simply chose to block this attack with his hand, utterly surprising the girl in the process. It's quite clear that our Nipo baby is still a thousand years behind this bastard when it comes to combat. And even though she didn't know who she was fighting, the girl was finally starting to realizing the gap between herself and her opponent. Quite nonchalantly, he pushes her hand down to waist length and grips it tight with the other one, almost like a dirty businessman sealing an unfavorable deal with a company on the verge of bankruptcy. Naturally, the girl got disgusted and snapped her hand away from him in anger, demanding to know what the fuck he was doing. Her eyes were now laser-focused on her opponent, since it became quite clear that she wasn't fighting with an ordinary civilian, but a high-level awakened. Determined to take this seriously and do her best, Yunseo once again took her stance to fight and swung her leg at our hero with an axe kick. Of course, it was dodged once again, but Minjun also took this chance to gain some distance from the soldier. His eyes were only focused on one thing alone, and it was nothing other than the crystal full of demonic energy. So this time, instead of avoiding his opponent, he went charging straight for the girl. Given his extraordinary speed, Yunseo instinctively put up her guard as she knew she wouldn't be able to dodge in time. But as you'd expect, the dude simply twirled around her, grabbed the bottled crystal, and bolted out of the living room in a single go. By the time our Nipo baby noticed what had happened, Minjun was already up on the balcony and out of the house. She tried to go after him and make him stop, but it's pretty clear that she was a step too late. My guy was already hopping out of the fence by now, accompanied by his bird companion. Yunseo stared at the crazy bastard in astonishment, absolutely stunned at the fact that she couldn't hit him even once. That's when she noticed the paper in hand, which Minjun secretly put it there during the dirty handshake from earlier. Curious to know the contents, she opened it immediately to see what it's about. Surprisingly, you would expect a few words of apology, but all we see is a single taunting word that I'm too old to understand. Still, it's very clear that the word was actually meant as an insult of some sort, because this is the first time I've seen our girl get so mad. As the perpetrator in question escaped the scene of crime in the middle of the night, the entire block could hear the faint echoes of curses getting thrown at him by Yunseo. A short walk away, the hero managed to hide himself inside the woods and immediately got to inspecting the weird crystal that brought him so far away from his camp. He was surprised to know that the object had a lot more demonic energy than most mutated monsters, and since it was inside the house of a hunter, it's safe to assume that its energy isn't harmful to the human body. We get a weird angle from the crow, shivering and commenting that the crystal probably belongs to a monster itself. And as we zoom out, we see that both these goons are currently facing punishment for their previous misinformation. Ninjun of course replies that he's aware that this is a monster crystal, but he doesn't remember giving anyone permission to talk. But even so, the fact remains that this monster crystal contains demonic energy, which is something that our hero never even encountered in Iskard. Usually, monster crystals are precious minerals that can occasionally be found inside some monsters. Their size varies depending on the danger level of the monster itself, but they all contain mana inside that's proportional to the crystal's size. Among all the materials that you can obtain from hunting monsters, this mineral is most definitely the most valuable item. But Minjun just drops it on the floor and watches the container break open as the crystal lies scattered on the ground. Since a crystal full of demonic energy instead of mana has been unheard of, our hero of course seizes the opportunity to crush it in his hand and start absorbing all of its plentiful power. And just like that, an absurd amount of demonic energy starting floating around the soldier, seeping into his body to make him even stronger. Multiple status windows popped up in front of him, informing about his increase in stats and the amount of energy absorbed. With such an immense power-up without having to face any consequences, Minjun is more than happy to have made this trip. He doesn't know what schemes the Saintess is planning against him, but he has no time to overthink each of his choices. That's when the system also announced the addition of two new skills to his arsenal. The first one is named Demonic Energy's Singularity, and the second one is called the Demonic Energy's Grasp. Needless to say, Minjun is extremely delighted to obtain two new skills at once. He opens up his status window to see his complete character stats, and we get a rundown of all his skills and their proficiency thus far. Pleased to see his ever-increasing weapons, our hero opens up the details of his latest additions. First up is the Demonic Energy's Singularity, which is a toggle skill to erase the odor and corruption effects of your own demonic energy. Since Minjun has been becoming extremely overpowered at an actually alarming rate, it was becoming hard for him to control all of his absorbed power. But with the help of his new skill, his concerns have been taken care of completely. I swear, the timing couldn't have been more perfect. On top of that, he also received back another skill that he's very familiar with, and he tries using it by extending his hand at his confused minions who are still being punished. All of a sudden, the crow gets lifted into the air against his will, and we find out that Minjun is using the demonic energy's grasp, which he just unlocked. Quite conveniently and effortlessly, the familiar floated onto the hand of his master, showcasing the usefulness of this ability. 
Our boy is a bit disappointed though, since this much weight seems to be the limit of the skill at its current proficiency. But back in Iskard, he could use this power to drag around ogres and even larger monsters. In any case, after confirming the effects for himself, the master tosses his familiar back to his buddy and assigns them both with a brand new task. Now that he has seen a monster crystal infused with demonic energy, he wants his minions to find out more information about this phenomenon and figure out if more of these minerals exist on Earth. Of course, being his loyal henchmen, the cartoonish fuckers heed his commands like soldiers, promising to bring back some satisfactory results. The carrot and stick strategy is useless without the carrot, so Minjun decides to show them some mercy and toss a bit of his energy for them to feed upon. But as soon as their master turns around, they go back to their roots and start fighting to gain monopoly over his favor. And when he turns back to look at them again, the little pieces of shit go back to being buddies like they're some married couple. Seeing them being so pitiful, our hero wonders if he should show his otherworldly friend the charms of his planet. He asks Lee Bongu if he has ever tried Korean food before, and the next thing we know, we're at a local soup shop in the town. The table is lined up with various ingredients along with some rich bowls of broth, and you can mix and make the perfect soup to your liking. Upon having just a single spoonful, the friend from another world starts crying, unable to believe that such a perfect harmony of godly flavors was even possible. His reaction is so exaggerated that even the waiter lady is put off by him, but the dude is just crying there and being an overall embarrassment. He chomps and slurps on the marvelous bowl of food, thanking his master for blessing him with such an experience. Naturally, Minjun snaps and tells the bugger to mind his manners and stop talking while he's eating, so the man immediately goes back to devouring his soup. Still, given the fact that most people only get to eat a fucking sand biscuit for ration in Isgard, it's not hard for our hero to believe why Bongu would act so surprised. After all, it might just be his first ever proper meal since the day he was born. Anyway, Minjun's phone suddenly starts ringing, and he takes his out of his pocket to look at a weird string of messages. Looks like it's a group chat for the second squad of the platoon and Guangxik seems to be the only acting member. Heck, he even invited back Sergeant Lee, who had apparently left the chat of his own volition. In any case, the dude seems a bit worked up about something. He is desperate to inform Minjun that the camp is starting their guerrilla training next week, and their training schedule is looking absolutely bonkers. Fast forward the time a little, and we're already at the start of the guerrilla training. For something with such a serious name, the training looks rather normal at first. The soldiers are seen doing squats, jumping jacks, and other normal stuff like the leg raise. Naturally, our boy is the only one enjoying this training, because the others are already fully exhausted at this point. We soon find ourselves at the rope bridge course, where this psychotic fucker is seemingly having the time of his life. He's just running across a tight rope like a kid in a playground, making it harder for the others to maintain their balance. Next up were some drop-down trainings, and once again, Minjun was like a kid on a field trip. Lastly, we see a hazmat suit and a very bored-looking man inside it, teaching the soldiers to remember their national anthem in a rather toxic environment. I don't know why it's so important to do this, but you can tell from everyone's faces that no one is having any fun. Still, the drill was conducted as per their protocol, and the squads were now finally free to roach around their tents. Most of them immediately went back to sleep on their uncomfortable-looking portable beds, while the others were left with streams of tears in their eyes, looking at the absolutely pathetic quality of food in front of them. Orange Hair and his buddy were both relieved on their beds that they finally get to eat, but the food in their hands was making it hard to enjoy anything. Heck, Colonel Orange Hair could hardly believe his eyes that this is the kind of meal he's being forced to eat during his final year in the camp. His gray-haired friend was not in any better spirits and was even started to wondering if the division commander hates him for putting him through so much hardship. Still, in the midst of all their misery, there was one psychotic individual who looked extremely satisfied with everything. You see, guerrilla training doesn't really hold a lot of meaning for the awakened soldiers with superhuman strength, but these absolutely abhorrent living conditions are what makes it incredibly notorious. As disgusting as the food might be, the orange hair is getting his fill and wondering why his friend isn't doing the same. But the gray-haired colonel is looking completely depressed, worried that eating more would make him need to use the toilet. And a shared toilet in this sweaty camp is bound to be nothing more than a pile of filth. During the night, the platoon commander brings along the company commander for some regular inspection. Sergeant Lee salutes his superior and reports that the platoon is currently under personal maintenance. The company commander tells everyone to be at ease and informs that since everyone is tired, the instructors will stand watch on the camp instead. He also congratulates everyone for doing good in their training, but is rather concerned about something else. With a fist full of determination and fire in his eyes, he shouts at everyone to do their absolute best in tomorrow's trench combat, which just so happens to be the real highlight of this training. The next day, under the partly cloudy sky, each platoon was busy cheering their individual squads for battle. 
Two incredibly bulky soldiers were duking it out in the arena, and as we zoom out, we finally see that the so-called trench battle was currently in full swing. The rules are simple, inside this square arena, you have to either defeat your opponent completely, or push him out of boundary to secure your win. Currently, the Mughead with a huge grin on his face seems to be the leading contender. After testing the waters with his opponent, he lifts him up in the air and very casually throws him out of the platform like a ball. And immediately after, he swiftly tackles down the rest of the opposing squad to eliminate them as well. The defeated soldiers fall on top of each other, and the referee calls for the battle to stop when the victor has been decided. The winning squad belongs to the first platoon of the second company in the first battalion, and they have now officially been announced the victor in their combat. The guy who single-handedly wrecked all of his opponents was still smiling confidently, almost making it seem like he's gonna win the entire thing. The judges were the battalion commanders sitting under a tent, and someone in particular looked a bit displeased with the results. This person is Colonel Jundium, commander of the 2nd Battalion, and even though he admits the exceptional skills of the Mughead, he can't help but feel a bit disappointed. That's because the Mughead is apparently the winner of the last year's trench combat, as well, and he belongs under the command of the 1st Battalion commander, Colonel Jian, who's currently very happy to see his squads in the lead. Colonel Jundium knows the man's skill is real, because he just saw him push off an entire squad on his own. The 3rd Battalion commander takes this chance to chime in as well, and slyly slips that the Mughead was actually offered a promotion, but the 1st Battalion pushed it off for the time being. That immediately alerts Colonel Jundium, and the reason is actually pretty valid. He starts yelling at the 1st Battalion commander that he delayed the man's promotion on purpose, just so he could use him again to win the trench battles. Because otherwise, his rank would not permit him to participate in this training. Of course, the cunning man gets aggressive at the accusation, blatantly refusing to admit any such intentions on his part. This kind of rivalry is a bit expected, because the trench combat is usually seen as a direct competition between the battalions. And while the glasses guy was smirking behind his hand after instigating a fight, the 4th battalion commander was simply silent. She kept herself out of the idiotic commotion of the rest, which only seemed to be getting worse, but her silence doesn't mean that she isn't competitive. In fact, Colonel Yu's eyes were firmly fixed on the referees and the results they announced. Upon a closer look, you could see that she was hardly able to maintain her emotions at the moment, because out of all her units, only a single squad had so far managed to stay in the tournament. We're then greeted upon the magnificent sight of the qualifying squad, featuring our favorite Nepo baby in the back. There's also the slender black-haired beauty and her pink friend on the side, but the main highlight for me are those apps. I mean, the incredible Dami Mami build of the golden-haired soldier in the front, whom we've never before seen in the story. I can't wait to know about this new and hot character, but I'm afraid that it's time to move away from this panel. We move ahead to our hero's side now, who's just sitting in a corner with his buddies, watching the match winners step away from the stage. That's when the passing Mughead notices his face and stops in tracks due to curiosity. He suddenly sprouts a wicked smile on his face, asking our boy if he's the famous Kim Minjoon from the 2nd Battalion. Of course, the man replies with a yes, and he seems a bit excited to note that other battalions have heard about him as well. The Mughead tries to act all chummy with him, commenting how he'd heard that Minjoon was the fastest person to become a sergeant. My guy is not one to get hyped by praises, so he just coldly affirms the rumors with a yes. But of course that's where the ugliness of the Mughead comes out, and we see him smirking at his future opponent with confidence. Without beating around the bush, he straight up lays it on our hero that he expected to see someone more impressive. But judging from his physique and personality, he's utterly disappointed that he'll be facing such a stupid opponent. Needless to say, his remarks didn't fly over the head of Minjoon's friends, and they immediately stood up from their seats to yell at the mannerless troll. But then, before each of them could say anything at all, the hulking man placed his humongous arms on their shoulders and pressed them down to really show them the difference in their levels. With a face even more disgusting than before, he tauntingly responds that he didn't mean to say those words out loud and hopes that his behavior would be overlooked. His single palm is bigger than their entire shoulder, so it goes without saying that the two corporals are quite intimidated by the Mughead's towering figure. And watching them shiver as he had expected, the troll bastard stands up again to smirk at his victims, before casually proceeding to walk along with the rest of his squad. In the meantime, Minjun did nothing but stand in his spot obediently. After the bully was gone, the corporals regained their anger and started talking behind his back as expected, but our boy simply told them that everything is fine. Wangshik was literally about to turn into an angry tomato after hearing this, and really wanted to go back to the troll and give him a piece of his mind. But then, he suddenly started shivering once again, and the fear he was feeling now was greater than anything the Mughead could ever instill. You see, the reason he sat back was because he didn't need to get angry on Minjun's behalf at all. After all, even if he says that everything is okay, the man in question is currently more angry than anyone else. I'm already extremely excited at this development, 
because Minjun's anger means that the poor Mughead is soon about to get his ass handed to him in a royal fashion. <laughs> anticipated episode 19 is here, and we're starting off by resuming the trench combat event in the training camp. The babes of the female squad are currently on standby, and it looks like our pink-haired shorty has something on her mind. Her name is finally introduced to us as Cha Mary, and she's irritated because she doesn't see the point of these battles. Not only are they tiring, but she's also someone who doesn't enjoy touching the sweaty bodies of other people. Surprisingly, it seems that her tall friend, Ms. Yoon Hyaju, is also inclined to agree. She seems to believe that the combat is slightly unfair, and they also get chewed by their superiors if they don't perform well. Not to mention, Mary is even more concerned that they are the only female squad who made it to the current round, and as she glances over at the direction of her battalion commander, she can't help but worry that she must be very angry. Her concern isn't baseless either, because we clearly see that Colonel Yu isn't pleased with these results at all. Her fuming face is caught perfectly by the pink shorty, and judging by her expression, you can tell that the girl is really fearful of the scolding that might come after the tournament is finished. That's when a certain mommy figure walks into the scene, assuring her team members that there's absolutely nothing to worry about. Right on cue, the referee calls for the female squad to step forward for their next battle, and we finally get to see the absolutely dominating figure of the mommy, whose abs I kept praising in the last episode. This magnificent lady's name is Osipyol, and she's a sergeant and the leader of this particular squad. As she openly declares that she's going to win this tournament, we realize that her character isn't only defined by her abs, because she also has a really fierce personality. The round starts, and the first thing we see is the screaming face of the pink shorty. Looks like the ladies are off to a bad start, as Mary is running off from a guy who's trying to chase her, while the tall lady is trying her best to push back her own opponent. In the background, two more ladies are really struggling against a single giant, who's hardly budging an inch despite their combined efforts. These two ladies are merely private ranks, and they really can't compare to the build size of their opponent. However, as a single hand grabs the man's collar from behind, we remember that there's someone in the female squad who far exceeds his caliber. That's right, it's the Sergeant Dami Mommy, and we see her strength on full display as she effortlessly flings back the humongous soldier in the air. The man barely stops his momentum from pushing him out of the boundary, but the Lady Sergeant is already on the move to take away his initiative. The woman gives a single spear tackle to the man's body, completely uprooting him from his grounded position. And of course, the impact is so strong that he spit out all the oxygen in his lungs, and falls unconscious without getting a single chance to retaliate. The man lands outside the arena's boundary with his ass in the air, and the sergeant gets up elegantly to clap the dust off her hands and look at the rest of her team. Guys, I won't lie, but I think I'm in love. Anyway, even though the woman is a literal force of nature in the arena, it seems like the rest of her team isn't doing as well, because the pink shorty is still just running away from her chaser without fighting back. Looks like the soldier's hand is finally about to reach the girl, and just as he got excited that he'll be able to eliminate her from the round, Mary shows an unexpected display of skills out of nowhere. She grabs the unsuspecting soldier's hand from behind her, and flings him upside down with the perfect posture of a judo master. A loud thud is heard when the man hits the floor, and the sergeant huffs a smile, almost as if she knew this was going to happen. The pink girl isn't even the least bit exhausted after running out so much, and the confidence on her face tells me that she was simply toying with her opponent. We finally get a sense of her character, when she boldly tells the defeated soldier that he was warned to stay away from her. After ending her own fight, the girl looks back to check the status of her tall friend, who's still just standing her ground against the opposing fighter. Looks like the man is slowly managing to push back the female corporal, but won't be enough to finish her off. That's when we see him smile and glance to his side, as his other friend rushes over to help him win the duel. The helper thinks that he has spotted an opening to take out the black-haired girl, but he doesn't even notice the hand that's currently grabbing his collar. And the next thing he knows, the idiot is flipped upside down in the air with his gaping mouth. As my man flies off in his reverse position, we see that the perpetrator this time was our favorite Nipo baby, Sun yun -seo. She smiles with satisfaction at her victory, making it clear that she's not one to be underestimated. And with that momentary distraction, Sergeant Yoon regains her footing and Monster grips the hand of her opponent, forcing his back on the ground with a powerful thrust. That earns her a wicked smile from her pink friend, who almost makes it seem like such a result was always expected. But it looks like these girls have two more people to deal with, who seem to be clicking their tongues at the pathetic display of their squad. These twin-looking bald heads are straight up bad-mouthing their own teammates, and laughing at them for not being able to take down a single opponent. The defeated soldiers have no choice but to stay silent, as the still-standing twins claim that they're going to carry their asses to victory. The brothers seem very confident of themselves as they take their crouching positions, and they actually believe that they will be the ones to win this entire tournament. With their baseless confidence, they charge at the female squad to claim their victory. 
but then we suddenly hear the swooshing sound of the air, and the next thing we know, Sergeant Mommy is holding them both by herself with her well-developed arms, and her incredibly muscular back. The twins laugh at her at first, thinking that she's crazy to think she can stop them on her own. But when they try to push her arms away, their faces turn to horror as they realize that they're unable to resist her grip. They struggle to get away from her monstrous grasp, and almost can't believe how her slender figure can hold so much strength. But of course, the sergeant knows that she doesn't really have to defeat these idiots on her own, since her dependable squad is already running over to lend their hands. In a matter of seconds, the ladies show their power by pushing their sergeant from behind, ultimately helping her push down the twins who couldn't even get away from her grip. At this point, the comic is basically writing my own jokes for myself, because the defeated twins cry for mommy as they fall to their elimination. Truly, it was the mommy who took them down, and she stands tall with her teammates in victory as the referee officially announces the end of this round. The sergeant dusts off her hands once again, and her squad rushes over from behind to congratulate her. Kim and Jun was sitting at the perfect location to witness them having their fun, and he can't help but acknowledge that the ladies not only have an excellent sense of teamwork, but they're also pretty skilled individually. Even his ponytail friend is openly commenting that the female squad this time is really good, and Guangxik is even going as far as to say that they'll be able to defeat the pathetic bully from last episode. Ponytail seems against this idea however, since if the female squad wins against the bully in the semi-finals, they would lose the chance to take their revenge against him in the finals. Guangxik agrees with his resolution, but as he looks at the ladies coming down from the arena, he can't help but wonder if they themselves can actually make it to the finals either. But of course, Mr. Ponytail shuts down his worries by replying that with Sergeant Lee and Kim Min-Joon on their squad, it would be impossible to lose even if they wanted to. Looks like the men weren't the only people staring, as the pink shorty seems to have noticed their presence as well. She glances over at our hero, Kim Min-Joon, and her face sprouts the most adorable and genuine smile we've ever seen her make. She waves her hands and calls out to the hunter while blushing, and while her own squad is puzzled at her actions, the two male corporals end up noticing her back. They both start blushing for no reason, each wondering if the lady is perhaps trying to grab their attention. Meanwhile, Mary is looking like the most adorable creature ever, completely smitten with love just by looking at our hero. Her cute face and bouncy expressions completely make the two corporals lose all of their desire for revenge. Within just a few moments, they have completely reformed and are now willing to forget their grudges and start rooting for the ladies to win the semi-finals instead of the bully, just so they can get a chance to touch their hands in the finals. Our boy sees their perverted nature and lets out a disappointed sigh while calling them a bunch of idiots. At the same time, the atmosphere was changing for the battalion commanders. Looks like the squad who just got defeated belonged to the glasses dude, and he's definitely a bit disappointed at their crushing defeat. The first battalion commander on the other hand is more than delighted, as he compliments the female squad for displaying such a perfect round. He further compliments Colonel Yu for raising such a dependable squad, but the woman just stays silent in response. Next up, the referee calls out for the next two squads to step up to the stage, and this time, something catches the eye of the female colonel. The reason for her attention is none other than Kim Min-Joon, and as the colonel remembers his time with the division commander and his past achievements, she can't help but get curious to see what he's got to show. While the boys were walking up to the arena, Mr. Ponytail nudges our hero to tell him that if they win the entire tournament, their whole squad will get a paid vacation as their reward. My man replies with an annoyed expression that he has no desire to go on a vacation with these idiots, at which the other two laugh that maybe they should give up on the first place after all. Of course, for our achievements hungry hero, such a result would never be acceptable. So he ignores their childish rebuttals, and with a scheming face that we're all so familiar with, he comments that they can simply enjoy their vacation separately. In other words, this dude has absolutely no intention of giving up on that first place position. Eventually, the two squads line up in front of each other to face off for battle a group of unfamiliar faces on one side, and our hero with his team on the other. The referee shouts for both teams to get ready and listen for the whistle before starting the fight. Of course, the whistle is blown, and the enemy team is the first to take initiative towards our heroes. Sergeant Lee and Corporal Ponytail also head forward to intercept the charge, but my boy just stands back with his dead fish eyes as usual. Lee displays his unmatched strength by holding off two opponents on his own, and Minjun's disciples quickly follow him up to take on the others. They both tackle the unsuspecting opponents with blistering speed, leaving them dazed and unbalanced. Guangxik sprouts a confident smile while holding onto the soldier, and can't help but comment how light he is as they both lift them up into the air. Looks like our hero's Spartan training has really made them strong. Dongjin seems to have the free time to glance at the others while he's easily handling his enemy, and it seems like the leader of the opposing group is still just judging everything from a distance. He takes a look at Sergeant Lee, who's still holding off two soldiers like a bunch of kids. 
and as he locks eyes with the fierce warrior to see if he wants to interrupt, the sergeant returns the glare with double the intensity. That's when Minjun stops their staring contest by casually waltzing into the middle and sizes out the squad commander with his scheming glare. Looks like he finds the opponent suitable enough and wants to test out his latest ability in secret. That's when the soldier charges into him with absolute determination, probably realizing that it's going to be a tough battle. Meanwhile, Minjun pulls back his arm and readies his demonic grasp skill to test it out in action. He targets the energy towards the foot of the charger, confusing the squad commander as he trips for no reason. The man falls straight into the grasp of our hero, who just uses his own momentum to push him down to the ground. His control of this skill is not yet precise, but using it to take away someone's balance seems pretty easy. The confused soldier gets up quickly to regain his footing, absolutely sweating at the weird scene that just happened. You can't really blame him either, since you can't see this skill with your eyes. But in the heat of battle, confusion turns to anger, and the opponent grits his teeth to once again charge at our hero, who's still just as expressionless as before. And once again, my boy pulls the poor bastard hand with his demonic grasp, and casually turns his shoulder as he lets him fall face first onto the floor. The man turns around with such a baffled expression, that you'd be believed to think that he's seen a ghost. Of course, Minjun can't really afford to let him get any more suspicious, so he cuts the childish play and taunts his opponent to attack him again. One last time, the squad leader stands up, raising his arms in the air with a hint of caution. This time, our hero is the one to charge at him instead. And even though the squad leader tries to swing his arm and stop the charge, Minjun simply manages to duck under and keep going. Before he could realize, our boy was already holding the soldier from behind in a suplex position. But instead of ramming his head back onto the ground, he just tosses the man behind him like he's some sort of trash. A single look at our hero from this angle, and you can really tell that there's nothing more he enjoys than a little bit of trolling. The scene then shifts, and it seems like a bunch of other battles have already been conducted throughout the day. As expected, Minjun and his squad made it all the way to the finals without any trouble. But as he glances to the side to look at his sulking comrades, it seems like something might have gone wrong in the middle. You see, both Guangshik and Ponytail are absolutely furious, because instead of fighting against the female squad as they had hoped, they'd be going up against the bully after all. At last, the referee signals for the last two squads to come forward and start the finals, so the soldiers start climbing the stairs to the arena. The face of the bully bastard hasn't gotten any less annoying, and he's smiling just as wickedly because he's certain of his victory. His challengers also step foot onto the stage right behind him, and they look absolutely riled up for some reason. Ponytail asks Guangshik if the bastard actually used to be a wrestler, and the corporal replies that he was pretty well known in high school competitions, up until he had to stop because of his awakening. The both of them seem to agree that the man is definitely very skilled, and Guangshik even adds that he used to win all of his competitions. But naturally, it doesn't mean that they feel any sense of respect for the bully, because Ponytail is simply furious why someone so skilled would also resort to playing dirty. As the both of them burn their heads hot with anger, Sergeant Lee grips them in place with a defeated sigh. Minjun is also a bit disappointed at their behavior, but he already knows the reason why they're so angry. You see, it all started back in the semi-finals. We are shown the face of the bully bastard blowing on his hand, and zoom out to see his whole squad standing tall at their victory. They had won their match against the female squad, but a single look at the struggling figure of the blonde mommy is enough to tell us that their methods were beyond aggressive. Bruised and battered, the female sergeant barely managed to stand up again as the last remaining survivor of her squad. The bully was of course surprised to see it, and the mommy soldier wasted no time to charge again with all of her strength. But once again, she was easily picked up by the gigantic wrestler and tossed back onto the floor to her crushing defeat. You see, in this match, the bully and his teammates defeated every member of the female squad, but made sure to not push even a single one of them out of the arena's boundary. Instead, these assholes kept beating them and tossing them, until they were actually unable to fight back and completely out of spirit. As we're brought back to the present, Minjun thinks about how the bully's method was definitely repulsive, but this is all part of the combat training in the end. He realizes that it's not the winner's fault for absolutely shaming their opponents, and as he glances over at the ladies who are obviously upset about their defeat, he can't help but think that it's the loser's fault for being weak. In the end, the mommy sergeant is so exhausted and dejected that she simply sits on her seat with her face covered in a towel, not saying anything to the others. Meanwhile, Wangshik is completely pumped and ready to teach some manners to those barbaric bastards. Our hero can't seem to sympathize with his feelings, however, as he believes that his reaction is a bit too extreme. He remembers all the comical and the horrible faces of the man who insulted him and smiles it off casually, completely unbothered. After all, he knows that there's no point in getting angry beforehand when he can simply beat him up to a pulp during the fight. It finally comes the time for the mug face to fight against a proper enemy and he stands with his squad on the left side while our hero and his boys stand on the right. 
Since the Mugface has been flaunting his strength and fighting off all the squads by himself, Ponytail taunts him by asking if he's going to do the same in the finals as well. As expected, the ugly ass fucker smiles and annoyingly replies that he doesn't want to disrespect the famous Sergeant Lee, but doesn't think that anyone else is worthy of being his opponent. He asks the corporal if he actually thinks he can shove him back a single inch, and Sergeant Lee is forced to hold him back from getting aggressive in response. The mug face then glances towards our expressionless hero, completely ignoring the burning head of Corporal Wangshik. The ugly dude snickers at Minjun for being so heartless and remaining unfazed, when he thought that he could definitely rile him up by beating his girlfriend. The statement comes off as a surprise to the boys, as Gwanchik asks the fucker what he's even talking about. That's when the mug face replies that he saw the pink-haired shorty waving aggressively at Minjun, and figured that she was probably his girlfriend. Naturally, the corporal gets furious to hear this and thoroughly denies such an absurd assumption. After all, he thought for some reason that the girl was waving at him instead. That's when the ponytail chimes in, needlessly commenting that other than Lumi from Dungeon Power Fighter, Sergeant Minjun doesn't care about any other girls at all. That comment of course warrants an awkward moment of silence between the two squads, before the pig-nosed bastard suddenly starts snorting with laughter. The mere thought of having a crush on a beginner NPC from a trash game from ages ago sends the man and his squad in a fit of hysterical laughter. He repeatedly mocks our hero for being a loser, which puts all the boys in our hero's squad in a state of panic. No one knows better the anger and strength of our hero than his scared friends, but the mug-faced idiot just keeps fueling the fire and laughing at Minjun while calling him a pathetic loser. At last, the referee decides to signal the teams to get ready for their match and asks them to wait for his whistle before engaging with each other. Tearing up with laughter and grinning like an idiot, the bully tells Minjun that he'll go easy on him in battle so he can go back safe and sound to his two-dimensional wife. That's when the referee puts the whistle in his mouth and the mug face takes his stance while still laughing and snickering. The whistle is finally blown and other than our hero who stands his ground, all members from both squads start charging at each other. The camera zooms in on Minjun, and since we don't see what sort of expression he's making, we can only assume that shit is about to go south. I guess his non-responsive state puts him as a target for the bully, who's currently flying at him from his position while asking him why he's still spacing out. We see from his perspective that his hands reach closer to our hero, and just as he was inches away from grabbing him by his shirt, something unexpected happens. Rather than using his fists or his abilities, my boy chooses to stop the gigantic man with a straight-up headbutt to his face sending shockwaves in the arena. At long last, as we start off the 20th episode of this series, we're greeted by the confused look of our hero's teammates after witnessing Minjun's head butt to the bully's face. Needless to say, the colossal idiot is already holding his face in agony, barely able to utter a word. Still, despite the pain, he has to keep playing the tough guy, so he tells the referee that this happened because he tripped, and he doesn't want to penalize our hero for hitting him. He and our hero both look at the referee with completely different reactions, confusing the man on what to do. Hitting someone blatantly in this tournament is a clear violation of rules, but since the bully wants to pay back our hero for this humiliation, he wants to let it slide. The referee then looks at the colonels from afar, and a simple wave of hand from the 1st Battalion commander gives him the answer he was seeking. The man with the red cap acknowledges the instructions, and proceeds to announce to the contestants that the current hit would be marked as a mistake. But in the future, he makes sure to inform that hitting your opponent would result in an immediate disqualification. With the referee out of the way, the bully was now left alone to contemplate his next course of action. He thoroughly believes that he was caught off guard and calls our hero's earlier attack cute, while also vowing to crush him thoroughly in the match. Minjun does nothing but smile in response, confused at the mughead's choice of words. And when the referee once again shouts for the match to be resumed, our boy replies in a cold voice, letting his opponent know that he's not done being cute. In the very next moment, we see him leap away from his current position in a completely unexpected direction. The bully's expression is relaxed to see this, as he thinks that our boy is now just trying to run away. But of course, it doesn't take him long to realize that something is terribly wrong. After all, this psychopath was charging straight at his own teammates with a murderous intent. Corporal Ponytail was already scared of Minjun, and seeing him charge at his face literally gave him the chills of his life. But before he could even shriek in surprise, him and his friend were both blown out of the arena with a thrust of our hero's shoulder. While in the air, the only thing the poor corporal could do was cry and wail at his horrendous luck. That's when the bully finally processed that the damned idiot was throwing his own teammates off the arena, and he was already on the move to his next target. Friendly fire was now on, and not just his own teammates like Guangshik and the others, but my guy was also flicking off the enemies at the same time. It eventually came time for him to face Sergeant Lee, who seemed pissed to see his absurd actions. While flexing his massive muscles to brace for the impact of Minjun's tackle, the soldier called him a psycho and asked to know the reason for friendly fire. 
Unlike the others, who were blown away simply from the impact of their clash, Sergeant Lee was able to hold off our hero for a brief moment. At this point, the bully was completely lost in the sauce. At one hand, he was able to admire our hero's monstrous strength, but on the other, he had no idea what the absolute fuck was happening. Sure enough, Sergeant Lee could also not hold on for long, and was quite softly thrown out of the boundary by Minjun, leaving the mug face completely baffled. After all, Lee was quite famously known for being the strongest sergeant in the division, so watching him lose so easily was nothing less than a shock. I mean, when you look at our hero in his current form, he looks nothing less than a demon incarnate, and it's not really a surprise that no one else stands a chance. Meanwhile at the tent of the colonels, the 1st Battalion commander was absolutely fuming at this absurd shit show. But in response, Minjun's own battalion commander shouted back that our boy wasn't really breaking any rules. However, while that might technically be correct, the 1st Battalion commander makes a point that it's definitely not normal to be eliminating your own teammates. This was absolutely correct, so the opposing colonel lost his grounds to argue back. He had no choice but to turn his face back to the match, fully knowing that he can't afford to make any more excuses. The 1st Battalion commander kept going on his tantrum, asking the 2nd colonel if he would be the one to take responsibility if someone got hurt because of this nonsense. But that's when Colonel Yu chimed in, replying to the fat idiot with a sharp gaze that the judges will take care of this situation on their own. She recalled how her own squad was brutally beaten to a pulp in the previous match by the same people, and everyone simply left the bully bastard's actions to the judges. In her eyes, this situation is not any different. That fact, along with the scary personality of Colonel Yu, immediately put some ice in the 1st Battalion commander's ass to cool him down. After all, he knows that his squad is guilty of many fouls in the previous matches. Seeing him shut his yapping hole, the woman lets out a sigh and chooses to forget the matter. Her gaze is then refocused on the match, where Minjun and the massive bully are finally fighting in a 1v1, since no one is left standing to interfere on the arena. Even now, there's nothing but confusion on the ugly asshole's face. He can't figure out why he would eliminate every other player in the arena, only to engage in a simple wrestling match where his smaller body isn't favored. That gives him confidence though, since despite our hero's overwhelming strength, the bully knows that your technique is a lot more important when it comes to wrestling. So, with a smug look on his face, he proceeds to hook his leg behind Minjun's, hoping to trip his balance and slam him down with the weight of his body. But of course, as we all saw it coming from a mile away, the massive onion wasn't able to move our boy a single inch, let alone slam him anywhere. On the contrary, Minjun was able to lift his elephant body in the air with ease, almost as if he was trying to lift a baby. But unlike how you would catch a baby after bumping him into the air, this asshole deserves absolutely no love, and gets brutally slammed to the ground on his back. The impact made his mouth open with a gasp, emptying all the air in his lungs. As he laid there with his eyes rolled back, contemplating how his technique didn't work, Minjun simply asked him to get his ass up for a second round. Somehow, the bully managed to lift his torso. But when he looked at the demonic figure of Minjun, completely relishing in the thrill of his revenge, he knew that he was fucked. Of course, he tried to surrender right away to avoid further pain and humiliation, but our boy got close to grab him before he could finish his sentence. And once again, with the technique of a judo master, he threw back the asshole to the ground where he belongs. Right upon impact, we could see that the bully was now crying, horrified at the fact that he aggravated the worst opponent. Minjun didn't need to wait for him to get up again, as he simply lifted his body on his own, telling him that he had no right to surrender. Flailing in our hero's grip like a baby, the mughead cried once again that he wants to surrender, but Minjun had a piece of his mind to give him first. He uttered the name of Lumi, his favorite character from Dungeon Power Fighter, and it immediately shocked the bully. And while proclaiming that Lumi isn't just some 2D character, he actually spun the wrestler around in circles in the air. Needless to say, his teammates were no more than stunned at this display, and the ladies were absolutely smothered by his gallant figure. Even the Nipo baby, who idolized her father for his strength, began to really look up to Minjun in this very moment. By the time our boy was done with him, the bully was already foaming at his mouth, lost and confused. That's when my guy reveals that Lumi is his absolute favorite, and he would never forgive anyone who taints this relationship. The dude actually went off on a rampage because someone laughed at his 2D wife, and I can't decide whether that's alpha as fuck or cringe as hell. Either way, the disaster he unleashed on his hapless victim would forever be ingrained in his body, and never again would he dare to laugh at a gamer. With this absolutely satisfying end to battle with the bully, the referee finally announces the winner of the match, concluding the end of the tournament. But even though the tournament was won, some footsteps of mixed emotions are seen approaching our hero. Minjun takes note of this, and we see that his teammates, other than Dongjin, are giving him some weird looks. I guess even someone as dense as our hero would now realize that he crossed the line earlier, so he nervously tries to apologize for his actions. However, his squad could actually care less about their unnecessary eliminations. 
They're just glad that he really humiliated the bully and properly avenged the female squad for the humiliation they were made to suffer. Wangshik goes as far as to say that he just witnessed the most impactful match of his life and couldn't have hoped for a better outcome. Even the ponytail guy, who was the first to get eliminated by Minjun, has nothing but a thumbs up to give to the champion who allowed him to watch such a refreshing match. To be honest, our boy is a bit baffled by their positivity, but he can't complain that it's a good thing for him in the end. But not everyone in this squad is a happy-go-lucky idiot, because there's someone who has taken a stance to reprimand our hero. This man is none other than Sergeant Lee, and he doesn't hesitate to announce that he's very disappointed in Minjun. And with just those short words, he leaves the scene, leaving our boy to once again realize that he really did cross the line. The camera follows the angry sergeant for a bit, but we soon see him letting out a sigh with a faint smile on his face. He remembers the look in our hero's eyes as he was charging at him with the tackle, and can't help but admit that he would eventually get swallowed by the rookie if he doesn't manage to keep up. With a refreshed determination, he tells himself that he's definitely going to win against Minjun the next time they fight. In the end, it looks like this gym bro is actually quite happy to finally have a rival in this division. A few moments later, the soldiers from each battalion line up for the reward ceremony. Colonel Yu gives the opening speech and proceeds to grant the gold medal to our hero as the winner and MVP of the tournament. The others salute the victor, and hence the tournament finally comes to an end. That doesn't mean that the guerrilla training itself is over though, since the tents are still raised up for the soldiers for shelter. We see Corporal Guangxi coming out of his tent a short while later, properly dressed once again for the training. His purple-haired friend asks him where he's going, but my man simply replies that he needs to hit the toilet. His irritated expression returns at the same moment, because he still can't figure out why this stupid training routine exists for the Hunter Corps when it doesn't even help them become stronger. This is when he's called out from behind by a female soldier with familiar hair and immediately starts blushing for absolutely no reason whatsoever. As we guessed, the soldier is our favorite Nepo baby, standing timidly with her blushed cheeks and a charming smile. Not gonna lie, she looks really cute in her armored uniform. The next day, after the short but intense training of the 104th Division, it started snowing in the campgrounds. We see the familiar hairstyle of Corporal Guangshik, carefully whispering to his friends that they should be careful with the matter at hand. The next scene is the goatee of the ponytail dude, who seems to agree with the suggestion and wants to push through with the operation at any cost. We also get a peek of Dongjin's head, and he seems rather worried that their sergeants might chew them out if they do something irrational, but Guangxik doesn't seem to care. There's also another person with these idiots, and according to Corporal Ponytail, his role is the most important in their mission. Just when I was starting to wonder if they were doing some undercover training, these morons were simply seen sitting out in the open while it was snowing. Guangxik seems to be the one in charge of this meeting, and says that they don't have a lot of time to decide. That's when the ponytail chimes in, saying that deciding upon a proper rendezvous point is the key. Dongjin entertains their conversation by commenting that they shouldn't choose a place that's too far so they can be more efficient with their time. Needless to say, Guangxik is quite pleased to hear his opinion. That's when the head idiot received a message on his phone, and as they all gather to look at the screen with their blushed cheeks, we finally get a hint of what exactly is happening. Looks like he exchanged numbers with the Nepo baby who wants to host a mixer-like gathering with Minjun's squad, and tells Guangxik that her own female squad would be joining them as well. And after asking him to choose the location and the meeting time to match everyone's day-offs, she casually asks him if he can share Kim Minjun's number as well. I'm pretty sure this was her objective from the start. Poor Guangxik and Ponytail get terrified to see the last message, because they think giving her our tyrannical hero's number might put them all in trouble. The former asshole wonders if he should tell her that he doesn't know his number, but both Ponytail and Dongjin tell him that it would come out as extremely unbelievable. After all, they're all members of the same squad who practically live together. But that just puts more strain on the poor Corporal's face, because he has absolutely no idea how to reply. That's when Corporal Ponytail starts getting cold feet and proposes that they should cancel their plan after all. It's fun and exciting to finally get to talk to some girls in their lives, but he thinks it's not worth the risk to get on Minjun's bad side. And with those words, he exits the scene by saying that they should quit this nonsense before they get in any trouble. The others agree and decide to leave as well, leaving poor Guangxik on his own, who still doesn't want to abandon such a chance. He tells his friends that it's possible that the sergeants might want to join them as well, but his words fall on deaf ears, and no one thinks to entertain such a thought. At the end, this sad and lonely loser is left all by himself in the snow, completely isolated in his dreams and horniness. Switching locations, we move inside the camp building, where the main hero of this story opens the door to the training room. First things first, he's quite excited to look at his newly updated status. As you can see, it looks like he has gained a bunch of strength and agility stats once again, while everything is practically the same. As he remembers the mug face he tossed around the map in the previous chapter, Minjun can't help but thank him for improving his status. 
you see. It was getting quite difficult to level up his stats once they reached 60, but thanks to defeating that wrestler, his surprisingly gained a boost to his stats once again. Of course, as he casually benches the ridiculously heavy red stone weights, our boy is practically smiling from ear to ear. He pumps out a bunch of reps with absolute ease when he's suddenly interrupted by a voice to his head. Minjun places the weights back on their rack and continues his telepathic communication with the voice. The man on the other end is Lee Bongu, our hero's newest lackey, and his concern right now is that he wants his master to order some food to his current location. Naturally, Minjun is pissed to hear such a menial request because he even gave the idiot Dark Mage some money so he could manage the food situation on his own. But after arguing for a while, he decides to order it anyway, for which the Dark Mage is thankful. As usual, our hero doesn't seem to enjoy his happy and idiotic attitude, but it looks like Bongu has something more to say. So he interrupts him once again when Minjun was just about to lose his shit and mentions that he has discovered another mysterious aura. That quickly calms down our hero as he sighs while asking why the idiot didn't start the conversation with such important information first. After staying silent for a while because he didn't have a response, Bongu starts explaining that what he sensed isn't exactly a source of demonic energy. In fact, it's something completely different that he has never even felt in Iskard. He suddenly stops talking during his briefing, so Minjun gets alert that he might be in some kind of danger. But as it turns out, he simply went to grab his soup order from the door and nothing serious was happening. Minjun was basically fuming at this point, almost about to explode his head in anger and frustration for having to deal with such annoying subordinates. And as if done on purpose, this is exactly when he also received a message from the Nepo baby, confirming if she has the right number to the sergeant. For a moment, Minjun had a dumbfounded look on his face, because he was absolutely lost at the sudden turn of events. But his annoyed expression soon returned, as he wondered why everyone wanted to talk to him today for no reason. Instead of replying, he was just about to block the girl's number to avoid further frustration. But that's when Guangxik charged into the room, begging him to stop. Creeped out by his unnecessary energy, Minjun asks the corporal what he's doing. And in response, the dude just starts groveling on his knees to beg the sergeant not to block Sun Yunseo's number. Desperate for some female touch in his life, the man starts begging Minjun to start thinking about his squad, as their mixer with the ladies is something extremely important to their mental health. Of course, our boy has no idea what the corporal is talking about. And more importantly, he's curious as Guangxik was the one who gave his number to the Nipo baby. Without hesitation, the corporal confirms this and begs the sergeant to be more understanding of his squad. He claims that they all give a 100% of their time to the military, and some female interaction in these desperate times could be the only thing to keep them from going insane in the future. Confused and irritated, we can already tell that Minjun is fed up with Guangxik's abrupt behavior. Still, he gives the hunter a chance to speak and inquires if he has arranged some plans with Yunxiao. The corporal seems confused at this, as he assumed that she must have messaged the sergeant about their plans. But that was not the case, and Minjun is now even more furious that he's not getting any answers. And now, Guangxik suddenly doesn't know what to tell him. My boy then resorts to his usual method of threatening the crap out of people and asks Guangxik to choose his words carefully. Suddenly, all of the corporal's confidence and energy drained out of his face as he gulped down his saliva to brace for what's about to happen. But surprisingly, an entire week after this interaction, we find ourselves looking at the front entrance of a knockoff from Disneyland. The boys start walking in with their freshly polished boots, and although all of them are straight up dressed for war, they all sparkle with delighted expressions. Corporal Ponytail starts by thanking Kim and Jun for allowing this meeting, because he never imagined that he'd agree. Guangxik reprimands him of course, because this was all made possible by his own efforts, while everyone else was simply a traitor who turned their backs. But before he could start an argument, a single glance from our hero calmed him down immediately. Minjun replies that no one is here because of his perverted fantasies, and he simply agreed because their youngest squad member was really excited to visit this amusement park. We find out that the youngest in question is the young man from earlier, who was partaking in the secret meeting with the others to plan this gathering. Changing topics, Corporal Ponytail then decides to target Sergeant Lee Seung Ho, who also unexpectedly agreed to their plan. He comments that the sergeant is just a man after all, implying that he must also be tired of living inside a literal sausage fest. But as usual, the cold man replies that he was going to spend his day off with these idiots anyway, and thought that it would be nice to have someone else in the mix. After getting roasted by everyone else in his squad, Ponytail starts looking around to see if the female squad is already here, and his eyes immediately perk up with an unimaginable amount of glow as he spots our favorite lady group from afar away. He calls out to the ladies, and we see that all the familiar faces are gathered in one spot, but there's a humongous figure shadowing behind the girls as well. The guys couldn't help but note the towering stature of the man, and even Kim Minjun was made to take notice of his presence. 
the person looked directly behind the Nepo baby, and it seemed like the girl was also a bit nervous because of him. As you might have already guessed, the Goliath was none other than the Nepo baby's father, Sun Tiho. The corporals of the male squad start to make assumptions, immediately wondering if the man is some kind of gangster. I don't blame them either, as our father-in-law looks extremely terrifying. But before they could do anything irrational, Sergeant Lee stopped them immediately, asking them to stand on attention. Followed by that order, he salutes the senior officer, who salutes back in response to the greeting, while Yun Seo just blushes in embarrassment the whole time. This is when Dong Jin also took note of the senior officer's face, and shocked everyone by revealing that it's the commander of the 107th Division, whom he once saw before on the TV. At the same time, Yun Seo starts fumbling around her dad, begging him to please go back home, as it's extremely embarrassing to have him around her friends. We already know that the scary major general is actually quite a doting father, and he gives her daughter the most lovely smile he could muster, telling her that he simply wishes to greet the hunters that work with her, and promises to leave right after. Despite his reassurance, Yun Seo seems aware of her father's overprotective nature, and doesn't feel that this is a good idea. But the man simply moves her hand away, looking straight in the direction of our hero. Minjun is actually quite delighted to see that he got noticed by the senior officer, as he always admires strong people from Earth. At the same time, the smile fades from the man's face completely, and he's almost starting to resemble a Yakuza. He walks closer to our hero with his leathered boots, and towers over him menacingly, blocking out the sun. And sure enough, with the face of a threatening Yakuza boss, the man demands our hero to confirm if he's the hunter known as Kim Minjun. The story resumes, and we find ourselves once again at the entrance of the amusement park. Looks like the gang has checked in with their tickets, and the pink shorty is leading from the front with her usual bubbly energy. With a smile as bright as the sun, she urges the rest to hurry up as well, because they only have a limited amount of time to enjoy everything. As expected, she's sticking oddly close to our hero, which the male soldiers aren't happy to see. Seeing her trying to lock her arms with Minjun, a wave of mixed emotions washes over the rest of the party. The boys are feeling jealous, while the girls are just embarrassed of their comrades' actions. But well, the party spirit rules over everything, so the men display a burst of renewed energy, hoping to get as lucky as our hero. The girls seem to respond in kindness, as this was a well-awaited and well-deserved vacation for all of them as well. And so, together, they all rush towards the center of the park, leaving the two remaining sergeants behind. Sergeant Mommy and the ever-so-serious Sergeant Lee look at each other, not sure on how to react to the current situation. Our blonde girl is the first to speak, commenting on how she's not really fond of such rowdy places. It comes to no one's surprise that Sergeant Lee agrees with her statement, which the muscle mommy was quite pleased to hear. Looks like the two of them are going to hit it off well, as they walk together towards the rest, having light chatter along the way like a pair of muscle enthusiasts. In the next couple of scenes, we truly get to see how much everyone is enjoying this event. They all throw their hands up on the pirate boat. The girls partake in some goofy festival costumes while the boys get some cotton candy. And of course, they all shout and scream on the roller coaster with a pure emotion of joy. Heck, Sergeant Lee and Muscle Mommy even have an arm wrestling showdown in the middle of the park for everyone to see. Later, we find ourselves at a children's shooting range, where the shop owner is announcing a price of 10,000 for 10 shots a person. Eager to show off in front of the girls, Guangxik tries to give it a shot and win the big prize. His eyes are focused sharp, and there's no way he'd allow himself to get embarrassed in front of the others. But the next thing we see is him holding a tomato plushie, which turns out to be nothing more than a consolation prize for participating. Looks like this goofball didn't manage to knock a single prize. Mr. Ponytail sees this of course, and tries to one-up Corporal Guangshik by taking the next place in line. The ladies are oddly impressed by his confidence, and he seems to boast a really nice posture with the air gun as well. But of course, my man ended up getting the same shit as Guangshik, openly becoming a laughing stock in front of the merciless girls. Although he's convinced that the gun must have been tempered for him to miss all of his shots, there's no way his fellow corporal is going to let that slide as an excuse, as he continues to taunt him for sucking balls. That's when our boy walks up behind the two, and notices something interesting on the prize table inside the shop. The first prize seems to be a mushroom from Mario, the third prize is a fucking banana, and there's an odd little keychain in the middle as the second prize as well. Zooming in, we see the figure of our hero's favorite character from his favorite game, and you already know what's coming next. That's right, he's got his eyes on the prize, as the girl on the keychain is none other than Lumi from Dungeon Power Fighter. Determined to claim the keychain at any cost, Minjun picks up the gun that has led down many others before him. We hear a bunch of gunshots echo through the air, followed by the absolutely stunned expression of the shop attendant. Our boy places the gun on the table after finishing his turn, but the attendant informs him that he still has one more bullet left to shoot. Minjun replies he doesn't need to shoot it, and I think you can gather the reason for this reply through the open-jawed faces of the people behind him. 
The girls are seen talking between themselves, wondering why he didn't shoot the last shot, despite hitting every single bullet on the target. The only exception is the pink shorty, who's just more and more in love with our hero. In any case, the shop attendant cautiously hands over the second prize to our boy, who accepts it gratefully with excitement. There was no wonder he didn't shoot his last shot, because he was only aiming to get this particular keychain from the beginning. Needless to say, the girls don't really understand the significance of this, as they don't even know the character on the chain. Finally, after hours of time spent in the amusement park, our hero smiles for the first time, because only now does he think this trip was worth it. Other than the shorty who's just fawning all over Minjun, I think the boys finally understand the irony of the situation. In fact, they don't even know if they should be impressed or annoyed. In either case, they decide to ignore the senseless behavior of our hero and decide to collectively head towards the next attraction. And as they move ahead, the Nepo baby takes this chance to finally call out to the hunter. Looks like she's still curious about his meeting with her father earlier and wants to know what they talked about in private. She manages to get our boy's attention rather easily since he's already in a happy mood, so he turns around with his smile intact, taking us into a flashback of their meeting. You see, from back where we left off in the last episode, Major General Sun and Kim Minjun had walked a fair distance from the group to converse in some privacy. The general starts off the dialogue by apologizing to our hero for dragging him to side while he's on his vacation. Minjun didn't seem to mind of course, so he asks the general to be casual and tell him what he wants. I guess his overly straightforward response ticked something inside the general, so he proceeded to intimidatingly put his hands over our boy's shoulder in a show of dominance. Not gonna lie, my man's got the hands of a giant, and he squeezes his fingers on Minjun's shoulder with full force to gauge his resistance. Of course, our hero notices the general's intentions right away, so instead of reacting, he just stands his ground with as little reaction as possible. This gesture alone was enough to give the Nepo baby's father the answer he needed, so he smiles and puts his hands away slowly, respecting our hero's trained body and resilience. He apologizes to the sergeant for testing him so abruptly, and comments that he's definitely very well trained. Naturally, Minjun takes the compliment with stride. Once again, the general puts on a face that tells us that he's very impressed with our hero so far. He then casually reaches inside the dashboard of his car and says that he's got something to give to the sergeant since his daughter seems to owe him a favor for that incident inside the tin can dungeon. He takes out a small box of black wood along with his contact card in case Minjun wants to reach out to him in the future. Before our boy could ask him further about the box itself, Sun Tio starts to elaborate that it contains an item that's generally reserved for general ranks only inside the hunter military. Although their technology isn't advanced enough to evaluate this item entirely, it's supposed to give a random raise to your stats. As the box gets opened, we see that the item in question is a silver bracelet of sorts, which looks rather rough and worn down. Perhaps it was previously used, or perhaps it's just the texture of this particular material. In either case, it looks like our boy has hit the jackpot, as his inner thoughts leak out to reveal it as such, while he's busy thanking the general for his generosity. Reaching for his car door to exit the scene, Sun Tio tells Minjun to use the item to train himself further and warns him to not tell anyone that he's the one who gave him the bracelet. He then offers to treat him to a meal if he ever decided to visit his division and follows it up with one last warning. As we all saw coming, the devil's face returns on the general, telling our hero loud and clear that if he ever tries something funny with his daughter, he would make sure to kill him with his own hands. And with that business concluded, the man finally leaves the parking lot with his car. Looks like his warning wasn't really needed, because as Minjun puts the bracelet inside his breast pocket, he smilingly comments how such concerns aren't necessary, implying that he has no foreseeable plans to get together with anyone. That's where the flashback ends, and we're brought back to the present, where our boy tells the girl that their meeting wasn't anything important. Not convinced by that answer, Yunseo inches closer to make sure, asking if he's sure her father didn't say anything rude to him. While reaching into his pocket once more, Minjun confirms that no such thing happened. He then takes out the general's card from his pocket and shows it to the Nepo baby to rest her mind at ease. He informs her that he received it as a gesture of goodwill because her father wanted to treat him to a meal if he visits his division. As far as Yunseo is concerned, her father isn't the kind of figure who would show such politeness to his juniors, so she wonders why he received such a gift for no reason. That's when Minjun replies that it's probably because the general is bothered that his daughter owes him a favor. Of course, this triggers the memories of the Tin Can Dungeon when the Nepo baby was helplessly clinging to our hero with an injured foot, and it blushes her cheeks pink with embarrassment. With the same shy expression, she tries to shake off the memory by addressing the sergeant once again, apologizing for the fact that he had to put up with her overbearing father. One last time, Minjun just snaps the card in front of the girl, and as she gets startled, he tells her that he's simply going to force his father to treat him to an expensive meal in return. Continuing on, we once again return to the main group, 
who's now just strolling inside the busy pathways of the amusement park. Guangxi tries to meekly approach the pink-haired shorty and starts getting embarrassed for no reason. Looks like he just wanted to thank her for this wonderful get-together, as she's the one who initially proposed this idea. But still, he's also curious to know the reason why she wanted to do this. The girl responds to the gratitude with a smile and proceeds to elaborate the reason as per his request. She reminds him of the trench combat and how her squad lost miserably to the mughead bully. And since Hunter Kim and Jun stepped in to take revenge for all of them, she just wanted to repay him for his kindness and effort. As she excitedly holds out her punch midair, and as Guangxi's expression gets duller by the minute, the muscle mommy wraps her arm around the shorty to further enforce her reasoning. She was very impressed with Minjun, and since this whole gathering was the female squad's idea, she tells the boys that they'll treat them to free lunch as well. With that, the two girls continue walking ahead in each other's arms, leaving the male soldiers sad and disturbed. They know for a fact that they didn't do jack shit during that whole trench combat thing, which means that this entire event was just a way for the girls to meet Kim Minjun once again. And that's not even the most sad thing to Guangxik, because he knows that his asshole sergeant didn't fight for the girls, he was just taking revenge on the bully for laughing at his favorite game character. Seriously, I'm actually starting to feel somewhat sorry for these people. So, to move away from their depressing mood, let me take you to a different part of town, General Sun Tivo's division to be exact, where a bunch of hunters are guarding a newly opened dungeon gate. A raven lands gracefully on top of an electric pole, and we zoom out a little to see that it's our hero's latest henchman, Li Bangu. He's currently overseeing this operation by the hunters and focusing on two soldiers walking shoulder to shoulder with each other. There's someone with a tablet in his hand, and he's surprised to see the details on the gate in front of him. This man is a colonel named Lee Sangjin and the 3rd Battalion Commander of Major General Sun Tiho's division. As usual, Lee and Kim are the only family names ever used in this manhua. It looks like he's extremely surprised to see the amount of mana stone found inside this dungeon, as the reported quantity is a staggering 100 kilograms. As his assistant confirmed this information, the colonel turns around to look at the gate behind him. His lips curl up into a wide smile, and zooming out, his face clearly gives off the feeling that he has apparently hit a massive jackpot. We'll get back to this later, but for now, let us return to the amusement park and see what everyone is up to. As it turns out, the girls and the boys have split up at the exit of the park and lined up to bid their farewells. We already knew that the girls had a ton of fun on this venture, so they make sure to relay their thanks to the male soldiers and wish them a safe return to their camp. Looks like the boys have also forgotten their sorrows from earlier, as we see them cutting into each other to get the last talk with the girls. Their bickering continues, and we also get a cute panel of the Nepo baby, shyly waving goodbye to our hero, who, as expressionless as ever, doesn't even bother to respond to the gesture. At last, time to part their ways finally arrives, and the pink shorty literally had to get dragged away by her tall friend. In the next scene, we find ourselves near a more busy area of the city, where the soldiers are slowly lining up at the bus stop to catch their ride to the camp. That's when Lee Bongu finally starts talking into Minjun's head, annoying him and telling him that he has encountered an issue. As our boy asks him to give details, the perspective shifts back to the raven, and through its eyes, we see the full view of the violent dungeon gate, which Bongu comments to be a bit suspicious. He previously informed his master that the gate was under investigation and properly guarded by the hunters, so Minjun doesn't understand what's so suspicious about it now. Bongu explains that there were only entry-level restrictions on the gate previously, but now, it seems to be getting a lot busier, as hunters are seen carrying inside a lot of mining equipment. The perspective then suddenly shifts to a split screen on our hero and the colonel on sight, both with polar opposite facial expressions to each other. While the colonel is just happy to have encountered this marvelous opportunity to extract a ton of mana stone, it looks like Minjun has spotted some sort of trouble. The next day at Dijian, the jurisdiction of General Sun Tio, a certain bus approaches its stop on time. Out from the bus, an annoyed-ass Kim Minjun emerges, who looks like he was forced to make this journey. He confirms the same to us as well, loudly mouthing that the current situation is an absolute mess. Back at the site of the gate, which is still being guarded by the hunter army just the same, we see a bunch of soldiers loading and unloading carts full of mana stone. Meanwhile, our boy reaches into his pocket and takes out the contact card that he received from the Nepo baby's father, wondering if this will allow him to enter the work site without any trouble. And while he's thinking that, we see a peculiar pigeon approaching him from the side. Minjun notices the cooing sounds of the bird, and as he turns to face it, the camera zooms into the goofy-looking creature, which is just Lee Bongu changing his appearance. Our boy recognizes him and tries to ask why he looks different, but the minion just replies that he's been keeping diligent watch over the site up until his master arrived. I guess Minjun isn't in the mood to argue, so he simply lets out a sigh and asks if it's true that they discovered a hundred kilograms of mana stone inside the dungeon. 
Bongu isn't aware of the weight system on Earth, so he doesn't know how much 100 kilograms is supposed to be, but confirms that this is definitely the figure he heard. This amount is definitely very suspicious to our hero, because it's a hundred times more than what you would find inside a dungeon in Isgard, and that's only if you get really lucky. Sure enough, it finally surprises the little goofball as well, since he knows that such an amount is not normal. Minjun further confirms that it's an incredible amount of energy, and since the forces on Earth are currently working to weaponize it, it's no wonder that they're extremely greedy for it. Once again, he looks at the cackling and pulsing blue gate of the dungeon, and his brain picks up a strange energy signal that feels out of place. To confirm his suspicions, he asks Li Bongu if this is the strange aura he talked about earlier. And quite frantically, the pigeon flaps its wings to respond, confirming that this is definitely what he sensed from the gate. He can't sense any monsters inside the dungeon, but still can't help the feeling that the energy is very evil in its origin. This is when Minjun outs on his serious face at last, replying to his minion that it's no wonder he didn't understand it, because he has also only felt this type of energy once before in his life. And when Bongu asks if he knows what this energy is supposed to be, our hero starts gritting his teeth with frustration. He replies with a yes, and immediately starts bolting towards the gate at full sprint. Meanwhile, the workers at the site were still busy doing their tasks like before, but I guess that's not going to last for long. Because right in that moment, a bunch of slithering tentacles start shooting out of the gate. Chaos takes over the chain of command on the site, as the soldiers try to run away from this abomination, and the colonel tries to figure out what the fuck is happening. The platoon commander shouts that some of his squads are still operating inside the dungeon, but the colonel warns him to run away and save his own life first. Posing like a true hero, Minjun arrives on the scene just on time, confirming all of his suspicions from earlier. He comments that this is a fake dungeon, which might explain all the unnatural events surrounding it. As he's approaching, a guarding soldier warns him to stay away because the situation isn't looking good near the gate. But of course, Minjun just sprints past him without heeding the warning. He tells the soldier his name, division, and battalion number, and informs him that he'll rush ahead to open the dungeon from the inside. His words make no sense to the corporal of course, as he just panics to see him rushing in. Making his way through the others, our boy also catches the attention of the colonel, who's the most superior officer on the site. Surrounded by tentacles, he tries to ask what the soldier is trying to accomplish. But once again, Minjun simply continues his charge, and jumps straight into the mouth of the tentacle hazard. We see him disappear inside the electrical blue energy of the portal, and right after, the tentacles retract themselves in a swirl to shut the gate close. The bizarre turn of events leaves the colonel agape, because now, the once presumed dungeon gate is just a mass of winding tentacles, with no way for anyone to approach it. The colonel swallows his spit in fear of the sight, and realizes once again that he's truly fucked. Meanwhile, a system window informs our hero that he has entered the dungeon, and we see him landing in the cavernous surroundings of this dimension. He notices a presence and looks up, only to find a bunch of mining hunters, scared of his sudden appearance out of nowhere. This is the point where the comic gives us the names and the class of each of these hunters, but I'm too lazy to remember them, so I'll just make up my own names as we move forward. Our boy notices from their badges that they're all privates and private first class soldiers at best, so he asks to know if anyone else is present on the scene. One of the soldiers reply that this is all of them, and asks to know the identity of the intruder. Once again, Minjun gives them his name and other details, and responds that he just happened to be passing through this area when he found the gate. Before the privates could raise any further questions, he tells them quickly that the current situation isn't favorable, and he has no time to explain the details. He then asks them to ensure that no one is hurt, and confirm that they're all in possession of their equipment. After a quick inventory, we see that the privates were only carrying three katanas, two daggers, and a bunch of energy bars each. Naturally, Minjun is disappointed to see this, but the soldiers inform that they're just the transportation team so this is all they get, and the inspection team has already left. Even so, our hero doesn't understand why someone in their right mind would decide to dispatch a transportation team without any backup. And as he once again looks at the inexperienced privates, he can't help but wonder that something is definitely wrong. In any case, he decides to put the matter on hold and orders the soldiers to take back their equipment. He then proceeds to inform them about the bitter truth, which is the fact that they're currently standing inside a fake dungeon. It's a bit hard for him to explain the full essence of it, so in order to make things simpler, he tells the squad to think of this entire dungeon as a giant monster. Of course, the scared soldiers get all up on his face with surprise, and he continues to elaborate that this monster lures people inside to swallow them. And this time, the bait was nothing other than that ridiculous quantity of mana stone which the colonel was so greedy to extract. Shivers of fear run down the spines of the privates as they look at the crystals on the ground, but Minjun assures them that there's no need to worry. With a carefree smile, he tells them that he'll take responsibility and make sure to safely get everyone out of this shitty place. This relieves the soldiers' sense of worry, but they wonder if he really knows the way out. 
First of all, our hero tells them that they must follow all of his orders, and proceeds to inform that from now on, they will have to kill monsters and start moving towards the center of the dungeon. That statement surprises one of the private first-class soldiers, who was under the impression that they only had to deal with a singular monster. That's when my man glances at his surroundings to gauge the danger. He informs everyone that the fight has already begun, and as they frantically turn around, we see a bunch of muddy figures looming in the darkness. Zooming out, we get a good look at these abominable monsters, who are somehow managing to trudge onwards with their melting bodies. While the rookie hunters were still wondering what the heck they were looking at, Minjun disappeared from their group with lightning speed. And right in the next panel, we see him smacking the fuck out of one of these mud monsters at the front, startling the ones behind it. The remains of the creature splatter and fall to the ground, while our hero orders the jaw-dropped hunters to stay behind from now on. Seeing this immense display of power, one of the privates with thick brows addresses his brown-haired superior, wondering if he's the same Kim Minjun from the 104th Division they'd heard rumors about. The private first class confirms his junior's suspicion, as he also thinks he's looking at the same legend from the rumors. We then get a montage of our boy beating the shit of these creepers one after the other, and the hunters become more and more certain of his identity. That's right, he's the man who became a sergeant in the shortest time in history, and is notoriously dubbed as the invincible monster of the Hunter Corps by his peers and admirers. The story resumes, and instead of starting from our hero, we're greeted with the startled expression of Colonel Lee Sangjin, who's being called out by someone about his rank. This senior is none other than the Nepo baby's father, who seems to have rushed over to the site after hearing about the ongoing commotion. Without any pleasantries or a moment of respite, the threatening general grabs the collar of the colonel and drags him closer to demand an explanation for what the fuck has he done. The frantic man tries to explain that he merely discovered a lot of mana stone in the dungeon and wanted to extract it. But that's not the answer the general was looking for, and his eyes get bloodshot from the colonel's words instead. He shouts at the ignorant man in front of him, laying it out that he was never ordered to do any extraction, and even made the stupid decision of sending in soldiers without a proper raid team. Not to mention, this gate isn't even linked to a real dungeon. The colonel, who's visibly crying at this point, explains once again that the gate was confirmed to be empty after two weeks of investigation, so he simply wanted to extract some mana stone for the hunter army. Once again, that's not what the major general wanted to hear, and he's beyond pissed that the stupid colonel deployed soldiers without his permission after merely two weeks of investigation. He's more than aware that the man decided to cut corners and put his soldiers in a dangerous situation, all for the sake of his personal track record. And for that, he can't help but shout at him with a threatening voice. After laying it straight for him, General Teo flings the man aside, telling him to be ready to take off his uniform, regardless of the outcome of this event. He then worryingly turns around to look at the dungeon gate once more, and is forced to witness the incredible mess this asshole created. One last time, he threatens the colonel that if there's a single casualty among his soldiers, he'll personally make sure to send him to prison. And with those words from our father-in-law, we finally head back inside the fake dungeon, where Kim Minjun is blowing apart the mud monsters with his fists. After leaving a long trail of their mudded bodies inside the cavern, our boy gathers the team of soldiers in front of him once again. For some reason, he looks incredibly pissed, and we soon find out the reason why. He asks the noobs why they're interfering in his fights, when he clearly told them that he'd handle the situation by himself. Of course, the soldiers simply wanted to be of help, so the sergeant lets out a huge defeated sigh to calm himself down. He looks back at the mud piles behind them, and reminds the noobs that he told them he had to defeat all these parasite monsters and reach the center of the dungeon. The privates look at him and nod in agreement to his statement, and that's when our boy explains that these monsters are created by the fake dungeon to absorb the prey that walks inside it. They will increase in number once he gets close to the heart of the dungeon, and start swarming their team from every direction. Which is why, he wants all the privates to save up their stamina for that crucial moment. And as soon as the soldiers hear this, their eyes lighten up with confidence and admiration for their leader, who has just assured them that their presence is not useless. Once they get hyped up and start cheering, Minjun is finally able to smile, because he knows that this rescue mission is now plausible. Of course, his words didn't actually have a hint of concern for these fools behind them, as the fucker was simply after the extraordinary experience points he's getting from the dungeon. And by making sure that he's the only one fighting, he'll make sure to grab every single one of these points for himself. So with that greedy obsession with power, he innocently signals his squad to follow behind him and keep moving forward, and without a shred of doubt in their leader's judgment, the privates happily raise their weapons to follow his lead. With a squad of ignorant buffoons behind him, our guy was now finally heading towards the heart of the dungeon. Soon enough, he stepped into another mud pile, and we zoomed out to witness yet another mob of these creatures swarming the party from front. Their number was greater this time, and they all seemed to be guarding some sort of massive gem behind them, which was conveniently raised on a pedestal to mark its importance. Meanwhile, even though they did nothing, the soldiers were starting to get extremely exhausted and out of breath. 
Minjun is already aware that you start losing your stats and stamina simply by staying inside this fake dungeon. And had he allowed his men to fight from the beginning, there's a decent chance that they could have died due to exhaustion. Nevertheless, he assures them that they simply need to smash the core gem that they see ahead of them, and they would be able to escape this prison. But a ton of monsters stand on guard next to that core, making it a lot more difficult than it seems. But this is when our boy tells them to play their part properly, which is to make sure that no one gets killed or hurt, no matter what happens. He almost slips in his inner thoughts and blurts out that their health is necessary for his track record, but quickly fixes his words to tell them that they just need to focus on defense and stay safe in the rear. Once again, the soldiers shout in resonance, heeding the command of their leader while striking a defending formation to ensure everyone's safety. That reassures Minjun that he's free to leave their side, so he leaps forward into the battle, trusting the defensive capabilities of the privates. The mud monsters charge forward at the same time, but our boy simply splashes through them without any sort of resistance. He has to nerf himself and not use his demonic skills though, because the privates are watching, and he doesn't want any unnecessary rumors. So, without using anything flashy, our hero slips past the sluggish monsters with ease. They try to swing their liquefied bodies to intercept his path, but then he simply jumps into the air, while John and Ted eat the full brunt of Dave's attack. And while poor Dave was still horrified at the fact that he accidentally killed his own friends, Min Jun was crashing down on him from above like a goddamn meteor. With the mightiest axe kick you've ever seen, he lands gracefully on top of the mud creature, splashing its body apart. Rest in peace Dave, may you be remembered by someone in the comments section below. Well, anyway, Minjun uses this moment to leap forth once again and bounces ahead, leaving the majority of the monsters behind him. Dave's family steps up to block his path once again, but Daddy Mudface over here gets punched in the neck by the ruthless fist of our hero. He does the same to the second monster and once again continues to breeze past his enemies. By now, it seems as if even these mindless monsters are instinctively starting to back away from our hero, which of course makes him sprout a huge smile as he demonically orders them to keep coming at him with their sweet experience points. But then, all of a sudden, the purple core of the dungeon starts to radiate with its pinkish energy. It seems to have surrounded itself with some sort of mist, and Minjun's eyes widen immediately as he recognizes the threat. He knows that the core is starting to emanate poison, so he shouts at his squad to stand back immediately. That's when the core practically bursts with a purple cloud of poison, adding another layer to the already difficult situation. Our boy is immune to most poisons thanks to the demonic nature of his innate powers, but that doesn't eliminate the danger for his subordinates. He starts gathering a spiral crackling demonic energy in his hand to somehow deal with the situation, but he's aware that depending on the type of this poison, it might not be possible to keep his men alive. Plus he's already running out of time, so his only option is to quickly clear this dungeon as soon as possible. This is the moment when a certain ringlet starts to shine silver. The shining power is coming through from Minjun's pocket, where he kept the silver bracelet that was given to him as a gift from the Nepo baby's father. A system window informs us that the item is reacting to our hero's demonic energy, and another window confirms that the item's hidden powers have been unlocked. Our boy of course doesn't have any idea what's going on, so he takes out the bracelet to grab a quick look. He remembers the Major General's words when he received this gift, and how he explained that although the military isn't able to fully evaluate this item, it is known to increase a person's stats at random proportions. Minjun had been wanting to save this item for later when it will get harder to raise his stats manually, but he's surprised to learn that the bracelet also contains some hidden power. Right then, another window startles him as it suddenly pops up in front, and this is where we learn the full specs of this item. It's called the Bracelet of Imitation, and it allows the caster to use any skill that they know about, even if they don't own that skill personally. Also, once the skill gets used, the bracelet will lose all its property and disappear entirely. Our boy almost couldn't believe his insane luck when he read the information, because this is precisely the kind of item he needed to get out of this situation. He holds out the bracelet in his hand, and recalls the perfect skill to deal with his current predicament. Since Minjun comes from another world with a plethora of experience under his belt, he knows about way more skills than he currently owns. And with his vivid imagination, he conjures up his dark powers around the item, forming a handle of some sorts in his hand. As we zoom out, we see that he's holding a massive sword of pitch dark energy, which appears extremely volatile in its element. I guess it wasn't possible to conceal such a skill from the eyes of the privates, who can do nothing but stare at the sergeant with stun-locked expressions. Almost like Guts from Berserk, the man holds out his massive blade on his shoulder with a grin of confidence. This is one of the unique skills of a monster called the Dark Knight, which gave our boy quite a run for his money when he tried to catch him. It almost looks comical when Minjun holds out this absurd-looking weapon above his head, but the skill he uses to cast it is nothing to laugh at. This skill is called Banishment, and it uses his demon sword to open up a rupture in the surrounding space, blasting all nearby enemies through a dimensional rift. 
With one last smirk, my guy tells the fake dungeon to get a load of his power and swings down the gargantuan sword, which almost forms a veil of dark energy in front of him. As expected, the slash opens up a dimensional rift in front of him, and although everything looks normal for a brief moment to the mud monsters, they soon start getting sucked into the void as their bodies disintegrate. The rupture is massive, and sucks in all the enemies created by the fake dungeon in a twirling motion around it, along with all of its purple poison. The dungeon core itself wasn't an exception either, as it soon began to crack and crumble under the pressure. Not being able to hold onto its form, it got sucked into the rift along with the rest of its measly creations. By now, Minjun's energy sword has exhausted its usage, so it started to melt away its shape and disappear into the air as well. And in a matter of seconds, it completely disappeared from the hands of our hero. Not that it matters, because the satisfied look on his face is already enough to confirm that he got what he wanted. That's when his lackey in the outside world contacts him via telepathy, telling him that there's been some trouble. Apparently, the hunter military soldiers are sticking some sort of strange device to the entrance of the dungeon, and he doesn't really know its purpose. As we zoom in further towards the strange contraption, we hear the soldiers confirming that they have successfully installed the mana bomb. The commanders shout for only the necessary personnel to remain on the scene, and orders the rest to immediately vacate the site. The man in charge of this operation seems to be Major General Sun Tiho, and after hearing the word bomb, the lackey starts to get worried. He informs his master of the same, who currently seems to be reaching towards the dungeon core without a care in the world. The destroyed core lays in front of him in pieces, as he replies to his lackey that there's nothing to worry about. He then quickly proceeds to further smash whatever remained of that purple ball, claiming that he's about to exit this place in a matter of moments. Going back outside, it almost seems as if the time is running out for our hero. The bomb has already been installed, and an officer is standing next to General Tio with the trigger to detonate it on his command. The division commander holds the switch in his hand, wondering if he has no option but to press it. It would be nice if they could open the gate through the bomb, but there's always a chance that it might trigger another unexpected reaction from the dungeon. That's when we get into a brief flashback where the general was shocked to learn about Kim Minjun being present on the scene earlier. The commanding officer confirms this and informs that Sergeant is currently inside the dungeon along with their own personnel. That of course doesn't make any sense to Sun Tio, as our boy had no reason to be present at this site, when it's not even his station of duty. Heck, this isn't even his division. But the information is true, and the commanding officer confirms once again that he rushed into the gate after stating his affiliation. The Major General asks if Minjun's division has been contacted regarding this incident, and the subordinate replies with a yes, further informing that his battalion commander is currently en route to the site. With an almost uncharacteristically panicked look, the Nepo baby's father looks at the dungeon gate once again. He's worried about our boy's safety, and the dangers that he might face inside the unpredictable environment of such a strange dimension. But the portal is already closed shut by a mass of tentacles, which brings us back to the present, where the mana bomb has been planted to deal with that exact same issue. Sun Tio holds the bomb's trigger in his hand, but he's rather unsure of this decision. That's when the subordinate from the flashback comes rushing in, informing at once that all troops have been safely evacuated to a safe distance. Once again, with a worried expression, the Major General looks at the trigger and faces reality. Although he wants to put his faith in our boy, he knows that they have already spent four hours in the dungeon without proper equipment, which makes their chances of survival very slim. However, just as he had resolved himself to finally push the button, the massive portal suddenly started to quake and tremble. Such an event was unexpected, and it left the two officers at the scene to become unsure of what was happening. Miraculously, the enclosure of tentacles started turning to brittle stone and crumbling before their very eyes. Tio's subordinate was still lost in the sauce, but the general was sharp enough to take action immediately. He ordered him to quickly call the medics to come to the aid of any survivors, and then bring the officers to come fully armed to the field for any unexpected dangers. The general then rushed straight towards the gate, and with his massive hands and abnormal physique, started tearing apart the weakened tentacles to fully open up the portal once again. While he was busy struggling to rip the tentacles piece by piece, the lieutenant was already back with the medics as commanded. A gray-haired woman, who looked to be the one in charge of the medical corps, immediately reported their arrival to the major general, but the man simply commanded her to stand by for the time being. And then, as he held the pieces of monster flesh he tore apart, the both of them witnessed something truly miraculous. Human figures started to emerge from the portal, and it only took a moment more to see that these were the privates who were sent inside for mana stone extraction. From the look on their faces, they almost can't believe that they actually made it out alive. I shit you not, this is actually the first time we've ever seen Nepo Baby's father with such a genuine face of happiness. I guess he really cares about his people. He pats the private first class at the front, and starts asking them if everyone is safe, and if there's anyone who got injured. I guess the reality finally set in for the redhead, so he starts crying with joyful tears, telling the division commander that everyone is safe. 
The remaining soldiers soon began to come out of the portal in numbers, and it became clear that their raid was successful. At the end of the line is our boy, heroically standing tall with an exhausted private on his shoulder to help him through. One of the medics rushes over to help the private instead, and our boy slowly leaves the man in his care. He then turns his gaze and meets the eyes of the major general standing a short distance away from him. First things first, Minjun makes sure to salute his senior on the field. The man at the other end sprouts a smile after this gesture, making sure to salute back in response. If not for our hero, the privates who were sent inside would have lost their lives, and our father-in-law seems well aware of this fact. The scene then transitions to the evening of the same day, and we're taken to the headquarters of the 107th Division. Inside the building, General Sun and our boy are sitting together inside his office. Placing down his cup of coffee, the general seems to be agreeing to some sort of report in his hand. He confirms the report by asking our boy if he was indeed on vacation, which the sergeant agrees to immediately. And when asked as to what he was doing inside a foreign division, Minjun perked up and replied that he came to avail the offer from the major general, who agreed to treat him to a meal. Of course, the officer finds it a bit odd that a soldier would willingly use his vacation for something so trivial. Not to mention, as soon as he arrived in the area, he noticed the portal acting weird at the perfect moment and jumped in to save a bunch of people he had no affiliation with. And after listening to all the facts, even Minjun is forced to face the fact that his lie is starting to stretch a bit thin. However, he has no choice but to stick to his words, so answers back with his usual bright energy, confirming that when he noticed the anomaly at the gate, his body started moving on its own to take action. There was a brief moment where the general was forced to think that this dude had to be bullshitting him, but he couldn't help and laugh at the answer instead. He likes the eccentric nature of our MC, and is finally beginning to understand why Brutus likes him so much. Meanwhile, my guy is just surprised that his lie somehow ended up working. After the hearty laughter, the Major General leans forward and informs our hero of the incredible feat he accomplished inside the fake dungeon by ensuring the safety of every soldier. He appreciates his efforts, and Minjun is more than happy to take up that compliment with stride. However, there's a sudden tension in the air when General Sun's eyes begin to sharpen. Minjun notices the shift and stays silent in response to listen further. That's when the man starts explaining that the sergeant is starting to stand out too much. Not only has he been rapidly moving up in ranks one after the other, but also given the achievements of today's incident, it goes without a doubt that the Hunter Corps headquarters is starting to pay him a lot of attention. To our attention-seeking hero, that's not exactly a bad thing, but the general is concerned that it might cause him some problems in the future. And if that happens, he wants to assure Minjun that he should never hesitate to inform him immediately. No matter what happens, he assures him that Brutus and himself will stand up for him at any given point. That means that our sergeant boy is now officially recognized by the father-in-law for his talents, and Minjun can't help but thank him for the gesture. After that, the general leans back on his sofa, telling the boy that he can't really treat him to a meal today because he's busy, but he'll go ahead and grant him any personal favor if it's within his power, as thanks for saving his men. Without an ounce of shame, this idiot blurts out that he'd like yet another promotion, but General Sun makes it clear that such a decision is not up to him in the slightest. That left our boy with a pouting expression on his face, but only until his eyes got drawn to something special. As he peered at the general's desk, he saw a very familiar-looking crystal that he once stole from the Nepo baby's house. Just like the last one, this crystal is giving off a faint, yet an extremely refined smell of demonic energy. The general notes that the sergeant's gaze is fixated on the object, and he immediately picks up on the cue that the boy probably wants it. He asks him if he knows the object, but Minjun plays clueless and replies that it just looks like a really interesting rock, and he's like to add it to his collection. Once again, his eccentric nature and responses are really starting to grow on the general. He gives him a stern look for a moment, and while my man just stares back with his puppy-eyed look, General Sun says that the crystal is a byproduct of a dungeon and is rather valuable. He adds that there was recently a burglary in his house, which left him with only just one of these crystals. If he catches the culprit, father-in-law would surely tear apart his limbs, but we already know that the rascal is sitting right in front of him, pretending like he doesn't know anything. But anyway, the general takes the jar in his hand, easily offers it to the excited sergeant as a gift for his services. The man can't help but feel that he strangely keeps getting involved with our hero just like his daughter, but he's finally starting to not hate these interactions. But thinking about his daughter, he suddenly regains his usual self, asking Minjun directly what kind of relationship he has with Yunseo. And of course, my man replies with a stern look that they're fellow hunters, nothing more and nothing less. In his case, it's also true because this dude don't care about no women. That statement in itself is a huge relief to the doting father, who just wants to protect his daughter from the lecherous gazes of men. So, with a smile etched on his face, the general excuses the sergeant and asks him to send his battalion commander in the office after he leaves. Kim Minjun salutes the Major General and exits the scene promptly with the crystal in his hand.
It is now nighttime outside, and our boy is waiting under a bus stop with a familiar figure by his side. Looks like Li Bongu has reverted back to his usual form to enjoy some sort of sweet fish-shaped pastry, and his master is just yelling at him to stop eating with his mouth open. Scared of his wrath, the cute lackey calms down a bit, and Minjun proceeds to smash the crystal in his hand to absorb its power. A bunch of system windows pop out in succession to inform about the demonic energy he has absorbed, and the amount of stats that have been increased. It actually seems much lower than the last time, and our hero is forced to wonder whether he's reaching a point where it's going to get much harder to increase his level. But just as he was thinking that, another system window informed him that he's reached the current threshold of the demonic energy, and unlocked a new skill called the demonic energy whip. Now that changes the whole story for our boy, who's suddenly excited again at the emergence of a new power. While all of that was going on, we go back to the Hunter Corps headquarters, where a meeting was ongoing inside one of the conference halls. Sun Tiho and General Brutus were standing face to face with each other, and the man in the center was their superior, yelling at Nipo Baby's father for the mess he allowed to fall on his sight. The man apologized for his oversight, but the superior officer, Lieutenant General Kim chang was far too furious to accept his apology. He yells that the 107th Division would get audited soon, and warns the Major General to be ready for it as well. While the two-star officer could do nothing but hide his face in shame brought upon by his useless subordinate, the Lieutenant General stayed relentless in his remarks. Even Brutus had no choice but to witness the whole scene quietly, as there was nothing they could do to mend this situation. Moreover, Kim Changmo was dying to meet the battalion commander who was the root cause of this mess, and it's very likely that he's going to strip him of his uniform. Sun Tiho agreed to send Colonel Lee to the meeting room later, and that's when the door behind him suddenly propped open. A single emergence of the figure from the door startled the three officers present, and Lieutenant General Kim was the first to get up and salute. The man stepped forward with authority, telling Kim Changmo to go easy on the Major General, because he's yelling loud enough to even be heard outside the room. The three-star officer immediately stands on guard after the statement, agreeing to the command and sweating profusely. That's when the figure finally took his seat while stating that he had received the report of the incident, and Major General Brutus quickly realized that shit was about to go down. You can already see the four stars on the uniform of this figure, which mark the highest status in the military, the rank of a general. And sure enough, as we zoom in on the cunning and calculating face of the man, the comic reveals him to be the supreme commander of the entire hunter military, General Gu Hakchiol. He utters the name of Kim Minjun, the man who was at the forefront of his report, and you can immediately tell that some intense politics are about to go down soon. The story continues, and we're immediately greeted by a brown car, speeding its way inside the hunter military camp. It comes to a halt with an abrupt press on the brakes, and out comes a fuming colonel, the commander of Minjun's battalion in the 104th Division. Still mad and upset, the guy doesn't even bother to close the door to his car and marches straight into the building. His destination is none other than his own office, and when he bursts open the door to head inside, he's immediately greeted by an energetic salute from one of the officers. The colonel looks around frantically, asking where everyone is. As we zoom into the face of the officer, we find out that it's Minjun's own platoon commander, and he seems a bit hesitant to answer the colonel. The colonel figures out the situation from his silence immediately, and asks whether the people came to target our hero, which is something the platoon commander couldn't refuse. Feeling dejected and defeated, the colonel takes a seat at last, calling the higher-ups a bunch of bastards for their underhanded tricks. He holds his aching head with frustration, knowing fully well that they deliberately made their move when he wasn't in the camp. As he sighs and tries to calm himself down, the poor lieutenant can do nothing but stare at him, with a face that says he doesn't know what to say. You see, this man was making the exact same face just an hour prior, when he was lost in the sauce in exactly the same way. He was sitting in front of two broad shoulders, which belonged to a pair of really scary individuals. The first one was a Master Sergeant Yu Tiwen, a senior officer from the Special Task Force of the Hunter Military. The second one, who looked like his brother from another mother, was also from the same task force, but slightly lower in rank. He was a Sergeant First Class, whose name was Jiang Minsu. Looks like they came with a request to Minjun's platoon commander, who was currently in the process to decline them politely. His reason was that the officers came really early in the morning, and wanted to personally meet his soldier who had just returned from his vacation. From his point of view, the whole situation was a bit odd, but his explanation was cut short by the gigantic hand of his guest. Master Sergeant Yu wasn't even trying to be subtle about his approach, as he openly stated that he's here on the orders of the top brass and would appreciate it if the lieutenant looked the other way. That of course infuriated the platoon commander, who was now trying to make it a matter of basic principle. But once again, the gorilla brother did nothing but laugh in his face while pulling out a phone from their pocket. Master Sergeant Yu claimed that they weren't breaking any rules, as a formal notice from the very general of the military could be arranged by a single phone call if they deemed it necessary. And sure enough, the mustache gorilla was ready with his flip phone to make that call on a moment's notice. 
This definitely put the pressure on the poor platoon commander, who knew that he couldn't possibly refuse orders from the general. And with that, the elder gorilla demanded that he call Sergeant Minjun to meet them, so they can have their meeting in quiet and leave without any trouble. Well, the lieutenant was left with no choice, and it didn't take long for the office gate to open once again, and our boy Minjun to step in with a salute to his senior officers. Both the first lieutenant and the gorillas turned their heads to gaze upon the man of the hour, and our boy immediately noticed the symbol of the special task force imprinted on the guests. Ignorant as he may be, Minjun lived inside the military, so he was able to quickly identify the mark. The lieutenant tried to set the tone to introduce his soldier to the guests, but the master sergeant jumped the gun to take the initiative. He got up and greeted our boy with a firm handshake, along with his own introduction to make it clear that he belonged to the special task force. Minjun replied to the gesture with the same energy and was overall pleased with their appearance. By now, the master sergeant seemed to have gained complete control of the conversation by sucking up to Minjun's achievements and asking him to sit down for a chat. Our boy thanked the officer and took his seat next to his platoon commander, who was currently very worried with how things were progressing. The elder gorilla didn't waste any time getting to his point, and straight up stated the special task force, or the STF, was in need of competent personnel like our hero. From that one line alone, it became pretty clear to Minjun that this was a scouting offer. Master Sergeant made the duties of the task force more clear from thereafter, stating that they're only deployed for special cases unlike the regular hunters. These tasks include raids inside high-risk dungeons, protection of VIPs, overseas missions for the military, and much more. It was a lot of gibberish that our boy simply didn't care a damn about, but his eyes were glittering in a way that worried the lieutenant. After all, as long as he was promised a huge promotion, this dude wouldn't really hesitate to switch sides. Master Gorilla even mentions that they often deal with the crimes of civilian hunters who aren't affiliated with the military, so high combat skill is an immense requirement for their unit. After stating all the work that they do, this dude claims that our boy's incredible performance in his division hasn't gone unnoticed by the headquarters, so they would like to offer him a place that he actually deserves, along with a special promotion. Yep, yeah, those were the words that tipped the scales completely. As soon as our boy heard about the special promotion, his eyes perked up with excitement, very much in contrast to what his commander was feeling. The master sergeant is just layering the cream on top of this delicious cake of an offer at this point, and confirms once again that if our boy indeed joins their task force, he would be promoted to the position of a staff sergeant immediately. That's where the mustache gorilla chimes in, further elaborating that the initial promotion isn't the only benefit, as people in the special task force are basically on a fast track to future promotions and rank ups inside the military, because they have more chances to rack up their achievements. Of course, with all those CO-optimized words to resonate with Majun's noodle brain, he was seeing absolutely no reason to refuse such a stellar offer. That's when the master sergeant's flip phone started ringing out of nowhere, and as he tried to excuse himself while trying to take it out of his absurdly plus-size pocket, Minjun couldn't help but notice that it's the exact same model as the one on the table. For some reason, that put a sense of worry on our boy's face, so he asked the mustache gorilla about it right away. Feeling cocky and superior, Jang started putting it back in his pocket, while explaining that it's a special device that's only issued to the special task force. It should not be confused with a regular smartphone, as this thing is specially designed for security and confidentiality. As much as he was being cocky in his explanation, it was starting to have the opposite effect on our boy, who was picking up signs of rigidness in the special task force's way of operations. He surprises the Gorilla Brothers when he asks them whether he'd be allowed to use the internet and computers as much as he wants if he joins their unit, and as expected, the response wasn't to his liking. The officers explain that they deal with top-secret information regularly and have to control their environment to prevent leakage. In other words, not only are they not allowed to use the internet during duty, but also actively encourage not using it during your vacation as well. Well, that was it folks, our boy has lost all interest in their offer. Even his platoon commander is able to tell what's happening, because he now knows that these task force buffoons don't know shit about our hero. In any case, the master sergeant was about to close the meeting by handing over his card and saying how such an offer is extremely rare to come by, but Minjun straight up cut him off and told him that he'd just stay in his current division. Not surprisingly, that immediately broke the previously calm facade of these idiots, who couldn't wrap their head around his answer. Getting slightly annoyed already, the master sergeant demanded our boy to reveal his reason for rejecting the offer. Of course, Minjun isn't known for his shy nature, so he immediately starts explaining that he can't join a squad where he can't even play his favorite game, Dungeon Power Fighter. Now clearly, that was an answer that sent the mustache gorilla in almost a justifiable rage. I mean, how could this dude reject such an incredible offer over some stupid outdated game? But that's just who our boy is, and he makes it clear to his guests that he's not joking. For him, this game is a vital source of energy, and he's not really willing to substitute it for anything else. Heck, this guy crossed over a whole separate dimension just to play this game. 
That doesn't mean that the master sergeant would simply accept his reasoning, however, but he's got no other choice. Realizing that the person's will matters the most anyway, he decides to take a calm stance unlike his angry junior and says that they will take their leave. Seeing them leave, the platoon commander jumped up with a giant ass spring in his steps and beamed ahead to open the door for them, showing them the way out so they can never come back. My guy was literally snickering behind their backs as the officers of the special task force could do nothing but exit the office with their defeated expressions. But as a one last fuck you, the mustache gorilla turned around and accused Minjun for having his accomplishments overly blown out of the proportion, as he never believed that someone of his caliber was fit to join the task force in the first place, and he's sure that he couldn't even pass their entrance test if he tried. I don't know what to say, but we all know that our hero doesn't like backing down from a challenge quietly. He unfortunately took the bait, and asked Jang how he could be so sure that he'd fail their test. The two guests' pride was already crushed, and now this idiot was clearly taunting them by claiming to be better than what they think, so it's no wonder that the poor platoon commander was starting to lose his shit once again. Minjun was already in battle mode in his head, so he provoked them once again, asking them how they could deduce that he would fail their entrance test. That made the mustache gorilla walk back up to him in retaliation, and as showed his teeth behind that bushy mustache, he confidently looked down on our hero, stating that he could prove his point at any moment. Right now, this asshole is clearly itching for a fight and the platoon commander knows that nothing good will come out of such a mess, so he tries to stop the two from taking things further. But he immediately gets cut off and tapped on his soldier by the master sergeant, whose snickering face tells us that he's enjoying the direction this whole commotion is headed. Now that they've failed the mission anyway, he wants to take down our boy a peg, and requests the platoon commander to let them use their training center for a duel. In the next scene, we head directly towards the mentioned training facility, where the mustache gorilla and our hero are holding their respective weapons to face off against each other. The observers are the master sergeant and the ever-so-confused platoon commander, who still doesn't know how to sweep up this mess. We finally get to see the incredibly buffed-up body of the gorilla from a front view, who's explaining to Minjun that the special task force's entrance exam is a freestyle duel against a senior member, so he should get ready to get schooled. Minjun makes it clear once again that he has no intention of joining the task force. So, if he comes out as the winner in this duel, he wants the mustached asshole to apologize before taking his leave. That of course sends the man boiling once again, who just can't seem to understand why our hero is still so confident. He mocks Minjun's choice to pick up a whip against him in a duel, and taunts him by claiming to fix his attitude for good by the time their duel is over. The master sergeant announces that the battle will be held over three rounds of three minutes each, and commences the fighters to begin their duel right away. Upon his signal, our boy starts cracking his whip, and the mustache dude takes up an offensive stance with his sword. The bell rings, and the gorilla is the first one to make the move, by instantly getting closer to Minjun to break his balance. Our boy manages to duck under the sword just in the nick of time, but the gorilla is now blocking his vision with his massive hand, while also bringing back his weapon for another attack. This catches our boy off guard, and sends him flying to the other end of the hall by a single thrust from the training sword of the gorilla. My man skids past his platoon commander and lands violently on the ground, leaving his enemy with an expression of satisfaction and victory. The platoon commander is quite shocked at such a scene, because this was probably the first he ever saw Minjun take any kind of attack from his opponent. On the other hand, our boy was lying rather silently on the floor with his arms spread. But as soon as we zoom in, we see that he's now actually grinning from ear to ear, absolutely thrilled at the prospect of this fight. The commander looks at the excited face of his soldier with worry, and this is where we enter a little flashback to see what happened earlier. You see, when Minjun was getting ready with his weapon of choice, the platoon commander called out to him. He wanted to ask what our boy's plan for the fight was, and of course, the up-and-coming sergeant was only planning to win overwhelmingly by thoroughly crushing his opponent. Now here's the thing that worries the platoon commander the most. He's not worried that Minjun won't win, but instead afraid that he'll beat up his opponent so badly that there might be consequences for them to pay afterwards. But even without him voicing out these words, our boy was starting to catch on. He straight up asked his commander if winning one-sidedly could have some sort of consequence later, and in response, his superior simply looked back at the Gorilla Brothers with worry. He explained that the Special Task Force is a squad that's well known for their overblown egos, so he's afraid that they might start targeting Minjun in the future if they lose face. Our hero gave it some thought, and eventually came to a very simple and effective solution that caught the first lieutenant's attention. He said that he'll just let the opponent hit him just once during the battle, which should be enough for them to save some face. Holy fuck, now it makes sense why he got hit like that in the first place, and why he was laughing like a maniac afterwards. Well, that brings us back to the present where our hero is downed on the floor. And as expected, the mustache gorilla is definitely on his high horse after that single blow. Master Sergeant tried to end the spar right there and asked the platoon commander to take his soldier to the medics, but this duel was far from over. 
Heck, even the commander himself knew that these guerrillas had no idea who the fuck they were messing with. The master sergeant was now getting overly condescending, telling our boy that he should be glad that he at least managed to dodge the first hit. But from the perspective of their unit, he's far from ideal. But you see, the man had no choice but to cut his words short and look surprised, because our boy immediately got up as if nothing had happened. With a confident smile on his face, my man deemed that the duel wasn't over and wanted to continue the fight. Of course, his crisp voice surprised the mustache bastard as well, because he knows that he hit him exactly where he wanted, so he shouldn't be able to get back on his feet so easily. He's worried and confused, but that doesn't mean he can back down from another round, because this was supposed to be a three-round duel to begin with. The master sergeant on the other hand thinks that Minjun is trying to push himself too far, and even though he agrees to continue the duel, he's worried that it won't be good for anyone if he gets injured too seriously. But that won't be a problem for our hero, because the battle hasn't even begun from his point of view. His opponent sees his courage as an act of arrogance, and once again comes back to teach him a lesson. With a pissed off face, he claims that such foolishness cannot be called determination, as it's nothing more than suicide. But well, he's talking to the wrong person entirely. Ninjun is now ready with his weapon, and we finally get an explanation on why he chose it in the first place. It's because he wanted to use his latest ability called the Demonic Whip, to encapsulate his energy into the weapon, and he further used his other skill to camouflage it completely from the eyes of others. The gorilla was now starting to look like an angry baboon instead, ready to tear apart his opponent for his arrogance. And just like before, he was once again the one to make the first move, coming at our hero directly with his load of overconfidence. This time, he launched a triple thrust attack with his sword, but our boy was as ready as ever. Without so much as a single flinch, he easily parried all of his attacks by tugging tight on his whip. For the mustache, who thought this round was gonna be just as simple as the last one, this was the first of many surprises to come. He immediately pulled back to gain some distance from our hero, and lunged forward once again with a much heavier thrust, aimed directly at the throat. Not that it was gonna matter though, because this time, our boy immediately captured the sword by turning the whip around it. The dude and his mustache were shell-shocked by what he just witnessed, and as Minjun tugged back on his weapon, the gorilla's training sword was flung ten feet into the air, disarming him completely. Both the master sergeant and the first lieutenant were mind-boggled to see this, but our boy had a lot more in store. Without relenting, he swung back his arm to direct the whip back at the gorilla, who was still stuck in his earlier position. This just goes to show just how fast all of this happened. The whip came crackling down from all directions, and the gorilla had no choice but to put his guard and endure the blows. Although disgruntled and furious, the man looked fine on the surface. But just as he was about to get cocky and tell Minjun that his lousy attacks weren't going to work on his buff muscles, his hands started to crank up from nowhere. His expression made a complete 180 in a matter of seconds, and the pain was so unbearable that he couldn't help but scream at the top of his lungs. As far as the master sergeant was concerned, perhaps this moment was the most shocking one to him. He couldn't believe that his brother Gorilla was kneeling down from such a seemingly underwhelming attack, but the man was literally trembling and wailing in agony. But this was just the start of the suffering, and the master sergeant could instinctively spot the threat when he saw the whip once again. In the hands of our boy, who was swinging that shit around like some experienced cowboy and grinning like an absolute psychopath, this innocent training weapon was starting to look incredibly terrifying. The master sergeant was finally beginning to realize that they might have fucked up, and Sergeant First Class Jang was literally about to cry when he saw our boy approaching. Of course, his cries wouldn't be heard in a duel of pride, and he was made to eat the full brunt of Minjun's demonic whip to his chest. With a tear and snot-covered face, the man almost fell unconscious upon this last impact. He grunted in pain, and our hero just watched him suffer from his high position. From this exchange, he could understand that the STF was definitely a cut above the rest, but they chose the wrong opponent to go up against. This was probably their first time getting hit by a whip coated in demonic energy, so it's no wonder the gorilla couldn't endure the pain. After all, when it comes to the life forms back in Isgard, even the incredibly thick-skinned orc warriors curl up on the ground from the impact of this skill. So, when the whip wails and cracks in the air, cutting through everything as our hero gets closer and closer to his opponent, the fear sensors in the gorilla clock up to the max, and he literally starts fearing for his life. My boy's demonic expression isn't helping the sergeant first class either, who's having a lot of fun thoroughly breaking down the egotistical nature of his opponent. Seeing him wind up another attack, the gorilla screams as loud as he can, and the master sergeant jumps in immediately to stop the fight and save his junior's ass. But my man is no warrior of justice, so he brings down the whip regardless. A loud clap of thunder-like impact is heard echoing through the training chamber, and we see that Minjun decided not to hit the poor gorilla after all. Instead, he hit the ground right next to his crotch. Well, not that it helped anyway, because the poor sergeant first class had already started frothing from his mouth when he saw the whip coming towards him, and rather pathetically, he fell down to the floor with an inch of his life remaining. Press F to pay respects for this poor idiot, 
who might never even appear in this manhwa again. Anyway, seeing him faint so abruptly, the master sergeant had no choice but to rush straight to his rescue. He lifted up his hulking junior, only to find out that he had fainted completely. For someone who never even blinked an eye while getting beaten up by terrifying monsters, Sergeant you can't believe that his junior would faint from the fear of pain. He looked back at our hero, happily chatting away with his platoon commander, and truly wondered if a training whip could ever be capable of dishing out such destructive force. The only conclusion he could come to was the fact that Minjun was truly special, and there was no way he could afford to let go of such a treasure. So, as the man who finally understood our hero's true value, he decided to face the shame, and asked if he could be allowed to apologize in place of his subordinate to atone for their mistake. For a moment, Minjun didn't know how to respond, for such a prideful man to personally offer him his apology. He wondered if he had gone too far to teach them a lesson. And as he looked once again at the sorry state of the sergeant first class, he was starting to feel a bit bad for what he had done. And so, deciding to let the matter go, he simply replied with an apology of his own, claiming that he had acted beyond his rank on impulse as well, so they should just bury the hatchet. The master sergeant didn't show much expression to that response, but deep down, he really respected our hero's reply to this situation. Growing more and more interested, he handed him out his card once again, telling him to contact him anytime in the future if he ever decides to change his mind about the offer. With that, he picks up his junior from the floor, politely deciding to exit the camp with whatever dignity they had left. But of course, the now-satisfied lieutenant teased them the whole way, asking them if they needed to be shown their way to the medics. Master Sergeant Yu declined the offer without showing any emotion, and gestured that it's best that they now get going back to their camp. And with that, this foxy bastard just stepped aside and showed them the way out with the most passive-aggressive pose imaginable to mankind. It looked as if Minjun was quite pleased with the end result as well. He didn't know what to do with the card in his hand, but this was probably the best outcome in this scenario. We now head back to the present timeline to the company commander's office, where a loud burst of laughter could be heard outside. The platoon commander had just finished telling the whole story to the battalion commander, who was beyond happy to hear it in detail. With a bright and pleased smile, he asked his junior officer about the whereabouts of the man in question, Kim Minjun. The lieutenant replied that he was now back in his barracks, and was currently training on his own. The colonel says that he'll personally deliver the news of Minjun rejecting the offer from the special task force, as he's sure that the division commander Brutus would be thrilled to hear it. But still, there's a moment where he shows some worry on face, because if our boy rejected their offer this time, he's sure that the STF now wants him more badly than ever. The lieutenant seems to think the same, and wonders if they should do something to entice our hero to make him stay in their battalion. The colonel's response to this is rather bland. He believes that the division commander must have predicted these things so far, so they shouldn't worry unnecessarily. He looks back up with a renewed smile and a hint of confidence, saying that he's looking forward to what kind of offer Brutus would prepare for our hero. That's where we transition the scene towards the training room with a bunch of broken slabs of wood on the floor, and our hero who's currently in the process of breaking more of them by using his whip. Holding his weapon with a hint of confusion, it seems as if this man is trying to practice his control over the skill so that he can tone it down a bit when dealing with a similar opponent in the future. The episode starts, and the first thing we see is the absolutely joyous face of Brutus, laughing at our hero's recent shenanigans with the special task force. He's getting the news from Minjun's battalion commander, and is overall quite pleased with the result. He speculates that the STF guys must be quite upset right now, to which the colonel fully agrees. You see, Brutus was previously quite worried because he knew he couldn't stop our boy from leaving if he decided to join the STF, but now, that situation has resolved itself rather beautifully. The colonel agrees, and suggests that it's probably the best time for them to step up their game. Since the Major General agrees with this statement, he wastes no time and gets up to express his proper appreciation to the right party. My man picks up the tiny handle of the phone receiver with his gigantic hand, and casually proceeds to talk in abstract words to the person on the other end, confusing the colonel behind him. With almost a vicious smile, he orders the other person to meet him right away and bring all the relevant files along with him. We'll get back to this mysterious development later, but for now, let us go back to the military camp of our hero. The corporals are all gathering in front of their sergeants, looking a bit anxious. The reason seems to be the newly lined shoulder traps of our hero, which seem to represent yet another promotion. Guangshik and the rest look confused to see this, and nervously ask Sergeant Lee what seems to be happening. Sergeant Lee responds without a change in expression, letting everyone know that he's no longer the leader of their squad, and the position has now been passed on to Minjun. The ponytail inquires if this means that Sergeant Lee is getting a promotion, but the man replies with a negative. However, he elaborates that he will soon be applying for the position of a staff sergeant rank, so he's now passing on his current position to Sergeant Kim Minjun. All of these guys have been through every dangerous situation imaginable, so it's not like anyone has a complaint regarding this decision. 
In fact, all the corporals agree in unison that no one else is more qualified than our boy to receive such a position. Still, Minjun's disciple raises his hand to ask a question, and the sergeant allows him to speak. Looks like the student is curious if his master was the one responsible for solo clearing the fake dungeon from a different division, because that's quite the hot topic inside the division. His inquiry hypes up Guangshik and the Ponytail as well, who claim that the entire hunter community is in an uproar because of that incident. I guess he couldn't deflect the rumors at this point, so my boy keeps it casual and calmly admits that he's the one responsible for clearing that dungeon. However, he makes sure to add that he was passing through that location by mere coincidence. After confirming the rumors from the man himself, it's to no one's surprise that the entire squad was dumbfounded. They knew it was possible, but getting the confirmation still left them surprised. Dong Jin expresses his shock and asks right away if the sergeant suffered any injuries. But as you can see, this fucker is in perfect condition. Now the others get extra chummy, wondering if this achievement has something to do with his promotion to the squad leader and whether he's going to receive any other rewards. Getting tired of their persistent questions, our boy pushes them away while agreeing to have received some other rewards, but it doesn't look like these people have any intention of leaving without getting their answers. A few days passed after that, and we now find ourselves inside a goblin colony dungeon, where our boys are slaying the monsters left and right. One of the goblins gets sliced in half with his tongue sticking out, and the dialogue between the corporals begins. Guangxik seems to be asking if Minjun really got a scouting offer from the STF after only joining the military recently, and the Ponytail confirms it immediately. Not only that, while hacking away at his target, the Ponytail Corporal even confirms that our boy straight up rejected the offer and brutally beat up one of their sergeants. Guangxik knows that all of this must be true, but given how unbelievable it all sounds, he can't help but comment that no one outside the military would believe such bullshit. But it remains a fact that the division commander made Minjun their squad leader, and even Guangxik knows that he has already been promised the position of a staff sergeant within a year. Anyway, while they were discussing such matters, the two corporals heard an unbelievable roar coming from the forest. A massive green hand emerged from the shadows, crushing a tree bark with its bare grip. Its glowing yellow eyes and its shiny white tusk became visible, making it clear that the goblin lord had made its appearance. My guy was built like John Cena, and creepily inched towards the corporals to avenger its fallen comrades. Once again, it roared with all of its might, but somehow, it got absolutely zero reaction from our guys. Even while the Lord was charging towards them with its massive club, the hunters didn't bat a single eye and kept staring at the creature with deadpan eyes. That's when a whip slithered past Guangshik with unimaginable speed and hit the overgrown goblin right in its eyes. The poor creature let go of its weapon while wincing in pain, and we finally realized why the corporals didn't even consider it a threat. More lashes of whip kept coming out in succession, the monster cried in pain and agony, while the hunters did nothing but watch the show from the sidelines. At this point, the goblin lord was looking more like a beaten-up slave, cowering before its master to beg for mercy. That's when we finally see the face of the perpetrator, who's of course no one other than our boy, Minjun. He holds a rather sturdy-looking whip in his hand with his signature smirking smile, ready to crack a bastard's skull. Just from the conversation of the corporals, it would seem that the new whip in our hero's hand is personal equipment, that was granted to him by the division commander himself. And given the fact that even the platoon commander doesn't have his personal equipment yet, this is definitely an amazing privilege. But privileges be damned, our boy out here just wants to have fun being merciless to a bunch of monsters while swinging around his new fancy weapon. The whip cracks like thunder on the poor creature, blasting him away to bits and pieces. At this point, Guangxi can't help but wonder why he was given a whip out of all possible weapons. The ponytail corporal replies, saying that this is something their sergeant picked for himself. And now that they see the effects of such rewards in live action, they're somewhat starting to understand why Minjun would reject a direct scouting offer from the STF. Even Minjun himself is really fond of his new weapon, thinking to himself how it's a lot better than he'd imagine. Swinging it around once more, he gets a near-perfect feel for its weight, balance, and the grip, which are exceptional to say the least. Not to mention, because of the mana stone engraved in the handle, our boy no longer needs to use his demonic whip skill for the impact to be effective. And with all of that combined, it's only natural that he's having a ton of fun using this weapon, blasting mofos into the nether realm, and surprising the fuck out of everyone who's watching him do it. He was promised another promotion within a year, but from the looks of it, and with the help of this incredible weapon, Minjun is quite confident that he'll be able to move that date forward by quite a bit. Now, let us move forward and time ourselves, as the scene shifts to a chicken restaurant inside of the Chunchen area. The delicious Korean meat is sizzling on a hot pan, but unlike the scrumptious nature of the food, our boy Minjun is looking pretty sour. Looks like someone is sitting in front of him, quite eager to eat the food, but my man isn't the least bit enthusiastic. He lets out a sigh, looks at the person in front of him with a frown, and asks them why they're here. 
quite surprisingly, the person on the other end of the table is the Nepo baby, completely engrossed by the food in front of her. The waitress swoops in to mix up the ingredients one last time, and earns one of the most beautiful smiles this world had ever seen from Sun Yunseo. And right away, without wasting a single moment, the girl starts chomping down at the delicious treat, completely ignoring Minjun's question from earlier. This puts our boy in a bad mood, as he stares at the girl with a mix of annoyance and puzzlement. At last, Yunseo finally notices his hostile gaze, and stops the next bite to observe further. She innocently asks her if he's not gonna eat as well, and offers to cover the bill by herself. But of course, that's not the issue at hand. Our boy is just curious how the Nepo baby knew that he was taking a day off, and also the fact that he was coming to this area. Heck, she even knew the exact restaurant he was gonna dine at. While piecing all of these things together, a thought suddenly pops up in our hero's mind. He remembers how he shared his plans with Corporal Guangshik, and immediately figures that he must be the bastard who leaked the information to Yunseo. As soon as he asks the girl to confirm this, she starts averting her eyes as expected. It looks like his guess was on the mark. Yunseo claims it to be just a coincidence, but the scary looks from our hero sets her straight that she's already been caught. So, she decides to own up to it, and apologizes to the hero while admitting to the fact that she was the one who requested the information. But the corporal's punishment is now up to the sergeant to decide, so he just cuts to the chase and asks the female hunter what she's planning by coming here. In fact, he straight up makes the assumption that maybe she likes him, which is a remark that the lady waitresses of the establishment are trained to overhear. Of course, our girl gets flustered and calls his comment nonsense. She blushes innocently and asks why the sergeant is suddenly talking to her so casually. Minjun doesn't see the problem with that of course, since they're both of similar age, and he'd actually prefer it if the Nepo baby would use the same casual tone. In any case, the girl rejects the notion that she likes her, but her reply only makes the old ladies in the distance smile with joy, almost making it seem like they know her true feelings better than herself. Anyway, Minjun once again asks her why she's here if that is not the case, and the girl finally admits that the sizzling meat wasn't the only reason she came here. Looking a bit shy and averting her eyes to the side, she suddenly mentions the tin can dungeon that they entered together for training. Minjun gets confused at the unexpected reply, but then Yunseo keeps listing other events such as the Red Boar Dungeon, and even the recent fake dungeon incident. In all of these places where our hero is present, some sort of unexpected incident occurred. And although it's just a curiosity at the moment, Yunseo just wants to stick around to confirm if something might happen again. Still, now that she said it out loud, it sounds so ridiculous that she's actually getting embarrassed that she brought it up in the first place. The two share a moment of silence in the restaurant, and quite cutely, our girl tries to lift her head to confirm Minjun's reaction. She expected ridicule and annoyance, but what she got was an unexpected laughter, followed up by a sweating face only a guilty criminal could ever make after getting caught red-handed. The girl tilts her head at him with a question mark above her head, not understanding his reaction. And our boy, absolutely losing his shit and unknowingly crushing the glass in his hand, can't help but panic that she might be onto him and his demonic powers. Once again, silence is shared between the two, until our hero notices the badge of a corporal on Sun Yunseo's uniform. He tries to take advantage of it to change the topic and asks if she got promoted, and Yunseo replies that she just passed her promotion exam last week. Minjun tries to egg on her some more, saying that it's an amazing feat to be promoted so quickly, but the remark only seems to annoy our girl. After all, he's sitting right in front of her as a sergeant, even though they both joined at the same time. Her annoyance brings her back to why this dude is still being so casual to her, to which he replies once again that she's allowed to do the same. The Nepo baby starts pouting once again, and even though the crisis seems to be averted, our boy's attention is quickly drawn towards a demonic call from his familiar. Looks like a dungeon gate is about to form near his location, and he's live footage of the scene through his ability. Minjun clicks his tongue, because this is literally the worst possible time for a dungeon to appear. After all, this girl over here is sitting right in front of him, actually waiting for someone to randomly happen while he's on vacation. You see, she was right on the money as well, because the only reason why Minjun took a break in the first place was because his employee of the year, the condom head demonic familiar, had informed him of a dungeon's arrival in advance. But now, his plans are completely ruined due to the Nepo baby's presence. Actually running out of options, my guy brings back his straight face and pulls out the oldest trick in the book to bail on your date in a restaurant, which is the excuse of needing to use the bathroom, and silently exiting through the back door. Yunseo allows him to leave, and the next thing we know, the idiot is out and about in a nearby park, waiting for the portal to emerge. He finds the crackling energy rather quickly, and starts looking around for his familiar. The camera pans towards a park bench, and our tiny condom head peeks through from behind it after spotting its master. Minjun gives it a thumbs up for bringing him such amazing news despite not even working with Lee Bongu, which is a praise that the familiar really seems to appreciate. 
After tossing away the ball of demonic energy for the familiar to feed on, our hero starts to wonder why his other minion hasn't come into contact with him lately. But before he can entertain that thought any further, his attention is diverted towards a much more pressing issue. The lightning of the dungeon portal seems to be acting more violently, which basically means that the gate is about to open. Minjun readies himself for the battle, commenting that it's good that not many people are passing through this area due to the winter cold. In just a matter of seconds, the lightning energy starts running rampant in its location, and a gigantic portal is opened right in front of our hero as he had expected. We all know that our boy isn't the type to care about others, but even he is getting annoyed by the fact that the gate is opening up in the middle of a residential area. Regardless, for the sake of the citizen's safety and his promotion, he gets ready to deal with this mess as soon as possible. In the next moment, we see a somewhat humanoid silhouette of a dungeon creature making its way out of the gate, looking quite menacing. The fact that the monster is coming out on its own isn't a natural occurrence, and is categorized as an anomaly called the Dungeon Break. This is when Minjun's phone starts buzzing, and he takes it out to see a message alert from the Hunter military, informing the citizens to escape the area due to the appearance of a dungeon. For now, our boy doesn't know what might come out of this portal, but if it's something he shouldn't be able to handle at his current level, he just needs to hold out until the reinforcements arrive from the military. After all, they already seem to be aware of its presence, so our hero just needs to think of a way to stall for time. Soon enough, a giant blade-like object comes out from the portal, and out emerges a massive creature with incredible muscles, sharp canines, and a face without eyes. The creature roars ferociously, immediately putting our hero on guard against it. Minjun recognizes this monster as a hanker, not to be mistaken with a wanker, and it looks like it's a somewhat troublesome opponent. The wanker, I mean the hanker, starts off the fight by bringing down its bladed hand on our hero. The attack gets dodged rather easily, but Minjun is still left with a lot of questions about this monster. First, he wants to make sure if it's the only one coming out of the gate, and secondly, given its abnormally dangerous arms, he wants to know if it has consumed a fuckton of demonic energy. The sergeant leaps away from the creature's follow-up attack, and immediately starts preparing his dark arrows to smite him into smithereens. However, before he could launch his attack, the hanker somehow propelled his left blade forward like a hand cannon. It definitely caught our boy off guard, and the resulting impact from the blow was rather flashy. But of course, we all know that this wanking hanker would never hit our hero in the first place. The blade was lodged to the ground, and zooming out, we see that it missed our hero by just an inch of a margin. Minjun admits that he didn't expect such an attack, but as he holds the chain, he remarks that this is nothing more than a petty trick. I guess the monster has an ego after all, because we see that it's pretty pissed by the comment. With its enormous strength, it pulls back the chain swiftly, forcing our boy to swing along with it. Not only that, it further follows up with another hand cannon attack with his other arm. Once again, showing incredible athleticism, my man dodges the unexpected attack midair by swirling around his body like a tornado. Let's zoom out and look at the scene in slow motion. This shit looks straight out of some superhero movie. With the wankers both chain arms swinging in the air, and our hero being suspended in the air with a forward momentum, he comes crashing down at the monster's jaw with his demonic punch. The Hulk falls to the ground with the impact, and Minjun lands gracefully right behind him. But as he turns around, he can immediately tell that his earlier attack wasn't enough. After all, even with its broken jaw hanging by the torn flesh of its face, the monster still managed to stand erect, as expected from the tenacity of a wanker. Minjun was now getting ready to launch another attack, but he finally gets interrupted as someone calls out to him from behind. He recognizes the voice and turns around his head with a face full of worry. And lo and behold, our favorite girl was sprinting right towards him, holding a fucking signpost of all things imaginable. Seeing a girl in its vicinity, the wanker started moving its arms as expected. Its shiny blade was aimed directly at the Nepo baby, but our hero saves the day once again by holding firmly onto the chain and deflecting the blade's path immediately. While doing so, the sergeant asks the girl what the hell she's doing here. On the other hand, the wanker was still busy roaring and screeching, probably wondering the same question. However, instead of replying to Minjun, Yunseo simply shouted back with the same question right back at our hero. After all, my guy ran off on her in the middle of their dinner. Minjun doesn't care about that either, he just wants to know how she figured out his location. In response, Yunseo holds onto the signpost even more firmly, before throwing it straight at our hero, telling him that she saw the message alert and sprinted her way over here immediately. At first, our boy just looked at the flying signpost with his straight face as usual. But zooming in, we see the smile on his face, signifying that this is just the thing he needed. He starts sprinting, following the post's trajectory, before leaping into the air, grabbing the handheld makeshift weapon, and coating it aggressively with his demonic whip ability. And with that momentum and a burst of power, my guy brings down the post of justice towards the poor wanker's head, crushing it completely. And all the while, he's just wondering if the Nepo baby at least paid the bill before leaving the restaurant. 
he now sits on top of the crushed monster, while on the other hand, the dust cloud made by the impact of the blow obstructs our girl's vision. Without wasting a single moment, Minjun takes this chance to immediately absorb all the demonic essence out of the creature. As soon as he finishes, he hears the coughing sounds of the girl, who, despite getting the confirmation, is still a bit confused that they were actually facing a hanker. It's a high-danger monster, and she's just stunned that our hero defeated it by himself. But of course, Minjun just looks at the signpost, and comments that she's the one who helped him, so it wasn't a solo feat. Although truth be told, he knows that he would have had a much easier fight if she hadn't interfered. Yunseo goes down to observe even further, and immediately notes that this version of the monster is also not normal, as it seems mutated, and much more dangerous than its normal counterparts. So, given all the evidence right in front of her, the girl gives a stern look to the sergeant at last, telling him that they need to have a serious talk about all the recent events involving him. But before such a conversation could be initiated, another silhouette starts to emerge out of the dungeon portal. The hunters both sense its presence and look back to confirm their suspicions, and we immediately see a total of five wankers, casually marching their way out of the dungeon. Seeing their numbers, the Nepo baby suggests falling back and regrouping with the reinforcements when they get here. Our boy likes the idea and tells the girl to back on her own and regroup with the others. But that means he's not including himself in his plan, and our Nepo baby doesn't understand this decision. But the time for such talk is over, as the group of wankers with their popping veins and ferocious nature are right upon their throats to rip them apart. Minjun sprouts his signature smile at the scene, confusing the girl even more. Immediately in the next scene, we see him make a battle-ready pose, coating himself in the signpost with a layer of demonic energy, and then quickly leaping forth in battle while leaving the girl behind. My man is happier than ever, already sure of himself that his next accomplishment will land him the position of a staff sergeant. We then move away from the fight, to a faraway location in Isgard, with two full moons in the starry night sky. A hooded figure makes their way into the depths of a thick forest, treading ever so lightly with their leathered boots. They stand in front of a rather peculiar-looking rock, and start chanting in a language that's unknown to us. Upon their chant, the rock splits in half, and slowly starts crumbling into little pieces, revealing a mysterious staircase leading to the underground. After revealing the hidden entrance, the figure starts descending the stairs slowly, we see their cloaked face, walking inside a fairly long and well-designed hallway. Soon, they reach a certain gate at the end of a hallway, and head inside into an open hall, very similar to the summoning room used by the Saintess in the central cathedral of Isgard. The figure stops in front of a shrine, pays their respect to the deity, and slowly reveals their crimson hair by unveiling the cloak. From a distance, we can tell that this person is a woman, wearing an outfit that's very common among the dark mages of Isgard. And zooming in, we also see that she's quite the beauty. To me, her slightly ruffled hair shows the character of a hard worker who doesn't care for her appearance, and her soft gaze gives off a vibe of intelligence. Zooming out, we see that she's standing in front of the shrine of Lumi Nuna, the video game character that Minjun adores, and the figure around which the Minjun's entire church of fanatics was found in Isgard. And standing right there, the girl mutters a single sentence, asking Lord Minold, also known as Kim Minjun, to wait for her to join him. I guess this girl was a member of Minjun's fan club and is also trying to find a way back to him, just like Lee Bongu. Regardless, this is a story that would only be further continued in the next season of the series, as the first season has now officially come to an end with this episode. A lot of suspense was left for us to think about as we wait for the next season, and I honestly can't wait to start covering it for you guys as soon as it comes out. Please spam the comment section below to let me know how much you enjoyed this series so far, what was your favorite episode, and what development are you expecting to see in the next season. Until next time, 